The Haunting of a German Submarine, the UB-65 After the outbreak of the First World War, warfare remained a somewhat gentlemanly and traditional affair for the Allied nations, where combatants lined up to expose their might before engaging in organized and decisive encounters. However, the Central Powers utilized superior technology and rapidly evolving battlefield tactics to eliminate their enemies in the quickest way possible. It did not take a long time for the Great Britain and her compatriots to encounter the effects of their short-sightedness. As poison gas flowed over European battlefields and firebombs rained over London, and Allied generals hysterically demanded new ideas and innovations to combat the German weapons, Britain had entered the war with the world's mightiest navy, unrivaled in terms of numbers and pedigree, and thus the effects were more evident on the high seas. Britain's admirals believed that bigger was better, constructing gigantic steel colossuses equipped with impregnable firepower, but her ships were aging and becoming superannuated, an aspect of the Imperial German Navy were keenly aware of. They knew the Royal Navy was insurmountable in open combat, so instead leaned towards the undersea boat, a new form of naval technology back then. However, the 24 operational undersea boats they possessed during the commencement of the conflict were dwarfed by the 80 submarines of the Royal Navy. Despite the commendable advantage, the British admirals viewed the submarines as a cowardly and underhanded weapon. They constructed them out of a feeling of necessity and had little idea of how to best operate them. Thus, what followed was a series of tragically failed attempts to add the submarines as a component of the main fleet. On the 22nd of December, 1914, the 7th Cruiser Squadron, commanded by Rear Admiral Arthur Christian, was confronted by the German submarine U-9 in the North Sea. Within the next couple of hours, three British cruisers had sunk into the depths, taking 1,450 sailors with them. The following spring, RMS Lusitania was sunk by a U-20 near the Irish coast, claiming 1,198 lives. Over the next six months, tons of shipping would be decimated by undersea boat activity, leaving the Royal Navy seemingly powerless to retaliate. At its peak, the undersea boat fleet consisted of 142 operational submarines, and their commanders were viewed as the aces of the German armed forces. In the early days of August 1917, UB-65 became a member of the fleet. Background Designed to operate in close proximity to coastlines, UB-65 had the ability to hold up to 10 torpedoes. But even before her hull had touched the water, she had gained a terrifying reputation as one of the unluckiest vessels to ever be released into the sea. Like most other vessels in the fleet, UB-65 was built in the Vulcan shipyards in Hamburg. But unlike the others, her time was constructed, was plagued by unusually high numbers of accidents. While the U-boat's keel was in the process of being laid, a couple of dock workers were mashed by a failing girder. While one of them succumbed immediately, the other remained trapped under a huge metal mass for a little over two hours. His agonizing screams echoed around the shipyard before the unfortunate man eventually met his painful demise. A few months later, after the boat was scheduled for its first test, another tragic incident followed. Three engineers were missing at the end of the working hours of the day. They were later found lying dead in the motor room, having been suffocated by diesel fumes leaking from a fault in the engine. Even after the submarine eventually left the dry dock, things did not seem to change. On her first test run, a squall suddenly raised out of nowhere before washing one of the sailors overboard, never to be seen again. Apart from these tragic deaths, the submarine was also plagued with technical difficulties. During another test run, one of the ballast tanks malfunctioned, thus causing the undersea boat to crash down into the seabed. After 12 hours of desperate attempts, the crew were finally able to resurface the vessel. On a further sea trial, a gas leak killed two more crewmen. These events formed a general opinion of the boat being cursed. After the new submarine was commissioned on the 18th of August, 1917, a crew of submariners led by Martin Shell was assigned to the UB-65. As the young commander restlessly drilled and trained his crew, he remained confident that the thrill of stalking the enemy would focus their minds, but the events that followed would prove otherwise. On 
On the evening of UB-65's first voyage, one of its torpedoes detonated without any explanation or warning. The submarine escaped with minor damage, but five of its sailors, including the second officer named Richter, were severely injured. Over the following two weeks, Richter died of his injuries. Repairs were completed, and the replacement crew members were found. Finally, in October 1917, the vessel silently made her way into the North Sea. Her first mission was greatly successful, as shells sunk five enemy vessels. Quickly afterwards, a string of unnerving incidents began. Tales of the Haunting One evening when Shell was resting in his cabin, one of the crewmen knocked on his door to inform him about a situation on the submarine's deck. As he made his way through the control room and up onto the Corning Tower, he found Peterson, the duty lookout, crouched down in fear. When the angered commander demanded the terrified lookout to explain himself, he recounted that he had been up in the Coning Tower, looking out across the waves, when he had realized that there was someone standing a few feet away from the ship's bow. The figure allegedly seemed to be an officer sporting a great coat and a cap. When Peterson had called out for the officer to identify himself, the figure turned to face him, revealing itself to be the deceased Lieutenant Richter before fading away. The commander accused Peterson of everything from drunkenness to cowardice before giving him a stern warning. The news of the incident immediately traveled through the vessel, and as Shell walked back to his cabin, he could feel his men regarding him nervously. Several days later, terrified screams emanating from the control room broke the morning serenity. The vessel had been on the surface for most of the previous evening, venting and recharging her batteries. As the morning lookout had clambered up into the conning tower to do a final sweep before it submerged, he had felt a tap on his shoulder. The sailor found Richter standing behind him and his face had an eerie smile etched upon it. Falling from the ladder and into the control room, the sailor had managed to break his leg. As the other crewmen hastily gathered to help him, two of them swore that they had seen Richter staring emotionlessly at them from the conning tower before disappearing into thin air. Shell again threatened to take disciplinary action against the men involved, but the incident had him feeling apprehensive. The hauntings continued for the submarine's second mission, increasing both in intensity and count. One evening, a couple of engineers were working on a piece of machinery when they noticed a figure resembling Richter survey the control panel behind them. When they had called out for it, it walked straight through a nearby bulkhead. No enemy ships were sunk during this patrol, and the captain suspected that the fear in the heart of his crewmen made them incapable of performing their duties. Shell had been keeping the issue from his commanders, but now he considered requesting a new crew to save his reputation. As the submarine headed back for its home base at Wilhelmshaven, another tragedy occurred. A torpedo man working on the bow compartment witnessed Richter walk past before disappearing into the steel hull. The terrified sailor squealed in fear and fought his way through the vessel, leaving behind chaos. He hastily ascended the Coning Tower ladder and before he could be detained, he had hurled himself into the water of the ocean. As Shell stood hopelessly on the deck, he turned to see Richter stand amidst the crewmen and stare directly at him before disappearing. Shell's superiors depicted a predictable mixture of bemusement and anger upon listening to his pleas from crew assignment. However, the corroborating testimony provided by his junior officer and the remainder of his crew proved compelling enough to launch an investigation. In order to stop the affair before its story spread to other ships at the base, a Lutheran pastor was asked to exercise the vessel and a majority of the crew were stealthily replaced. The next two patrols passed without any incidents, but on the evening of the 10th of July, 1918, the haunting of the submarine would come to a quick and violent conclusion. A tragic ending. An American submarine had been hurrying to assist a Portuguese freighter that had been torpedoed near Padstow. When her crew had observed the UB-65 sitting motionless on the surface of the sea, as Lieutenant Augustine was preparing to get a better look of the unsuspecting enemy ship, something caught his attention. Upon looking through his binoculars, the lieutenant realized that the German vessel was already tilting heavily to its right. On top of its deck was a solitary officer, staring at an open sea. Before his American counterparts could load their torpedoes, Augustine noted UB-65 shaking violently 
as if she had been hit by an explosion. The very next moment she sank into the depths. For a couple of hours that followed, the American ship sailed across the region looking out for possible survivors, but they found none. Almost 90 years would pass before the haunted vessel would be seen again. In the year of 2004, a documentary crew working for Channel 4 discovered the remains of the UB-65. The wreck was inspired by Dr. Enes McCarthy, a renowned nautical historian, and he could find no indications of enemy action. The ship's aft hatches were open, suggesting that at least some of her members had tried to escape the sinking vessel. So did the spirit of the submarine's deceased second officer play a role in her expiration? Her first crew member certainly believed so. Strangely, this isn't the only bewildering incident that occurred to a U-boat on the German fleet. A monstrous creature in the depths of the ocean. In the year of 1915, after torpedoing the British steamer Iberian, George von Fortzner commanded the U-28, and his crewmen gleefully watched their enemy vessel sink under the waves. Moments later, they witnessed a huge sea creature hurtle itself out of the sea and jump into the air before the ship's engines exploded. On the 30th of April, 1918, two months before the loss of the UB-65, HMS Coriopsis encountered the UB-85 at the coast of Belfast. The undersea boat was half flooded and sinking fast, but the arrival of the Royal Navy vessel saved the crew. Her captain, Gunter, claimed that she had been sunk after encountering a monster. He recounted ordering the ship to surface in order to recharge her batteries before a huge creature emerged from the water and climbed up onto its deck. Its weight had quickly pulled the vessel under the water line, causing the water to enter through the hatches that had been opened in order to ventilate the ship. The petrified commander had assembled his entire crew for arms, but they weren't able to use the deck gun as the creature had coiled around it. Thus, the crew opened fire on the beast with their sidearms before the creature crashed back into the water further damage as it went. The German crew spent the next few hours working tirelessly to slow down the flooding, and they were eventually taken into custody by their enemies. Despite the ridicule and accusations he faced over time, Captain Gunter stood firm on his claims until his death. In the year of 2016, the remains of the submarine were discovered by a telecommunication company in the Irish Sea, but the cause of the sinking couldn't be determined. A Skeptical Point of View Across the two world wars, being a submariner was an extremely arduous task. Housed beneath the waves and cramped conditions for weeks together, it was immensely taxing on the sailors' physical and mental health. Furthermore, they were only a detonation or leak away from their death. To add on, the constant pressure of fighting for victory while trying to preserve the lives of other crew members couldn't have made things better. Thus, the state of affairs could have caused the sailors to lean on superstition to explain an otherwise natural thing. Although plausible, the speculation is far from conclusive due to the fact that the man that they knew, by leaning toward a paranormal explanation, they would open themselves up to ridicule and punishment. These are happenings that were witnessed and verified not just by individual members, but entire crews. Moreover, it can be argued that the soldiers who made these reports had nothing to gain from fabricating them except ridicule and abuse. Examination of their remains seemed to rule out the involvement of actions of their enemies. The sea remains a vast and inadequately explored zone, which almost certainly is filled with unrevealed secrets. Ships continue to disappear under mysterious circumstances, even with the huge advancements in safety and communication. Unfortunately, we'll never really know if the UB-65 was haunted, nor know if the man witnessed by the American captain was the deceased German lieutenant. However, the one thing we know for certain is that whatever answers may exist about the fate of the vessel had been buried in an unbreakable coffin whose location would never be found. Scratches and marks are appearing with no apparent cause. I feel like I'm going crazy. It was a few weeks ago and I first noticed a peculiar occurrence in my bedroom, one that left me feeling bewildered and questioning my sanity. As I gazed upon the familiar walls of my sanctuary, my eyes fell upon a deep scratch etched into the surface, positioned just above my bed. 
I was taken back, for I had not made any significant changes to the arrangement of furniture in the room. The scratch seemed to have materialized out of thin air, defying any logical explanation. Curiosity gnawed at me, urging me to investigate further. I turned my attention downward, only to find yet another enigmatic mark, and this time on the hard floor. A massive, deep scratch marred the otherwise pristine surface, a stark contrast to the previously flawless state. I couldn't comprehend how such a significant blemish had manifested itself without my knowledge or any plausible cause. Naturally, my first thought turned to my faithful companion, my beloved Kali. However, upon closer inspection, I quickly dismissed the notion that he could have been the culprit. His claws, though strong and sturdy, were short in length, rendering them unable to produce such a fine and elongated scratch. Furthermore, it struck me as odd that a single scratch would be left behind. If he had slipped or stumbled, one would expect multiple marks indicative of a struggle or an accident. The mystery deepened, and my perplexity intensified. In the face of this inexplicable phenomenon, I couldn't help but question my own sanity. Doubts and uncertainties clouded my mind as I pondered the origin of these perplexing scratches. Was it possible that I was hallucinating or succumbing to some sort of delusion? The rational part of my being sought to find a logical explanation, a plausible answer that would restore my sense of order and reason. Compounding my concerns was the looming presence of my landlord, who I imagined would be less than pleased with the state of the premises the way they were. The fear of retribution weighed heavily on my shoulders, exasperating my anxiety and exasperating my determination to unravel the mystery before me. Driven by an insatiable curiosity and a desperate need for answers, I embarked on a quest to uncover the truth behind these inexplicable scratches. I meticulously combed through every possible scenario, considering every conceivable cause. Could it have been the result of an unseen intruder, stealthily leaving their mark as a twisted form of psychological torment? Or perhaps there was a rational explanation rooted in the intricate workings of the natural world. Some unseen force is at play. Days turned into nights as I pored over countless articles, delving deep into the realms of the paranormal and the unexplained. I sought solace in the accounts of others who had experienced similar inexplicable occurrences, finding comfort in the knowledge that I was not alone in my confusion and bewilderment. Yet, despite my tireless efforts, the answers remained elusive. The scratches continued to taunt me, a daily reminder of the enigma that had invaded my sanctuary. Sleep eluded me as my mind became consumed with theories and conjectures, each one more outlandish than the last. Amidst this turmoil, a sliver of hope emerged. I realized that dwelling on the uncertainties and fearing the wrath of my landlord would only serve to heighten my distress. Instead, I chose to adopt a different perspective, one of acceptance and surrender to the unknown. With this newfound mindset, I decided to embrace my mystery, allowing it to weave its intricate threads into the fabric of my existence. I recognize that there are phenomena in this vast universe that defy explanation, and perhaps these scratches were one such phenomenon. Instead of tirelessly seeking answers, I resolved to find peace within the acceptance of the unknowable. As time went on, the scratches on my bedroom wall and floor became a constant presence in my life. They served as a reminder of the limits of human understanding and the mysteries that lay beyond our grasp. Instead of succumbing to frustration or fear, I chose to view them as maybe an invitation to explore the realm of the supernatural and delve into the depths of the unexplained. I embarked on a journey of research and discovery, immersing myself in books, documentaries, and online forums dedicated to paranormal phenomenon. I connected with individuals who had encountered similar unexplained scratches and shared their stories finding solace in the collective wisdom and support of this community. Through my investigations, I unearthed tales of haunted houses where inexplicable scratches appeared on walls and floors, attributed to the restless spirits of former inhabitants. These stories resonated with me, and I contemplated the possibility that my own abode harbored a hidden history or unseen occupants. Seeking guidance, I consulted with paranormal investigators and spiritual mediums, inviting them into my house to conduct thorough investigations. 
Their presence brought a sense of both trepidation and anticipation, as I hoped for answers while fearing what they might uncover. During their visits, the investigators utilized a myriad of tools and techniques to communicate with the spiritual realm. Electronic voice phenomenon recordings were made, EVPs, capturing potential messages from beyond. EMF, electromagnetic field detectors, were employed to identify fluctuations in energy, potentially indicating the presence of otherworldly entities. As I sat in the darkness, surrounded by these dedicated individuals, I witnessed moments of profound intensity. Whispers filled the air, shadowy figures appeared, fleeting in my peripheral vision, and the temperature fluctuated unpredictably. It was an eerie and surreal experience, one that simultaneously thrilled and unnerved me. Yet, despite the meticulous investigations and the tantalizing glimpses into the supernatural, the origin of the scratches remained elusive. The experts themselves were confounded, unable to provide a definitive explanation. They offered theories ranging from poltergeist activity to residual energy imprints, but none could be conclusively proven. In the absence of concrete answers, I found solace in the realm of speculation and personal interpretation. I began to embrace the scratches as symbols, manifestations of a hidden narrative or emotional energy. They became a catalyst for introspection, prompting me to explore the depths of my own psyche and confront unresolved emotions and subconscious fears. In the process, I discovered the power of self-reflection and the potential for personal growth that lay within the enigmatic scratches. They became a metaphor for the scratches and scars we all carry within us. Physical or emotional reminders of the challenges that we have faced and the resilience that we have cultivated. As I continue my journey of self-discovery and spiritual exploration, the scratches gradually lost their ability to unsettle me. I found peace in accepting their presence as part of my life a mysterious and unexplained phenomenon that defied rational explanation. Instead of allowing them to instill fear or doubt, I chose to view them as a reminder of the vastness of the universe and the infinite possibilities that exist beyond our comprehension. Today, the scratches on my bedroom wall and floor serve as testament to the intricacies of existence, a tangible representation of the mysteries that surround us. They have become a symbol of my own journey, a constant reminder to embrace the unknown, to seek answers while finding solace in the acceptance of the unknowable. So as time goes and the scratches persist in their enigmatic nature, I continue to live alongside them, guided by a newfound sense of curiosity and wonder. I am reminded that life is a tapestry woven both with the known and the mysterious, and the human experience itself. It is in these moments of uncertainty and intrigue that we are compelled to expand our perspectives, challenge our preconceptions, and explore the boundless realms of knowledge and spirituality. I've come to realize that the scratches on my bedroom wall and floor are not merely physical aberrations, but profound symbols of the interconnectedness between the seen and unseen, the tangible and intangible. They are reminders that our understanding of reality is limited and that there are forces at work beyond our comprehension. With each passing day, I find myself drawn deeper into the mysteries that surround us. I immerse myself in philosophical texts, scientific research, and ancient wisdom, seeking to unravel the secrets that lie hidden within the fabric of existence. Though this journey of intellectual and spiritual exploration is hard, I have discovered that the scratches serve as gateways to the greater understanding of the universe and our place within it. As I embrace the unknown, my perspective expands, and so with it my consciousness becomes more attuned to the subtle energies and vibrations that permeate our world. I have developed a heightened intuition, allowing me to perceive the subtle whispers of the universe, guiding me toward profound insights and revelations. In the midst of this transformative journey, I've encountered individuals who share similar experiences, forming deep connections with fellow seekers of truth. We exchange stories, theories, and hypotheses, piecing together the fragments of our collective understanding and weaving a tapestry of shared knowledge and wisdom. 
Together, we explore the realms of metaphysics, consciousness, and spirituality, delving into ancient teachings, mystical practices, and scientific breakthroughs. Our discussions are filled with excitement and wonder as we delve into the realm of quantum physics, multidimensional realities, and the interconnectedness of all things. The scratches that once filled me with apprehension now filled me with a sense of awe and reverence. They have become symbols of the vastness of existence, reminding me that there's always more to discover, more to learn, and more to experience. They serve as gentle nudges from the universe, urging me to embrace the beauty of the unknown and to venture into the uncharted territories of knowledge and self-discovery. Through this ongoing exploration, I've come to understand that the scratches on my bedroom wall and floor are not a burden, but a gift. A gift that has expanded my consciousness, deepened my spiritual connection, and enriched my perception of reality. They've allowed me to transcend the boundaries of the mundane and glimpse into the profound interconnectedness of all things. So, as time continues its relentless march forward, I stand in awe of the scratches that adorn my surroundings. They are no longer mere physical marks, but portals to a world of endless wonders and infinite possibilities. With each passing day, I am reminded of the immense beauty and complexity that resides within the fabric of our own existence, and I am grateful for the journey of self-discovery and enlightenment that these scratches have set upon me. In this eternal quest for knowledge and understanding, I embrace the scratches as constant companions, guiding me toward a deeper comprehension of the mysteries that lie just beyond the veil of the known. And in their presence, I find solace, inspiration, and a profound sense of purpose. For it is through the enigmatic and the unexplained that we truly come alive, embracing the fullness of our human potential and our infinite capacity to explore the vast expanses of existence. More Ghost Stories Part 2 The chilling tale of the no-face lady began when my younger sister, just four years old at the time, first encountered her ethereal presence. It was approximately a month after we'd moved into our new house when my sister shared her unsettling experiences with us. According to her, a lady would enter our room at night, but initially none of us could see this mysterious figure. However, after my own spine-tingling encounter with an entity named Laura in the basement, I was inclined to believe my sister's account. Curiosity piqued, I decided to inquire about the lady's appearance. As I questioned my sister, her description sent shivers down my spine. She explained that the lady had no face, devoid of eyes and a mouth. Bewildered, I probed further, asking about her nose. After a moment of contemplation, my sister touched down her own nose and revealed that the lady's nose lacked any nostrils. Sensing her unease, I ceased my inquiries, realizing that delving deeper into the subject would only intensify my own fears. With each passing day, the paranormal activity in our home escalated. Phantom footsteps echoed through the hallways and disembodied voices filled the empty spaces. I had already encountered a full apparition myself, and now my sister had too. It was becoming increasingly evident that we had taken up residence in a genuinely haunted house. Feeling the weight of these experiences, I decided to share my concerns with our parents. However, as I had come to expect, my mother dismissed our claims, refusing to acknowledge the supernatural occurrences. My father, on the other hand, displayed a more receptive attitude. Although he hadn't witnessed apparitions firsthand, he acknowledged the validity of our experiences with the voices and footsteps. He reasoned with my mother, emphasizing that children often possess a heightened sensitivity to such phenomena and encouraged her to adopt a more open-minded perspective. Alas, her skepticism remained unyielding, leaving us to navigate this eerie reality on our own. Another month passed, and one fateful night I was roused from my sleep during the early hours of morning. To my astonishment, my younger sister sat upright in her bed, her gaze fixed upon the door. My drowsiness vanished instantly as I inquired about her unusual behavior. She pointed toward the door and she whispered, She's here. 
A surge of adrenaline coursed through my veins as I turned my attention to the doorway. Standing there was a tall woman with long, dark red hair. However, the longer I scrutinized her, the more I noticed the disconcerting abnormalities that defined her presence. Her elongated fingers appeared grotesquely disproportionate, while her slender limbs seemed out of sync with her equally slender frame. Yet the most chilling detail, echoing my sister's earlier account, was the absence of a face. Instead, were features that shouldn't have been there. And it was just black and featureless. It was as if she was an imitation of a human, a flawed mimicry trapped in an uncanny valley. Paralyzed with fear, I remained frozen, my default response when confronting with such a terror. Remarkably, the lady paid us no heed, drifting silently into our closet before re-emerging. She wandered over to the window, then returned to the closet, eventually vanishing through the door and descending the stairs. The following day, I shared the unnerving encounter with my father, who promptly reached out to a knowledgeable friend for guidance. Following their advice, he performed a sage cleansing, hoping to banish the malevolent presence. Miraculous encounter with the no-face lady came to an abrupt halt, and we never laid eyes upon her again. Though the memories of the no-face lady still haunt me to this day, recounting the events in vivid detail helps me to come to terms with the inexplicable and unsettling experiences that unfolded within the confines of our home. It was a time marked by both fear and fascination as the supernatural encroached upon our lives with relentless presence. The passing of my beloved grandmother in 2019 had already cast a shadow over our household, her absence left a void that seemed insurmountable, and the house itself carried remnants of her presence, a bittersweet reminder of cherished memories. Little did we know that her departure would unveil a realm beyond our understanding where the living intertwined with the unknown. The enigmatic phenomena commenced shortly after our family's relocation when my young sister, just four years old at the time, became the first to encounter the no-face lady. She described a lady entering our room during the night, her visage devoid of essential features that define a human face. At first, her accounts were met with skepticism, dismissed as the product of an overactive imagination. However, a haunting incident involving Laura, a presence that I myself had encountered in the basement, shattered any doubts I had harbored. Intrigued and increasingly disturbed, I sought to learn more about the apparition that haunted my sister's dreams. I engaged her in conversation, delicately unraveling the details of her encounters. The image she painted was chillingly vivid. No eyes, no mouth, and even no nose. The depth of her description sent shivers cascading down my spine, fueling my own trepidation and solidifying the reality of this malevolent specter. As days turned into weeks, the paranormal occurrences in her home intensified. Eerie echoes of phantom footsteps reverberating through the halls, causing our hearts to skip beats, whispered voices seemingly disembodied, and echoes in empty rooms, testing the boundaries of our sanity. The veil between the physical and spiritual realms had been pierced, and we found ourselves ensnared in an enigma that defied rational explanation. Compelled to seek solace and guidance, I mustered the courage to share our haunting experiences with our parents. However, as if often the case when confronted with the inexplicable, their responses diverged. My mother, steadfast in her skepticism, dismissed our accounts as mere flights of fancy or figments of overactive imaginations. Her reluctance to acknowledge the supernatural left us feeling isolated, grappling with the weight of our own encounters in silence. In contrast, my father displayed a more emphatic and open-minded disposition. Though he hadn't personally borne witness to the apparitions, he recognized the validity of our experiences, acknowledging the subtle signs that sort of whispered a hidden reality. His willingness to listen and validate our encounters provided a glimmer of comfort amidst uncertainty that loomed over our lives. Night after night, the specter of the no-face lady persisted, her ethereal presence casting a palpable pall over our household. The boundary between the physical and the metaphysical realms blurred, as if the veil separating the living and the departed had thinned to the point of near non-existence. 
I found myself teetering on the precipice of fear and fascination, torn between desire and to unravel the mysteries that plagued us, and the instinct to shield myself from the relentless onslaught of the unknown. However, it was a fateful night on New Year's Eve 2020 that would forever be etched into my memory, solidifying the existence of the otherworldly presence that had infiltrated our lives. Engrossed in a late-night gaming session, I disregarded the passage of time, oblivious to the approaching hours of the early morning. Thoughts of rest fitted through my mind, a mere passing notion in the midst of my engrossment with the digital realm. Oblivious to the impending dawn of a new year, I continued to immerse myself in this virtual landscape that unfolded before me. The weight of fatigue tugged at my consciousness, urging me to surrender to the embrace of sleep, yet the allure of the game held me captive, delaying the inevitable descent into slumber. As the clock ticked relentlessly, the minutes bled into another, blurring the boundaries of time, it was in this twilight hour straddling the precipice between the past and the future that the supernatural world would once again make its presence known. It started with a sudden interruption, an abrupt cessation of the game that unfolded before me. A perplexing error message materialized on the screen, its cryptic words a jarring disruption to the immersive virtual reality. Startled, I stared at the screen in disbelief, my heart pounding within my chest. The timing, so impeccably aligned with my thoughts of retiring to bed, sent shivers coursing through my weary frame. It was as if an unseen force had intervened, yanking me from the clutches of my digital reverie and thrusting me into a state of heightened awareness. The realization dawned upon me with chilling clarity. The no-face lady possessed a presence that transcended the boundaries of time and space. She had become intricately entwined with our lives, a spectral guardian who defied the constraints of mortal existence. Though her intentions remained enigmatic, there is an undeniable connection between her ethereal visits and the events that unfolded in her home. With a newfound urgency, I relayed the unnerving incident to my father, who had become a pillar of understanding in the face of the inexplicable. Recognizing the significance of the occurrence, he reached out to a trusted friend who possessed a deep knowledge of the paranormal. Following their advice, we embarked upon a spiritual cleansing, utilizing the purifying properties of sage to cleanse our dwelling of any lingering negative energies. As tendrils of fragrant smoke curled through the air, carrying our intentions of banishment, a profound sense of peace settled upon our home. The oppressive weight that had plagued us gradually dissipated, leaving behind a semblance of serenity. The no-face lady, with her enigmatic presence and unsettling features, receded into the ethereal realm from whence she came, her purpose fulfilled, or curiosity satiated. In the aftermath of these otherworldly encounters, we were left to grapple with the implications of our own existence. The no-face lady had left an indelible mark upon our lives, forever blurring the boundaries between the tangible and the intangible. Though questions lingered, the very fabric of our reality forever altered, we found solace in the unity forged within our family. Together we weathered the storm of the supernatural, emerging stronger and more resilient. To this day, the tale of the no-face lady serves as a testament to the unfathomable mysteries that exist beyond the realm of human comprehension. It's a reminder that the unseen forces that weave through our lives are not always malevolent, but rather agents of transformation and growth. And as I navigate the vast tapestry of existence, I carry with me the lessons learned from that haunting chapter, forever mindful of the delicate threads that connect our world to the ethereal unknown. A Possible Cursed Book I'm from Morocco, a small country in North Africa known for its deep-rooted belief in witchcraft, black magic, and the occult. It is a land where stories of supernatural encounters and the mysterious practices permeate the cultural fabric, and my family, like many others, is no stranger to this enigmatic realm. Through the generations we've carried the weight of this mystical heritage, with my grandparents, may their souls rest in peace, possessing a unique connection to the spiritual realm. 
As a music teacher in an old, weathered elementary school, my wife is confronted daily with the echoes of the past. Our home, conveniently situated across the street from a cemetery, adds an extra layer of intrigue to our lives. It's within this backdrop that a series of inexplicable events began to unfold, slowly unraveling the thin veil that separates the ordinary from the extraordinary. It all started when my wife joined the faculty of the school. She would return home with tales of peculiar occurrences in her classroom, the persistent toppling of her pencil cup each morning. Initially, she brushed it off as the handiwork of a disgruntled custodian, a mischievous act aimed at testing her patience. But as the days turned into weeks, the frequency of this unexplainable phenomenon intensified, leaving her perplexed and searching for answers. Intriguingly, whispers of the mysterious book surfaced within our family. It was said to have been left in my grandfather's care by a fellow practitioner of the occult, who, lacking immediate family, entrusted its safekeeping to him. My father, in hushed conversations with his brothers, referred to it as cursed, attributing its presence to my grandfather's deteriorating health. My grandfather, burdened by schizophrenia, paranoia, and heart disease, experienced a peculiar pattern. His symptoms would inexplicably worsen when the confines of our ancestral home, within them, while finding temporary respite when staying elsewhere. Despite the offers from nearby relatives to provide him with a more comfortable and secure living arrangement, he adamantly clung to the notion that he would breathe his last breath within the walls he had meticulously erected with his own hands. And so, tragically, he did, succumbing to the mysterious ailment that plagued him. As the family gathered to bid him farewell, my young and impressionable self, accompanied by my equally intrigued cousins, found herself lured by the forbidden. Driven by a misguided sense of adventure, we obtained my grandfather's keychain, unlocking the door to the secrets hidden within his dwelling. In our innocence, we viewed it as a harmless exploration, unaware of the gravity of our actions. Together, we scoured his room, sifting through drawers and containers until we stumbled upon the elusive book. Its appearance was deceptively ordinary, a tome with a worn, dark brown cover that hinted at a hidden history. Clutching it tightly, we gathered in anticipation, half expecting a genie or otherworldly entity to manifest before us. Yet, as the pages unfolded, we were met with disappointment rather than awe. The text contained within a baffling mixture of horribly misspelled Arabic and Hebrew, rendering its contents indecipherable to our young minds. Some pages were torn, hinting at a potential narrative that had been deliberately obscured. Undeterred by our lack of comprehension, we resolved to test the book's powers, fueled by a potent blend of curiosity and recklessness. A dare was issued, and my cousin Hamza, ever eager to prove his mettle, volunteered to sleep with the book under his pillow for a night. Little did we anticipate the harrowing consequences that awaited us. In the aftermath of our ill-advised experiment, Hamza emerged a changed person. Dark circles clung to his wary eyes, a testament to the torment that he had endured. Sleep became a distant luxury for him, as his nights were besieged by a relentless barrage of nightmares. In the depths of his slumber, he found himself pursued by shadowy figures through the pitch-black labyrinth of the city. Their presence was palpable. Their breath hot in his neck as he sprinted through the darkness. Desperately seeking escape, each time they draw near, they dissolved into thin air, only to reappear moments later, their haunting footfalls echoing in his ears. Hamza's ordeal extended beyond the realm of dreams. Even in wakefulness, he was plagued by ghostly sounds, a chorus of whispered voices and mysterious knocks that echoed through the recesses of his mind. It was as though the book had unleashed a dormant force, an unseen energy that clung to him with malevolent intent. Terrified by his suffering, we convened to discuss our next course of action. Hamza, driven by fear and a sense of urgency, urged us to rid ourselves of the accursed book, to consign it to the flames, and sever the ties that bound us to its otherworldly influence. Yet, I hesitated, my mind clouded by conflicting blends of greed and practicality. You see, I was aware of the dire straits that had befallen my family. We struggled to make ends meet, with financial stability remaining an elusive dream, and within the peaks and pages of that seemingly innocuous book lay a potential fortune, a ticket to escape the cycle of poverty that had gripped us for generations, 
the allure of wealth whispered enticingly in my ear, drowning out the cries of reason. In a moment of misguided determination, I made the fateful decision to abscond with the book, secretly stashing it away in the confines of my own room. It became my clandestine treasure, hidden from the prying eyes and shielded from the grasp of my family's destitution. However, my ill-gotten possession came at a steep cost. That night, as darkness cloaked the world around me, a sense of foreboding settled in my heart, knocking on my door, reverberating through the silent corridors of my consciousness, each rap a chilling reminder of the entity I'd unwittingly invited into my life. Sleep eluded me as I lay awake, my senses heightened to every creak and whisper that permeated the stillness. The night became a tapestry of terror, woven with the same threads of my own apprehension. A fitful slumber, I found myself ensnared in the same nightmarish landscape that had ensnared Hamza. The figures pursued me relentlessly, their sinister forms merging with the inky blackness, while their spectral breath scorched the nape of my neck. Drenched in sweat and tears, I would awaken time and again, a fear clutching at my heart like icy talons. The cycle repeated itself, plunging me into a nocturnal purgatory from which there seemed no escape. It was a torment that gnawed at my sanity, eroding the boundaries between reality and the ethereal realm that now held me captive. Haunted by the book's malevolence, I could bear the burden no longer. The weight of my actions pressed up against my conscience, and I felt compelled to confess to my father, to seek his guidance and redemption from the clutches of the supernatural. Bracing myself for the consequences, I divulged the truth to my father, unburdening my soul of the secret I had harbored for far too long. His stern countenance betrayed with a mix of disappointment and concern, yet he took the book from my trembling hands, his resolve unwavering. He uttered a stern warning, instructing me to never speak of the book again. The gravity of his words hung heavy in the air, laden with unspoken knowledge and a profound understanding of the forces that lurked within its pages. What became of the book, I can't say with certainty, for my father's actions remained shrouded mystery. However, one thing was undeniable. The nightmare ceased, the hallucinations evaporated, and the oppressive presence that had plagued our lives dissipated like morning mist. Years later, and the memories of that fateful encounter faded into the recesses of my mind, life unfolded with its own unique tapestry of joys and challenges, as I navigated the labyrinth and pathways of adulthood. Yet, a recent discovery resurfaced, the specter of the past casting a pall of an ease over my present existence. During the renovation of her ancestral home, urged by the persistent persuasions of my aunt, my family pooled their meager resources to breathe new life into the dilapidated structure. Amidst the chaos of construction, a hidden compartment was unveiled, concealed within the very fabric of the house. Within its confines lay a weathered metal box, heavy with the weight of forgotten secrets. Intrigued, I stood alongside my relatives as the lid of the box was cautiously pried open, revealing its long-guarded contents. The jewelry remained of my long-departed grandmother, and it evoked a bittersweet nostalgia, while the faded photographs whispered stories of bygone days. Yet amidst these sentimental relics, an enigmatic collection stood out. A gathering of baby teeth, a shredded piece of paper, wrapped in a cloak of dirt-stained cloth. Curiosity tugged at my being, compelling me to examine the fragments of paper, their shredded edges invoking a sense of fragmented knowledge. As I gingerly pieced them together, my eyes widened with a mix of fascination and trepidation. The words etched upon the fragments were unmistakable, the same misspelled Arabic and Hebrew that had adorned the accursed book of my grandfather's possession. A chill ran down my spine as the realization dawned upon me. The book, once thought banished from our lives, had found a clandestine sanctuary within the hidden depths of our ancestral abode. Its secrets torn asunder and scattered to the winds, lingered as a haunting reminder of the inexplicable forces that had touched our lives. In that moment, the memories flooded back, and I retraced the path that had led me to this juncture. 
regret mingling with curiosity as I questioned the choices I had made and the risks I had taken. The allure of wealth, once so intoxicating, now seemed insignificant in the face of the supernatural turmoil that had ensued. I share this tale now, as a matured soul at the age of 26, burdened by the weight of my past actions. The story serves as a cautionary reminder of the delicate balance between greed and integrity, between curiosity and respect for the unknown. It's a testament to the enduring power of the mystical realm that permeates the cultural tapestry of my homeland, a reminder that some secrets are best left undisturbed, as the fragments of the torn paces, pages lay before me, their fragmented words whispering secrets lost to time. I can only hope that my family's brush with the occult serves as a cautionary tale for those who dare to tread the murky waters of the supernatural. May it serve as a testament to the resilience of the human spirit and the enduring power of family bonds, reminding us that the true wealth lies not in material possessions, but in the love and unity that guide us through the shadows of the unknown. Prophetic dream about death came true. Over two decades have passed since I lost my beloved father. The memories of those tumultuous weeks leading up to his passing still haunt me. He had been confined to the hospital for approximately six agonizing weeks. His condition deteriorated rapidly due to sepsis. It was a devastating ordeal for me, as my father was not only my parent but also my closest confidant and best friend in the entire world. However, it was a particular dream that struck me with an eerie sense of foreboding, leaving an indelible mark on my psyche. Roughly three weeks before his eventual demise, I found myself immersed in a distressing vision during my slumber. In the dream, I entered a vast room, its expanse filled with an array of coffins, each possessing its own unique size, color, and design, some were humble and unassuming, while others were opulent and exorbitantly priced. It was an overwhelming sight to behold. As I stood there, contemplating the significance of this unsettling dream, a disembodied voice echoed through the chamber, urging me to make a choice. Pick one, it commanded. Naturally, confusion and panic flooded me. Pick one, for who? I questioned in a state of distress. The voice responded solemnly, For your dad. In an instant, I jolted awake, engulfed in a frenzied panic. The intensity of the moment was so consuming that I can't recall whether I let out a blood-curdling scream or remained in a state of complete, silent shock. My wife, awakened by my sudden turmoil, hastened to calm my racing heart and soothe my troubled mind. It was just a dream, she reassured me gently. Gradually, I regained a semblance of composure, casting a forlorn gaze upon my wife and expressing the haunting realization that I had become painfully clear to me. My dad isn't going to make it. He's not coming home. My father had valiantly battled kidney failure for the past two decades, navigating a treacherous journey filled with countless hospital visits, recurrent surgeries, and even a transplant. The resilience he exhibited throughout the years and these trials had instilled a steadfast hope that he would always triumph over adversity and return home just as he had done so many times before. But this time, he remained hospitalized during this particular episode, and it never occurred to us that his departure from the world was imminent. We had grown accustomed to the ebb and flow of medical emergencies, perpetually clinging to the belief that he would defy the odds once more. Thus, the news of his passing struck us a profound and bewildering shock. The day of his passing blurred into an amalgamation of overwhelming emotions, I found myself adrift, struggling to maintain a fragile semblance of composure amid the weight of my grief. The hospital staff directed me to visit the funeral parlor to initiate the necessary arrangements for retrieving my father's body. Accompanied by my uncle, a pillar of support during those trying times, I made my way to the somber establishment, prepared to navigate the practicalities of bidding farewell to my cherished father. Sitting within the confines of a solemn office, I found myself immersed in a sea of paperwork, tasked with completing numerous formalities that marked the somber transition from life to death. 
As I filled the requisite information, attempting to steady my trembling hand, a sense of otherworldly presence descended upon the room. I sensed movement behind me, and my gaze was drawn to a door that had previously escaped my notice. The person from the parlor who had been guiding me through the proceedings stood up with an air of solemnity. Salam. Attempting to steady my trembling hand, a sense of otherworldly presence descended upon our room. I sensed movement behind me, and my gaze was drawn to a door that had previously escaped my notice. The person from the parlor who had been guiding me through the proceedings stood up with an air of solemnity and gestured for us to follow him. Curiosity gripped me as I followed the funeral parlor representative, accompanied by my steadfast uncle, into an expansive room that awaited us beyond the mysterious door. As we crossed the threshold, a profound sense of solemnity enveloped us, intensified by the sight that unfolded before our eyes. The room was adorned with a multitude of coffins, each one unique in size, color, and craftsmanship, mirroring the vivid imagery of my haunting dream. The stark contrast between the humble and opulent was striking, a reflection of thy diverse paths that individuals tread in their final resting places. The funeral parlor representative's voice resonated through the hushed atmosphere, breaking the silence that hung heavy in the air. With measured words, he uttered those hauntingly familiar instructions, pick one. It was as if the dream I had experienced weeks before had materialized before me, challenging me to confront the profound reality of my father's departure. Emotions surged with me, a tumultuous mix of grief, confusion, and a glimmer of inexplicable understanding. Was this a mere coincidence, an eerie alignment of events, or was there something more profound at play? Deep within my soul, a belief began to take hold that perhaps there was a divine orchestration guiding my path, intertwining the realms of dreams and reality. With a hesitant yet resolute spirit, I approached the sea of coffins, my fingertips gazing the surfaces as I searched for the vessel that would cradle my father's remains. Each touch, each moment of connection, felt imbued with a deeper significance as if an unseen force guided my hand. My eyes were drawn to a particular coffin, its elegant craftsmanship and understated beauty resonating with the essence of my father's spirit. It was as if this vessel, this sacred container, whispered to me, assuring to me that it was the right choice. In that pivotal moment, surrounded by the tangible symbols of mortality, I made my selection, a choice that extended beyond the physical realm, was a testament to the unbreakable bond I shared with my father, transcending the boundaries of life and death. With a heavy heart, I conveyed my decision to the funeral parlor representative, and together we embarked on the solemn journey of arranging the final farewell for my beloved father. In the days that followed, as we prepared for the funeral and navigated the intricate details of honoring my father's memory, I found solace in the notion that the dream had served as a profound message a spiritual communication that had transcended the confines of time and space. It was as if my father had reached out from the realms beyond, offering me a glimpse into the profound mysteries that lie just beyond our comprehension. The funeral itself became a poignant celebration of my father's life, a testament to the impact that he made and those that loved him. The room filled with friends, family, and acquaintances united in their collective grief and the shared memories that painted a vibrant portrait of my father's legacy. We gathered, enveloped in a tapestry of tears, laughter, and heartfelt stories, honoring the man that had touched our lives in immeasurable ways. As I reflect upon the transformative period, I'm struck by the realization that death is not an end, but rather a transition, a gateway to a realm beyond our mortal understanding. The synchronicities, the dreams, and the inexplicable occurrences that peppered my journey are threads in the tapestry of a larger narrative, reminding me that there's a vastness to existence, and it extends far beyond the realm of the tangible. In the years that have followed, I've continued to explore the interplay between the seen and the unseen, the finite and the infinite, 
My beliefs have expanded, embracing the interconnectedness of all things, enduring presence of our loved ones beyond the confines of our earthly existence. Through my personal experiences and profound encounters with the mysteries of life and death, I've come to understand that our departed loved ones continue to guide and watch over us, their presence intertwined with the fabric of our lives. The journey of self-discovery and spiritual exploration led me to delve deeper into the realms of metaphysics and the nature of consciousness. I discovered that we're more than just a physical being inhabited by a singular dimension. Rather, we are multidimensional beings, intricately connected to a vast tapestry of existence that extends far beyond what our limited human senses can perceive. Guided by my newfound understanding, I delved deep into the concept of multiple dimensions. Contemplating the intricacies of time and space, it became clear to me that there are dimensions beyond our immediate awareness. Realms where the essence of our thoughts, emotions, and intentions can resonate and manifest. Within this expanded worldview, the idea that our thoughts possess power in a dimension beyond our own became a tangible reality. It echoed the experiences of those who had honed their intuitive abilities, granting them access to realms when thoughts that intermingle with telepathic connections can be formed. These individuals serve as living testaments to the boundless potential of the human mind and the interconnectedness that permeates the vast cosmic tapestry. It was against this backdrop of expanded consciousness that the news of my ex-boyfriend's passing, discovered belatedly after a year of his battling with cancer, took on a profound significance. Though our relationship had been unconventional, characterized by a blend of casual connection and deep friendship, the news of this departure from this world stirred a mix of emotions with me. In the wake of this revelation, a series of synchronicities and unexplainable occurrences unfolded, reinforcing my beliefs. I apologize, the story is repeating itself several times. In a world that often feels fragmented and disconnected, this understanding offers a profound sense of unity and purpose. It reminds us that our existence extends beyond the physical realm, that our actions, thoughts, and intentions have ripple effects that transcend time and space. Although grief may linger and the ache of loss may never fully dissipate, I've come to see that there is a beauty in the tapestry of life and death. It is through the interconnectedness of all things that we find solace, meaning, and the unbreakable bonds of love. So, as I continue to navigate the intricacies of existence, I hold on to the belief that our departed loved ones are not truly gone. They live on within our hearts, their essence intertwined with our own, and as I bask in the warmth of their enduring presence, I find solace, comfort, and a profound sense of peace, knowing that love transcends the boundaries of time and death, weaving an intricate web of connection that spans eternity. Tales of the Stardust Ranch After moving furniture and unpacking boxes until early evening, John Edmonds had finally decided to call it a day. He made his way out to the front porch, grabbed himself a beer, and sat quietly surveying his new home. In addition to the five-bedroom building with a pool, the ranch that he and his wife Joyce had purchased covered ten acres of land, a guest house, and two horse corrals. Sipping his beer, John noticed a movement in the undergrowth that lined the property's premises. A few moments later, a singular figure emerged from the tree line, walking with purpose across open fields toward the house. John had not been expecting anyone when he noticed something long and metallic in the approaching figure's hand. He immediately retracted to grab his revolver. Re-emerging from the farmhouse, he began to walk toward the intruder, openly showcasing his weapon as a sign of warning. However, as he got closer, he found himself thinking that this might have something to do with the belongings of the previous owners, which had been left on the property. When John and Joyce arrived at their newly purchased property a few days prior, they found that the premises were still filled with possessions left behind by previous residents. When inquired, the agents profusely apologized and promised to speak to the previous tenants. When John returned the next morning, he found the house empty but every fixture and fitting have been broken and deposited outside the empty swimming pool. The agents were called once again, but they denied any knowledge of this, claiming that they still had not heard back from the previous owners. 
After another day of waiting, John arranged to have the unwanted objects disposed of. As John pulled up a few feet short of the striding man, an uneasy silence hung in the air. The stranger was dressed like an army veteran, had unkept hair and bore a distinctly frightening expression. The rusted manchette in his hand held John's attention. It was causing him to keep his hand firmly on his gun. The man claimed to have worked for a previous owner, and John explained that the property had not changed hands. When John asked the man why he was carrying the rusted blade, he replied that it was for hunting monsters, a service which he had been paid to do. Throwing out a mockery burst of laughter, John told the man his help was no longer needed, as he had seen any monsters around. The man threw his weapon to the ground and began to walk away, shouting that John would repent for his behavior before fading back into the trees. Unbeknownst to John, the Stardust Ranch's new owner, the strange man, was not lying. Inexplicable Vandalism The initial days of the rural property went as planned for the couple. They started receiving a steady supply of sick and neglected horses, and they had everything they needed to reach, as Phoenix was only about a half an hour drive away. The first sign that indicated that the agents haven't been transparent about the history of the property came when John tried to get his faulty telephone line repaired. Despite booking three different appointments, employees of the phone company failed to turn up at the property. After a formal complaint was eventually registered, an engineer reluctantly made a short appearance, hastily repairing the problematic line. When John demanded to know the reason behind the rush, the worker hurriedly explained that the ranch was cursed causing the people of the local community to avoid it at all costs. Several days after this eerie conversation, John understood that not everybody was choosing to avoid his property. On his morning rounds, he noticed that someone had been tampering with fencing around the horse corrals. The metal posts had been pulled out of the ground at several points, and they had been bent and twisted in some cases. The incidents continued and the damage only got progressively worse. John started hearing strange humming sounds at night, whose source he couldn't really find. But one day he found one of the horses dead, choked to death by a heavy iron post which had somehow been twisted and wrapped around its neck. As John wondered what could have bent the thick metal bar, Joyce broke down and told him that she constantly felt the presence of people in the farmhouse. She claimed to have caught sight of a shadowy figure which had followed her from room to room, the figure had appeared in Joyce's periphery, and it seemed to be disappearing whenever she tried to focus on it. While John was consoling her, citing the vandalism on the property, he was deeply concerned by the strange death of the horse, causing him to place weapons at strategic points around the house, apparently offering him a sense of easy reach. A period of calm followed before the circumstances took a terrifying twist. Shadowy Figures John was awake in bed one night, unable to settle due to Joyce's disturbing snores. While he lay staring at the wall in front of him, the shadows on it suddenly seemed to swell and contort, materializing a dark figure. The frozen, helpless man watched as the silhouette slowly made their way over to his wife's side of the bed. As the leading figure reached out towards Joyce, John suddenly felt his fear turn into rage, reaching down for the aluminum baseball bat beside his bed after letting out a roar of anger. He moved across the room in seconds, lashing out at the dark shapes that were now leaning over his sleeping wife. He let out a wild swing, hitting the nearest one with the metal bat before a high-pitched shriek emanated out of nowhere, causing the figures to disappear. The police were immediately called, but found no evidence to ascertain John's claims. From this point onwards, hostile interactions with the shadowy figures started occurring on a weekly basis. While he struggled to watch over his wife by staying awake during the evenings, John began hearing deep humming sounds off in the distance. When he looked out of his window, he would often observe what appeared to be bright portals appearing in the middle of the night sky, illuminating the darkness. He further witnessed mysterious objects disappearing into the portals, which would then close behind them without leaving any traces. The nighttime intrusions of the shadowy figures continued, they often moved around in groups of three, and they had the ability to pass through walls and locked doors. John described them as being four feet tall, and they were deathly cold to the touch. One evening, John saw the family's Rottweiler pursue a group of these creatures across the grounds outside the house. 
it was able to attack one of them which immediately disappeared into thin air before the poor animal choked to death. John would go on to lose two more dogs under similar circumstances, but these weren't the only animals to suffer as some of the horses would also be found mutilated. Final Days at the Property Despite his best efforts, John couldn't stay awake all the time and often collapsed due to exhaustion. One evening he had accidentally dozed off before he suddenly jolted awake again with a feeling of pure dread. Joyce, who was fast asleep in front of him, was being lifted by a thin beam of bright light which was being projected from outside. Realizing that his wife was floating toward the open window, he immediately got hold of his rifle before firing continuous shots at the apparent source of light until it disappeared. After this incident, John started handcuffing Joyce to the bed, but despite his best attempts, both he and his wife began experiencing periods of memory lapses. When they awoke, they would find inexplicable injuries on their bodies resembling deep cuts which had healed over a lengthy period. Eventually, John contacted the local media, hoping that someone could help rid him of the shadowy attackers. He participated in radio and television interviews and allowed research groups to visit the property, but the problems caused by the shadowy intruders persisted. Finally, after 20 years of desperately fighting back, John was forced to give in and he and his wife sold the Stardust Ranch in 2016 and moved away. Other Witnesses John and Joyce are not the only people to have experienced strange happenings on the property. During the 70s, the ranch played home to Gina Irons and her family. When John went public, she came forward to speak to the media about her past experiences. She described encountering ghostly figures which invaded their home, with her and her younger brother feeling temperatures instantly drop whenever the figures passing across. A research team reported encountering a thin humanoid figure that allegedly darted past them and disappeared into the undergrowth. When investigators searched the area, they discovered a stone with a mysterious star-shaped carving into it. In 2013, John was put into contact with William, a biologist, by a mutual friend. After an initial conversation, John was able to send him samples of tissues and fluids that had been left behind by his intruders. A few days later, William contacted him before informing him that the DNA found in the tissue was unearthly. Furthermore, the biologist had allegedly claimed that the fluid given by John had a high concentration of a substance resembling chlorophyll, and it was similar to the samples collected at the scene of cattle mutilations. He showcased his intentions of disclosing the findings to the public before hanging the call. When John tried to regain contact with William several weeks later, he was informed that the biologist had died. His laboratory had mysteriously caught fire and his wife had also died a few days later. Thus, the only samples John had in his possession had disappeared. At first glance, John's wondrous claims seemed to be made up. A scenario where supposed otherworldly life has decided to torment an ordinary couple for two decades seems to be a far stretch. The inability to capture their intruders on film during their stay at the property further questions the credibility of the story. John claimed to kill at least 18 of these creatures but never presented any of the remains. He explained that they disappeared immediately after their death, making the skeptic and oneself scream hoax. The corroboration outside witnesses adds some weightage to John's claims. Moreover, there seems to be a level of honesty in his retelling of the account. While he's been constantly charged with exaggeration, he stood firm on his stand. People who have interviewed him state that he is sober and a convincing man who told his stories in a grounded and logical manner. Keeping that in mind, it's hard not to consider the fact that John wished to sell the property for $1 million. However, after the media frenzy, the place sold for about four or five times its price. So, was the entire tale a perfectly constructed ploy to inflate the resale value of his property? Or were the inexplicable activities so pronounced in the property that it made its new owner pay the hefty sum for its supernatural nature? I leave the answer to your judgment. Tales of the Sel Nui's Rot House On the 10th of April 1945, the U.S. 84th Infantry Division crossed the Vesser River and captured Hanover. 
the city had been bombed by Allied air raids, resulting in 90% of the city center being reduced to rubble, thus offering little to no resistance when ground forces arrived. The under-resourced German soldiers had had enough, and their morale had collapsed along with the buildings around them. The surrounding townships soon followed suit, raising the white flag as soon as Allied armor rolled into view. One of these towns was Sel, a small ordinary settlement of around 40,000 people sitting 20 miles northeast of Hanover. It was well known for housing one of the largest freestanding brick-built structures in Europe at the time. Its new town hall, aka the News Rathaus, while its name is rather unassuming, there's something unusual about that concrete behemoth. A U.S. Navy Diver's Account The town of Sell surrendered on the 12th of April, 1945. Similar to the case of Hanover, there was no resistance from German forces or the civilians residing in the bombed-out buildings. The town hall had miraculously escaped the bombing campaign relatively intact. Being the humongous concrete structure that it was, it seemed to be the perfect place to house occupying troops and host temporary administration. After all, it had already served as a barracks for German troops, and had even housed an SS battalion. While the building comprised five floors above ground and five floors below, the Allied forces lacked access to the lower levels, as they had been completely flooded with water and sealed with concrete. This immediately kindled the curiosity of the commanding officer, as the SS had been hiding stolen precious artifacts and evidence of war crimes under artificial water bodies. In the next few days, he would make a determined effort to ascertain exactly what the Germans had attempted to cover up. On the 15th of April, a special request of Lieutenant General Brian Harrox, three U.S. Navy divers arrived at Sell with the intention of exploring the submerged depths of the building. Due to the obvious dangers, each diver was tethered by a line to the surface and sent down at different entry points. What took place over the next 30 minutes is not fully understood, but what is known is that two of the divers never made it back to the surface. Their tethers were retrieved, but not their bodies. The third diver who resurfaced raved like a lunatic. When he finally came to his senses after a couple of hours, he reported his findings. The floors and walls of the lower levels were allegedly painted in back, with strange runic symbols and pentagrams etched upon them. With operation theaters and patient beds, the rooms held a resemblance to hospital facilities. On the third level down, the diver had seen mutilated corpses strapped into chairs. Some had their abdomens ripped open wide, or all of their limbs removed, while others had goats' heads attached to their bodies in place of their own. While his descriptions were terrifying enough, he spoke in whispered tones about how he had seen them all moving, as if they were still alive. This sight caused him to panic and swim back to the surface before a dark, cloudy mass chased him through the water. As expected, the diver was never the same again and was soon discharged from the Navy. The commanding officer was reluctant to investigate further as he didn't wish to put any more lives at risk. But as Sell was in the British zone of occupation, time was running out. With the help of his crew, he tried pumping out the water, but the SS had flooded the building by breaking one of the walls evidently allowing groundwater to seep through. Eventually, the building was formally handed over to the British Army, and the commanding officer was relieved of his posting at the site. The basements were sealed over with concrete shortly after. Tales of the Paranormal During the Cold War, Sel became a significant military town, staging a notable contingent of NATO forces. The small town was converted into a permanent barrack, and housed regiments from the British and German militaries. The stories regarded the flooded levels and the fate of the U.S. Navy divers arriving during this period. While many believed them to be nothing more than urban legends, no one could get away from the fact that the access to the basement floors was indeed restricted. Most stairwells leading down to the lower levels had been hastily filled with concrete, and the tops of handrails can be seen protruding from the floor. A young recruit by the name of Martin Fox woke up one night to find the ceiling of his bedroom inches from his face. Initially, he assumed it was a prank played by his roommates, but when he realized his bed was floating several feet above the floor, 
He screamed his lungs out before he and the bed came crashing down. A soldier named Stephen Daly reported that his first night in the building as a new recruit, he saw silhouettes of people walking back and forth outside his windows. Assuming them to be the soldiers on patrol, he didn't pay much attention to it, but the next morning he realized his window is actually seven feet above the ground on the outside of the building. Stephen was stationed for four years in cell, and he reported experiencing all kinds of strange occurrences. There were instances of people hearing German whispers and locked in empty rooms. A sergeant major was utterly stupefied in the early hours of one morning when he witnessed a column of German panzer tanks move near him in complete and utter silence. To add to the strangeness, soldiers reported having their rooms vandalized even though they had been locked and secured in the intervening times, and no one else had even been there. Dark, shadowy figures stand at the edge of the bed, and the hallways had become a normal thing. Furthermore, there had been an unusually high rate of suicide amongst the men stationed at the town hall. There were certain rooms on the upper levels which were said to have pentagrams etched onto the floors and walls. Recruits who spent a night in these rooms ended up taking their own lives. After undergoing psychological evaluations, a considerable number of soldiers were also discharged on medical grounds. Many of them had become deeply depressed during their tenure in the station. It's no secret that the Nazi regime had a notable interest in the occult. It is believed that the Third Reich was looking to channel untold powers in order to tip the war in their favor. Rumors suggest that the Spear of Destiny was stolen from a museum in Vienna to aid in the summoning of dark forces that the German naval commanders employed, and they used a dousing of it in an attempt to locate British submarines and merchant vessels. Adolf Hitler himself was no stranger to paranormal experiences, recording such instances in his private journals many times. The study of witchcraft was high on the agenda for the German elite, and the Cell Neuss Rathaus was said to be one of the many sites across the country where the SS carried out such research. There were tales about how the SS was summoning dark and sinister forces in the room situated on the lower levels of the building. Jewish prisoners were allegedly being horribly mutilated in order for their bodies to become more accepting of demonic possession. Reportedly, the building itself has cult symbolism running all the way through it. Many believe the townhouse served as a gateway, which amplified the effects of such practices. An anonymous German, whose father had been stationed there during the war for years, had a bizarre story to tell. He recalled how his father had told him that the SS had been attempting to bring soldiers back from the dead, allowing demonic entities to possess the deceased and use their bodies as vessels. His father went on to describe how in attempts of doing this had been successful, but that these reanimated corpses apparently had no sense of honor or loyalty, and the research in the area was abruptly halted. There was no doubt that the townhouse does have floors below ground, which are inaccessible and have been covered up with concrete. But if the tales of submergence are to be believed, how practical would it have been to fill in the equivalent volume of a football stadium with water? After all, burning the building would have been far quicker and easier method of destroying every evidence, or anything that was going on there. But if the SS were the only one trying to quarantine their creations and not trying to hide evidence, then their choice seems to be plausible but the likelihood of unfolding the exact reasoning is non-existent. The sheer amount of paranormal activity that soldiers experienced whilst on the base is far too much to dismiss. This likely supports the idea that something sinister was going on in this maze of dark halls and rooms of its lower levels at some point during its history. But whether it had connections to the occult or otherwise is up for debate. That being said, there seems to be possibly a logical explanation for the events at Cell Neuss Rathaus. The two lost U.S. Navy divers could have been trapped in the confines of claustrophobic sections of the building's lower levels before succumbing to exhaustion. The third diver could have been a victim of nitrogen narcosis, a condition which is commonly caused by inhaling compressed nitrogen gas. The condition is known to cause hallucinations in scuba divers. When the paranormal phenomenon reported in the building are taken into consideration, it could be attributed to the township's dark history. Cell had been a scene of unwavering tragedy, where thousands of innocent people lost their lives in a barbaric manner. Bergen, a suburban district of Cell, played host to the infamous Beslan concentration camps, 
Many Jewish prisoners were being transported by rail into the town center before being dispatched to Belsen. Knowledge of these aspects could have had a negative impact on the servicemen's moods and behaviors given rise to the tales of the paranormal. Militant forces vacated the premises entirely in 2012 when the building was repurposed as originally intended. Sections of it were converted into a hotel, which has seen positive reviews from visitors on travel websites. Some of the guests suggest that the strange happenings in the building have not stopped, often reporting the sounds of jackboots marching in the hallways. It started with three knocks. Let me tell you about an experience I had a few years ago when I was 17. At that time, I moved in with my boyfriend at his parents' house. He had been suffering from night terrors for many years, and I had known about it for five years. He would wake up in a bad mood, and after a few minutes of heavy breathing during his night terrors, his mood would be withdrawn and irritable, and it would take a while for him to level out and become approachable. He had severe insomnia, and this made him sleep very few hours over the course of the day. We had been living there for a few months, and everything seemed normal. Some days I would wake up and see open cabinets and drawers in the kitchen, but I thought it was just someone forgetting to close them after a midnight snack. Until one morning, I joked with his mom about the opening cabinets, and she nonchalantly replied, Yeah, that's just the shadow people. They do that all the time. Followed by telling me about how her and her husband had seen them in different areas of the house on multiple occasions. But since, I hadn't experienced anything there myself, just laughed it off. Our bed was against the inside wall of the house, beside the door from the hallway. One day I decided to do some spring cleaning and rearrange the bedroom furniture. I pushed the bed against the outside wall next to the window and pulled the TV stand next to the foot of the bed. When my ex came home, we ate and took turns having showers. When I went to open the door to the bedroom, the handle didn't turn. I thought he was playing a joke on me, so I tried twisting the handle back and forth multiple times, but it stayed stationary. When the latch finally released, I pushed the door open with such force that I stumbled into the room, only to see my ex playing Xbox with his headset on, sitting 15 feet away from the door, and wondering why it looked like I had just fell in. That was the first time I felt like something could be in the house. The knock started at the fall. We were having some strong winds accompanied by cold rain. There was only one other one in the house that shared the dead-end road at the top of the hill where we lived. It was late in the evening and the rain knocked the satellite out. So we got out some DVDs and put on a movie. We both heard scratches on the walls from the shrubs and trees and the leaves hitting the sides of the windows. Then three faint knocks came from the wall to the right of the bed. This was an exterior wall at the front of the house, so we decided that it was the wind probably. Some minutes passed and we heard three more knocks come from the wall next to the closet, an interior wall with a large shared dresser along it. We decided to recreate the sound by knocking on the wall behind us just to confirm that the noise that we heard was coming from there. And less than a minute later, three clear knocks came from the wall directly behind us. We knocked three times back, then the knocks started coming from what seemed like all the walls at once. They were much faster and louder this time and seemed to have no pattern at all. As they were coming from everywhere, but it was not natural. Just as fast as they came, it all stopped. We told his parents who came into the room and knocked three times on the wall. We got the echo back. Back to the night terrors. Since I'd figured out when he was having an episode, I began waking up to heavy breathing and slight twitching, so I'd calmly try to soothe him with a quiet voice and tell him it's okay. And that's where I was. He told me that it helped, so I decided to pray a little bit. I asked him what he liked, and he only told me about the things he used to see, and they were always different when he was younger, but more recently, it was a recurring regularly. He wouldn't describe what it looked like, but just that it got closer to him every night, and he was afraid of what might happen if it got close enough to touch him. He woke up once and told me that it would lay down next to him, and he was completely distraught because it was the closest that it had ever been to him. But he said it couldn't touch him when I'm around because it's afraid of you. 
I didn't know what he meant by that, but I told him that it should be. That's when I began to notice movements. It started with dresser drawers being open in the mornings and after we left the room. I thought maybe the drawer slides were just wearing out from use and were popping back open. But it was always in a different room in a different drawer. If I noticed three drawers open in the morning, I'd close them and go about my day, yet different ones than before would open when I came back. Sometimes they were slightly cracked and others would be pulled all the way to the end. A few times, we caught them opening after we closed them, and we tried every way we could think of for the possibility that it wasn't us, and that they weren't being closed correctly in the first place, causing them to roll back. Then one time when my ex was napping, the drawers started to open. I noticed his heavy breathing and panicked REM state, so I tried soothing him with my voice which seemed to calm him down, but then I noticed an empty pop and a can from the TV stand started to rock side to side. It was slow at first and then began to move so fast it seemed like it was vibrating. As it was getting worse, so was his breathing, so I looked at it and shouted in my mind for it to stop, and as soon as I thought it, the can stopped, and he was back to peaceful sleep. I used to be a regular lucid dreamer, I've never had sleep paralysis or any sort of experience like this. The same night as the wobbly can, I was sleeping curled up on my bed and facing in a downward spiral toward the door. When I saw an entity, it stood in the doorway, taller than the frame with the shadow or misty looking body and a face whiter than anything I'd seen before. No discernible facial features, just as if the whiteness was light being pulled into it or through it, almost like a tunnel. It seemed like I could feel it better than I could see it. It felt like rage. It felt like anger and sadness, stronger than I've ever felt in my life. Before I could make sense of what was happening, I felt myself stand directly up out of my body and point at the creature and yell at the top of my lungs, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to leave this house. I looked down and saw my ex sleeping beside me, and as quickly as I had stood up, I fell straight back into my body and into my most peaceful sleep. When I woke up, my ex was sitting and watching TV. I looked at him and asked him what the thing looked like from his sleep paralysis, and he told me he didn't want to talk about it. But it would be easier to draw it. He got a notebook and drew exactly what I had seen at that point, and I immediately got the chills and started crying when he showed it to me. He asked me if I'd seen it, and I told him what had happened, and neither of us had seen it since, until he came home from the military. It had been a few years since I had last been seeing my ex-boyfriend, the one who had the night terrors and lived in the haunted house. We had gone our separate ways after our time together in that house, but he recently reached out to me, wanted to reconnect and catch up on old times. I was hesitant at first, but eventually agreed to meet up. We sat down at a local cafe and started chatting about our lives since we last spoke, and he had joined the military and had been stationed overseas for a while. I told him about my job and my recent move to the new city, and it was all very normal and mundane until he brought up the house. He told me that after he came back from military deployment, he decided to visit his parents and stay at the house for a few days. He said that everything seemed normal at first, but then he started experiencing some strange things. He would hear footsteps in the hallway at night, but when he went to investigate, there was no one there. He would feel a cold breeze brush past him, even though all the windows were closed. And then one night, he saw it again, the entity. He described it exactly as I had seen it all those years ago. The misty body, the white face, the overwhelming feeling of rage and sadness. He said that it stood in the doorway of his old bedroom and just stared at him. He couldn't move. He couldn't speak. Couldn't do anything but stare back at it. It was like time had stopped. Eventually, the entity disappeared. My ex-boyfriend was left alone in the room shaking and sweating. He didn't know what to do, so he just lay there in bed, waiting for the morning to come. When he finally got up and went downstairs, he saw that the kitchen cabinets were all open, just like they used to be when we lived there. He knew then that the entity was still in the house, still haunting it. He hasn't been back since. He said that he couldn't handle it anymore, that the memories and the fear were just too much, and I don't blame him. I knew firsthand how terrifying that particular house could be. As we finished our coffee and said our goodbyes, I couldn't help but wonder if the entity was still there. 
if it was still haunting that old house, and if it was, I hoped that it wouldn't harm anyone else who happened to cross its path. What was that? Let me take you back to a memory from my younger days, a haunting encounter that continues to occupy my thoughts, even now. This peculiar incident unfolded when I was just a student, either in middle or elementary school, and its enigma has never ceased to intrigue me. It happened during a visit to a friend's house, an abode that could only be described as a mansion, at least when compared to my humble-sized dwelling. This extravagant residence boasted two floors, a glistening pool, and even a private forest, which seemed like a fantastical wonderland to my youthful eyes. On that fateful day, my friend and I were engaged in joyful play, relishing in the freedom of an afternoon unburdened by responsibilities. Laughter filled the air as we frolicked around the house, delighted in the various amusements that it had to offer. However, as the sun began its descent and the velvety night draped its cloak upon us, a strange sequence of events unfolded, etching itself into the deepest recesses of my memory. As darkness settled in, we found ourselves alone within the confines of the grand mansion. The house, now shrouded in shadows, took on an eerie aura that seemed to amplify the subtle creaks and whispers emanating from its walls. I can't recall the exact reason, but we gravitated towards a piano located on the first floor, its ebony and ivory keys beckoning us to explore the melodic potential. The only source of illumination was a solitary light directly above us, casting an ethereal glow that barely managed to pierce the encroaching gloom. From my perch at the piano, I peered into the expanse of the living room, catching glimpses of the dimly lit dining room table and the silver of the adjacent kitchen. The ceiling soared to remarkable heights, a testament to the mansion's grandeur. The house itself followed a unique L-shaped architecture, concealing the kitchen from our direct line of sight with a formidable wall and a mysterious corner that obscured our view. Focused on my musical endeavor, I immersed myself in the intricate dance of melodies, oblivious to this enigmatic revelation that awaited me. As my fingers danced upon the keys, skillfully navigating the symphonic sounds, an eerie sensation crept over me. It was then that my friend, seated right beside me, began tapping on my shoulder incessantly, an urgency palpable in his actions. His voice trembled with concern as he implored me to divert my gaze toward the ominous corner that had captured his attention. Lost in the pursuit of musical perfection, I chose to ignore his persistent nudges, dismissing them as distractions that threatened to derail my performance. Finally, as the notes resonated through the stillness, I relinquished my focus on the piano's keys, allowing my eyes to ascend and confront the mystery that had captivated my companion. What I witnessed in the harrowing moment defied all logical explanation. Peeking out from the lofty corner, just at the edge of my field of view, was a figure, a presence so indescribable that words fail to convey its true essence. It lacked a discernible countenance engulfed entirely in a darkness so profound it seemed to consume all light around it. However, in the midst of this obsidian void, a peculiar anomaly stood out, an ethereal white ring that encircled the area with its face, or rather where its face should have been. Yet even more chilling than its inexplicable appearance were its grotesque extremities, Long, sinewy figures extended from its enigmatic form, ominously moving and contorting as it instinctively retreated into the shadows, vanishing from sight as soon as our gazes locked onto it. An icy shiver raced down my spine, sending tremors of fear coursing through every fiber of my being. In that moment, the reality of the situation bore down upon me, and the adrenaline-fueled instinct for self-preservation surged through my veins. Reacting swiftly, 
my friend instinctively bolted toward the safety of the upper floor, seeking refuge from the unknown entity that had materialized before us. However, curiosity mingled with trepidation within me, compelling me to investigate further. Ignoring the warnings that instinctively urged me to flee, I mustered the courage to venture into the dimly lit kitchen, determined to unravel the enigma that had seized hold of my senses. Each step I took reverberated with an eerie hush, heightening the atmosphere of surrealism that enveloped the mansion. As I cautiously explored the kitchen, my senses attuned to every sound and movement, a disconcerting realization washed over me. The absence of any tangible evidence. It was as if the entity, that unexplainable presence, had vanished into thin air, leaving no trace of its existence behind. The once familiar surroundings had transformed into a maze of uncertainty, where every shadow seemed to harbor secrets and every sound whispered of unseen forces at play. Questions tugged at the corners of my mind, demanding answers that remained frustratingly elusive. What was that phantom apparition that had momentarily graced our vision? How could something so ethereal and otherworldly inhabit the confines of this earthly realm? And perhaps the most perplexing of all, why did it choose to hide from me while my friend bore witness to its ethereal form for a prolonged duration? In the aftermath of that haunting encounter, I find myself endlessly pondering the nature of the inexplicable. The tendrils of uncertainty coiled around in my thoughts, weaving a tapestry of speculation and conjecture. Was it a figment of my imagination, fueled by the dim lighting and the overactive imagination of a young mind? Or did I stumble upon a rare glimpse into a hidden realm, intersecting momentarily with our own? Over the years, this unforgettable incident has remained etched in my memory, a constant source of fascination and bewilderment. This enigmatic nature has left me with an indelible mark on my perception of the world, reminding me that the boundaries of reality are far more fluid than we dare to comprehend. While the questions may never find concrete answers, the encounter serves as a testament to the vastness of the unknown, urging me to embrace the mysteries that lie beyond the veil of our understanding. In retrospect, that evening in the mansion stands as a poignant reminder of the transient and enigmatic nature of life itself. It serves as a testament to the unfathomable depths that lie beyond the surface of our existence, beckoning us to explore, question, and dare to venture into the realms that elude explanation. And so, I continue to muse upon that eerie encounter, forever marked by the image of a faceless specter peering from the shadows, an enigma that defies the confines of time and reason. Ouija Something or someone made an appearance, unbeknownst to us, during our session. Years ago, my friend and I, a self-proclaimed skeptic of the Ouija board, decided to embark on a daring experiment. It was an evening filled with curiosity and a desire to test the boundaries of the supernatural. With the room bathed in the flickering glow of candles, we prepared ourselves to challenge the enigmatic powers of the Ouija. Although I approached the endeavor with a healthy dose of skepticism, I wholeheartedly invited any spiritual entity to make its presence known. The room, illuminated solely by the soft glow of candlelight, set the stage for our supernatural exploration. With both hands on the planchette, we began our quest for communication, posing questions and seeking signs from the other side. Minutes turned into an eternity as we patiently awaited a response. The planchette remained stubbornly motionless, refusing to yield to our request for contact. Doubt started to creep into my mind as I glanced across the coffee table at my friend, wondering if this was all just an exercise in futility. Little did I know that the inexplicable was about to unfold before our eyes. In the midst of any disillusionment, I noticed a peculiar occurrence. One of the candles situated on the table suddenly extinguished, casting a shadowy ambiance over the room. 
Simultaneously, I caught a glimpse of my friend's eyes shifting to the left of me. It dawned on me that the candle behind me must have met the same fate and snuffed out its flame. Undeterred by this unsettling development, we persisted, hoping for a breakthrough. Minutes stretched into eternity once again, with no discernible signs or messages from the beyond. Eventually, we conceded defeat and initiated the closing ritual, bidding farewell to the potential spirits that eluded us. As we engaged in post-experiment conversation, we contemplated the possibility of giving it another try. As our initial endeavor seemed to yield no tangible results, little did we know that our perception of the evening's events was about to be shattered. I reached out to turn on the living room lamp, prepared to blow out the remaining candles, and it was then that I noticed something perplexing. The candle I believed to be extinguished earlier was in fact still flickering its eerie glow. Puzzled by this contradiction, I dismissed it as a trick of the mind, eager to move on from the unnerving experience. However, my friend's voice pierced through the air, uttering words that sent shivers down my spine. He spoke of a candle positioned behind the chair, tucked away in the corner of the room. Confused, I responded that I hadn't placed a candle in that location, and he confirmed that he hadn't either. Yet, he vividly recalled seeing a light behind the chair vanish mistakenly attributing it to a candle I'd supposedly placed there. Intrigued and somewhat frightened by this unexplicable revelation, we mustered the courage to investigate further. Pulling the chair away from the corner, we searched intently for the source of the phantom light, only to find nothing, no candle, no logical explanation for the ethereal illumination of subsequent disappearance. It was as if something or someone had shown us a sign during the very moments when the portal to the unknown was wide open. The spine-chilling encounter left an indelible mark on our psyches, serving as a stark reminder of the unfathomable forces that exist beyond our comprehension. The Ouija board, once an object of curiosity and experimentation, became a relic we wanted no part of. In a mix of trepidation and haste, I either gave it away or disposed of it, eager to distance myself from its eerie influence. Never again did we dare to summon the spirits through the ominous gateway of the Ouija board. The unexplained events that unfolded that fateful evening left an indelible impression on our souls, serving as a stark reminder of the delicate balance between the known and the unknowable. Reflecting on our experience, I couldn't help but ponder the profound impact it had on our perception of the supernatural itself. It made me question the boundaries of our understanding and the potential consequences of delving into realms beyond our comprehension. Could there be a correlation between our ill-fated encounter and the unsettling events that followed? My mind drifted to the haunting notion that our brush with the paranormal might have had other lingering effects for me and my friend's well-being. The weight of anxiety and depression that she now carried seemed too coincidental to ignore. Could her prolonged exposure to the eerie occurrences in her bedroom have taken a toll on her mental health? Was there a deep-rooted connection between the unexplained and the inner workings of the human psyche? Intrigued by this hypothesis, I began exploring the possibility of similar experiences among others. I delved into research seeking stories of individuals who had encountered inexplicable phenomena in their childhood bedrooms, wondering if such encounters had left lasting imprints on their mental well-being. As I delved deeper into this realm of inquiry, I discovered a myriad of accounts that seemed to validate my theory. Countless individuals shared their haunting recollections of inexplicable occurrences in their bedroom, ranging from eerie sounds and mysterious shadows to unexplained apparitions. Many reported struggling with anxiety, depression, or a sense of unease that persisted into adulthood. While not a conclusive scientific study, the parallel between these personal anecdotes and my friend's ordeal was too compelling to ignore. It left me pondering the intricate interplay between our external environment and our internal emotional landscape. Could the unseen forces that manifested in our bedroom have permeated our minds, leaving an indelible mark on our mental well-being? Admittedly, my theory may be dismissed as far-fetched or purely speculative. Skeptics might scoff at the notion of a supernatural link to mental health, attributing it to mere coincidence or the power of suggestion. Nevertheless, I couldn't help but contemplate the profound implications of our experience and the potential ripple effects that it may have had on our lives. As I sit here, 
Clad in my metaphorical tinfoil hat, I realize that the mysteries of the universe are vast and unfathomable. Our brief encounter with the unknown left an indelible impression forever shaping our perspective of the paranormal. Whether it was a mere play of the imagination or a genuine connection to the realm beyond our understanding, one thing remains certain. We have chosen to steer clear of the Ouija board, forever wary of the enigmatic forces that lie in wait. So, dear reader, I invite you to embark on your own journey of exploration and introspection, delve into the depths of the unexplained, question the boundaries of your own beliefs, and unravel the intricate tapestry that connects our physical reality to the reality that lie beyond. Just remember to tread cautiously, for the line between curiosity and the unknown can be perilously thin. My Ex-Boyfriend Visit As a devout Christian, my faith in the existence of multiple dimensions, created by God and yet beyond our complete comprehension, remains steadfast. While I acknowledge Einstein's calculations, which provide compelling evidence for the existence of at least 27 dimensions, I'm convinced that there are countless more waiting to be discovered. My belief system encompasses various facets, including the power of intuition, the presence of signs from a higher realm, and the existence of an afterlife. Moreover, I firmly believe that our thoughts possess a profound influence in one of these dimensions, which is exemplified by individuals who possess a heightened connection and can perceive the thoughts of others. Recently, I received news that shook me to the core. It turns out that my ex-boyfriend, whom I affectionately refer to as Ray, had passed away in March of 2022. Astonishingly, an entire year had slipped by without my knowledge of his departure. Describing our relationship as complicated would be an understatement. Perhaps it leaned towards a casual dynamic, albeit with underlying foundation of profound friendship. Ray grappled with anxiety and resorted to medicating himself, and usually with marijuana as the coping mechanism. These details are significant as they represent my limited understanding of him through these lenses. However, the course of my life took a dramatic turn in 2019 when I met and fell head over heels in love with the man of my dreams, whom I shall refer to as Grant. Our connection blossomed, and in the same year, we exchanged vows, embarking on a journey of love and commitment. The birth of our precious baby in 2021 solidified our bond, and we aspire to build a life together that will span a lifetime. Ever since learning about Ray's demise due to cancer, an arduous battle he valiantly fought for 16 months, silently choosing not to reach out and inform me. I've experienced sporadic surges of thoughts relating to him, and at times I'm inclined to believe that these occurrences coincide with his spiritual presence drawing near to me. Today marked the first day of potty training for my daughter, a significant milestone in her young life. In the midst of our joyous celebration, as we danced exuberantly to the rhythm of the music, I couldn't shake the feeling that Ray was watching over us, his countenance radiating with an ethereal smile. Curiously, both my daughter and I ventured into the kitchen, leaving my phone behind in the living room, continuing to play the melodic tunes through our Bluetooth speaker. Out of the blue, midway through the song, my phone abruptly transitioned to Till My Last Day by Justin Moore, a track whose lyrics encapsulate profound meaning and significance. If you are unfamiliar with the song, I implore you to look up its lyrics and immerse yourself in its heartfelt sentiments. The sudden switch sent shivers cascading down my spine, leaving me awestruck and emotionally moved. However, the profoundness of the moment was far from over. Shortly after the mysterious song change, my daughter's attempt at using the potty ended in minor mishap. She missed her target, inadvertently soiling the floor, and in a twist of fate, slipped and fell into her own accident before I could reach out to catch her. Hastily, I rushed to grab a towel, hoping to rectify the situation and restore a semblance of order. Meanwhile, as I tended to the messy aftermath, I noticed a peculiar occurrence, a barely perceptible reduction in the music's volume. Intrigued, I examined my phone and made a startling discovery. The volume had been turned all the way down. In that moment, an overpowering realization washed over me 
flooding my senses with indescribable mixes of emotions, I realized that Ray's mischievous spirit, even in the afterlife, still found ways to playfully interact with mine. It was as if he had orchestrated the sequence of events from the song change to the mishap with my daughter to remind me of his enduring presence and love. Tears welled up in my eyes as I embraced the bittersweet beauty of the moment. Despite the physical separation and the passing of time, Ray had found a way to reach out and touch my life, reaffirming our connection on a spiritual level. It was a testament to the boundless nature of love and the unbreakable bonds that we form with those that have touched our hearts. In the depths of my soul, I felt a profound gratitude for the divine orchestrations that had led me to Grant, my loving husband and father of our child. While Ray and I had shared a significant chapter in our lives, it was Grant who had become my rock and my partner and my soulmate. Our love had flourished, and together we built a life filled with joy, commitment, and blessings of parenthood. The echoes of Ray's presence in my life only served to reinforce the magnitude of what Grant and I had created together. As I completed the task of cleaning up the little accident, a sense of serenity enveloped me. I knew in my heart that Ray's visitation, however playful and mischievous, was a sign of his well-being in the realm beyond. It was a comforting reassurance that he had found peace and that his spirit continued to watch over those that he cared for. In the days that followed, I found solace in sharing this extraordinary experience with Grant. His unwavering support and understanding embraced my beliefs, intertwining our spiritual connections with the love that had brought us together in the first place. Together, we marveled at the mysteries of the universe and the intricate ways in which our lives were interwoven with unseen dimensions. From that day forward, I embraced the moments when thoughts of Ray surged within me. Each occurrence became a gentle reminder of the eternal nature of love and the interconnectedness of our souls. I no longer questioned or doubted these intangible connections, but embraced them as sacred gifts, a testament to the profound mysteries of the divine. As the years passed, our daughters grew and our family flourished. We celebrated milestones, overcame challenges, and cherished the blessings that life bestowed upon us. And throughout it all, I carried Ray's memory in my heart, forever grateful for the lessons that he had taught me about friendships, love, and the resilience of the human spirit. In the tapestry of my life, the threads of past and present intertwined seamlessly, forming a beautiful mosaic of experiences that shaped me. This belief in unseen dimensions, the power of intuition, and the enduring nature of love became pillars of my faith, guiding me through the joys and trials that lay ahead. And so with every passing day, I continue to navigate this earthly existence, ever aware of the spiritual realm that intertwines with our reality. I cherish the moments of connection, the signs of synchronicities that remind me of the vastness of existence and the divine presence that surrounds us. In the end, my journey is one of faith, love, and a deep appreciation for the intricate tapestry of life. As I walk the path, I remain open to the wonders that lie beyond our comprehension, knowing that the dimensions that we have yet to explore are filled with boundless possibilities and the eternal embrace of a loving creator. First time experience with a ghost. Still can't process that it really happened. It was a typical night just like any other. I had settled into bed with my young son, who often sought the comfort of sleeping beside me. The room was enveloped in darkness, save for the faint glow of the moon casting an eerie shadow across the wall. Little did I know that this seemingly ordinary night would soon turn into a harrowing encounter from the unknown. In the midst of my slumber, I was abruptly awoken by soft cries of my son, signaling his hunger. Disoriented and groggy, I fumbled around on my nightstand in a desperate attempt to locate his bottle. The room was cloaked in an impenetrable darkness, rendering my search a daunting task. And then it happened. As I extended my hand blindly, hoping to find the familiar shape of the bottle, an eerie sensation washed over me. A warmth unlike anything I had ever experienced before enveloped my hand. It was as if another hand, a tangible and palpable presence, had gently clasped mine. My heart skipped a beat and a surge of fear coursed through my veins. In that instant, I knew that something otherworldly had invaded my sanctuary. The touch was undeniable, the grip gentle but firm. 
I let out a blood-curdling scream, my body convulsing with a mixture of terror and disbelief. It felt as though I had been jolted out of my own skin, desperately seeking the sanctuary of light to banish the approaching darkness. With trembling hands, I fumbled the light switch on, my heart pounding in my chest like a drum. As the room flooded with light, I surveyed my surroundings, hoping to find a logical explanation for the inexplicable occurrence. Yet, to my dismay, the room remained seemingly ordinary, devoid of any signs of spectral presence. Since that night, I've been plagued by a relentless search for answers. I've scoured books, forums, and countless articles, hoping to find someone who has experienced a similar phenomenon. However, my efforts have been met with disappointment. The reports I came across only mentioned a chilling touch of cold hands, never warm ones like I had encountered. The absence of any reasonable explanation has left me feeling unsettled and vulnerable. How could I rationalize an event that defied all logic and scientific explanation? It was as if a veil had been lifted exposing the hidden depths of reality that lay beyond the realm of our own comprehension. I have been plagued by sleepless nights, haunted by the memory of that spectral touch. Was it a residual energy, an echo from the past reaching out to me? Or perhaps a benevolent presence, offering comfort in the darkness? The possibilities swirl within my mind, each one more bewildering than the last. Some nights as I lie awake, I feel a heightened sense of awareness, as if the unseen world is watching, waiting to reveal itself once again. I'm caught between trepidation and curiosity, torn between the desire to unravel the mysteries that shroud my experience and the fear of inviting further encounters with the unknown. For now, I continue to seek solace in the company of others who have had their own encounters with the paranormal. I share my story hoping to connect with kindred spirits who can shed light on the inexplicable. Together, we may navigate the labyrinth-like depths of the supernatural, weaving threads of shared experiences and attempting to make a sense of the enigmatic realm that exists beyond our understanding. In the company of fellow seekers, I find solace in knowing that I am not alone in my quest for answers. As I delve deeper into the world of the paranormal, I have encountered tales of warm touches and gentle grasps, similar to my own haunting experience. It appears that the mysteries of the supernatural are as diverse and multifaceted as the human experience that shaped our lives. Some speculate that these warm touches may be the result of residual energy from a departed loved one, reaching out to offer comfort or reassurance. Others suggest that it could be the presence of a benevolent spirit extending a helping hand from the ethereal plane. While the explanations may differ, one thing remains certain. The warmth of the touch signifies a connection, a bridge between the living and the beyond. In my search for understanding, I've immersed myself in the rich tapestry of the paranormal research and spiritual teachings. I've explored ancient folklore, delved into the psychic phenomena, and delved into the intricacies of energy fields and vibrational frequencies. It is through this vast array of knowledge that I hope to piece together the puzzle of my own encounter. The journey of unraveling the paranormal is not without its challenges. Skepticism and doubts often creep in, attempting to undermine the authenticity of our experiences. Yet, I stand firm in the knowledge that I have witnessed something extraordinary, a touch that defies conventional explanation and forces me to confront the limits of my understanding. In the depths of these inexplicable encounters, I find myself questioning the nature of reality itself. And there's unseen dimensions that seem to interact with our own, permeating our lives in ways that we can't comprehend, perhaps. Could it be that our human senses, constrained by the physical world, can only perceive a fraction of the vastness that surrounds us? As I continue my quest for answers, I approach each day with a newfound sense of wonder and openness. The scratches on my bedroom wall and floor, the spectral touch that gripped my hand. These are not isolated incidents, but glimpses into a greater reality that lies just beyond our reach. They serve as reminders that our understanding of the world is constantly evolving, and that there's always more to discover, explore, and question. While the search for answers may be arduous, I'm filled with a sense of anticipation, eager to unlock the secrets that lie within the realm of the paranormal. I'm no longer haunted by fear, but motivated by curiosity, a curiosity that drives me to delve deeper into the unknown 
to seek connections and to unravel the tapestry of the supernatural. In the tapestry of existence, we are but threads, intricately woven together by experiences that extend far beyond the boundaries of our physical reality. The warm touch that gripped my hand serves as a poignant reminder that our journey is not confined to the tangible, but encompasses the ethereal, the unexplained, the extraordinary. And so I embrace the enigma, the mysteries, and the uncharted territories of the paranormal. For in these unexplored realms, I find the potential to expand my consciousness and deepen my connection to the unseen, and to unravel the threads that bind us all to this grand tapestry of existence. Hospice Story, Meeting at the Gate Let me tell you a captivating story about a remarkable journey that unfolded in the lives of Hilda, a delightful elderly woman under my care, and Claude, her son, who was also in my hospice. The setting was divided between Odessa, Texas, where Hilda resided in the nursing home, and Midland, Texas, where Claude lived with his devoted wife, Joni. Their intertwining stories took place simultaneously, but fate had a peculiar plan in store for them. Hilda, at her advanced age, was battling the ravages of Alzheimer's disease, which had slowly confined her to a bedridden state. Despite her physical limitations, she managed to maintain a pleasant demeanor, often repeating cherished anecdotes from her youth during her interactions. It was heartwarming to witness her innocent confusion as she would occasionally make statements that defied her current circumstances, like expressing her intent to play baseball at the park over the weekend. Her infectious sweetness combined with the fragmented recollections never failed to bring a smile to my face. Given her condition, I had anticipated that Hilda's decline would be gradual, expecting to continue our visits for a few more months, if not longer. My visits to the nursing home occurred twice a week, usually on Tuesdays and Fridays, followed by my visits to Claude, Hilda's son. Claude, on the other hand, had been experiencing more rapid deterioration. His confusion had increased, his physical strength diminished, and his overall appearance reflecting his ailing state. I had believed that Claude's passing would precede his mother's, as his condition suggested that his time was drawing near. Nevertheless, I never imagined the events that would transpire. One fateful Friday... After checking on Claude and ensuring his pain was under control, I informed Joni, his dedicated wife, that I would be visiting Hilda next. She was doing an exceptional job of caring for both her husband and her mother-in-law, skillfully managing their needs. I proceeded to the nursing home in Odessa, where the staff reassured me that Hilda seemed happier than usual. Time was not on my side that day, and I knew my visit with Hilda would be brief. I entered her room, and she greeted me in her customary way. Hi, I'm Hilda, she cheerfully exclaimed. Hi, Hilda. I'm a nurse. I came to check on how you're doing today. Well, I think I'm good, she responded. Are you hungry? Have you eaten? Oh, yes, dear. I think I've had some pancakes and sausage, she recalled. Satisfied with her response, I continued. Very good, Hilda. Do you have any pain today? No, you know, I never have any pain. Who are you? She asked innocently. I'm Chagrin, and I'm a nurse. I'll check your blood pressure and listen to your breathing, if that's okay, I explained. Of course, honey, do what you need to do, but I really don't think I need a doctor or a nurse, she responded, her gentle nature shining through. After confirming her vitals and finding no signs of distress, I assured her that she seemed to be doing well. I mentioned my earlier visit with Claude and Joni, informing Hilda that they were also doing fine. I promised to see her again in the following week, to which she responded with a curious remark. Well, honey, my son, you know, the one on 145th Street, said he was meeting up at the gate today at 2. He's taking me home. I won't be here. I pondered her words, considering the possibilities they presented. Given Claw's deteriorating condition, it seemed highly unlikely that he'd be able to fulfill his mother's desire to take her home. Moreover, mentioning 145th Street, a non-existent number in Midland, puzzled me even further. Even in Odessa, such a high-numbered street did not exist. It was evident that Hilda's confusion had seeped into her conversation, creating a blend of reality and imagination. 
With time ticking away, I bid Helda farewell, expressing my intention to see her the following week, and despite her confident assertion of not being present, as I gathered my belongings and prepared to depart, I couldn't help but feel a sense of fondness for this gentle soul, and I cherished the opportunity to continue our visits. The day progressed, and at 2.15, I received an urgent text from Hilda's nursing home. Curiosity piqued. I promptly returned the call, expecting a routine medication-related inquiry. However, the news I received left me stunned. Annie, Hilda's nurse, informed me that she had just checked on Hilda and discovered that she had passed away. The staff had seen her alive merely half an hour prior, making her sudden departure all the more shocking. In disbelief, I reflected on our conversation during my visit earlier that day. Hilda mentioned meeting her son at the gate at two o'clock resonated deeply within me. Could it be that Claude had passed away and their spirits had converged to embark on a final journey? However, my knowledge of Joni and Claude's well-being contradicted this theory. It seemed Hilda's confusion had created an alternate reality one that transcended the physical constraints of time and space. Compelled to share this revelation with Joni, I called her. And as she answered, I relayed the news of Hilda's passing. Joni, while saddened, didn't appear entirely surprised. In her melancholic tone, she revealed a crucial detail that shed light on Hilda's enigmatic statement. No, she was referring to her other son, Claude's brother. He lived on 145th Street in Lubbock. Unfortunately, he passed away five years ago. It seems he meant to meet her at the gate today at two to bring her home. Joni disclosed, her voice heavy with emotion. My astonishment grew as the pieces of the puzzle fell into place. Hilda's statement had held a deeper truth, a connection with her departed son and a longing for a reunion at the afterlife. The realm of her confusion had merged with the realm of spirits, allowing her to glimpse at the homecoming that awaited her. In the weeks that followed, Claude's health continued to decline, and he eventually joined his mother in the ethereal embrace of the great beyond. Joni, left behind to navigate a world without her beloved husband and mother-in-law, bore her grief with strength and resilience. She carried their memories deep within her heart until her own journey's end, which arrived a couple of years later. As I look back on the lives of Hilda, Claude, and Joni, I'm reminded of the extraordinary bond they shared, their stories intertwined, converging at the gate where souls reunite, welcoming one another home. It serves as a testament to the enduring power of love and the eternal connections that transcend the boundaries of time and space. Random stuff that happened to me. One of the most remarkable and intriguing stories from my childhood revolves around an unforgettable day when my brother, my cousin, and I embarked on a thrilling adventure at my great-grandma's house. Our young minds were filled with boundless energy and curiosity, and being surrounded by limited toys, we decided to bring along our cherished garden bowling set to ensure an afternoon of endless fun. I vividly recall the warmth of the sun on my skin as we arrived at my great-grandma's quaint abode. The scent of blooming flowers filled the air, infusing the atmosphere with a sweet fragrance. As the hours waned, the day unfolded into an exciting game of hide-and-seek, with the pins from our bowling set serving as objects of our pursuit. Standing at approximately 30 centimeters in height, these pins proved to be all but perfect companions for our game. Eager to embark on our quest, we scattered across the sprawling garden, seeking the ideal hiding spot for our treasured pins. I distinctly re remember the thrill coursing through my veins as I discovered the perfect nook within a small tree. With a mischievous smile, I carefully concealed one of the pins, certain that it would provide a challenge for my fellow seekers. However, little did I know that fate had a peculiar twist in store for us that day. As the game progressed, the minutes turned into hours, and eventually the time came for me to disclose the location of the remaining hidden pin. Filled with anticipation, I returned to the same spot where I had concealed my first triumph. To my astonishment, the pin had vanished into thin air, leaving no trace behind. 
was a perplexing enigma that continues to bewilder me to this day. Even as the passage of time was 15 years, despite my best efforts, the whereabouts of that elusive pin remained shrouded in mystery, forever etching this peculiar incident in the depths of my memory. Fast forward to the present, where life has taken me on a completely different path, leading me to a thrilling career as an archaeologist. Exploring ancient civilizations and unearthing remnants of the past have become my passion. During one particular assignment, I found myself in the heart of an abandoned house, which had become our base camp for the duration of the excavation. From the moment I set foot inside, an inexplicable sense of unease washed over me, penetrating my very core. The dilapidated structure exuded an eerie aura, as if it held secrets begging to be unraveled. Despite the unsettling ambiance, I remained determined to carry out my duties, delving into the depths of history within those crumbling walls. However, the nights in that house would soon become a test of my bravery. As darkness enveloped the surroundings, I found myself tormented by restless nights, plagued by restless fear that pierced through the veil of sleep, each creaking floorboard and whispering wind conspiring to amplify my anxiety, leaving me on edge throughout my stay. One fateful evening, while diligently working on my research, I, a chilling sight met my eyes. In the dimly lit room, I caught a glimpse of something lurking in the shadows, a mysterious figure dressed in black, peering at me from behind a wall. My heart skipped a beat and a shiver ran down my spine as I frantically tried to make sense of the spine-chilling apparition. Yet, as swiftly as it appeared, the specter vanished, leaving no trace of its presence. To add to the mystifying encounter, I also found myself subjected to eerie whispers that seemed to emanate from an unseen force. On one occasion, while immersed in my work, the sound of a woman's sigh pierced through the silence, reverberating right beside my ear. A chill crawled up my spine, freezing me in place as I grappled with the reality of what I had just experienced. I was the sole female presence in that desolate house, and the inexplicable sighing in such close proximity was enough to unnerve even the bravest of souls. Uncertainty shrouded my mind as I questioned the nature of these unsettling occurrences. In the days that followed, I found myself torn between the allure of the archaeological discoveries and the growing trepidation that consumed me. The house became a battleground between my insatiable curiosity and the lingering fear that lingered in the air. Each time I crossed the threshold, a sense of foreboding loomed, as if the house itself held secrets that wished to remain buried. Despite the unnerving encounters and sleepless nights, my archaeological duties compelled me to press forward. My team and I meticulously excavated the surrounding area, unearthing remnants of the past, piecing together the story of those who once inhabited this dwelling. However, the unearthed artifacts, while captivating, failed to provide answers to the phenomena that had haunted me. As the project drew to a close, I couldn't help but reflect on the mysteries that remained unsolved within those haunted walls. The unanswered questions gnawed at the edges of my mind, fueling a mix of fascination and trepidation. What had caused the disappearance of the garden bowling pin all those years ago? And what were the origins of the ghostly presence that had manifested in that forsaken house? Although time has passed since these eerie encounters, the memory of those inexplicable events still linger with me. They serve as a constant reminder of the vast and unexplained intricacies of the world we inhabit. As an archaeologist, I've delved into the depths of history, unearthing relics and piecing together fragments of forgotten tales. Yet, it is these personal encounters the unexplainable and uncanny, that truly ignite my imagination, that kindle a sense of wonder. The inexplicable disappearances of the garden bowling pin and the spectral sightings in the abandoned house have left an indelible mark on my consciousness. They've brought in my perspective, reminding me that there's more to our existence than meets the eye. These encounters have instilled with me a deep respect for the unknown, igniting a lifelong pursuit of unraveling the mysteries that lie beneath the surface of our everyday lives. As I continue my journey as an archaeologist, I eagerly anticipate the next discovery, 
the next unexplained phenomenon that will challenge my perceptions and test the limits of my human understanding. The pursuit of knowledge, fueled by the inexplicable events of my past, has become an integral part of my identity, a testament to the resilience of the human spirit in the face of the unknown. One of my experiences from living in a haunted house. I'm a person who grew up in the 90s, Minnesota. My parents divorced when I was just eight years old, and every other weekend, we would go to my dad's haunted house in East Bethel. This house was no ordinary house. It had every type of ghost you could think of, from a shadow man in a trench coat and a brimmed hat to another separate shadow figure that danced down the hallway. There was also a man dressed to go fishing, a doppelganger of my father, two giggling little girl ghosts, and many other unseen entities that haunted the place. The dishwasher, radios, and lights would turn themselves on and off randomly. Loud banging could be heard on the walls and doors. The door handles would jiggle and turn on their own. Feelings of being touched or caressed in the shower were also reported. My father also had an incident where he felt like someone crawled into bed with him in the middle of the night when he was the only one at home. The paranormal activities were just too much to ignore. My uncle reported hearing two little girls giggling and singing in the basement one night while sleeping downstairs. Upon awakening the next morning, he discovered that there were no kids in the house that night. There was even a salamander plaque one night. The entire yard was covered in a slimy, slithering salamander mass. It only ever happened once, and while I'm not positive if it's paranormal, it's certainly strange. One Saturday morning, my brother and I were up early watching cartoons, and while visiting my dad, I was eight years old at the time, my brother was three, as we sat on the couch, we heard three knocking sounds on the wall five or six feet behind us. Knock. Knock, knock. Our heads quickly snapped back to look at the wall where the sound was coming from, but we saw nothing. My brother and I quickly turned to look at each other with frightened eyes, and being the older sister, I tried to be brave and told him it was nothing. As we turned our attention back to the cartoons, my little eight-year-old brain was spinning. What if that banging noise we just heard wasn't just the pipes, as I had been told so many times? What if it was a ghost? I hate when ghost comes around. Hey, why isn't my dad around whenever this happens? As these thoughts are swirling around in my head, we heard it again. Knock, knock, knock. And this time, it was coming from somewhere in the kitchen off to our left. It wasn't as loud as the first time, and the sound was a bit different, like someone was knocking on the kitchen counter instead of the wall. We quickly strained our necks to peek inside the kitchen, lightning speed to catch whomever or whatever was making that noise, and again there was nothing there. I took a deep breath and pretended to be brave again, telling my brother, it's nothing, just ignore it. My heart was thumping in my chest and there were butterflies in my tummy as the familiar anxiety grew worse from each passing second. I tucked myself up on the couch in a ball, not wanting my legs to dangle off the edge. I no longer felt safe. Nothing was to be trusted. Knock, knock, knock. This time, the sound was coming from the dining room. I could tell the noise was coming from the wooden dining room table this time. I could see the entire table from where I was sitting with ease, and there was nothing on the table that should be making that noise. No one except my brother and me were awake. And there was no one in the dining room, and no logical reason for this knocking noise that was moving around us. And just then... I realized the knocking sounds had been moving in a big circle around us. If this invisible entity was to move any closer to us, the next logical place for it to be would be in the living room where my brother and I were currently sitting. No sooner than that crossed my mind, it happened again. Knock, 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 and this time the noise was coming from the coffee table. Sitting no less than a foot away from us, instantly I flipped over on the couch in reverse somersault-like motion and ran at superhuman speed to my father's bedroom. In a panic, I completely left my three-year-old brother behind to fend for himself. Luckily, he wasn't too far behind. We snuck into our father's room and quietly lay on the floor. Our dad would have been super pissed if we woke him up early on a Saturday morning. 
even for a ghost. In our commotion, we woke up our six-year-old sister who was sleeping on her dad's floor too. Us three kids always slept on the floor together when we were visiting. So we quietly whispered what had just happened out in the living room to our sister. As we were telling her this story, something caught her eye. We could see a black shadow under the small space between the bottom of the door and the plush carpet. The black shadow was slowly pacing back and forth in the hallway, just on the other side of the bedroom door. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It felt like this shadow was waiting for us. Unfortunately, I don't remember what happened after that point. Somehow, the rest of that memory has just been lost with time. But I know for sure we didn't open that door. As an adult, I often wish that I had been brave enough and opened the door. What would have been waiting? Would the entity have entered the room and attacked us? What would we have been shocked and seen? Would we have been confused to have found in that empty hallway? Would that gray shadow just keep pacing, oblivious to our frightened, curious eyes? Living in that house was definitely a challenge, and it was not easy to ignore the paranormal activities happening around us. It was even harder when my dad wasn't around, and my siblings and I were left alone with the ghosts. I often wonder if my family was haunted themselves, or if we were all just suffering from a 12 plus year mass hysteria. Over the years, I've done a lot of research on the home and property, but I couldn't find any evidence of death or tragedy that would account for so much paranormal activity. I even reached out to a previous and current owner to see if they had any strange experiences. The two families who lived there previously said they never had any strange experiences. Neither did the family who lived right there after my family. The family currently living there didn't respond to my questions, and in hindsight, I regret even asking them. It wasn't cool of me to even put that in their head. The house in East Bethel remains a mystery to me, and I'm not sure if I want to go back there to revisit the memories. Nonetheless, this experience will always be one of a personal, scary nature to me. Thank you for hearing my story, and I hope it gave you the chills as much as it gave them to me. Interacted with deceased family members leading up to my grandmother's passing. Six months ago, I flew up to my grandmother's house across the country. I had moved out two years prior, and her health had been steadily declining since. My grandmother was in her mid-70s at the time and had been placed into a home hospice care. I had purchased tickets to a concert an hour away from her house, figuring that I'd come to visit my child at home, spend a day or two with her, and then help cheer her up and go to my concert and fly home the next day. Upon arriving, I found that the place was a bit of a mess. My cat had been neglected and the caretaker, a family friend of ours, was just kind of bumming around. I was a bit panicked, but it was all right. My grandmother was doing fine giving her medical, you know, giving her medical conditions. Not great, but she had just a good amount of fight in her. At least another three or six months or so, maybe. As the place was a mess, I decided to spend the night at my friend's house. We woke up the next morning and headed over to make my grandmother some lunch and hang out. As we walked in, the house was filled with smoke to the point where I was having trouble breathing and expected everyone inside and my cat and my grandmother and caretaker to be dead. Thank God they weren't. I called the fire department and they vented the smoke out and left. Turned out the caretaker started a pot of pasta the night before, fell asleep, and ignored it until we found it. The hospice nurse came for my grandmother and found out that she was not doing so good. Not surprising, given that she had just been inhaling smoke for the past eight or nine hours. She was a bit sleepy and delirious, and as expected, I guess. The nurse and my, well, the nurse and my friend decided it was the best time for my grandmother to go home or to nursing care, since she couldn't be alone now, obviously. My grandmother was still coherent and agreed reluctantly. The night was the night of my concert, and she insisted that I go to my concert and have fun and not to worry about her. So I went to the concert and spent the night at my friend's place again. We went over again the next morning and found my grandmother knocked out, just sleeping peacefully. It was around 9 a.m., and as the day progressed, I could tell she had taken a turn for the worse, from coherent to sleepy to nonverbal. 
The nurses came by and gave her morphine every four hours, and it was just terrible. Every time I walk into her room, it got very cold. Just near her doorway, extremely cold. The rest of the house and her room were fine, but the doorway was cold. I thought it was strange, but brushed it off until I felt like I was being watched. I didn't mention this to my friend, who had stayed with me essentially this whole weekend, now considering the situation going on, but he brought up that he felt that way too. That's when I told him I felt it. I awkwardly, sort of jokingly brought up that I'd heard about this phone app called Ghost Tube, whether it's being legitimately trusted or not, whatever. I said, obviously, I know it sounds stupid, but fuck it, morbid curiosity, you know? So we opened it up, just kind of hanging in my room, when I had a bright LED strip light up on the sound detection mode, and I asked some basic questions again, not expecting anything like, is anybody here with us, basic childhood-like ghost, you know, hunting stuff. Nothing, no response whatsoever. So I told my friend that I was going to check out my grandmother, and as I headed toward the door, the ghost tube app suddenly picked up a message, don't go or don't leave. My friend and I were both frozen, staring at the phone in disbelief. A few seconds later, the app displayed no and stay here. We looked at each other visibly freaked out. The room felt colder than ever and we both had goosebumps. Carefully responded to the app's messages by asking who are you and is this someone here with us? The response I got back was Sailor, which was my grandmother's last name before she got married. Her deceased mother was also staying in my room for a year or two, so the fact that the app picked up on her maiden name was quite startling. At this point, I was freaking out. He was just kind of frozen. I was teary-eyed and continued asking questions. This went on for another half hour, with the app giving us genuine answers to our questions, albeit some a little bit vague. Never did we receive any simple yes or no answers, though. We also noticed that the LED lights in my room and the sound detection mode were flickering in response to our questions, even when there was no sound. So we repeated some of our questions and added, using the lights twice for yes and once for no. We asked questions like, are you here to help my grandmother reach the other side? And all the answers we received were what you'd expect. This went on for about four or five hours, and I remember feeling a sense of relief and sadness at the same time. At one point, while my friend and I were discussing how insane this was, and we must have just been crazy, my mom suddenly went white. Or sorry, my friend suddenly went white. His eyes widened and he froze. I asked him what was going on, but he was too freaked out to respond immediately. Eventually, he reluctantly said, I just saw a figure pass by the doorway. I was skeptical at first, but then I saw it too. It was tall and dark and seemed to move past the doorway and disappear. We both freaked out and we were about to leave the room when we suddenly heard my grandmother calling out my name. We quickly ran to her side and found her semi-conscious. We tried to calm her down and make her comfortable, but we knew that her time was running out. After a while, the hospice nurse arrived to administer more morphine to my grandmother. My friend and I took this as a sign to leave and let my grandmother rest. And as we walked out of the room, the ghost tube app displayed one final message. I love you. We both froze and looked at each other. It was clear to us that this was not just some random coincidence. We felt that we had truly connected with someone or something beyond the physical realm that day. As we left my grandmother's house that day, I felt a deep sense of loss, but also a newfound appreciation for life and the unknown. I realized that there's so much more to this world than what we can see or touch, and that maybe, just maybe, there's something beyond this life that we're not meant to fully understand. Greetings, fellow adventurers of the unknown. Join us here at Paranormal M as we uncover the most mysterious and perplexing stories. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications to never miss out on our latest unexplainable tales. We hope you enjoy the journey. Imaginary Friends 
When I was one or two years old, my family temporarily moved into an unfinished house. I don't remember much about it, but my mom and sister told me about it. Years later, anyway. Apparently, it was a house that a family friend owned, and we moved in there on a whim after my parents were evicted from our old house because of some office drama. My dad's boss blamed him or something, and he didn't do directly for some reason, and ever since, we were renting out the lot from him, and we had to leave. The new house was generally unsafe, with deep cracks in the road and no street lamps. This meant that no cars would be passing by, but it also meant that the neighborhood kids would be playing in the empty lots in the area, including the one that we were living in. The lot area was huge, so there was plenty of space for them to run around. And for some reason, I became consistently sick since we moved there. My parents didn't have much money, as my dad was just a rank-and-file minimum wage earner with three kids, but somehow they always managed to pay for my hospital bills. I must have been getting sick from the lack of clean water and electricity, but my parents never really talked about it. During the day, my parents and I were rarely home. My dad was at work and my mom and I were at the hospital. Only my older siblings, who were five and eight years old, would be left at home managing the store that my mom had set up after we moved in. At night, my older sibling would tell my parents about some kids that would be pranking them. They would hear voices of kids pretending to buy something. But when they would come to the store, no one would be there. There were also times when the neighborhood kids would stand in front of their door wearing horn-like sticks on their heads. And whenever they would check, the kids would be gone. As for me, I would cry and say, there's a moo moo. Moo moo means ghost or monster, anything unnatural and scary for the kids while pointing at the ceilingless roof. This had been going on for two months and everyone thought I was dying because I was consistently dehydrated, barely ate anything, and I would only play outside when there were no kids around. There was a mango tree on the property that I would climb, and I would shout, hey friends, to no one in particular. My family thought I was losing my mind, and one day the tree was filled with honey that the neighborhood's kids had collected in empty glasses. Another day, the entire lot area of the house was filled with white flowers. My mom said it took her days to clean it because it was really thick, about a foot. It also smelled really good. My sister told me that flowers, these particular flowers, looked like frangipani flowers, kalachuchi in our language. My parents are massive skeptics and dismiss these things as anything but natural occurrences, though they really don't have any explanation about it other than you know, the honey, and why they would be bothering to do it. My pediatrician at the time told them that it's normal to have an imaginary friend at my age, so they just went on with their lives. That is, until my grandma visited us and was shocked at how many changes I had gone in, in over just two months. She scolded my mom about not taking my health seriously, despite her bringing me to the hospital every single day. My grandma told my mom that my disease, which the doctors at the time couldn't really figure out the cause, aside from the lack of running water, could be caused by supernatural entities. Considering the honey and the flowers, which my grandma thought to be gifts from the spiritual world, my parents were skeptical, but they were trying to try anything that would help me feel better. They brought me to a, they brought me to a witch doctor, a faith healer, who gave me the most sticky massage I've ever had in my life. I can still weirdly remember it, focusing on my forehead. I'm not sure what happened next, but I remember this old lady handling melted candle wax at my mom with what looked like woods. I don't remember anything else, but my sister told me that they've been seeing something which resembles a woman with long hair, triangular nose, and whiskers. She said that it really looked like a cat. The old lady, the faith healer, said that this cat-like figure wants to get me, and that's why they're giving me this disease. Shortly after that, we left that house and lived in a much better area. One of my godparents heard about what had happened to me and had their old house rented out to us. 26 years later, my mom and sister would be telling me this story, only that my older sister remembers a friend that had passed away. My sister described the kid pretty well, and then she was tall, blonde hair, white skin, and always wearing a white dress, but in her undies. My sister also told my mom that she doesn't know where this kid lives. Now my mom, though mostly not at home, knows the neighborhood kids because she's friends with their parents. 
even after we left the area. And she said that it's impossible for her to miss that kid because she'd always be seeing them playing at her house. But my mom doesn't know the kid. My sister, who knows where all of her friends live, also doesn't remember where this kid that passed away lived. She said she's always just seen her in one of the empty lots in the area. I don't remember anyone else playing with her other than her. Doesn't know how she passed away, but she said it must have heard it from someone else or someone who had heard it from them. The weird thing about the two months stay in the house is that I can clearly remember the hospital visits and the massage, but not the house or the friends. I only remember playing once outside the house, picking some red flowers and calling some kids by their names, which my sister and mom know and nothing else. When we moved out, my older sibling would scare me about the cat-like entity whenever I'm playing with cats. And we didn't own any cats prior to moving into that house, but I insisted to have one once we moved out. I can remember my mom and older brother always throwing these cats out of the house. I loved them so much, but they felt creeped out with how much I loved them. I refused to play with other kids unless they were involved. I can still remember this, and I loved hearing them breathing despite not having any idea about deaths. I always played alone, but I was happy as long as my cats were with me. I still have cats, and they're more scaredy cats than me. Never going back in. When I was a teenager, my family and I lived in eastern Kentucky, in the heart of the Appalachian Hills. Our small town was so remote that everyone lived miles apart from each other, and as a result, we often found ourselves searching for ways to entertain ourselves, like going ghost hunting or having sleepovers at friends' houses or parties in the woods. And one summer night when I was 17 years old, our group of three guys and three girls decided to visit an abandoned church that the guys had heard about. We set out in the car, but one of our friends wasn't able to join us, since we had no service to tell him that we were were headed on our phones. It was just the five of us in the car. No service. The abandoned church was located in a hollow, far from town, up the hill. We had to turn right off the main road, and then drove for about 45 minutes down a one-lane street that curved over creeks and hills until it got extremely narrow and rural. The guys told us that once we got over a specific hill, we would start feeling odd, like someone was with us. It was also probably around 12 a.m. or 1 by the time it started. The area was hot and humid since it was in the middle of July, and we were in the car laughing and looking around as our driver took us over the creek and through the woods. After about 30 minutes, we made it to that hill that they had mentioned, and the car came to a stop in the middle of the road. The guys turned off the lights, and we watched and waited, but nothing really happened. This disappointed me, as I wanted to see something crazy, like lights or a demon standing in front of us or something. We decided to keep going to the church after a couple of minutes of silence and darkness. The guys were telling us about the last time that they had stopped in that spot. Apparently, they had a big commotion, and they thought that it would recreate itself in the present. So, we drove about 10 or 15 minutes more down this tight road between the mountains. Finally, slowing slowing down around a curve, the hills opened up into a clearing with tall, tall grass. It was probably around one or two acres. In the far left of the property was a two-story stone building that was clearly a church. Sitting in the dark, we couldn't stop staring at it. There were trailers in the next field with lights and cars, so it wasn't 100% desolate. I was so excited to see something. I searched the windows, convincing my eyes that I might peep a little figure peeping through the darkness, but I saw nothing. We parked on this concrete lot area, right off the road and got out. The guys convinced us to hike through the grass to the building, and we went happily. The first story was the basement, and the second was the church itself. The guys led us up the steps that went to the second story through the front doors. I don't remember if we were inside or still standing outside, but our sixth friend pulled up about ten minutes after us. He said that he couldn't get a hold of us since there was no service anywhere. He said someone wrote the initials of the street of the church and it was located in the dirt of his car window and decided to see and luckily his hunch was right. We all went inside at this point. This was a Southern Baptist type of church and the sanctuary had all the windows broken out. 
There was a raised stage area where the preacher probably stood with a podium. The pews were all gone, so it was an open room with a black corner closet in the left of the stage and a small door and a small door to the right of the stage, which led to the basement. The guys decided to venture down there alone while the three of us girls stayed upstairs and do some ghost hunting. Armed with our phones as recording devices, we asked the usual questions like, what's your name and who are you? But there was nothing, just silence and response. As I sat on the stage, closer to the closet in the corner, I began to feel a sense of cockiness wash over me, which was not my usual demeanor. I couldn't explain why I was feeling that way, but I knew better than to challenge something I didn't understand, and I said, I don't believe anything is here. Why don't you knock on something, make a sound, do something? Then we heard a knock. My friend warned me, it's going to follow you home if you don't be careful. But I brushed her off. Suddenly, the closet next to me started making subtle sounds as the dead leaves inside shuffled quietly. The three of us huddled together, bracing ourselves for what was going to come. We then heard footsteps from the front doorway to the church, and then from the closet. A cold wind and the footsteps from the door started running towards us, progressively getting louder with each stomp. All three of us began to scream as the guys ran upstairs to meet us. I don't know why we didn't just run out of the building, but eventually we regrouped and made our way back to the car. One of the guys said that he heard a choir of people singing from downstairs, and one of the girls claimed to have heard a piano while they were regrouping. The next night, I was safe in my room sound asleep. I had a dream that a huge black figure with claws came through our closed front door. It stomped up the steps the same way that we had heard in the church, and it entered my room. It slammed my door open, shoving the doorknob into the wall and causing damage. It came up to me asleep and unable to wake, and it shoved me out of my bed. I woke up on the floor with the door embedded into the wall. It was my first sleep paralysis dream. Since then, I've had similar dreams of this figure finding me, standing and staring at me, shoving its hand into my body and dragging out my organs. All while I couldn't move or scream, it's been years, and these dreams are not as common anymore. I never went back into that building because I truly believe whatever was there followed me home. Of course, we went back to the church constantly and it became popular, but I would wait in my car and whoever's vehicle took us each time. I've seen friends go back in and run, children chasing them in the grass, even when they didn't have kids with the group. I've seen eyes in the rearview mirror while leaving the hollow. I've even felt my long hair being pulled in the car while I waited, and even while I was sitting at home after visiting. I've had paralysis dreams since then, and I believe it was whenever I was in that church the first time that this all started. I'll never go back there ever again. Welcome to Paranormal M, where we delve into the darkest corners of the supernatural. Be sure to hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications to stay up to date with our latest eerie tales. We hope you have a hauntingly good time listening. Shadow Figure in My Parents' Basement In 2005 and 2006, I was just 16 or 17 years old, living in my parents' basement and I had recently started dating a girl who claimed to have the ability to communicate with spirits. Initially, I was skeptical of her abilities, but being a teenage boy, I was more attracted to her than concerned about her claims. One day after coming back from a soccer game, I went downstairs to find everything pulled out from under our staircase in the laundry room. When I asked my dad what had happened, he told me that the cats had been going under the stairs instead of using the litter box, so he had to clean it up. I helped him out a little bit before heading to my room to take a shower. My girlfriend was coming over, so I wanted to freshen up. About ten minutes into my shower, I started hearing loud and aggressive banging on the door. Bang, bang, bang. I assumed it was my dad needing something from me, so I shouted back, One second, Dad, I'm just in the shower. But the banging continued. Bang, bang, bang. I was getting a little bit annoyed now and shouted, Jesus Christ, I'm in the shower, give me a minute. But the banging persisted. And this time, I was furious, so I grabbed a towel and stormed over to the door and flung it open, saying, Kay, what do you want? I'm taking a shower. 
And to my surprise, no one was there. I was weirded out at this point and chills ran down my spine. The basement always creeped me out, so I poked my head out and looked to the other side of the basement, thinking maybe my dad stormed off or something like that. And then I saw it. A black figure, standing there, as if I had caught him off guard. It had no eyes, no mouth, just a figure looking at me. We stared at each other for a second or two, and then it moved across the hallway towards the laundry room. I slammed the door shut and I started hyperventilating. What was I going to do? I had to pass the laundry room to get upstairs. I quickly got dressed and gingerly opened my door to look on the other side of the basement, but there was nothing there. No sign of the figure. I tiptoed towards the other side of the basement until I could see the stairs and then ran up. The first thing I did was call out to my dad, but my mom answered, saying that he was in the garage. I ran to the garage and asked my dad if he had been banging on my bedroom door. He looked at me confused in hell and said, no, why? I didn't know what to say. I was in shock. If that thing could physically hit my door, what else could it be capable of? As I sat there in the garage with a blank look on my face, I heard the dog start barking inside. That's when I realized that my girlfriend had pulled up outside. So I ran out to the front door to meet her, trying to play everything off as normal. But as soon as she walked in, she had a worried look on her face and asked, What did you do? Confused, I asked her what she meant, and she said, You've changed something about the house. Whatever you've changed, you need to change it back right now. I explained to her that my dad had just cleaned up a mess that the cats had made underneath the stairs, and we had to pull everything out. She told me to put everything back the way it was, so I hurriedly put everything back underneath the stairs in the laundry room, as it was before. I couldn't help but feel a little bit unnerved by her demand, but I tried to shake it off as her just being superstitious. After all, she's the one who claimed to communicate with spirits, not me. My girlfriend and I spent the evening watching movies and hanging out in my room, and I tried my best to forget about the strange incident earlier. But as the night wore on, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. I kept hearing strange noises coming from the laundry room, and shuffling sounds, as if something was moving around down there. Every time I heard a noise, I would tense up, my heart racing in my chest. I finally mustered up the courage to investigate, grabbing a flashlight from my room and cautiously making my way down the stairs. As I approached the laundry room, the shuffling sounds grew louder and more frenzied, and I could hear what sounded like faint whispers. My heart was pounding in my chest as I slowly pushed open the door and shone my flashlight around the room. At first, I couldn't see anything out of the ordinary, but as I swept the beam of light around, I caught a glimpse of something moving in the corner of my eye. When I turned to focus on it, I saw the same black figure from earlier standing in the corner of the room. Its featureless face turned toward me. I froze, my mind racing as I tried to make sense of what was happening. But before I could take a step toward the figure, it vanished into thin air, leaving me alone in the silent laundry room. I stood there for what felt like an eternity, my heart still racing, trying to come to grips with what I had just witnessed. Eventually, I managed to gather my wits and make my way back to my room, where I spent the rest of the night tossing and turning, unable to shake the feeling of unease that had settled over me. Over the past few weeks, I became increasingly paranoid and anxious. Every time I walked past the laundry room, I felt like I was being watched, like something was lurking just out of sight. I stopped sleeping well at night, too, plagued by nightmares and waking up in cold sweats. I even started avoiding spending time in my room altogether, spending as much time as possible at school or hanging out with friends. Eventually, I mustered up the courage to confide in my girlfriend about what had been happening. At first, she was skeptical, but when I told her about the figure I'd seen in the laundry room, her expression turned serious. She told me that she had sensed a dark presence in the house from the moment she came over, but that she had been trying to ignore it. Together, we decided to try to do something about it. We spent hours researching online, trying to find ways to cleanse the house of negative energies or spirits. We burned sage and candles, sprinkled salt around the perimeter of the house, and even tried to communicate with whatever entity might be haunting us. But no matter what we did, the feeling of unease persisted. In the end, we eventually moved out of the house and into an apartment together. It was a relief to finally leave the basement behind, but the experience had left its mark on me. 
I never forgot the feeling of dread that would wash over me every time I would think about the black figure in the laundry room, or the whispers I heard in the darkness. And even now, years later, I sometimes wonder if that entity is still there, waiting for someone else to stumble across it. My wife works in a haunted school, but maybe it's nothing. We reside in a quaint little town nestled in the heart of the Midwest, where the ebb and flow of daily life carry with them tales of the mysterious and unexplained. My wife, a passionate music teacher, has found herself entangled in a web of peculiar occurrences that continue to both intrigue and unsettle us. It all began when she accepted a position at an ancient, time-worn elementary school that carries with it an air of mystique and whispers of spectral encounters. Coincidentally, our humble abode is situated across the street from a cemetery, where we have both caught glimpses of an otherworldly presence, though I must admit my skepticism still lingers. It was during her initial days at the school that my wife brought home a curious tale, one that left her perplexed and searching for rational explanations. Each morning upon her arrival, she would find her pencil cup unceremoniously cast upon the floor, its contents scattered haphazardly, and at first she dismissed it as maybe the handiwork of a disgruntled custodian, attributing the untidy scene as a mere act of mischief. Yet as the phenomenon persisted night after night, she found herself questioning the very objects involved. Was it the fault of the cup? Perhaps the desk? the worn and wary passage of time. Or it could just be the very foundation upon which the school stood was somehow unbalanced. And despite her efforts to unravel this enigma, the nightly ritual of finding her pens strewn about in the cup on the floor continued unabated. Eventually, she ceased discussing the matter and resigned herself to the unsettling routine. To our surprise, the custodian, seemingly driven to frustration, lodged a complaint with the school administrators, accusing my wife of carelessly tossing her pens and neglecting to clean up after herself. It was a baffling turn of events, for she knew all too well that she was not responsible for the disarray that greeted her each morning. The inexplicable pen cup phenomenon persisted, undeterred by the custodian's accusations, haunting her days like a specter refusing to be silenced. The next incident that sent shivers down our spines occurred with the confines of her classroom. Long after students had departed and solitude reigned supreme, engrossed in practicing a hymn, my wife found herself confronted by an unsettling disturbance emanating from a very instrument that brought her joy, the piano. As if possessed by an unseen force, emitted a cacophony of notes, as if someone or something had taken a seat upon its time-worn keys, it was brief but obnoxious, followed by an eerie silence that permeated the room. Despite the chill that crept up her spine, my wife mustered the courage to slowly retreat from the scene, willing herself to push this disconcerting incident to the recesses of her mind. However, it is the last encounter, the one that unfolded within the confines of the school's unfinished second-story storage attic, that haunts me the most. This particular space, accessible only through a locked ladder located outside the building, has become the backdrop for a series of spine-chilling incidents reported by fellow teachers. While my wife harbored reservations about these stories, she found herself drawn into the tapestry of the unexplained on that fateful night. Engaged in a private lesson with a talented high school student aspiring to master the realm of opera, my wife bid her pupil farewell as the evening drew to a close. Yet, as she began to gather her belongings, an abrupt commotion erupted from the depths of the inaccessible side of the attic, reverberating through the empty space with thunderous footsteps. With mounting dread, she listened as the sound of rapid, thunderous footsteps echoed through the hollow expanse of the inaccessible attic. From one end to the other, the phantom runner sprinted with an intensity that sent chills coursing through her veins. It was as if an invisible presence fueled by an unknown energy raced toward the side where the ladder stood. Its purpose and intent shrouded in the realm of the inexplicable. My wife, overwhelmed by a mixture of fear and fascination, found herself caught between the allure of these otherworldly encounters and the deep-rooted concern for her well-being. 
As the echoes of the ethereal runner faded into the silence of the night, my wife's heart pounded in her chest, her senses heightened by the undeniable presence of something beyond our understanding. With every fiber of her being urging her to seek safety, she swiftly made her way to the safety of her car, where a semblance of normalcy awaited. It was during that tumultuous drive home that she shared the chilling details of her encounter, her voice trembling with a mixture of awe and trepidation. For my wife, these encounters while unsettling carry a strange allure. She's drawn to the enigma that permeates her professional life, embracing the mysteries that surround her with a sense of curiosity that borders on the supernatural. But for me, her partner in life, the fear and concern are ever-present. I cannot help but worry about the potential implications of these encounters, the impact that they may have on her well-being and her shared existence. I've delved into countless encounters of paranormal experiences, seeking solace in the stories of others who had traversed similar realms of the unexplained. And yet, the answers remain elusive, mere whispers carried by the winds of uncertainty. Have others encountered such inexplicable phenomenon within the confines of their workplaces? Do they too walk the tightrope between fascination and fear? I yearn for the solace of shared experiences, for a glimmer of the understanding that can bring comfort to my restless mind. As we navigate the delicate dance between the known and the unknown, my wife and I find ourselves standing on the precipice of a world where the veil between reality and the supernatural grows too thin. Together, we tread cautiously, embracing the enigma, while holding lightly to our shared love and support. And as the clock ticks and the shadows deepen, we remain ever vigilant, prepared to confront whatever mysteries the universe has chosen to reveal to us, for better or for worse. House full of ghosts, bunch of kids and one adult. When I was 12 years old, my family and I moved to a house on the outskirts of Los Angeles County, not far from the Knott's Berry Farm in Disneyland. It was the early 80s and we lived there for about a year. The house was completely haunted and a bunch of strange things happened that I couldn't explain. Every night everyone went to bed I could hear someone digging with a shovel outside the window. However, there was no one there when I checked. If I turned on the lights, the sound would stop, but only for a few seconds, maybe 30 at the most, and then they'd resume. This went on for months. I had OCD as a kid, and I'd put all of my toys at the right place at night, and on several occasions, the following morning, they'd be scattered all over the floor as if someone had played with them during the night. I would yell at my younger siblings thinking that they had done it. My mother would tell me I was the last one to go to sleep and the first to wake up, so it was not them. Every night without fail, at 11 p.m., I could hear children yelling and playing in the backyard outside upstairs the window. If I looked out the window, it was pitch black and there was nothing there. And on more than one occasion, I went downstairs and opened the door to the backyard, but the sound was gone. You couldn't hear it from downstairs, only upstairs. My grandmother came to spend the night once. She got so scared, she never came back. She slept in the upstairs spare bedroom and said that she heard noises outside the window. When she looked out the window, down below she would see a shadow walking up to the front door, but no one was there. My aunt spent the night once in the same bedroom, and something similar happened, noises just outside the window. And when she looked down below, she saw lights moving and shadows, moving toward the front door. But no one was there. Like my grandmother, she struggled to explain what it was that she heard and saw. She never came back to visit. The house rented cheaper than any of the other houses in the area. Every time the landlord would come by to pick up the rent, she would ask if everything was okay. My parents would invite her inside the house, and she would always refuse. The neighbors to the right of us were very strange. They were an older couple. The man would never say a word, not one, not even hi. But the wife was always extra nice. She would ask the same things as the landlord. Is everything okay? Are you guys doing good? She knew something. We were playing with one of the neighborhood kids once, running around. We all ran back to our house. 
and it was just as we went through the front door, he stopped in his tracks. He said he was not allowed in the house. His parents forbade him. Why? Because he had spent the night once with a kid who lived in the house before we did, a year earlier. And during the night, the mother of the kid who used to live there started screaming and grabbed the kids and ran out of the house. As they ran, they all saw a blue mist and a ghost with a distinct pattern on its head and shoulders. The only person in my family to see the blue mist and ghost was my father, who said it walked down the stairs and directly into a closet. His description was identical to that of our friend who refused to come back to the house. The last day we were in the house, we had finished putting up things for a U-Haul truck, and we were cleaning up the last of the things. I remember we were eating pizza, too, as we were getting ready to walk out of the house. I felt a mixture of relief and sadness. We had lived there for a year, and despite all the strange occurrences, it had been our home. I remembered the excitement I felt when we first moved in, and I was excited to explore the neighborhood, make new friends, and see what adventures awaited me. But the adventures that awaited us were not the ones that we had expected. From the very first night that we moved in, we would sense that something was off. I remember lying in bed trying to fall asleep when I heard a faint sound outside of my window. At first, I thought it was just the wind rustling the leaves, but then I heard it again, louder this time. It sounded like someone was digging with a shovel outside my window. I tried to ignore it and go back to sleep, but the sound continued. It was a steady rhythm, like someone digging a hole. I was too scared to get out of bed and check, so I just lie there, listening to the sound until it eventually stopped. The next morning I told my parents about what I had heard, but they dismissed it as my imagination. They told me that it was probably just me hearing things and that it was nothing to worry about. But the digging sound continued every night, and soon other strange things would happen as well. One night I woke up to find all my toys scattered on the floor. I was confused and angry, thinking my younger siblings had played with them during the night. But my mother told me that it was the last one to go to sleep, so it couldn't have been them. But I already told you that. Despite all these strange occurrences, we never really talked about them, while we lived in the house anyway. We all tried to rationalize what we saw and heard, thinking that we were just imagining things. And it wasn't until we moved out of the house that we started comparing stories and realizing that we all had experienced strange occurrences. One of my roommates mentioned that she would hear someone whisper her name when she was alone in the house. But when she turned around, no one was there. Another roommate said that she always felt like she was being watched and that she would occasionally see shadows moving in her peripheral vision. As we continued to talk, we also realized that we had strange dreams while living in that house. Some of us dreamt of dark figures standing in the corners of our rooms, while others dreamt of being trapped or suffocated. At this point, we all became convinced that the house was definitely haunted. We had never believed in ghosts before, but there was no other explanation for the things that had happened to us while we lived there. Looking back, I think that the experiences we had in that house were a combination of our imaginations running wild and the strange sounds and creaks from an old house. However, I can't deny that there were some things that happened that still can't be explained to this day. Ghosts Down Under my ghost tour of Pentridge Prison, Coburg, Victoria, Australia. Firstly, brief history of Pentridge. Opened in 1851 after Old Melbourne Jail got overcrowded, housed many of Victoria's worst criminals over its time, including serial killers, gangsters, and was home to 11 executions, including the last in Australian history, and countless other deaths, all buried in a mass grave near the H Division. Only the aforementioned H Division is standing as it was when the prison closed in 1997. First time I, a 23-year-old male, went was the most macabre second date ever, both superstitious after both having previous experiences with the paranormal. The first thing I noticed when I entered the building was it felt odd. It felt alive with energy despite there being nothing in it. Those who believe in ghosts probably know what I'm talking about. Anyway, the tour continued as normal and the guide was telling great stories of what prison life used to be like. 
Then the guide then asked for a volunteer to stand in a cell by themselves for a while. My date, a 24-year-old female, put her hand up and was shut into the cell. This cell was 9 feet by 6 feet by 9 feet, with about a 3-inch thick heavy metal door. This cell had a pentagram on the floor, but only for effect as there were no recorded Satanists or associated rituals in the prison at any time. Whilst my date was there, the rest of the group moved to another part of the prison. Still had line of sight into the cell that my date was in, though. About two minutes after, my date came barging out of the cell saying, Nope, 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 and was clearly frazzled. She said that she was standing in there saying a rosary prayer as she was Catholic. She said that she immediately felt as though she was not alone and was being drawn into the back right-hand corner of the cell. She started to struggle to breathe, although she managed to focus on taking deep breaths and the feeling subsided. But then she felt a warm breath on the back of her neck, which promptly made her leave. The cell belonged to an American-born serial killer, Eddie Leonsky, a.k.a. the Brownout Strangler, who murdered three women in Albert Park during his deployment to help the Australian war efforts in 1942. Here's where things get interesting. Leonsky was known for getting drunk and singing in a high-pitched womanly voice at pubs at night, which made him a bit of an attraction for fellow pub-goers, and many started singing along with him. All three women that he murdered were one of those people who sang along with him. Leonsky confessed to liking those women's voices as they were vaudeville performers or professional vocalists, so as they were taking their dying breath, he would physically suck their breath out of their mouths with the hopes of gaining their vocal skills. My date was a trained opera singer. I personally didn't have anything super noteworthy happen aside from getting a super heavy feeling in my stomach and chest when I was in the cell of the former Surrey Road Gang leader, Mark Chopper Reed. My date also had a similar feeling in the adjacent cell, and the night was capped off by a jump scare from a mannequin that was placed right in the doorway of a closed cell that the tour guide said to look in as well as a plaque with information about the history of the prison, where there was a guide also well aware of the mannequin and was laughing when the group had a mini heart attack after opening the cell door. The second visit was about six months later, with my now long-term girlfriend, 23 years old. This time, the prison felt different felt obscenely heavy, felt like we weren't wanted in there, and at this point my girlfriend grabbed my hand, looked at me, and took an exasperated breath. The, the tour started and my girlfriend promptly took me to the back of the group so that way she could lean on the wall, as she said her knees started to get the shakes. We were standing there for roughly five minutes and she whispered in my ear that she needed to step outside, so I excused myself from the group and took her outside and sat down. She then explained to me that she was starting to black out and felt like that she was completely drained of all energy. And she visually looked pale, which takes a lot considering that she's from Zimbabwe. I prayed for her protection, we're both Christian, and I convinced her to go back, as it was an expensive tour and we had only really been there for 5 minutes of the 90 minute tour. She apprehensively agreed but clung to my arm the whole night to the point that I started to lose circulation in my arm. I did stand by myself in a few cells, and it seemed random what cells had, chest-crushing heaviness or not. In fact, I think the main foyer area was heavier than the previous hot spots, as I felt nothing in Eddie Leonowski's cell. Apparently he doesn't react to men in his cell. Coward in life, coward in death, I guess. And Chopper's cell felt like a friendly respite. Makes sense as he was known for his humor and charisma. Even the cell reserved for death row inmates was quiet. I did take a photo, which does have an unexplained shadow that was unfortunately lost when I changed phones. Convenient, I know. I want to make this very clear though. I fully believe in keeping an open mind and not jumping to conclusions when it comes to the unknown, such as ghosts. I am fully open to constructive criticism, and I can't say for certain that what I experienced was actually paranormal, despite me believing that it might be. All I want is respect on both sides of the argument, as I've experienced skeptics calling believers psychos, 
and other toxic comments purely based on their belief in the paranormal. Keep it civil and raise each other up with healthy discussion rather than cutting each other down, eh? Weird experiences. Any advice? I've been having some really strange experiences in my home lately, and I'm not quite sure what to make of them. I've lived in Idaho for about five years now, and up until a couple months ago, never had any weird happenings to speak of. For a little bit of background, I live with my parents and three younger siblings in a pretty typical suburban home. I've always had a bit of a messed up sleep schedule, so I often find myself staying up at night. I usually spend my evenings playing The Sims on my laptop while I was in bed, and I've gotten into the habit of leaving my window cracked open just a little bit to let in a cool breeze. My window is directly to my right next to my bed, so it's pretty easy for me to hear what's going on outside. About two months ago, I experienced the first of several strange occurrences. I was laying in bed playing on my laptop when I heard a sudden piercing shriek come from outside. My blood ran cold and I froze, unable to move for several seconds. Finally, I managed to shake myself out of it and rationalize that it was probably just my husky chasing some raccoons or foxes, and we have a lot of those in our area. Yet, as I lay there, I began to feel more and more anxious. I got up and went downstairs to check on stuff thinking that maybe seeing the dog and the rest of the house would maybe calm me down. When I got downstairs, I saw my dog just staring at the doggy door we had for him. He was completely still and silent, which was really unusual for him. As I approached, he started growling low in his throat, his eyes fixed on the door. This really freaked me out, but I tried to tell myself that it was just a dog being weird, and it was 4 a.m., and I knew my mom would be up in an hour or so, which helped me feel a little bit more at ease. But as I lay in bed trying to fall back asleep, I couldn't help but feel curious about what I'd heard outside. I know it was a stupid idea, but I was dying to look outside and see if there was anything out there. Eventually, I couldn't resist the urge any longer. I got up and walked to the back door, turning on the backyard light before opening a door a crack. The light wasn't very bright, but it was enough for me to see that there was something underneath my sibling's trampoline. It looked like a person, hunched over and sitting there. I called out, thinking that it might be one of my sister's friends who was trying to sneak into or out of her room. Yet, no response for a few seconds, and then I heard crying coming from underneath the trampoline. At that point, I was absolutely terrified. I didn't know what to do. I closed the door and locked every door in the house, including the doggy door before sitting on the couch and facing the door until my mom came downstairs. When she finally came down, I told her everything that had happened, and she went outside to take a look. She came back in and told me that there was no one out there, and that it was probably just one of my sister's friends who had gotten scared off. I tried to accept what she was saying and let it go, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was really off. Fast forward two weeks and I started hearing loud knocking on my window. Whenever it happens, fear just paralyzes me and I immediately pretend to be asleep or go to sleep in my mom's room. I heard the knocking. Fear just paralyzes me. It's like my body's frozen and I can't move. The knocking starts abruptly and it's always loud, like someone is pounding on the glass with all their might. I try my best to ignore it, but it just becomes harder and harder. I've been losing sleep and my anxiety levels have been through the roof. One day I decided to talk to my siblings about it. And they had all had their own stories to share, too. My brother, who lives in a separate building in the backyard, had heard loud banging on his door at night. And my sister claimed that she had seen a shadowy figure lurking around her backyard. I was surprised that they had experienced similar things, but at the same time... It made me feel better that I wasn't alone. I started researching online to see if there was any explanation for what was happening. I read about paranormal activity and ghost sightings, but I wasn't sure if I believed in that kind of stuff at all. 
I also looked up stories of burglaries and break-ins in the area, but nothing matched the strange occurrence in her home. One evening, the knocking was particularly loud. I mustered the courage to look out my window. I slowly got out of bed and crept toward the window. My heart was pounding, my palms were sweaty. As I got closer, I could feel the chill in the air, and I shuddered involuntarily. When I reached the window, I took a deep breath and slowly pulled back the curtain. What I saw made me gasp in horror. There, standing just outside my window, was a figure dressed in all black with a hood covering their face. I couldn't see their features, but I could feel their eyes on me, watching me. I stumbled back in shock and my heart felt like it was about to explode. I didn't know what to do. I was frozen in fear and I felt like I was going to pass out. I eventually gathered my wits and ran to my parents' room, waking them up in a panic. My parents immediately called the police, but when they arrived, there was no one there. The police searched the backyard and the surrounding area, but they found zip. They told us to call them if anything else had happened, so they left. That experience left me shaken and scared. I couldn't sleep for days, and every time I heard a noise, my heart would skip a beat. I didn't know who or what was behind the strange occurrences in our home, but I did know that I never wanted to see that figure outside my window again. I still don't have any answers, and the fear of the unknown still haunts me to this day. Someone give me some insight here on a dream or not dream. I would love another perspective. My name is Nate, and I work at a factory in Virginia that constantly hires temporary workers. I've met all kinds of people from different walks of life, but one particular couple caught my attention back in 2011 or 2012. Let's call them Ben and Lisa, both around 20 or 21 years old. They had just moved here from New York. Lisa had lived with her father her whole life and then decided to reach out to her mother online. They moved down to Virginia to meet her mother and leave behind some of the trouble that they had gotten into in New York. Interestingly enough, Lisa was a practicing witch, and upon meeting her mother, found out that her mother and grandmother were also involved in witchcraft. As a Baptist minister, I always tried to bring up faith in conversations. Not in an overly pushy way, but more of a general question. If they wanted to talk more about it, that was fine. If not, that was fine too. Ben was interested in my beliefs, and over the past few months, he worked with us. We had several conversations about our different beliefs and backgrounds. We became pretty good work friends. However, Lisa worked in another part of the factory where there was another lady who was practicing witch as well. Unfortunately, there was some bad blood between the two. This lady was someone that the wife grew up around, and although we knew her pretty well, we never fully trusted her. One night I was up late washing bottles for my baby son. I let my wife go to bed early and I stayed up and took care of the bottles and preparing things for the next day. I finished up at around 1am and went to bed. I was almost asleep when I felt something slide across the top of the blanket from my left foot across my body and come across the right side of my bed beside my head. I heard a voice ask, What if you looked over and your wife wasn't your wife but was Jane? the other witch lady at work. My response was a calm and peaceful, I would kill her. No idea why it was that extreme. In my sleep or not sleep, I reached out and grabbed whatever was there and tried to strangle it. Then the thought crossed my mind. You're killing your wife, dummy. I woke up and I was still lying on my stomach, but all the muscles were tense and I was gritting my teeth and feeling uneasy. My wife was still alive and sleeping peacefully beside me. I hadn't moved since I laid down. I shook it off and glanced at the clock. It was 1.30 a.m. and I had to get up soon for work, so I went back to an uneventful sleep. The next day at work, I saw Ben looking pretty rough, so I asked him if he was okay. He stopped and looked at me, waiting for some people to pass by, and told me that he hadn't got much sleep last night. I asked him if he was sick because he sounded pretty hoarse. He pulled down the collar of his coat and showed me his neck. He had a very deep purple bruising on his throat. I asked him what happened and he told me a story that sent shivers down my spine. I was asleep in bed and something dragged me out of bed and tried to kill me last night. It was choking me to death. 
And while it was, my girlfriend said it was growling or something was growling in the room. There was a voice in my head that said I had one week to leave the house or it would kill me. Lisa ran and got her mom. And as she did, we let go. I remember the day that Ben shared that terrifying experience he and his girlfriend Lisa had gone through. It was a typical day at the factory and was going to lunch when I saw Ben looking disheveled and tired. I asked him if he was okay and he stopped and looked at me with a serious expression. He waited for some other people to pass by and told me that he hadn't gotten much sleep. I asked him if he was sick and he sounded hoarse, but I'm repeating myself because this is written by AI or something like that. Ben had been asleep in bed when something had dragged him out of bed and tried to choke him to death. He struggled as it squeezed his neck, and he heard growling sounds coming from him or the room. Then he heard a voice in his head warning him that he had one more week to leave the house or would kill him. I asked him what time it was, and his answer stopped me in my tracks. It was about 1.30 in the morning, he said. I told him 1.30 in the morning I had been trying to kill something in my dream, or not dream, by choking it to death. We were both disturbed by the similarity of our experience and wondered what it could all mean. Later that day, we managed to find some time to piece together what was happening. Ben's girlfriend kept coming out and acting strangely, whispering in his ear and staring at me weirdly. I felt something evil standing right beside me. I became nauseous and chilled, feverish at the same time. My palms were sweaty, which hardly ever happened to me. It felt wrong, like something evil that did not like me was speaking to Ben. The next morning, while I was washing bottles in the kitchen, I had a visitor. In the dark kitchen, lit only by a crappy small fluorescent bulb, I felt something slip up behind me, just like at work. The breath on my neck, the feverish chill, the sweaty palms, the nausea returned. I chucked the bottle in the sink and told the entity that it did not belong in my house, that it was a Christian home and it had no place there. Then as calmly as I could, turned and walked as fast as I could into the bedroom without looking back. I said a prayer for Ben because the last time I felt that presence was when I talked to him. I felt like he was in danger. I didn't know what had happened exactly, but I found out at work the next day that the previous night, around the same time, I had felt the entity in my kitchen. Ben had decided to convert to Christianity. He said that whatever had been bothering him had left. I had no idea what any of this meant or what caused it. I had questions whether it was Ben's girlfriend or maybe she didn't like the influence I was having on him. Or if it was just the other girl that my wife knew trying to cause the two of them, Ben and Lisa, issues or something, and I got dragged into the middle of it. All I know is that it was more than just a coincidence, and whatever it was that caused it it hasn't been back around since. My dead grandmother comforted me when my appendix ruptured and made me call the EA. Now I'm a seer. As an atheist, I never really believed in the existence of the supernatural or the afterlife in general. However, my experience in October last year made me question everything I'd ever believed in. For two weeks, I had been dealing with intense abdominal pain, which only worsened with each passing day. I went to the emergency room three times, but each time I was sent back with painkillers and told to come back if the information worsened. I couldn't hold food anymore, and I hadn't slept properly for two weeks. I made the most excruciating pain I'd ever felt. I even had a fever and vomited and I was drinking water and it was almost impossible. Despite all this, I still didn't go back to the hospital because the waiting time was about seven hours and I couldn't afford to waste that much time when I had work to do. At the end of the second week, I woke up in complete shock because my body was twitching and the pain was so severe that I vomited immediately after waking up. That's when I heard a voice and looked at the end of my bed. There I saw my grandmother, who was the one who raised me and loved me more than anyone else in my family. I adored that woman so much, but I was in complete shock because I didn't recognize her at first. Her voice was much younger and her face much more youthful and her hair curly brown instead of that whitened strands that I used to know. I couldn't see what she was wearing because she was almost so white that she appeared like she was on fire or surrounded by light beams. She walked towards me and the only thing I could say was, I love you, Omi. She didn't reciprocate, but she looked incredibly sad and asked me to call somebody for help. 
I told her that I did, and they sent me back numerous times. It was to no avail. They wouldn't help me. She interrupted me, saying, You need to go because you're dying, and I don't want to see that. You can't go just yet. Not so young. Call for help. I replied. The pain lessened. I can sleep it away. My voice getting quieter, my body becoming very tired. I was so exhausted like never before, and I wanted to sleep. But for the first time I've known her, she got seriously angry. You need to call somebody. Call somebody to help you. Don't go to sleep. Don't sleep now. I love you, but you must go now. Go hurry. My body jolted up with force I never felt. I called the emergency services to come and get me. My voice became slurred. And while they weren't really talking to me in the hospital, which was only nine minutes away, I already fainted and was in and out of consciousness. I woke up on the operation table a second before they applied the mask, and then faded away. The operation took about six hours to fix everything up. My appendix had ruptured and poisoned me, and my body was slowly succumbing to sepsis. If it hadn't been for the amazing doctors who saved my life, I would have died. The reason my body started to feel less pain that night my appendix ruptured was that the pus finally had opened and started to release, and the buildup of inflammation was gone. However, my body was dying slowly to sepsis. If I hadn't called the emergency services, I wouldn't have made it. When I told everyone in the hospital about my experience, they all believed me. Apparently, it's not unusual for dying patients to have visitors or visitors to take them with them to the afterlife. I never believed in such stories until I experienced it myself. After all this happened, I started having mad astral projections when I lay in bed. I began to see after my near-death experience, something strange started happening too. I began to see things that I'd never seen before. I would lay in bed and have these projections and things that would usually be invisible to me were there. It was as if a veil had been lifted from my eyes, allowing me to see beyond what's normally perceivable by humans. At first, I was scared and confused by these visions. I didn't know what to make of them or what they meant, but as time went on, I began to realize that they were becoming more and more realistic. I would hear whispers in specific locations, and my dreams completely changed. They were no longer filled with monsters or unrealistic beings, but instead, they were almost like visions of real-life events that would come true. I would share some of these visions with my boyfriend, who happens to be a physicist, he was fascinated by them. He began to theorize that my near-death experience might have changed something within my brain's neurons, allowing me to perceive things beyond what's normally possible. But while my boyfriend was intrigued with my newfound abilities, others were not so accepting. When I shared my vision with my friends, they were terrified and they didn't want to hear about them at all. They would tell me not to tell them what I dreamt of, and they just wanted normal conversation instead felt horrible because at first I was excited when something I saw would come true, but now it's causing fear and anxiety in people around me. For example, I prophesied that my best friend's husband would cheat on her and never come back, and he did, and he came back for two weeks and acted like he loved her before leaving her and filing for, filing for divorce. My friend was understandably angry with me, and it stained our relationship. However, I was also having visions that saved lives. I saw my mother's face completely disfigured in my dream, and she was in tremendous pain. I called her in the morning and asked to go see the doctor. They found a huge abscess hidden in her lower jaw. If it hadn't been for that call, the infection could have traveled up to her brain or her bloodstream, potentially causing death. As time went on, I began to wonder if there is a way to turn off these strange visions. I didn't ask for them, and they were causing more harm than good just wanted my life to be back the way it was before. But as far as I knew, there was no way to deactivate them. I was stuck with these abilities, and they were changing my life in ways that I couldn't have predicted. Several Paranormal Experiences in India and Germany I have some inexplicable things that were happening to me over the years. One time I had a visit from my great-grandfather in my dreams, even though he passed away years before I was born. I can remember what he looked like, but not what he said to me. 
He warned me about something, and I couldn't shake the feeling that it was important. Later on, I found out that it was indeed my great-grandfather after seeing pictures of him for the first time of my life. My grandmother had removed all pictures of him after passing away from cancer and stored them in the attic. She ended up clearing out the attic a decade and a half later, which was when I saw the picture. Another strange occurrence happened when I saw a shadow person imitating my mom and standing in the doorway of my bedroom, calling for me. I turned around and mumbled to that thing to leave me alone, believing it was my mom. The living room was next door, and my mom heard me mumbling, so she asked if I was okay. I answered, Hey, why did you wake me up? Turns out, she never called for me, and never stood in the doorway. And she didn't even see or hear the thing call out to me. It was a creepy experience that I couldn't explain. Another time, my grandma called me on the phone. She has a sixth sense when it comes to her family, and she told me everything was going to be okay. She didn't even see hi or ask how I was doing. At the time, I felt very sad and didn't know what to do with my life at all. I have no idea what happened or why she called me, but she knew everything. She did that a couple of times with my sister, too. She'd call her and tell her something related to what's happening in her life and give her advice and help without even being told anything about it. The latest experience I've had was to do with my Indian part of the family. We used to have a shrine in our wardrobe for the gods, before we moved houses anyway. One night, a blue orb danced through the room. The curtains were closed and didn't let through any light. The orb curiously moved into the wardrobe to the shrine. I told my husband about it, and he said I saw a god. I have no idea if that's the case, but I certainly couldn't explain what I saw that night. Another time we had a solar eclipse, and my husband had a necklace he carried since he was a baby. My mom extended it as he grew, and he gave it to me, so whenever he had to leave for extended periods of time, he could give this to me. On the day of the solar eclipse, I suddenly felt very sick. The bus driver noticed because I turned pale like a ghost while driving home, and he even offered to call a doctor for me. I declined and had a hard time walking the last meters to the house. I called my husband immediately to inform him. I also had a burning sensation where the necklace touched my skin, so I asked him if I could take off the necklace and put it away and how to store it properly. He told me to put it in a box, store it in the furthest corner away from me, and not to wear it until he tells me it's okay to wear it again. Turns out his father's mistress does black magic, and the gods to protect us from black magic are weakest during solar eclipses. I felt weak until the eclipse passed and started wearing the necklace again without any issues. The last story I have is the most recent one. I visited my in-law's house in India, which is a little bit old, but really comfy and kind of pretty. I have to admit that there was something about that staircase in my in-law's house in India that always gave me the creeps. Even though the rest of the house was comfy and pretty, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off every time I went near it. It wasn't until later that I found out that the staircase was actually the most active part of the house in terms of paranormal activity. Apparently my mother-in-law had some doubts about me at first, but then she realized that the ghosts in the house were actually less active during my stay with them. She told my husband that she believed it was because I carry too much light energy, which helped to dispel the negative energy and protect us from any spirits that might be lingering around. I was honestly surprised to hear this, as I had never really considered myself to be someone who was particularly in tune with the spiritual realm. Despite this revelation, I still couldn't shake the feeling of unease whenever I went near that staircase. It was almost as if I could feel the presence of something, even though I couldn't see anything. One night I was coming back to my room after using the bathroom when I saw something out of the corner of my eye. I turned to look, but there was nothing there. It was only then that I noticed the hairs on the back of my neck standing up and the feeling of dread that had settled into my stomach. I quickly made my way back to my room and I tried to shake it off, but as I lay in bed, I couldn't help but feel like I was being watched. I tried to tell myself that it was just my imagination, but deep down I knew that something was off. The next day I brought it up to my mother-in-law, who seemed unsurprised. 
She explained that the spirits in the house were known to be mischievous at times, but they meant no harm. She also gave me some tips on how to protect myself from any negative energy, such as burning sage and carrying certain crystals. I tried these techniques and found that they did seem to help. I still felt uneasy around that particular staircase, but I was able to manage the feeling much better. It wasn't until I left the house that the feeling of unease lifted completely. Looking back on my time in India, I can't help but wonder what other experiences I might have had if I had been more in tune with my spiritual side. Who knows what other spirits might have been lurking around that old house, waiting to be discovered. A symbol appeared to me after brief contact with an invisible entity. I've always been a skeptic in my life. I never believed in anything beyond logical explanation. But last night something happened to me that I can't explain logically. Maybe there is a logical explanation, and I really hope there is, because it would be so much easier for me to accept than what I really think happened. Maybe I'm just crazy and going out of my mind, And but what happened yesterday could have been a hallucination. It would be reassuring to know that it was. But as I think about it, a fear too great to be a product of a broken down mind overwhelms me. It's the knowledge that what I saw with my own eyes is real that terrifies me so much. Let me start from the beginning. I was lying in my bed in that transition phase between wakefulness and sleep. Best time to hallucinate, you'd think. And that's exactly what I thought too, but then it happened. I felt something moving underneath my sheet. But I didn't bother to look because I thought it was just a sensation induced by my imagination. However, the sheet moved again, and this time with more force. And in that moment, I understood that something was actually moving. But I thought it was just the fabric that was sticking to my bed, and maybe it was falling and generated movement. So I straightened out the sheet and went back to sleep. But another motion followed. I was surprised, but the thought again that it was the fabric falling off, so I fixed it better, tucking it underneath my legs to prevent it from falling out again. Only that the sheet kept moving. The sheet moved as if something underneath tried to lift it, like a cat that curls up underneath the covers but then tries to get out. Too bad that I didn't have a cat, not anymore, so that motion appeared inexplicable to me. I thought maybe I was lucid dreaming or it was sleep paralysis. But I had those experiences before, and it couldn't be the same. I was there awake, and I could move. I could scream. I could look at the clock and count how many fingers on my hand I had. And that's exactly what I did. I tried to reestablish contact with reality to understand if all this was a result of my imagination. It wasn't. The sheet moved again. It began to rise, as if there was someone underneath it, outlining a shape. Not the shape of a person, but that of a sphere as if there was an invisible ball underneath the sheet that rose above my legs. I began to feel an indescribable fear. The whole episode lasted, at most, a handful of seconds, but they seemed like minutes to me. I'd never experienced anything like this in my life. I had some near-death experiences in which I felt immense terror, but nothing compared to how I felt when I understood the irrationality of that phenomenon. But it wasn't just that. I perceived evil coming from that orb, if we can call it that. I felt like that it was a positive entity, and that it wanted to hurt me. I don't know how to explain it, nothing in this story anyway at all, I don't know how to explain. So in fear's grip, the only thing that came to my mind was to tell that thing not to hurt me, and the reaction that the orb had was something inconceivable. The terror that I felt when I saw the sheet shake violently as if this thing actually tried to communicate its hostile intentions to me. It's hard to understand. It was as if it tried to tell me, yes, I'm here to hurt you. And in that moment, fear took over me, knocking me unconscious. Or at least, that's what I think and I hope happened. When I woke up, I felt a sharp pain in my head. It was pounding like when you drink too much and have a hangover. I tried to remember what had happened the previous night, but my mind was too foggy. As I slowly sat up in bed, I realized that something wasn't right. My head was still throbbing, and I had a strange sensation on the sides of them. 
I tried to shake off the feeling, thinking that maybe I slept in a strange position, and that's what was causing the pain. But as I got out of bed and walked around, I realized that the pain wasn't going away. It was as if someone was hammering inside of my skull. I couldn't understand what was happening to me. I hadn't drunk alcohol, I hadn't eaten anything heavy, and I hadn't taken any drugs. The only thing I had taken was some butocyanide for my asthma, but that had never caused any side effects before. As I walked around the room trying to make sense of the pain, I noticed something strange. When I closed my eyes, I saw a drawing imprinted on the back of my eyelids. It was a mark, a strange symbol with the letter V, and a cross placed at its vertex. I rubbed my eyes hoping to make the drawing go away, but it remained there, as if it was imprinted inside of my head. I've never seen anything like it before, and I couldn't understand what it meant. I decided to recreate the mark with paint, hoping that someone could help me understand what it meant. I felt a sense of fear as if something was not right, and I couldn't shake off the feeling that it was demonic in origin. In a panic, I started to pray. I've never been a religious person, but in that moment, I felt that the only thing that could really help me was to pray, and as I prayed, the mark on the back of my eyelids began to disappear, and the pain in my head slowly subsided. I felt a sense of relief as if someone had lifted this particular pain and weight off of my shoulders, but at the same time, I couldn't shake off the feeling that something strange had happened to me. I was left with only fear and the doubt that it was all the result of a hallucination. I know it sounds crazy and I wish it was just my imagination playing tricks on me, but deep down, I couldn't shake off the feeling that something else was at play, something that I couldn't explain logically. Freezing cold room in Alaska during the summer. In the summer of 2008, I was 16 years old and living in Fairbanks, Alaska. Although I was born in Anchorage, I grew up in Seattle, Washington, and I frequently visited my grandparents in Fairbanks since I was a child. I had very nice memories there, but this time, things were about to change. My grandpa had passed away a few years prior, and my uncle had reached out to my mom, saying that one of her kids needed to come out and help with grandma's garden. Apparently she had been depressed and couldn't keep up with it anymore. I eagerly volunteered, excited to spend three weeks in Fairbanks and work on the garden with my younger cousin. My grandma's house has always been creepy to me, even when I was a young kid. I can't tell you exactly when it was built, but it's old. Maybe from the 50s or 60s. It's been a couple of tundra floods, so every single floorboard in the house has a nice creak to it. The front yard is huge with a hundred foot driveway that people used to confuse with a public park. The basement is deep underground with about 30 steps to get down there, very steep. And once you're down there, it's full of vintage dolls, toys, and mannequins and all around creepy stuff from back in the day. I really believe in the basement being bigger than the main house altogether. My grandma made the basement apartment cozy for me to stay with my own space being 16 and all. The haunting began the first day I arrived in Fairbanks. My grandma prepared the basement apartment for me to sleep in for the next couple of weeks. The apartment had a 70s style wallpaper and an old lamp, a bed, and probably the first digital clock ever created. That night I went to sleep only to wake up and realize that it was 3 a.m. on the dot. The bed I was laying in was perfectly made, almost like it was ironed on with no creases or anything in the blanket. I didn't think anything of it at the time, just that it sucked to kind of wake up in the middle of the night. And then I realized it was cold as hell, like Antarctica cold, like below 50 degrees cold. I'd been in blizzards before, and this was the coldest I'd ever been. My teeth were chattering violently, and I was breathing out huge clouds of air inside my bedroom in the summer. I've heard friends say that it was just air conditioning, but the house for sure doesn't have any AC. Also, I know it's Alaska, but the summer's pretty normal as far as temperature goes, 80s or 90s. After that, things got quiet, like pin drop quiet, and it felt as though the darkness in the corner of the room was closing in. I snatched up all the blankets and pillows in one swoop and bolted out the door. As soon as I was out the door, the temperature went back to normal. 
I ran for my life, falling multiple times, and slipped and busted my hip twice. Once I got to the stairs, I literally tried to jump up ten steps and broke two of my toes. Almost lost fingernails as well, trying to claw my way up the stairs. And once I got upstairs, I went to sleep on the couch in the living room. My grandma woke me up laughing like, Oh, you didn't like it down there. I replied like, I did, I just like it better up here. I started experiencing unexplained phenomena again, and it was during my college years when I was living in an old dormitory on the campus. It was a classic brick building with a long history and plenty of rumors about ghosts and hauntings. I didn't believe in those kinds of stories at first, but that all changed when strange things started happening to me. It started with small things like objects moving on their own and doors opening and closing and strange noises. At first I thought it was just my imagination, but then I started to notice patterns. The occurrences just happened at the time when I was alone in my room, and they became more frequent as time went on. One night I woke up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom, and as I walked out of my room I saw a figure standing at the end of the hallway. It was a dark figure with no distinct features, but I knew it wasn't a person. I froze and the figure started moving toward me slowly. I tried to scream but no sound came out of my mouth. I closed my eyes and when I opened them again the figure was gone. After that experience I started doing some research on the history of the building. I discovered that there had been a fire in the building in the 1940s. Several students had died. Rumor had it that their spirits still haunted the halls and some people claimed to have seen apparitions. As the semester went on, the occurrences became more frequent and more intense. I would hear voices whispering in my ear, and I would feel a presence in my room even when there was none there. The worst experience was when I woke up to find that I couldn't move. It was like I was paralyzed and I felt a weight on my chest like something sitting on me. I tried to scream, but again no sound came out. I felt like I was being suffocated. It was the scariest experience of my life, and after that night, I knew I couldn't continue living in that dormitory. I moved out as soon as I could and I never looked back. However, the experience stayed with me and made me more aware of the paranormal world. I started researching more and reading books about ghosts and hauntings, trying to understand what happened to me. It's been years since then, but I still feel uneasy whenever I enter a building or a place with a dark history. I know that the paranormal world is real, and I hope that others can learn from my experience and be prepared if they ever encounter it. The Shadow Man has visited my bed twice that I know of. I've always been hesitant to speak about my two experiences that I've never been able to explain nor do I really want to understand them. The first experience took place when I was in junior high school. I remember being sick one night and left an orange nightlight on by my bedside table. I fell asleep and started dreaming. In my dream, I found myself lying in bed at the top of a long driveway on a hill. I looked down between my feet, down the driveway to the road, and then into the forest on the other side. As I lay there, I noticed a section of the forest that was darker than the rest of the trees. All of my alarms went off in my head, and I stared at the dark spot, realizing that it was the size of a tall man. I never saw the man move, but in the blink of an eye, I realized that he was no longer, and it was just in the middle of the road. Then another blink, and he was at the start of the driveway with the road behind him. Still, it was all dark, and I could only see him because he was darker than the surrounding trees. Every few seconds, he had moved closer, but again, I never saw him move. He just got larger and larger and closer and closer until he's standing at the foot of my bed. In my dream, I was trying to scream, but I couldn't. Then it opened its eyes, and there were orange light reflecting out of his black face. Suddenly I woke up only to see the shadow at the end of my bed with two orange glowing eyes. I screamed and swung my arms out, knocking the orange nightlight onto the floor and breaking it. The shadow was gone, but I was awakened to a whole night and I never understood what happened. I told myself I hadn't seen him at the end of my bed and that it was just the end of the dream still in my mind when I woke up. 
Fast forward 15 years later, I had moved into a new house, a 1920s bungalow with a lot of history. It felt like a good space to me, but on my third night or so there, I was sound asleep when in my dreams, I started to feel terrified. I don't even remember what the dream was, but I knew that I was in terrible danger. And suddenly in my dream, my best friend from high school, who had died our senior year, was screaming at me. You have to wake up, you have to wake up. My eyes flew open, and there it was again, the shadow man leaning over my bed. Pitch blackness, except for two dark, oily, wet spots, like obsidian where the eyes should be. I snarled, get the fuck away from me, and without me seeing it move, it was just a few feet back, then a few feet more, then at the end of my bed, at the bedroom wall, and gone. I never saw it move, only registered movements like you would under a strobe light. First here, then there, and then there, but no visuals of actual movement. At the wall, it seemed to fold itself and then was gone. That was in 1992, and I've never seen it again. One time a few years ago, my dog woke growling, and I woke to the feeling of maybe it being in the house, but down the hall. I told it to leave, and the feelings disappeared, and I fell right back asleep. I've never sought to find more about what happened. The rational side of me just wanted to pretend it was a dream. But that same rational side of me also was seeing every flag up and that I was in danger and that I couldn't just ignore that such a thing was standing over my bed. It was a shadow figure with two dark, oily wet spots where his eyes should be. As it turns out, the house was built in the 1920s and had a long history of mysterious deaths and strange happenings. There had been several reported sightings of ghosts and other supernatural entities throughout the years. Some people even claimed that the house was built on top of an ancient burial ground, which could explain the strange occurrences. I was both fascinated and terrified by what I had discovered, and it seemed like there was some truth to the rumors about the house, and I couldn't shake the feeling that this shadow man was somehow connected to it. I decided to contact a psychic and see if they could shed any light on the situation. The psychic told me that the shadow man was a manifestation of negative energy that had been lingering in the house for many years. She said that the energy had attached itself to me because I was sensitive to paranormal activity. She also confirmed that my friend who had passed away was trying to protect me from the negative energy, which is why he had appeared in my dream. The psychic advised me to cleanse the house of negative energy and to protect myself with positive energy. She gave me several tips on how to do this, including burning sage and keeping positive energy crystals in the house. I followed her advice and performed a cleansing ritual in the house, and since then, I've never experienced anything or any other strange experiences, and I feel much more at peace. Looking back on the experience, I realized that it was a turning point in my life. It opened up my eyes to the existence of the supernatural and made me more aware of the energy that surrounds us. I'll never forget the shadow man and the terror that he brought into my life, but I am grateful for the lessons that I learned from the experience. Human-shaped brown smoke. In 2020, I discovered that I had cancer. It was a difficult time for me, and I had to undergo surgery, chemotherapy, and other treatments for several months. But I was relieved when I finally finished my treatment in 2021. One day while I was taking a bath, I felt something strange. It turned out that the surgery site had ruptured after five months and it was oozing pus and blood. I was filled with despair and didn't know what to do. I was afraid to start treatment again, thinking that maybe the cancer had come back with a vengeance. At the time, my father owned a quarry that was located about eight kilometers away from the city. It was a beautiful place surrounded by woods and with some family farms nearby. I decided to go there to clear my head and think about what to do next. The quarry had an open mine that was about 120 meters in diameter and 20 meters deep. There used to be a crushing plant located there, exactly where the trucks unloaded to the grinder. To take advantage of the force of gravity, it was located on the slope of the ravine about 30 or 40 meters high. From there, I could see an incredible view of the horizon. 
I parked my truck at the crushing plant and lay on top of it to watch the shooting stars. I don't know exactly how many hours passed, but it must have been something like midnight when I heard footsteps slowly coming towards me. I was armed with a pistol, but I had left it inside the truck, and all I had was a piece of wood lying there at the time. I was scared of being a criminal because we had problems with thieves. Trying to maybe steal machine parts or other items like that in the area. But the footsteps seemed to come from the side of the cliff, which was impossible for anyone to climb. I even went back there to check it later. My second thought is that it was a jaguar. And because I'd been lying down for some period of time, whether it was a jaguar or a criminal, it might have thought that I'd fallen asleep. And as the steps got closer, I deduced that the figure was already on my side. I looked without moving my head and didn't see anything that was the height of a person. So I jumped with a piece of wood and screamed because, you know, had to be an animal. Then I saw something that I'd never seen anything like before. I got goosebumps just writing about it. A human figure, completely dark brown, and it had no eyes, no mouth, and no ears. It looked like thick smoke, and it walked very clumsily, as if twisting. When I jumped, it still hadn't finished climbing. I froze, and it finished the climb. It passed by my side about a meter away from me. I deduced that it was just my... Maybe my height, I guess, 1.90 meters or less. When I jumped up and screamed, it did absolutely nothing. It passed by me and followed the opposite path I took when I got there. Left the road and entered the forest. At that moment, I took the gun from inside the car. It walked for a while and came out again in the clear and started coming towards me. The night was very clear with an almost full moon. When it got in a safe distance, as it came toward me, I started shooting. I shot 10 times, and I remembered that I still had 12 rounds, because I fired a few shots when I arrived. I landed all the shots as it approached, but it didn't do anything. It didn't seem to hit anything. At that distance, I never missed. However, it stopped and went back into the bush. For the rest of the night, I remained on high alert, watching and listening for any signs of the strange figure that had appeared before me. I couldn't shake the feeling of unease that had settled deep within me. Every rustle of leaves and snapping of twigs sent my heart racing with fear. Despite my best efforts, I couldn't explain what I had seen. The figure had moved like no human or animal I'd ever encountered. Its complete lack of features, save for its shape and color, left me feeling deeply unsettled. As the hours wore on, I tried to calm myself down by focusing on other things. I thought about my cancer, about how far I had come since my diagnosis, and how much more I had to live for. I thought about my family and friends and how much they meant to me, but no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't shake the feeling of dread that had taken hold of me. Eventually, as dawn began to break, the figure disappeared back into the woods, its footsteps fading away into the distance. I breathed a heavy sigh of relief, but my sense of unease remained. I packed up my things and drove back to the city, still shaken by what I had experienced. Over the next few days, I tried to make sense of what had happened. I spoke to my father about the strange figure, but he refused to say much, only warning me to be careful if I ever went back to the quarry at night. I searched online for any accounts of similar sightings, but found nothing that matched what I had seen. In the end, I had to accept that what I had encountered might never be explained. But despite the fear and uncertainty that it brought me, it also reminded me of how precious life is and how much we have to cherish and protect it. One STG thing is following me. As a 19-year-old female living in an older Texas town, I've had my fair share of strange experiences. Most of them began when I was five years old. So about 15 years ago, but things got worse when I got a little bit older. My family first moved to Texas for my dad, and he was doing work way back in the mid-2000s. And I didn't feel like I was being watched until we moved into a large house in a pretty damn good neighborhood. 
The house was gorgeous, with two stories, a pool, and a large backyard. My room was on the same side of the house as the rest of my family's. However, after my parents' divorce, I had to move rooms to make room for the younger kids. The room I was now in was the only bedroom on the opposite side of the house, with a media room on the same side. But I'd always hated going into that room. When I first walked in, I was immediately met with an overwhelming anxiety. I didn't understand why, but it felt like a hundred pairs of eyes were all staring at me. I told my parents about it, but they thought it was just because the room was always dark. However, I was never afraid of the dark until I lived in that house. I avoided going into the room whenever I could, and I would always close all the doors when there were no people inside. I would especially make sure the doors were closed before I went to bed because I got a perfect view of the entrance to the media room from my room. Every time after I closed doors, I felt like I was running up the stairs super fast after turning the lights off, but way worse. I would occasionally feel the same sense of overwhelming anxiety when I was just near the room or lying in my room. There were two incidents that I vividly remember happening in that house that really made me realize that my family weren't the only ones there. The first major incident happened when I was about nine. My family was going to go on a movie marathon in the media room for that night, and I was excited because I didn't mind being in there if I wasn't alone. We had eaten a fun dinner, and since I was a good kid, I, I was basically offering to do the dishes while my family set up upstairs. I was, re well, I was getting ready to go upstairs to meet the rest of my family when out of nowhere the feeling came back. I was hit like with a wave, with that familiar overwhelming anxiety. But it was way worse than normal. I started to throw up and I began to have a panic attack. I was crying, throwing up, and felt like I couldn't breathe. I was all alone in our kitchen, hovering over the sink, when I felt a hand on the back of my neck. I whipped around and saw an outline of something, but not a full figure. I violently threw up again, and I heard someone whisper in my ear. I don't actually remember all of what it said, but I do remember it mentioning God. I started to bawl, but I was able to breathe again. We are a religious family, which is why I began to bawl after it whispered. I was still sick, but I didn't feel like I was in danger or anything. My older sister later found me over the sink, after I didn't meet the rest of them upstairs. She told me I had been almost maybe an hour since I had left, and they figured I'd just gotten distracted. I didn't tell any of my family about what happened, and they just thought I had a panic attack. The second incident happened around four years later, when I was 13, it was really late at night, and I was ironically watching Supernatural. It was a school night, and I remember feeling anxious as I watched the clock. I didn't want to oversleep and be late for school, but I also didn't want to go to bed. You see, I had been experiencing some strange occurrences in my Texas home, and I was always on edge, waiting for the next incident. The incidents had started when I was just five years old, shortly after my family moved to Texas for my father's work. We moved into a beautiful two-story house with a pool in the large backyard. My room was on the same side of the house as the rest of the family's, but that changed after my parents' divorce, and I moved to a different room to make room for my younger siblings. My new room was on the opposite side of the house, and there was a media room on the same side, which I avoided at all costs. The media room made me feel incredibly uneasy, but I already told you about all that. <clears throat> We've since moved out of that house, but I still have one unfortunate experience in our current home. We moved into a gated high-income community, and the new house is really nice, but I still feel uneasy, especially when I'm staying in the media room. The last major incident happened about a year ago on Christmas Day. I was visiting my dad, and I didn't have a room of my own, so I was staying in with my younger brother. My older sister and I were sleeping in the game room while visiting. We somehow got on the topic of the old house and I ended up telling her everything that happened to me while we were there. She told me she felt like there was something in the house too, but nothing ever happened to her personally. She was never really there. She lived with her grandparents for school, but when she visited the side of the house that my room was on, it made her uncomfortable at that time. We finished talking and she told me that I may be a clairvoyant, but I don't really believe in those kinds of abilities. Thank you. 
The Board of Truth As a child, I'd experienced a few strange occurrences that were also witnessed by my mother. Those experiences made me realize that there are some truths to the paranormal world. However, I never thought that I would personally have any experience with the supernatural until I became an adult. About four years ago, I experienced something that changed my life forever. First, I was excited about what had happened, but then, like the flip of a switch, everything turned dark. Very dark. I was curious and I wanted answers. So, I began investigating my own experience, doing everything I could think of, including things I'd seen on TV. Looking back, I now know that it was a huge mistake, but at the time I was trying to get answers, and I was willing to do anything, even something that I'd always sworn that I would never do, attempt to use a spirit board. I did all of my investigating alone, which, again, another mistake. I would go to the cemetery where it all started by myself at all hours of the night, and one day I got the bright idea of downloading a spirit board app on my phone. The first time I used it, I got just what I expected, garbage. But I didn't give up. After several attempts, I made one more, and this time, things were different. I was sitting at my kitchen table, turned on the app, and started asking questions. The answers were coming back quickly and accurately, and I thought to myself, wow, this time it's working. But I was still skeptical and thought to myself, I'm going to debunk this thing and bust it as a fake. I asked the spirit board if it could see me, and the answer was yes. I then asked for its name, and it responded with Maria. I asked where I was sitting, and it correctly answered kitchen table. I then asked what I was wearing, and then it answered correctly. Asked it where it was, and it replied with, next door in the cellar. Feeling confident that I had the spirit board app figured out, I asked it where it was located, and I asked, Oh, so you're in the red brick one story next door then? The spirit replied with a firm, No. So I asked, Which house are you in then? The answer made my blood run cold. The spirit replied with, Gray two story on the corner abandoned. When I looked out my kitchen window, there was indeed a gray two story house on the corner of another street. It had been abandoned for several years and had a cellar, not a basement. I continued to have conversations with Maria through the spirit board app for several months. One night, I started at 1 in the morning, and I didn't stop until about 7 a.m. It only felt like 20 minutes had gone by, but Maria could tell me things about myself that nobody else would know about. It would tell me about calls I had responded to years ago as a police officer and what I had seen or felt. My haunting became very horrifying for several years, and I still deal with it daily and nightly. An investigation was done at my house, and they got the name Maria as well. They said that Maria was actually a succubus that was attached to me. I stopped using the spirit board app a long time ago, but I'm still dealing with the very real issue of using one and not closing the door when done, using it by myself, and so on. I'm here to tell you that just because you use a spirit board and have no issues, it doesn't mean that your time isn't coming, and when it does, I feel sorry for what you may be dealing with. Please use spirit boards with extreme caution and never use them alone. The experience I had with Maria has left me with a deep understanding of the paranormal world and a newfound respect for its power. I've learned that spirits can attach themselves to us and we need to take precautions to protect ourselves. Since my experience with Maria, I've sought the help of paranormal investigators, psychics, and other professionals in the field. They've helped me understand what I went through and how to protect myself in the future. I've also done a lot of research on the subject, reading books and articles and attending seminars and conferences. My experience has become mostly a passion, and I now use my knowledge to help others who are going through similar experiences. I've also learned the importance of keeping an open mind when it comes to the paranormal. People may dismiss the idea of spirits and ghosts, but the experience has shown me that they are very real, and I've come to believe that there is much more to this world than what we can see, touch, and hear. 
In conclusion, my experience with Maria and the Spirit Board app has left a lasting impact on my life. It taught me to respect the power of the paranormal world and to be cautious when dealing with it. I hope that my story will serve as a cautionary tale for anyone who's considering using a spirit board. Always use them with extreme caution and never use them alone. And remember, once you open the door to the spirit world, it can be difficult to close it again. <clears throat> More ghost stories. Then came the voices. After midnight, you could never be sure if your ears were deceiving you. When they began, it was like a radio stuck between stations, a lot of garbled sounds with an occasional word coming through. Gradually, over the course of about a month, they became more intelligible. We began hearing full conversations coming from the living room, knowing full well everyone in the house was upstairs. We tried several times to sneak down and catch an apparition or something, but no matter what, the time that we reached the middle step, the voices would stop. A couple of months go by, and we're regularly experiencing phantom steps and voices, random things going missing and turning up somewhere totally random, taps and knocks, etc. But I've yet to catch another apparition. My mom started a new job, working nights, so she always missed all the activity and explains away the rest. But she couldn't explain the ghostly girl in the basement, but she's sure that she thought hard enough about it that she could come up with something. This part is relayed from her to me. Quote, One night I came home from work early, around midnight, and it sounded like you were all in there in the dark having a party. I was mad that your dad let you stay up so late, so I busted in the front door ready to chew you all out, and the living room was empty. All the lights were out, and y'all were all sound asleep upstairs. I thought I must have been hearing neighbors or something carried myself upstairs and got in the shower. While I was showering, I heard what I thought was one of you girls going down the stairs. So I hollered and told you to get your ass to bed, and I heard footsteps run back up the steps and toward y'all's room. I didn't hear anything else, so I figured whoever it was went to bed and finished my shower. I got out and I was drying off when I heard the footsteps coming from the stairs this time. I thought one of y'all had snuck downstairs without me knowing it, and I was trying to sneak back up. I flung the bathroom door open, expecting to catch one of y'all in the act, but no one was there. I just sort of shook it off as the house settling and went to my room. I closed the door like I always do, got dressed, and when I got to crawl into bed, I noticed the door was open. I figured it must have latched wrong and went and closed it again. I got halfway across the room before it creaked open again. I spun around, marched over, and slammed it and got back into bed. I didn't know how it did it and how it didn't wake your dad up but he just kept snoring. I have a hard time falling asleep, you know. So I was laying in bed staring at the ceiling when out of the corner of my eye, I see the door swing open again. Now I'm pissed because I'm thinking the latch is broken. I get up and I turn on the light and go over to look at it. It seems to be working just fine. So I closed the door and jerked it real hard to make sure that it stayed and it did. Now I was curious and I started to think about y'all's ghost stories. So I sat on the edge of the bed and I watched the door. Before long, I noticed the doorknob turning. I reached over and tried to wake Dad, but he just sort of mumbled and rolled over. The knob kept turning until the latch came free and the door swung open again, and this time, a lady walked in. She was a little old lady, skinny with gray hair, wearing a flowery nightgown. She kind of reminded me of your grandma. I finally froze for a second, and I was too shocked to do anything else. She stood there staring holes through me for a minute before I found my voice to ask who she was. She didn't answer. She just stood and stared. I freaked the fuck out. I started shaking your daddy and hollering, saying that if he sat up, he was in a trance and he looked over to where the woman was standing. What's the matter, he asked, yawning. I said, do you see her? He blinked real fast and squinted at her. Yeah, he said so casually. It's just that lady. I was frantic at this point. What fucking lady, I squealed. And then, like it wasn't even a big deal, he laid back down and immediately fell back to sleep. When I noticed that she was getting closer, she wasn't walking, though. More like gliding, I guess. She said gliding right up to me and then through the closet. It was like I was paralyzed. I couldn't move. I couldn't breathe, scream, or anything. I got so cold in the room that I could see her dad's breath. 
The woman then glided back out of the closet and back across the room out the door, swinging it shut behind her. Once she was gone and the door closed, I gasped and gulped for air like a fish out of water. I was trembling and had been so terrified in my life, but I tell you what, I know ghosts are real now. Personally, I never experienced this old lady's ghost, but I know mom's fear is palpable when she talks about it. I experienced run-ins with several apparitions in that house. My sisters, too, so often that we named them. There was the no-face lady, the peepers or peekaboo men, Tommy, and the cigar man. We decided the girl in the basement, we decided his name was Laura, because she looks like Laura Engels. My dad was a very spiritual man who taught us to live alongside them in peace. Some of them were scary, yes, but we never experienced anything malevolent at all. Most of the time, it was as if they were wholly unaware of us. Finally feeling my grandfather's presence. Recently, I experienced a painful loss in my life, my beloved grandfather passing away. It's difficult for me to accept the fact that he's gone, and even though I'm sort of in denial, it's still a heartache that I can't seem to shake off. I can't even bring myself to say the word died. Perhaps it's because I can't come to terms with the fact that he's no longer with us, but maybe it's just my way of coping with the loss. In the past few days, I've been praying and begging for a sign from him. I'm not very religious, but I do believe in God and Jesus. I just needed some sort of connection with my grandfather to feel him around me somehow. And today, less than 30 minutes ago, I finally got my chance. I was sitting at my desk reading some articles and listening to music when I felt a poke on my side. It was a familiar feeling, one that I knew all too well. My grandfather used to do that to me all the time when he was still alive, poking me on the neck or on the side. It was our little thing, and now I felt the same sensation. It froze me in my tracks. I paused the music and looked around, thinking that it might have been my mother trying to get my attention. But she was sitting on the couch to my right. She denied poking me or needing my attention at that moment. My niece and nephew were both sleeping in another room, and my cat wasn't even in the house, with just my mother and I in the living room. This led me to only one theory, that it was my grandfather reaching out to me. I had begged and prayed for a sign for about a week now. I asked him to do something only he and I would know he'd do, and now I think he did. It was a very emotional moment for me and I couldn't hold back the tears. It reopened a very fresh wound that had just barely started to heal, but I'm not upset that he made contact. I'm actually very happy about it. It's just the pain of losing him is still very raw and it hurts so much. I've stepped out of my comfort zone by sharing this story, but it was just too good not to share. To everyone reading this, please take note of what I'm saying. Hold your family close and love them. I know some of you might be thinking, of course I already do, but trust me, it will really sink in when they're gone. Family issues are common and some things might be unforgivable, but if it's something small enough to forgive, please do it. You don't want to leave things unsaid. My grandfather and I had a great relationship. In fact, he was more like a father to me than my grandfather. My grandparents divorced when I was 14. It was like my parents had split up, but they managed to keep a pretty great relationship. I think they needed time apart for a while. He lived in another house taking care of his mother and one of his two brothers. But he always came around and made sure that we were okay. The last time he came over to my house, I was sleeping. I thought I'd catch up with him later, but I regret that decision so much. I'll regret it for the rest of my life. My grandfather and I were really never once to express our loves for each other in words. We didn't need to. We just knew that we loved each other. But now, I wish that I had that chance. I wish I could hug him and tell him how much I loved him. But it's too late for that now. Losing someone close to you is never easy. and It's been especially hard for me because my grandfather was more than just a family member. He was my father figure. He was always there for me, through thick and thin, and he never judged me for my mistakes. He loved me unconditionally, and I loved him just as much. Since he passed away, I've been struggling to come to terms with his absence. I miss him so much, and I've been praying every day for some sort of sign that he's still with me in some way. And today, I got that sign. I felt a poke on my side, and just like he used to do when he was alive. 
first I thought that it might have been my mother, but she denied poking me. There is no sign in the room that there is anyone else there. That's when I realized that it must have been him. I know some people might think I'm crazy for believing in signs like that, but to me, it's more than just a coincidence. It's a message from someone I love and miss dearly. And even though it reopened a fresh wound, I'm grateful for the opportunity to feel his presence again. This experience has reminded me of the importance of family and how we should never take them for granted. Life is short. We never know what we might lose in someone that we might love. So we should cherish the time that we have with them and never leave things unsaid. Even though my grandfather and I didn't say I love you to each other often, I know deep down that we both felt it. It's hard to express the depth of my grief, but writing about it here has been therapeutic for me. It's a reminder that I'm not alone in my pain, and there are others that maybe are going through similar experiences. Losing my grandfather has been one of the hardest things I've ever had to face, and I know that he's still with me in spirit, and that brings me comfort. To anyone else who might be going through something similar, I just want to say that it's okay to grieve, and it's okay to feel whatever you're feeling. We all cope with loss in different ways, and there's no right or wrong way to do it. Just remember to hold your loved ones close, and never let a day go by without telling them how much you care. Haunted Work Building When I was working at the pub, everything seemed pretty ordinary at first. It was a small town in England with a lot of regular customers, nothing out of the ordinary. However, the staff started to tell me stories about the pub that made me feel uneasy. They told me that it was an old Victorian house, with a family living upstairs and a woman living where the bar was. I also learned that the cellar had once been a doctor's surgery, and that the deepest room in the cellar was used as a laundry room, but it always made me feel extremely uneasy. The staff told me that the old surgery room was haunted by ghosts that didn't like the women in there. They said that the only way to protect myself was to tell the ghost that I had the right to be there. They also told me that the woman who died in the bar was still there. All of this information made me feel quite uneasy, but I kept working. It wasn't until I'd been working at the pub for a few months that I had my first big experience with the ghost. I was alone in the pub before the shift, and I had gone down to the cellar to collect bottles and drinks to refill the fridge upstairs. I decided to go deeper into the cellar and get clean towels, but on my way out, the lights cut out. The laundry door slammed behind me and I heard footsteps coming up. The footsteps sounded heavy, like a man, and I heard heavy breathing. I swear my heart was pounding and as soon as the footsteps stopped, the lights came on. There was nobody there, but I ran upstairs and bolted the door. When my colleagues arrived, they said that I was shaking. I remember just praying and refusing to go back downstairs. The second experience was different. I was in the bar with my colleague when a woman walked up to the bar, and we were serving other customers, so she was in her periphery. She was very clearly asking us if we could please help her. We said, yes, just wait a minute. And she said that she'd been waiting. She walked out of the bar and into the adjoining concert room, and once we finished serving, we went into the room to see what she wanted, but she was gone. What made it weird was that the room had no other exits. She had just walked in and vanished. We checked the CCTV, but there was no sign of her. It shook me up, but unlike our first encounter in the cellar, I didn't feel scared, I felt sad. It was like she was a residual spirit, lost and lonely. I hope she managed to find peace. The third experience was the second negative experience. Every area in the building had a telephone in it. The idea being that we could just call in each room since it was a huge building. The only phone that was broken was the one in the cellar because it never worked and my boss didn't see the point of replacing it. Nobody really used the phone anyway. I had finished up for the day and had gone upstairs to the office and staff room. I was collecting my bags when the internal phone in the office rang. I was very surprised because there was no one else in the building. I went to check the screen to see where the person was calling from, and they were calling from the cellar phone, the one that had been broken for years. I frantically texted the other staff, and they confirmed that no one was up there. I answered the phone, but no one spoke, so I hung up. The second I did, they started calling again. I had this awful, uneasy feeling from the cellar ghost again. 
I grabbed my things and got the hell out. I told my boss the next day about the strange phone call, and she checked the cellar, confirming that the phone was still out of use. She felt really sick as if she had been violated in some way. That place had so many little spooky things going on, doors closing, bar shutters rattling, things moving around, snooker balls rolling on their own, curtains twitching, but none of that stuck with me like these three experiences. The second one just made me sad, but the encounters in the cellar made me feel sick to my stomach. I used to dread going down there, and every time I entered the cellar, I felt uneasy. And when I left it, I was upset and emotional. I remember crossing myself or praying just to feel safe. There was something down there, something that could not have been good. Every woman who went into that cell came out looking pale and upset and needed a few minutes to herself afterwards. Despite all the strange occurrences, I kept working there. I needed the money and the job wasn't that bad. The regulars were friendly and the staff was like a big family. However, after that phone call incident, I started looking for a new job. I couldn't shake off the feeling that I wasn't safe there. Finally, after months of searching, I found a job in a different town and I quit my job at the pub. I was thrilled to leave that place behind. I still wonder about the spirits that haunted the pub, especially the woman in the bar and the doctor in the cellar. I hope that they've found peace and they no longer torment the staff and the customers. My Ghost Encounter On February 4th of this year, Saturday, my family and I decided to visit Dauga, a heritage preservation site located in Tanzania. As soon as my mom, who's a geography professor and loves to visit such places, heard about it, she got excited to go. Upon arriving at the entrance, we were amazed by the great facilities with a bookshop, a gift shop, and a cafe. But to our surprise, that day, there were more staff than visitors. As we started exploring, we were blown away by the Colosseum epic. I couldn't help but feel a sense of awe as we walked around, and then we saw that we could go underground to see some rooms. Maybe that's where they kept the warriors. It was like stepping back in time. We also accessed the leftovers of a hammam and sauk, and that was a castle with really tall pillars. There were rocks with old Latin words carved on them, and then we saw a big pile of mess. Mom and Dad thought it was just a pile of rocks, but my sister and I were cautious we explored it further. It was a giant mess of rocks and holes, not protected at all, and I think you could die if you fell into one of them. But despite that, we kept going around wondering if there was a way to go down safely. We searched the red wooden staircase that usually indicates you can go down there, but we couldn't find anything until we found a very thin staircase in a circular tower. You know those staircases they build in towers? Half of it was buried underground. We started going down the staircase, and then we jumped, and oh boy, it was pitch black. We followed the light to ensure that we had a secure escape, and then we started discovering this large area underground with my phone's flashlight. Of course, in video recording mode with night mode, with night mode I could see stuff on the screen more than I could with my naked eye. It was a very large area full of rooms. Who knows what happened there, but there were no signs of anything, not even empty beer bottles kept wandering around and my phone flashlight couldn't keep up. It had a wide angle of light, but it wasn't that bright, so I couldn't see more than 10 meters. Honestly, I didn't feel scared at all. The idea of a ghost or a crackhead attacking me didn't even cross my mind. I kept joking and talking with my sister, and it was pretty much normal. I forgot that a cat was following me from the beginning, and when we jumped into the dark underground area, it started running forward and I couldn't keep up with her. Then we found a hole that barely fit an adult. Leads to two tunnels, one going to the right and one going forward. But the latter had a slight curve to the left. Here we go, I said, and we took the right tunnel first. We were going slowly and it was deep. Even with the flashlight on, you couldn't see the end of it. In the middle of the tunnel, the flashlight flickered twice. I thought maybe it had switched to battery saving mode or that my Xiaomi phone had just bugged. My sister had scared for a second because she wasn't able to see anything, not even her feet. So I stopped recording and enabled the flashlight only. We completely discovered that the tunnel 
had come back to the second one, the moment I entered, I got the funny feeling of someone watching me. Remember the whole time I was looking through the screen, we got closer to the curve and I saw a white low light through the screen. As I entered the second tunnel, I felt a strange sensation as if someone was watching me. I kept looking through the screen in my phone flashlight and got closer to the curve. I noticed a white glow at first. I thought it might have been a white rock reflecting the light. But when I moved my eyes off the screen, I saw something that made my train brain stop for a second. There was a woman, all dressed in white, with no face visible, wearing something like a joba. It was such a strange sight that I couldn't even react. I turned my head to my sister, and she started screaming. Time to run, boys, she yelled. I was still in shock, trying to process what I'd just seen. My sister grabbed my arm, and we started running back through the tunnel, trying to get away as quickly as possible. The cat that had followed us darted past us, and we followed her out of the underground area, running as fast as we could. We finally emerged back into the daylight. We were out of breath and completely disoriented. We looked at each other trying to make sense of what had just happened. Did you see that? My sister asked. The white lady? Yeah, I saw her. I replied, still in disbelief. We spent the rest of the day exploring the rest of Dauga, but we couldn't shake the feeling of unease that had settled over us since our encounter in the underground tunnel. When we got home, we told our parents what had happened. They didn't believe us. Since then, we've been telling our friends and family about our experience, but most people think we're just crazy. We've even seen posts on the internet from people claiming to have seen a ghost at Dauga, but we know that what we saw was real. Four eyes saw her. We'll never forget that day. Ask Reddit 1 I used to live in what I'd like to call a half house, with the address of 118001 half. It was basically a shack remodeled to be a house. Let me explain the layout. The front door led to the small kitchen with a window that faced the driveway. The opposite, the window, was a half wall to separate the living room, which we used as a bedroom. The actual bedroom was always freezing cold and super tiny. It was just off the living room and the bathroom. The bedroom was connected to what everyone would call the garage, which only had two access points one from the bedroom and one from the outside by the driveway, just a few feet away from the kitchen window. I've always been a crazy insomniac, so one night while my boyfriend was passed out drunk to my left and our kid was to my right, I found myself lying in bed staring at the ceiling. Suddenly, I started hearing footsteps on the roof, loud footsteps. But despite the flimsy material, it never shook our house. Our house was long, not big, but long. But whoever this was managed to run across the entire roof down the long way in just a handful of steps. But they always managed to stop just above our heads. I added this to my telling of creepy crap that happened in that house to my boyfriend's family when we spent time with them on the weekends. However, my boyfriend always blew me off and no one believed my stories. After months of this, my boyfriend finally got tired of my stories and decided to prove me wrong. I told him that he couldn't get drunk and that I'd wake him up when the stomping started. He agreed to have no drinks that night. Well, the stomping started and I woke him up. He heard the stomping. He jumped up, threw his work boots on, in his boxers, and took my giant Rambo knife with him. And he ran outside. I locked the door behind him and waited and listened. Then I heard the stomping run from the living room across the house to the driveway. Our driveway had rocks, those stupid white rocks that my boyfriend thought looked nice all the way up and down the driveway, so when you walk on them, it has a very distinct sound. The thing got to the kitchen side of the house, jumped off the roof, and I heard those rocks just outside the kitchen window. I was too chicken to peek through the blinds, though. A few minutes later, my boyfriend came inside and said he didn't see anything except a cat. The cat was doing that thing he does when he wants to be petted more. The thing he does after someone's been petting him but stopped before he wanted them to. I told him the thing ran across and jumped into the driveway, that I heard the rocks. I never heard the stomping again, but other crazy shit started happening. His family finally believed me after that. 
After that night, I became obsessed with the paranormal. I started doing research and reading books and attending seminars and conferences. I wanted to understand what was happening to me and my family. I even reached out to paranormal investigators and psychics for help. They confirmed my suspicions that our house was indeed haunted. I learned that our house was built on Native American land, and there had been several tragic events that occurred in the area. I also learned that spirits can attach themselves to people, and that we need to take precautions to protect ourselves. I started taking steps to protect myself and my family, including smudging the house and wearing protective stones. In conclusion, my experience with the stomping on the roof in her half-house was just the beginning of my journey into the paranormal world. It taught me that we should always keep an open mind to the unknown and the unseen. We should also be respectful to the spirits and entities that might be sharing our space. My experience showed me that sometimes it takes a while for others to believe you, especially when it comes to the paranormal. But it's important to keep speaking up and sharing your experiences because it may help others who are going through something similar. I am grateful for my experiences in the half house because it led me to a path of understanding and acceptance. I've become a believer in the paranormal and use my knowledge and experiences to help others who may be experiencing similar situations. I've also learned the importance of protecting ourselves from unwanted entities and keeping our energy fields clear and balanced. In conclusion, our half house may have been small and humble, but it opened up a world of possibilities and experiences for me taught me to always trust my instincts, to speak up even when others don't believe you, and to be respectful of the unknown. I'll always be grateful for that old creaky house and the stomping on the roof that started it all. I used to talk to a Nazi in my bathroom light. When I was a teenager, I made the regrettable decision to use a Ouija board. At first, it was just a harmless game that I played with my friends, but eventually I became curious and started doing it alone in my 115-year-old house. Let me tell you now, I do not advise anyone to use Ouija boards, ever. My house was already paranormally active and filled with bad energy, but my foolish actions only made it worse. The spirits that I contacted were either powerless or had a good sense of humor, except for one particularly dark entity that called himself Secret. I won't reveal his name because I don't want to invite that kind of energy back into my life, and to this day, I still regret ever making contact with him at all. He was a Nazi involved in many deaths in France, and despite losing family members in World War II, I had to keep sweet with him. I tried to joke around with him to avoid any vitriol, but I never really liked him. He was creepy and definitely not my type of guy. And one day, something strange happened with the bathroom light in my house. My stepdad tried to turn it on, but it wouldn't work. He called my mom over to check it out, and as soon as she touched the light, the light switched on. They tested it repeatedly to make sure that it wasn't just a coincidence, and many weird things had happened in her house before, so they just added it to the pile of strange stories. However, as I write this now... I realize that the reason for the bathroom light malfunctioning might be because my stepdad is Jewish. It's a horrible thought, but a possibility. After the bathroom light incident, the light started flickering and we realized that it was responding to us. We tested it by asking it simple yes or no questions, and it flickered once for no and twice for yes. My mom and sister believed that it was our late Nana communicating with us, but I didn't believe it for a second. I knew that I'd brought something more powerful than other spirits that were in our house before. I started using that Ouija board, and that was it. Despite my skepticism, I still felt a chill down my spine when I asked the light to sing with me. It flickered on every syllable, in time with my singing, and stopped as soon as I did. It was creepy to say the least. During one Ouija board session, I became particularly close with a little boy spirit who had drowned along with his sister in some Eastern European country. His sister had made him feel lonely and angry in the afterlife, which was a dangerous thing for a spirit as it could turn them into a very dark soul. He would feed on my energy in order to communicate through the board, so I tried to be there for him and showed him kindness. He changed and promised to keep me company as I had done for him. 
I allowed him to connect with me, although I never really understood the full extent of what that meant, and I still hope that he's okay. But this story is not just about the little boy's spirit, but about the experience with the Ouija board. After a session with my friends outside a derelict pub by the beach, we met a lady who claimed to be a witch. She warned us that her energy was sacred, and that these activities could corrupt us and lead us to dark thoughts and traumatic events. Sadly, I think one of my friends may have been a victim of this as she entered a depression shortly after a Ouija board session. The lady also told us about her white witch friend, who she would ask to send us peace and protection, and asked to look out for white feathers and said that they were a sign of protection and peace. In the following days, my friend and I both saw white feathers in various places, including my front door. I didn't know what to make of it, but the fact that we both saw them made it feel like something was maybe happening with that. After that encounter with the witch, we stopped using the Ouija board altogether. I realized that it wasn't worth the risk and I didn't want to invite any negative energy into my life at all. The flickering light stopped as well, and I can only assume that it was because we stopped engaging with it. I stopped talking to the little boy's spirit, but I still hope that he's doing okay. I try to be a positive influence on the people around me, and I'm grateful for what I have. I don't know if the Ouija board experience affected me in any other way, but I try not to dwell on it too much. In conclusion, I urge anybody considering using a Ouija board to think twice. My experience with the boards were creepy and potentially dangerous, and I wouldn't wish them on anyone. It's better to be safe than sorry, and there are plenty of other ways to get fun and explore the unknown without risking your safety and well-being. Do fear the reaper. So I started a bit later in life. I decided I wanted to go into uni at 27, and I did. I wasn't going to let anything stand in my way, and I didn't. So I did my first year, passed with flying colors, and returned for my second. At the time, I needed to get out of the flat, and I decided to buy myself a new camera. So I took the last test run to see how far I could zoom in and out, if it was shaky, and if I could get a good feel for it, and this all becomes relevant later on. Skip forward to the end of the year. I had a few episodes of bad stomach pains, which would always pass. Until November, that is, the worst pain in the world hit me, and I wanted to run away from myself. I wanted to lose consciousness because this pain felt like anything I'd ever felt. So bad I knew my life had to be in danger. So I called an ambulance, had gas and air, but they diagnosed me with constipation of all things. I pleaded with them, and I was up all night while they gave me enough laxatives to make the most people go for a whole year. Finally, it seemed to pass, and I went home. But it wasn't as simple as that. I wanted it to be, but it wasn't. So I'm now in more pain and in the ambulance again. The doctor showed me to go to the ward this time after giving me the good painkillers. I seemed to burn this off after two hours and I was in agony again. Then the diagnosis of kidney stones came. Even though I can pee, they didn't do any scans, just blood tests, which showed elevated white blood cells. By the time we got to the appendix diagnosis, they finally decided to actually scan me using a CT. I was deteriorating by then, feeling faint and in agony. After the scan, my girlfriend at the time overheard the two consultants arguing that they screwed up. The more senior one asking why a scan wasn't done on day one. So instead of taking responsibility, they rushed me to a London hospital, by which time it was gangrene inside due to a blood clot that it's said to have formed over a year ago, but my body had kept growing millions of tiny vessels around the clot and effectively saved me. This was why I kept having pain. It would go, so I'm in a coma for four months. During that time, they operated on me and removed 70% of my small bowel and stuck it out in a bag. It was literally stuck out about an inch of bowel and then the bag. So I lost 7.5 stone, and I never to this day got that back. I had died two times on the table. I had been in some other world, and when I woke up I couldn't believe I was in reality. I had believed the dream, which I might add shouldn't have been possible. 
in the coma state anyway. So then comes the decision to rejoin it. Not waiting another six months because I'd die of malnutrition. Second operation, it was the worst. I died again, and I was not left to recover from the GA, but I awoke waiting to run. I can remember after talking to the man in the bed to the right because he had a leg missing. In the night, I heard some strange things, saw a nurse in what appeared to be a strange uniform, floating along the floor, and rabbits. Weird, right? Anyway, the next day I asked the nurse where the man to the right had gone, to which she replied, there is nobody on the right. It's the nurse's station behind a curtain. So who was I talking to? I was told I survived a really bad gangrene that should have killed me, and it did four times. I got out and fast forward a year later, I got my camera out and discovered the video I took to test it. This time, though, in the empty field, I see a black cloaked figure with no face, just black where it should be. It had some resemblance to the Grim Reaper. So was that a warning? Perhaps one that I didn't get? In the years since then, I've had strange abilities appear, such as knowing when someone will die. It's usually a feeling or a daydream which comes, comes kind of comes at me like in those movies in Final Destination. And sometimes at night, in surviving this, did I somehow inherit the ability to know when the Green Reaper is coming? Paranormal encounter with a strange goblin devil-like creature that other people with me also saw. Allow me to take you back to a distant time in my childhood when I was just a young curious kid. On that particular evening as the night began to unfold, my dear mother tucked my brother and me into our cozy beds, bidding us good night. She then retired to her own room, though she remained awake for a while. The soft glow of light emanating from her, slightly ajar bedroom, spilled into the hallway, preventing the darkness from engulfing our surroundings entirely. Given the short and narrow nature of the hallway, it never truly became pitch black. Positioned right in front of my bed, the door to my room provided me with a clear view of the hallway. As I lay there, comfortably nestled between my covers, I found myself gazing intently into the well-lit corridor. It was during this silent observation that a sudden and inexplicable event unfolded before my very eyes. Out of the corner of my vision, a peculiar and enigmatic creature materialized, traversing the hallway in front of my door. Its appearance was nothing short of extraordinary, resembling a curious fusion of a goblin and a devil. My initial inclination was to dismiss it as a figment of my imagination, a mere creation of my young mind. However, just three seconds later, my brother, whose room was adjacent to mine, broke the silence with a tremor in his voice. Mom, is that you? Something just passed through the hallway. Startled by my brother's statement, our mother hurriedly emerged from her room, her face etched with a mixture of surprise and concern, Realizing that something extraordinary had indeed occurred, she meticulously scoured every nook and cranny at the end of the hallway, which led solely to the bathroom. Yet, to our collective bewilderment, her search yielded no evidence of the creature's existence. Not a trace remained. It was as if the creature had vanished into thin air. No windows were left ajar to explain its sudden disappearance, leaving us dumbfounded and filled with an eerie sense of uncertainty. Attempting to provide a description of the creature, I estimate its height to have been somewhere between 60 and 70 centimeters, although my memory may serve me less than perfectly. I utilized the nearby light switch as a mental reference point to gauge its size. Devoid of any noticeable tail, horns, or wings, its body appeared emaciated, almost skeletal in nature. Furthermore, its entire form was shrouded in a deep shade of obsidian, which accentuated its mysterious aura. What struck me most about this extraordinary being was its unearthly silence and remarkable swiftness. 
In a mere blink of an eye, it traversed the hallway, leaving barely a whisper in its wake. The phenomenon was akin to witnessing something so incredibly fast that in its physical movement remained imperceptible to the naked eye. Instead, it appeared frozen in time, existing only for a fleeting moment before vanishing from our realm of perception. Since that bewildering encounter, I have neither laid eyes upon nor crossed paths with this otherworldly creature. Its whereabouts and ultimate fate remain a perplexing enigma, as if it dissolved into the very fabric of existence, defying the laws of reality. And so my tale concludes, leaving us with a lingering sense of wonder and an unquenchable thirst for answers. The memory of that fateful night forever etched in my mind serves as a reminder of the mysteries that lie just beyond the veil of our everyday lives, waiting to be unraveled and understood. The Unexplained Blanket One fateful morning I found myself waking up earlier than usual filled with a sense of curiosity that beckoned me to explore the mysteries of the living room. As I gently opened the door, my eyes were immediately drawn to the couch, where an inexplicable sight awaited me. An upright blanket, defying the laws of gravity, standing proudly in the center. The blanket appeared as if it had taken on a life of its own, assuming the shape of a bell, as if someone or something were seated beneath it. The edges of the blanket gracefully cascaded down, still touching the surface of the couch, creating an eerie and otherworldly tableau. A shiver ran down my spine as I stood there, transfixed by this perplexing sight. In a state of both awe and trepidation, I stood rooted to the spot where I felt like it was eternity passing by me, trying to make sense of the inexplicable phenomenon unfolding before my very eyes. Ten seconds which felt like an eternity, ticked by before I summoned the courage to break free from the grip of astonishment. With a surge of adrenaline, I sprinted toward my mother's room, determined to share this mind-boggling spectacle with her. Waking my mother from her slumber, I hastily recounted the strange occurrence that had unfolded in the living room. Together, we mustered the bravery to approach the enigmatic blanket, our hearts pounding in our chests as we cautiously ventured into the living room, Anticipation mingled with trepidation as we neared the enigmatic object that defied reason and logic. With each step, our surroundings seemed to hold their breath, as if anticipating the revelation of a hidden truth. As we stood mere inches away, my mother mustered her resolve and slowly pressed down the center of the mysterious blanket, half expecting to encounter a hidden presence beneath. But alas, our search for rational explanation yielded no tangible results. There was no one seated beneath the blanket, no concealed form waiting to be revealed. The fabric obediently succumbed to my mother's touch, collapsing into its rightful place as if mocking our bewilderment. As we stood there, our minds racing to comprehend the inexplicable, we were left with more questions than answers. How could a seemingly mundane blanket defy the laws of physics and stand upright on its own? What unseen force had conspired to create this mesmerizing spectacle? Was it a trick of the light, an optical illusion, or is there something more profound at play? Seeking solace and understanding, I began to delve into the annals of the paranormal. In my quest for answers, I encountered tales of objects moving on their own accord, unexplained phenomena that defied conventional wisdom, and I discovered that I wasn't alone with my bewildering encounter. As others had also experienced inexplicable occurrences that challenged the boundaries of our understanding. Yet, despite this plethora of accounts and speculation, a definitive explanation remained elusive. The truth, it seemed, was veiled in an ethereal realm of the unknown. The standing blanket became a symbol of the enigmatic and unexplained, a constant reminder that there are forces in this world that defy rational explanation. To this day, the incident remains unsolved, etched into the fabric of my memory. I continue to search for answers seeking the wisdom of those who had treated similar paths. Maybe they possess the key to unraveling the secrets of the extraordinary. So, dear reader, if you too have encountered inexplicable phenomena, I implore you to share your experiences, 
to shed light on the shadows of the unexplained. Together we may inch closer to understanding the enigmas that surround us, piecing together the puzzle of our bewildering existence, one encounter at a time. Someone pulling my hair. About a week and a half ago, a strange and unsettling phenomenon entered my life. It all began during a playgroup session with my child, where I suddenly felt a gentle tug on my hair from behind. My initial thought was that my little one was seeking my attention, so I turned around expecting to see them standing behind me. To my surprise, there was no one there except for my child, who stood about 15 feet away completely engrossed in their own activities. At that moment, I dismissed the incident as a fleeting sensation and continued conversing with the other mothers, not giving it much significance. However, little did I know that this peculiar occurrence was destined to repeat itself multiple times over the next 10 days. In fact, it happened to me on at least 20 separate occasions. Each time, I would feel that distinct tug on my hair, as if someone were gently pulling it from behind. At first, I rationalized it as a consequence of my long hair getting entangled in my clothing. Perhaps, I thought, it was getting caught on my bra or some sort of other article of clothing, causing the peculiar sensation. Yet, my perspective shifted drastically one evening, as I emerged from the shower, standing there completely naked and vulnerable. To my astonishment and dismay, the hair-pulling phenomenon occurred once again, leaving me perplexed and unnerved. What struck me as well, particularly unsettling was the fact that these hair-pulling episodes seemed to manifest themselves not only in the comfort of my own home, but also in public spaces, such as stores and other crowded areas. I would find myself being tugged at by an unseen force, surrounded by a sea of oblivious strangers. The sensation was almost the same, soft, deliberate, and eerily reminiscent of a child seeking attention a sensation that I knew all too well from my own child's playful antics. As the frequency of these hair-pulling incidents continued to escalate, so did my concern. While I cannot claim to be gripped by paralyzing fear, I must convince that each occurrence sends an uncomfortable shiver down my spine. The inexplicable nature of the phenomenon leaves me with a nagging sense of unease and a myriad of unanswered questions. I find myself yearning for answers, seeking solace and validation by reaching out into the well by reaching out to others who may have experienced something similar have you ever encountered such a bewildering phenomenon do you know of anyone who had endured comparable hair pulling episodes if so i implore you to share your knowledge and insights what could possibly explain these inexplicable occurrences that have disrupted the peace and tranquility of my life in my quest for understanding i've embarked on a journey of exploration Delving to the realm of the paranormal and the unknown, I have immersed myself in countless stories and anecdotes of unexplained occurrences, desperately searching for a semblance of clarity. Yet, as often the case with such enigmatic phenomena, the answers remain elusive, the truth concealed within the shadows. For now, I continue to navigate this unsettling hair-pulling phenomenon with a mixture of curiosity, trepidation, and a determination to unravel all the mysterious origins, and I remain vigilant, documenting each occurrence in meticulous detail, hoping that one day the pieces of this perplexing puzzle will all fall into place. If you possess any insights or have encountered similar inexplicable events, I beseech you to share your wisdom. Let us join forces in our pursuit of truth as we strive to shed light on the shadows that surround us and uncover the enigmatic nature of these hair-raising experiences. I don't know what just happened. I'm currently laying in my bed and it's 1.43 a.m. I was scrolling through my phone aimlessly passing the time when I noticed something peculiar happening outside my window. The clock read 1.23 a.m. and a sudden flash of blue light caught my attention. It was a vibrant blue color and it seemed to be coming from right outside my window, which was directly above my bed. I couldn't help but feel a wave of fear wash over me as I stared at the light. It was as if the light was staring back at me, threatening me. 
I knew that it was ridiculous to be frightened by a simple blue light, but the more I looked at it, the more I felt like something sinister was happening. I decided to close the window, thinking that it'd be a good idea to shut out whatever was causing the light, and as I reached out to close it, I noticed something strange. It felt like someone or something was holding the window from the other side. I started to panic, and that's when I felt a cold grip wrap around my wrist. My heart racing, I tried to pull my hand away from whatever was holding me, but it was too strong. I could feel my pulse pounding in my ears as I struggled, but eventually I managed to force the window shut. I let out a deep breath, feeling relieved that I had succeeded in closing it. But even though the window was shut, I couldn't be shaking that feeling that something was still out there watching me. The fear that had gripped me earlier was still there, lingering like a bad taste in my mouth. I lay in bed unable to sleep, my mind racing with thoughts of what could have caused the blue light and the strange presence that held me captive for a moment. As I lie here in the dark, I can't help but wonder what other mysterious and eerie events might occur in the night. The darkness of the night only heightens the feeling of the unknown and the inexplicable, and I'm left with an unsettling feeling that I might not be alone after all. Every night, one of two rooms, my dog raises her ears and stares. I've been noticing something strange happening with my dogs for years now, and I can't seem to shake it off. It all starts with their behavior in two specific rooms in my house. My bedroom and the laundry room. Whenever my dogs are in those rooms, they start staring and moving their heads around, as if following something that I can't see. This alone is enough to make me feel extremely weird and uncomfortable, especially at night or in the dark in general, but there's just something about these two rooms that freak me out and I can't quite put my finger on it. But it's not just their strange behavior that makes me uneasy. Sometimes I feel like I'm seeing things too. I know it sounds crazy, but there have been times that I've seen things out of the corner of my eye or felt like there was something in the room with me. I try to brush it off as my mind playing tricks, but the feeling lingers. Now let's get back to my dogs. All three of them exhibit this strange behavior in those two rooms. And it's not a rare occurrence. In fact, I'd say it happens more than 40% of the time. They'll stare, move their heads around, and sometimes even growl. It's enough to make me wonder what could be causing all this. I've been asking myself this question for years now, and I still don't have an answer. Is it possible that there's something paranormal going on in those rooms? Could it be a ghost or some other entity lurking around, causing my dogs to react this way? Or am I just overthinking things and there's a logical explanation for this all? Whatever the case may be, I can't shake off this feeling of unease whenever I'm in those two rooms and it's like there's something there that I can't see. But I can definitely feel it, and I just hope that one day I'll be able to figure out what's going on and put my mind at ease. Our house wasn't haunted, it was just visited. Growing up, I had the misfortune of living next door to an old cemetery in a small town. Even though the cemetery was very old, people were still being buried there. My family's experience living next to the cemetery were nothing short of strange and unexplainable. As my parents worked until 6 p.m., my brother and I would get off the school bus between 3 3 30 p.m. and would be home alone. Every day we'd get off the bus and wait until it left before casually walking into our house and going about our routines. However, some days we'd hear children's voices coming from our backyard, even though there were no other houses nearby with kids. Our house was surrounded by cornfields and the cemetery next door, which always made us feel uneasy and kind of nervous. My little brother would act like it didn't bother him, but I know he felt it too. We stopped checking the yard for children and just ran inside and after a while. It was just a strange occurrence that happened almost every afternoon. My brother's night terrors started getting worse. His screams would wake us all up at night in a panic, thinking someone was hurt or worse. One day I asked him if he remembered what he dreamt about, and he told me that he'd scream just so he could move and he'd be paralyzed facing his closet, where his clothes would be turning into bodies hanging from nooses. It was always the same people just hanging there and looking at him. Another terror he had involved a man who would appear in his bedroom door. 
walk to the window across the room, stand there before slowly vanishing. The man would reappear at the door and continue this cycle until my brother would scream himself out of it. Years later, I recall coming home one night. My parents were out, and my brother had all the lights on in the house, the TV, music, everything. I found him on the floor, trembling and crying. After I calmed him down, he told me that there was something in the basement. I looked over, and he had the door blocked with one of her dining room chairs. I told him to stay there and that I'd check it out. I moved the chair, opened the door, and looked down the stairs, and I saw it too. At the bottom of the stairs, there was what looked like a girl. She was on her hands and knees with her long hair covering her face. She was looking down at the floor, but facing the stairs. I was able to muster up a, who is that, or something like that, and her head flipped up, and I mean flipped. It was not a human movement, and I didn't stand there long enough to get a good look at her face. I grabbed my brother and told him to get in my car. We left and didn't come home until we knew our parents were home. We never saw that one again, but she has stuck with me. There is so much more to this story, but who has the time to read all that? My brother's blocked out everything that happened, and he won't talk about her childhood ghosts with me anymore. It's almost as if he's trying to forget everything that we experienced living next to that cemetery. I learned later that the cemetery was having issues with new burials. The bodies would be shifting underground, and the maps that the town have are inaccurate. When they'd go to dig up a plot, sometimes there's already someone buried there. It's a chilling realization that her driveway sits right over the cemetery, according to Google Maps. The experiences I had while growing up next to a cemetery had a profound impact on my life. Even after so many years have passed, I still can't forget the strange and unexplainable things that happened to me and my family. All these experiences have left a lasting impression on me, and I can't help but feel that they have influenced the person that I am today. The Haunting of a Hotel I'm an avid traveler, and I've been staying at numerous hotels, but none of them have left me with feeling shaken or terrified as my last experience at a hotel in Istanbul. Let me take you through my unforgettable and bone-chilling experience. It was a beautiful day when I arrived in Istanbul, Turkey. I checked into a hotel a charming boutique hotel located in the city's historic district. The hotel was housed in a century-old building with a rich history, and I was immediately captivated by its old-world charm. The hotel staff was friendly and the atmosphere was welcoming. Little did I know that I was about to encounter something far beyond my imagination. On my first night, I started experiencing strange things. At first, it was just small things like faucets in my bathroom turning on by themselves, Objects moving inexplicably, and eerie whispers echoing through the halls late at night. I brushed them off as my imagination playing tricks on me, but as the days went on, the encounters intensified. One night, I woke up to the sensation of someone sitting on the edge of my bed, but when I looked around, there was no one there. Another night, I heard footsteps pacing outside my door, but when I opened it, the hallway was empty. I couldn't shake off the feeling of being watched and the air in the hotel seemed to be constantly charged with an otherworldly energy. As I ventured deeper into the hotel, I discovered that this hotel had a dark past. It was said to be built on an ancient burial ground. The locals whispered of a tragic incident that occurred there years ago. Legend had that it was a family that was brutally murdered in the hotel and their spirit still haunted the premises. Determined to uncover the truth, delved into the hotel's history and discovered chilling details. There were reports of unexplained deaths, strange occurrences, and guests who had checked out abruptly, unable to bear the paranormal activity present there. The hotel staff seemed to be tight-lipped about the incidents, but their nervous glances spoke volumes. As my stay continued, the encounters grew more intense. I heard disembodied voices whispering my name, saw shadows darting in and out of the corners, and witnessed objects moving on their own. The atmosphere in the hotel became suffocating, and I found it hard to sleep or even feel at ease. One fateful night as I lay in bed, I saw a figure standing at the foot of my bed, staring at me with empty eyes. My heart pounding in my chest as I tried to scream, but my voice was silenced. 
The figure disappeared before my eyes, but the terror remained. With my nerves frayed and my sanity questioned, I decided to check out of that hotel the next day, desperate to escape the malevolent presence that had tormented me throughout my stay. As I left the hotel, I couldn't shake off the feeling that something had followed me out, a cold presence lingering on my shoulder. I shared my bone-chilling experience with a few Turkish friends, warning others about the haunted hotel. I was shocked when others shared their encounters and experiences at the hotel. Some claimed to have had pretty much the same story that I had, while others vowed to never stay there again. To this day, I can't explain the inexplicable events that occurred at the hotel, but I am certain that I encountered something beyond the realms of the natural world. My story serves as a cautionary tale for those who dare to stay at that hotel, a place where the veil between the living and the dead seems to be disturbingly thin. I'm pretty sure my grandma crashes one of my video games. For the majority of my life, my grandmother resided with my parents and me. Her presence was an ever-present source of comfort and guidance. However, in the year 2020, she passed away peacefully in her basement apartment, leaving an immense void in my heart. Coping with her loss has proven to be an arduous journey as absence is keenly felt in every aspect of my life. Curiously, we've experienced a series of peculiar occurrences within the confines of the basement. It was my sister who first encountered an inexplicable incident when she ventured downstairs. As she stood amidst the collection of old clown figures, one of them suddenly toppled off the shelf without any discernible cause. The event left her startled and questioning the laws of the physical realm. On another occasion, I found myself sitting alone in the basement, enveloped by a tranquil ambience. It was during the festive season and a beautiful adorned Christmas tree stood as a centerpiece. To my astonishment, as if moved by some unseen force, the ornaments hanging from the branches began shaking uncontrollably. It was as though an invisible hand was orchestrating an eerie dance of the decorations. I couldn't help but wonder if it was my grandmother's way of making her presence known. In my moments of grief, seeking solace, I turned to a cherished photograph of my beloved grandmother hanging on a wall. Engaging in a form of therapeutic conversation, I poured out my emotions, sharing anecdotes and expressing my deepest longing for her guidance. To my astonishment, as if in response to my heartfelt words, the picture inexplicably illuminated, casting a soft glow that enveloped the frame. It was an ethereal moment one that stirred both awe and a sense of connection beyond the veil of mortality. However, it was New Year's Eve, that fateful year 2020, that an incident occurred which remains etched in my memory. Isolated due to the pandemic, I resigned myself to spending the evening engrossed in the world of video games. As the clock ticked closer to the midnight hour, my fatigue began to weigh heavily upon me. Thoughts of retiring for the night crossed my mind, but the allure of the game proved too difficult to resist. In a moment of indecision contemplating the consequences of my late-night indulgence, a sudden and inexplicable event transpired. In an instant, my game abruptly shut off, plunging the room into darkness. An unfamiliar error message flashed across the screen, one that I'd never encountered before and I've yet to witness since that incident. It was as though a higher force intervened, urging me to relinquish my nocturnal pursuits and seek the rest that my weary body desperately needed. The message was clear. My grandmother, even in the realm beyond, was still watching over me, offering her gentle guidance and reminding me of the importance of self-care. These occurrences, though unexplainable by conventional means, have left an indelible mark upon my psyche. It seems that my grandmother, in her ethereal form, continues to assume the role of a loving parent, nurturing and safeguarding me even from beyond the grave. While the mysteries of the afterlife remain beyond the grasp of human understanding, the comforting presence of my grandmother serves as a beacon of reassurance, reminding me that love transcends the boundaries of life and death. I 
feel like I'm going crazy and I don't know what to do. Shadow Hat Man. It was a few nights ago when I experienced something that still sends shivers down my spine. I was driving home at around 8.30 p.m. with my furry friend, my dog, on my lap and her head out the car window. I had just turned the corner in the parking lot of my condo heading toward my parking spot when I caught sight of a large shadow from the corner of my eye and my driver's side. My heart skipped a beat and I panicked, thinking I had almost hit someone. I quickly turned to look at the shadow, but to my surprise, there was nothing there. I was only driving about 10 miles an hour since I was in a parking lot. My dog didn't react at all. I was about to shrug it off when my driver's side blind spot sensor went off, indicating that something was there. I looked at my side mirror and saw a tall shadow figure with red glowing eyes running after my car just like a human. I was horrified and I sped up, but the creature seemed to be keeping pace with me. The side center stayed on the entire time and I could see the creature until I pulled into my parking spot. I was trembling with fear as I was pretty sure that I was going to die when I got out, but to my surprise, nothing was there. I walked over to the area where I first saw it there was nothing to be found. My dog never reacted, which made me wonder. Maybe it was just my imagination. But the sensor was not my imagination, and I saw it out of the corner of my eye before the sensor went off. This wasn't the first encounter with the creature. I've had two other experiences that felt like and looked like the same thing, and both were sleep paralysis. I had heard of the hat man or shadow people before my sleep encounters, but found out about them and looking them up and stuff. I attributed my experiences to sleep paralysis, and at that time my now husband and I had just moved into the condo, and both times it happened is when he had left early for work and I was still asleep. In my dream state, I thought some man had broken in and he was going to attack me, and both times my husband had forgotten to lock the front door. I told him I was feeling paranoid and to please remember to lock the door. And after that, I never really remember it happening again until now, which is about three years later, and I was awake. It feels like whatever it is, it's the same creature. It's hard to describe, but it feels malicious, like it wants to hurt me. It feels like I'm going crazy. I've been having dreams of it chasing me for years. And I somehow know that it's a man chasing me, but I never see him. And in my dreams, I'm always running and hiding for my life. The strange thing is, is that I've been running in this recurring dream for as long as I can remember. And lately, I feel like I'm being watched. And when I walk my dog at night, I swear I hear footsteps every time I turn around. Nothing. I'm constantly searching for similar experiences online but I can't seem to find anything on shadow people chasing others. Do you think I'm just paranoid? Or has anyone else had similar experiences? I feel like I'm just going crazy and I don't know what to do. Care Home Ghosts But let me tell you, this particular incident truly solidified my belief in the existence of the other side. It was an ordinary day at the care facility where I worked, when a resident sadly passed away. We followed the usual protocol, gently washing and redressing the departed soul, and then laying them to rest, awaiting the arrival of the coroner and the subsequent transport to the funeral home. As I attended the needs of the resident in the neighboring room, attending to their care and ensuring their comfort, an eerie sound caught my attention. The sound of water running. Not just a gentle trickle. It was a loud, rushing noise that echoed through the hallway. Intrigued and slightly unnerved, I followed the source of the sound, which led me to a room of the deceased resident. To my astonishment, the windows in the room were covered in a thick layer of condensation, as if someone had been breathing heavily against them. It was a chilling day, and there was no reasonable explanation for this peculiar phenomenon. With a sense of trepidation, I cautiously entered the bathroom attached to the room. What awaited me inside sent shivers down my spine. All the taps were turned on, gushing water relentlessly, 
and the shower was on full blast, creating a torrential downpour within the small enclosed space. It was a sight that defied logic and defied any rational explanation. What could this be? No one has been in that room after we prepared the resident for their final journey. Yet here I stood, witnessing an inexplicable manifestation. To make matters even more unsettling, I noticed that the deceased's resident's body had shifted a few inches down the bed from the position that we had carefully placed her. It was as if the unseen force had moved her, defying the laws of physics and challenging the boundaries of our understanding. In that moment, a chill ran down my spine and an overwhelming feeling of unease enveloped me. The hair on the back of my neck stood on end as I grappled with the undeniable reality before my eyes. The existence of the supernatural, the presence of spirits beyond our realm, this became an undeniable truth. Needless to say, this encounter left me profoundly shaken. The incident shattered my skepticism and replaced it with an unwavering belief in the existence of the other side. From that day forward, I couldn't help but wonder about the mysteries that lie beyond our mortal existence, the enigmatic forces that may roam among us. As I reflect on that chilling experience, I'm reminded of the fragility of our understanding of the vastness of the unknown. It serves as a constant reminder that there are phenomena in this world that defy explanation, inviting us to question and explore and embrace the mysteries that surround us. So my friends, I share this story with you, not merely as a tale of the supernatural, but as a testament to the power of first-hand experiences and the profound impact that they can have on our beliefs and perceptions. May it serve as a reminder that sometimes, in the face of inexplicable events, the line between the physical and the metaphysical blurs, and we are left to contemplate the existence of a realm beyond our own. My Grandma's Ghost Story During my high school years, my grandma shared a story with me that occurred around nine years prior. Although I don't recall every single detail, the essential parts have remained etched in my memory. Let me start by saying that my grandma is a bit eccentric, you know? She's not into drugs or anything, but her mental stability has always been somewhat questionable. However, when she recounted this tale, she seemed more grounded and I genuinely couldn't fathom a reason for her to be fabricating such a story. Back when she was a young girl, roughly between the ages of 10 and 13, she lived with her mother. Occasionally, her uncle would reside downstairs in their home. However, during the incident I'm about to describe, he wasn't living there. Nevertheless, my grandma ventured downstairs one day to fetch some potatoes for her mom. As she flicked on the light, a chilling sight awaited her an image forever imprinted in her mind. There in the middle of the room sat her uncle on a chair. She attempted to greet him, but there was no response. He simply sat there, fixated on some unseen point in space, his gaze empty and devoid of life. Bewildered, she made her way back upstairs and relayed the peculiar encounter to her mother, stating, I didn't know uncle was staying with us at this moment. Naturally, her mom's reply was puzzling. He isn't. This revelation only deepened the mystery. My grandma insisted. Well, I just saw him downstairs, sitting in the middle of the room. Intrigued and perhaps a bit unsettled, intrigued and perhaps a bit unsettled, her mom cautiously ventured halfway down the stairs to investigate. To her astonishment, there were no sign of her brother anywhere. The room lay vacant, devoid of any presence. Now both my grandma and her mother were deeply connected to the spiritual realm, open to the possibilities that extended beyond her earthly understanding. With a shared sense of curiosity, they decided to take matters into their own hands. They got into the car and drove down the road a short distance to a trailer where her uncle had been residing. Dread and anticipation hung heavy in the air as they arrived. What they discovered inside would forever haunt their memories. There, lying lifeless on the floor of the trailer, was her uncle, his soul claimed by a sudden heart attack. The revelation was both shocking and chilling. How could my grandma have seen him on her own house, seemingly alive, moments before he passed away? 
The inexplicable nature of the experience left them grappling with questions that they had no rational answers for. It was as if a glimpse into an ethereal plane had been granted to my grandma, a haunting encounter that transcended the boundaries of our mortal existence. As the years have passed, the story remained etched in my consciousness, a testament to the inexplicable mysteries that surround us. It serves as a constant reminder of the thin veil that separates our world from the unknown realms that lie beyond, reminding us to remain open to the possibilities that exist beyond our comprehension. The tale my grandma shared during my high school days continues to ignite my imagination, sparking a curiosity that propels me to explore the depths of the unexplained and to seek solace in the enigmatic tapestry of our total existence. Weird screeching in my house. I've been renting a house with my wife for around three years now. And I have to say, it's been a great experience. It's everything we ever wanted, a full house to ourselves, and we're loving it. Recently, I started a new job on night shift. I got home around 5.30 a.m., and my wife was fast asleep. I decided to unwind by playing some games on my PC. However, at around 5.45 a.m., I heard a loud screech through my headphones. I took them off and looked in my room, only to find my wife was awake with her three dogs all staring at me like they were wondering what the hell was that. I went downstairs to investigate, but I couldn't find anything out of the ordinary. I was kind of confused, but I decided to go to bed anyway. The next day, my wife got home from work and walked into the room looking worried. She said, I don't know how to tell you this, but that screech that happened a couple times when you weren't home. At this point, I was starting to feel a little bit worried. I was at work and my wife was at home alone. Should I be worried? Does a house make weird noises like this sometimes? What should I do? I decided to do some research and found out that a house can indeed make strange sounds, especially if it's an older house. Some of the sounds can be explained, such as creaky floorboards, expanding pipes, or even the wind blowing through the cracks in the walls. However, there are some sounds that can't be easily explained. For instance, the screeching noise my wife and I heard. Some people might dismiss it as a figment of our imagination, but I knew that it was real. I started to worry about my wife being home alone, so I decided to install a security system. I figured that this would give me a peace of mind, knowing that she was safe and secure. I also did some research on ghost sightings, just in case there was something paranormal going on in her house. But I didn't find anything that could explain the screeching noise. Over the next few weeks, I kept hearing a strange noise in the house. It was starting to drive me crazy, and I felt like I was going to lose my mind. I couldn't concentrate on anything, and I was always on edge. My wife didn't seem to hear the noises, and I was starting to wonder if I was going insane. One night, I decided to set up a camera in the living room to see if I could catch anything on film. I turned off all the lights, and I went to bed, leaving the camera running. And the next morning, I woke up, and I checked the footage. To my surprise, I saw something moving in the living room. It was a shadowy figure, and it seemed to be moving toward the camera. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I showed the footage to my wife, and she was just as shocked as I was. We decided to call a paranormal investigator to see if they could help us, and the investigator came over and did some tests, and they concluded that her house was indeed haunted by a spirit. They told us that that spirit wasn't harmful, and it was just passing through. We were relieved to hear this, but at the same time, we were still a little scared. We decided to leave the spirit alone and coexist with it. We got used to the occasional noises and strange occurrences, and we even started to feel like the spirit was a part of our family. Overall, the experience was a little unnerving, but we learned to live with it. Caught what was possibly a cryptid, attempting to enter my home uninvited. About a year ago during the summer, something really creepy happened to me. I was living in a house that had one acre of land surrounding it, and it was located near farmland. One morning, I woke up in my living room couch around 8 in the morning, 
having fallen asleep the previous night along with my mother and sister who were sleeping beside me. I had planned to watch a movie that I hadn't finished the previous night on my laptop and eat breakfast in the dining room of my house. I sat down at the end of the dining room table, which was the closest chair to the kitchen. If I leaned back in my chair, I could see into the farther side of the kitchen where the door that led into the deck was, which was a huge window next to it. So I turned on my movie and started to eat my breakfast as my dog trotted over to me and sat next to me. I think I was about 45 minutes into the movie when my dog suddenly switched spots, now sitting right under the archway that led into the kitchen, staring at something. I felt her move but didn't really think anything of it. If it was serious, she would have been barking like crazy. About 10 or 20 minutes later, I glanced over at the dog and noticed she was still staring at something, and this time I heard shuffling and scratching over in the kitchen. I called out her name, but she didn't move. When I walked over to investigate, I followed her trail of vision and noticed that she was staring at the window in the kitchen that leads to the deck of the house. I nearly shit myself when I saw something or somebody behind the window outside peeping through the blinds. I forgot to mention that there was a chair on the deck right under that specific window. So whatever the hell that was had to have been balancing on the chair to look inside. It looked bald almost and was white with a pinkish tone. It had been holding into the window frame, peering at my dog and me while scratching the screen on the window with this horrible heavy breathing. I remember thinking in the moment that it was a person trying to break in because whatever he was, he wanted to get in desperately. The thing was sort of small and seemed as if it didn't want me to see the rest of its face, only its eyes. The whole time my dog had been watching whatever this thing was and not barking. I'm saying this because something as simple as dropping a cup will send my dog into a fit, barking like crazy. Even a voice coming from TV would, maybe a couple minutes of barking would come from her after that. As I said, I believed someone was trying to get in, so I ran over to the couch in the living room, shaking my mother awake and bringing her to the kitchen. And of course, whatever the hell it was had simply disappeared. I would have thought I was losing my mind if my dog hadn't seen the same thing as me. I peered out another window, checking the driveway in case it was a person who had driven a car here, but there was nothing of the sort. My mother went out into the deck and looked around, but there was nothing except for fingerprints on the window frame. We checked around the whole yard and found nothing except the prints. I'm still traumatized to this day, knowing that whatever that was was watching me for quite a while and I didn't know. And also, the fact that if it was a person, it would take a while to get off the land, even if they tried running away. We would have caught them. There's a huge yard. Spirit kitties are real? In our humble house, we are fortunate to be blessed with the delightful presence of three feline companions. Each cat possesses its own unique coat of fur, allowing us to easily differentiate among them. The first, a charming combination of black and white, exudes elegance with its contrasting colors. The second, a graceful blend of gray and white, bears additional hues that adorn its coat in a captivating manner. Lastly, we have a captivating brown and black striped tabby with pristine white underside, which never fails to charm us with its enchanting appearance. On this particular evening, as the night cast its gentle veil upon her household, our three precious cats found themselves nestled comfortably in bed alongside my beloved wife and our cherished three-month-old daughter. Curiosity piqued with me. I couldn't resist the urge to take a peek at this adorable scene before undertaking the task that awaited me. Engrossed in my nocturnal pursuits, I found myself deeply engrossed in the completion of a magnificent Lego set. However, my devoted wife called them upon me, requesting that I fulfill a vital duty to tidy up the remnants of our scrumptious dinner once I had satisfied my own hunger. This is written very weird. Our well-appointed kitchen stands as a central hub within our home, adjoined by entrances from both the family room and the dining room, each situated at opposite ends of the culinary domain. As I diligently carried my bowl and its assortment of utensils from the stove to the sink, an unexpected spectacle unfolded before my eyes with remarkable clarity. Emanating from the family room, a feline creature, or a cat, 
distinct in appearance due to its noticeable darker fur color, dashed into the kitchen with unparalleled swiftness. I anticipated a gentle wag of its tail or perhaps a fleeting gust of wind as a result of its rapid movements. Yet to my surprise, there was nothing but stillness in the air, as if the moment had frozen. Just as I shifted my gaze from the stove to attend the final item requiring cleansing, an astonishing occurrence transpired before me. Another of our dear feline companions darted down the hallway, mirroring the resemblance of our black and white cat yet boasting a distinctive arrangement of colors. Astonishment filled me as being as I relayed this remarkable sighting to my wife, who, meanwhile, was engrossed in nursing our precious daughter. Intriguingly, she admitted to glimpsing at the cat with black and white markings out of the corner of her eye, describing it as having a touch of elegance and akin to a tuxedo pattern. With each passing moment, the mystery surrounded our beloved cat seemed to deepen, their comings and goings becoming increasingly enigmatic. As I contemplated this extraordinary revelation, I couldn't help but marvel at the unique personalities that each of our feline companions possessed. Their captivating appearances, synchronized with their whimsical behavior, truly made them integral members of our loving family. And so, as I continued my nocturnal activities, I remained captivated by the magical presence of our three extraordinary cats, eager to uncover the secrets they held within our enigmatic gazes. My name is written in dust on shelves. The backstory to my current situation is that my beloved mother passed away unexpectedly in 2019 due to a sudden illness. As life moved forward, I found myself residing in the very house we once shared, navigating the unfamiliar territory of a fresh relationship. Everything seemed new and filled with promise of a different chapter unfolding. However, one morning, a peculiar occurrence caught my attention, altering the course of my thoughts. I noticed atop a dusty shelf the first three letters of my name clearly spelled out, as if someone had delicately traced them with their fingertips. The dust was thick, but the letters remained pristine, unaffected by smudging. At first I brushed it off, thinking it was perhaps just my girlfriend's way of expressing her unique and playful nature. Nevertheless, today we engaged in a cleansing spree. I stumbled upon my name once again, inscribed in the fine layer of dust on a lower shelf. This time it wasn't just three letters, it was my entire first name, unmistakably etched into the surface. I couldn't help but notice that the first letters had materialized right beside the spot where I kept my tarot cards, while the second set of letters emerged near the area where I typically light incense. Perplexed by this mysterious phenomenon, we turned to our mutual friends and anyone who had ventured upstairs within the past month, hoping for a logical explanation. Yet, no one claimed responsibility for this inexplicable writing in dust. The realization struck me with a strange sense of specificity. After all, it seemed rather peculiar that someone would inscribe another person's name not once but twice in such an unconventional manner. As I racked my brain for rational explanations, I found myself at a loss. I'm not the one to readily entertain the idea of spirits or supernatural occurrences. It's simply not my inclination. However, the evidence before me defied any logical reasoning I could conjure. The notion of living in a house where the ghostly presence of my mother could potentially be lingering, especially while I indulged in my guilty pleasure of watching Top Gear, felt disconcerting and out of sync with my worldview. Desperate for answers and a return to a sense of normalcy, my partner and I yearned to discover the obvious explanation that had thus far eluded our grasp. The last thing we desired was the presence of any spirits, be they benevolent or otherwise, disrupting the sanctuary of our home. We craved a resolution that could put our restless minds at ease, allowing us to move forward without the unsettling sensation that my mother's ghost might be watching over me, even during moments of mundane indulgence. Thus, my quest for clarity and peace within the confines of our shared abode continues. I remain hopeful that with time, and perhaps a stroke of logical insight, 
The enigma surrounding the mysterious inscriptions will be unraveled, restoring harmony to our lives and dissolving the lingering uncertainty that has taken root within the walls that once housed the bond between my mother and me. The Figure with Teeth in the Dark So let me take you to time about six years ago. I was just 12 years old, and I was fresh from school and ready to unwind. I had my lunch and plopped myself down in front of the television engrossed in my favorite cartoon. You know, back when TV was still a thing. My parents were out and my grandma was taking a nap in her room. Now, as I sat there, something caught my attention in the peripheral vision. At first, I tried to ignore it completely absorbed in my show, but then I felt a strange movement in the room. I turned my gaze and my eyes locked onto the teeth of a person. It was a shocking sight, a black figure with a wide, eerie smile. The figure appeared to be a woman, and I was taken back. I couldn't move, frozen in place by fear. I kept staring at this mysterious woman for what felt like an eternity. But in reality, it was only about five seconds, and then she started moving towards me. That's when I reached my breaking point. I shouted, fuck this shit, jumped to my feet, raced toward the figure, slammed the door shut, and bolted into our backyard. My mind was in disarray. I couldn't gather myself, couldn't catch my breath. I continuously glanced back at the house, checking every door and window, terrified that something might be following me took me a good ten minutes to finally calm down. No cap. Only then did I gather the courage to go back inside. To my relief, the door was still closed, a reassuring sign that whatever is happening was contained. I mustered up the nerve to check on my grandma, who appeared to be peacefully sleeping. Although I wanted to wake her up and tell her about the horrifying encounter, I found myself unable to do so. I can't explain why, but I simply sat in front of the TV, staring blankly at my favorite show, desperately trying to brush off the fear and hoping that it was all just a terrible nightmare. But it wasn't a nightmare. It was real. After a while, my parents returned home and their presence brought with me a sense of security. I immediately called up to my friend and spilled out the entire story, recounting every chilling detail. Strangely enough, I eventually forgot about the incident. I can't explain how or why it happened, but I never mentioned it to my parents until just a month ago. It was a horror movie that triggered and buried my memory within me. Suddenly the image of that figure with its menacing teeth resurfaced, and I decided to confide in my parents. However, they refused to believe me. Can you blame them? After all, I'd kept the secret for six long years, and they concluded that it must have been a mere dream. But my friends, bless their heart, remembered it vividly. They confirmed that what I experienced was undeniably real, so it wasn't just a figment of my imagination. Still, I never encountered anything like it again, except for a strange night that occurred just last week. And now, here I am, sharing this tale with you, hoping to shed light on the inexplicable encounter and maybe find some answers. Ouija Board Spirit Children When I was 11, my best friend Emma and I went to Lake Tahoe for a week with her family. We stayed in a cabin with three rooms, and we got bored easily without modern-day entertainment. So, Emma's mom suggested we look for a board game in the closet. That's where we found a Ouija board. Now, my mom and grandma had used Ouija boards and tarot cards, and I'd grown up with many ghost experiences, so when I saw that old dusty board... I thought it would be fun to use it. Little did I know that it would be a life-changing experience. Emma and I used the board to contact three spirits who were all children. The first one, Jane, was a girl around my age who had been a minor child star and died in an accident. She was a loving and pure spirit, and I felt a connection with her. The second spirit was an older boy, maybe 12 or 13. He who had died in the 1970s or maybe early 80s and a young girl around eight years old from the 1870s. 
The boy seemed to be looking after the girl. They were always together. We took a photo of them, and in it, you can see two of the spirits very clearly. The boy was wearing a t-shirt with a beach logo and shorts from around 1980, while the girl was wearing a long-sleeved dress that hit her ankles and a bonnet, like someone from Little House on the Prairie. She was leaning into the boy, who seemed to be her protector. When I showed the photo to my mom, she took it for safe keeping, but I never found it again. I hoped to find the negatives and get the photo printed again, as it was clear and showed so much detail. During our trip, we connected with these spirits and became friends, as much as an 11-year-old with a Ouija board and a dream can. We used the board all the time and we told spirits, bad spirits, were trying to get through, but we were being blocked out by the good spirits that we had called for. The bad spirits were attached to the cabin, but couldn't make direct contact unless we helped them. One year later, I used the Ouija board with another friend, and we connected with Jane again. I checked up on her every so often over the years, feeling a strong sense of protection and love from her. The other two spirits were also loving, but Jane's spirit was the strongest, with a bright white light around her. I later learned that she was quite a philanthropist and a little activist, and I felt like she would have made a lot of change if she had still been alive. There was some weird activity during our Ouija board sessions, and the good spirits told us that the bad spirits were trying to get through but were being blocked out. There was a struggle, but the good spirits were holding the door shut with all their strength to spend time with us. I got the feeling that they'd interacted with the other kids and for a long time that they were genuinely good spirits. They were like literal angels, and their energy and love were so strong that it was palpable. Writing this out made me realize the magnitude of the experience. We were scared at the time, but looking back, it was incredible. I felt a connection with these spirits, and they protected us from the bad ones. I don't think I'll ever forget that experience. It was life-changing. The Ghost at the Office I had the opportunity to work in an old house in the west of the U.S. It was built in 18, sorry, 1915 and converted into an office. It was located in a historical town that was also a popular tourist destination. The house was called the Admin House, where a group of around 12 people, including me, worked for a larger company in the region. Since people's schedules were not consistent, we often found ourselves alone in the house with just a few others. But we didn't like being alone due to the belief that it was haunted by the spirit of a woman. The CEO's office was known as the hotspot for ghostly activity. Sometimes the basement, too. The activity usually occurred in the early morning or late afternoon when you were alone and maybe only other few people were in the office. While working at my computer in the quiet admin house, I often heard a deep inhale and dramatic sigh of a woman coming from the CEO's office. Sometimes the sound of a chair being moved or papers shuffling would accompany the sighs. Knowing that the CEO was not in the office, I would get chills every time this happened. I would get up and look in the office finding no one there, and sometimes paper would be scattered on the floor. Other employees started taking notice to these strange happenings too. One time the HR lady came up from the basement asking if anyone had just come down there. She heard the basement door open and close and then heard a woman give out a big sigh. Getting up to look, she found nobody there. None of us wanted to go into the basement who were there working at the time. Some of the more bizarre happenings were when I had come into the office alone on a Sunday to finish up a report due the following day. After a few minutes of logging onto my computer, I started to hear opera music. But the music sounded like it was being played on an old phonograph with scratchy noises. At first I thought it was coming from outside and continued working, but after a couple minutes of this music stopping and then returning, I suddenly realized that it was coming from the CEO's office. Weirded out, I got up and walked toward the office. As I approached, the music was getting louder and I heard a woman sigh. Just as I heard the sigh, the music abruptly stopped. I looked in the office and it was empty. The CEO's computer was not even in the room since she took it home. 
The last encounter I will share was when it was just me and the CFO at the office. The CFO was coming out of the bathroom when she heard someone calling her name from the CEO's office. She went into the CEO's office and then came out with a freaked out look on her face. No one was there, but the woman audibly called out her name. It was just the two of us at the office, and this experience creeped us out enough to make us done for the day and leave the house. Despite working there for two years, I never got used to the unexplained things in the admin house. It was clear to me that there was something paranormal happening, and I'm still not quite sure what it was, but I do know that I wouldn't want to be alone in that office at any time of the day or night. My house is haunted. When I was eight years old, my family moved into a house that seemed like a normal house at first, but there was something about it that felt eerily familiar to me. Despite having never set foot in that house before, I knew where everything was and everything felt super familiar. A few months after moving in, I started having recurring dreams of me wandering around the house. Although these dreams probably don't mean anything, they felt so real that I would wake up feeling like I had spent hours wandering around the house. And in these dreams, I never felt alone. Whenever I turned my head, I would see something peeking at me. The dreams eventually stopped, but I always felt like I wasn't alone in a room. My dogs would bark at corners in the house, and my older sister claimed to feel something living in her room. For a while, nothing really happened, until a couple of years ago, when I was 13. I began hearing whispering whenever I was alone in the house, and I started seeing shadows when no one was around. Objects like balls would roll on their own, and although I initially thought it was just the wind moving them, my dogs would bark at something next to the ball. Other objects would also be in different places than where I left them, like stuffed animals or the TV remote. I even heard running in footsteps at times, always running to my location in the house. Despite my attempts to tell my family about all the strange occurrences, only my older sister believed me. Although the stuff that I was seeing never happened to her, she could feel a presence in her room at times, but one of the weirdest things happened when I moved into the room downstairs. The room in our basement is the biggest room in our house, and since I'm the last kid living at home, my parents decided to give it to me. There's a back door down there that connects to the dog area that I keep locked because it makes me feel safe. And sometimes I'll exit through that door to pick up dog poop or something different. And most of the time I'll lock the door back up, but I've forgotten to do so about a dozen times. When I forget to lock the door, I'm getting ready to go to sleep. I'll hear this sort of tapping. And the tapping only happens when the door is unlocked. At first, the tapping sounds like it's outside. But when I get up to go to the door to investigate, it sounds like the tapping is coming from somewhere else. When I lock the door, the tapping stops immediately. I don't know if this is something like a reminder telling me to lock the door or something else entirely. Most of this stuff happens when I'm alone. It happens to me. And if I am with someone and I hear whispers or footsteps, no one else can hear it, just me. I know if this is a friendly ghost or something malicious, but it hasn't hurt anyone yet. However, if it's targeting me, since I'm the only one who here who happens to be able to hear it and interact with it, maybe something else is going on that's... Definitely something that concerns me deeply. To add to the mystery, this house is fairly new and has only had one other family living in it before us, but no one in that family died. My sister says it could be a ghost of my biological dad. I was adopted and he passed away when I was a baby, but I don't think it's him. Nonetheless, I can't shake off the feeling that there's something supernatural going on in my house. Beginning of a real-life horror movie. About four years ago, I had the unfortunate experience of breaking my foot pretty badly. As a result, I had to spend a couple of months in a cast and on bed rest. During that time, I had to stay with my mom since I couldn't do it much on my own, really. I was afraid that if I got hurt again, at least my mom could help me. Two months passed by, and my mom received a phone call from a family friend that my grandmother wasn't doing too well. She was very sick and the doctors were putting her in hospice care. Then a week after, the 
the call came again, and this time it was to say farewell to Grandma. I spoke to her and told her that I loved her. She couldn't say much, but I didn't know that she was trying to say something back. It was pretty sad and emotional for me. She was in another country and I was stuck in bed. I literally couldn't do anything. She ended up passing away two days later and my mom was devastated. She had to fly out with family to another country for the funeral arrangements. She was gone for almost a month. Now, I was alone in the house completely. Granted, I was alone at times while she worked, but now it was just me and the cat. A couple of days after she left, I was on my phone in bed. It was around noon when I heard faint steps coming from the living room down the hallway. They had become loud steps walking in from what felt like circles. My heart stopped, and then came the rustling of papers as if someone was going through multiple books' pages being thrown. My first thought was that someone had broken into the house. However, I never heard a door open or a window. I mustered up the courage to get up slowly and grab a crutch. I hopped up as quietly as I could, my phone in my hand with 911 ready on the dial. I peered out of the doorway into the hallway and into the brightly sunray lit living room. The police are on their way, I yelled. Complete silence. The house was empty and there was nothing. I walked out and nothing had been moved or was out of place. I was alone in the house. Then a few days after that, my cousin came over to keep me company. We were sitting at the dining room table, and there was a doorway that led to the basement right beside it. We both turned our heads to the doorway as we heard footsteps making their way up wave towards us from the darkness. The footsteps stopped right in front of us. I turned to my cousin, whose eyes were wide open, and said, What was that? She screamed, running out of the house. I was there at the table in disbelief with the crutch in my hand. There was nothing there, and I didn't sleep in the house that day. I called my mom and told her what happened, and she said not to worry. It was probably Grandma doing her rounds to say farewell to the family. I felt a little relief since things had never happened at the house before she died. The only thing that worried me, maybe, was that she had never been to the house. But if they can travel in dreams, maybe they can travel to a house too. The house has been silent ever since, though. Ask Reddit 1 During our time in Indiana, my family and I resided in a rather eerie house. It was the epitome of a fixer-upper, and as soon as we moved in, we could tell that the previous occupants had smoked indoors for years. The walls were coated with a layer of tar and smoke residue, which we diligently wiped away. After a few years, we decided to move out, and another family took our place. Little did we know that they would make a startling discovery that would leave us all disturbed. Years after we left, the real estate agent that we had used to sell the house contacted my mother with some unsettling news. Turns out that the new homeowners had embarked on a complete renovation of the house. During this process, they stumbled upon something truly chilling. Hidden within the ceiling and walls throughout the entire house were numerous small cameras. Almost every room had one, and to their horror, they found that each bedroom had been under constant surveillance. It was a horrifying revelation. The previous occupant, as it turned out, had installed these covert cameras along with secret viewing areas in the attic. From that sinister perch, he would sit, indulging in alcohol and cigarettes while watching his own family sleep. The mere thought of such a twisted and invasive act sent shivers down my spine. The fact that we had unknowingly resided in that house, oblivious to the dark secrets hidden within its walls, was deeply unsettling. What made the situation even more chilling was that my sister's bedroom was the access point to the attic. A small door concealed within her closet led directly to that ominous space above. I distinctly remember an incident from our last time in that house when my parents had hired a babysitter one evening. The babysitter had brought her boyfriend along, as children do, and we were fooling around and deciding to explore the attic. Curiosity got the better of us and we opened the door, peering inside only to catch the sight of someone's presence. 
The fear that gripped us in that moment was indescribable, and we wasted no time fleeing downstairs. We persuaded the boyfriend to investigate, but when he ascended to the attic, he found nothing and reassured us that we were safe. In the years that followed, I didn't dwell much on that spine-chilling incident. However, when my mother recounted the details shared by the real estate agent, it all came rushing back. She informed me that she had noticed tiny holes in the ceiling during our time in the house, but had dismissed them as inconsequential. Little did we know, those inconspicuous holes were likely the surveillance points from which every move had been observed. The realization of how we had unknowingly lived in a house infested with hidden cameras and subjected to such grave invasion of privacy was deeply unsettling. This left an indelible mark on our memories, forever reminding us of the sinister secrets that can lurk behind the surface of even the most ordinary of homes. I saw a patient that didn't exist. Let me tell you a story that perplexed me for the past five years. I was just starting out practicing as a healthcare provider in a private practice. The practice had set up cameras to monitor. Front desk activity outside in the hallway for security and emergency reasons, as we were in the large metro area with a moderate to high crime rate. We utilized a very well-known yellow booking software, and one day, I received an appointment request with no insurance listed, only a name. Let's call them JD for short. The appointment request was never confirmed via phone, and JD had an international number. When JD showed up, it was a standard visit for the most part everything went smoothly. However, during the appointment, I couldn't help but notice that JD didn't have an accent despite claiming to be from a certain place. There were no distinctive markings or features other than JD's height which was well above average for either sex. The appointment ended and JD paid in cash and made no follow-up appointment. Later that day, when I sat down to do my notes, I noticed that JD was not in the note tally at all, meaning there was one patient missing from the total. I checked the system thinking that the front desk might have gotten something wrong since it was a cash note, but the appointment was not there. So I checked the booking app to pull up JD's info but the appointment wasn't there either. I asked the front desk what happened, but they didn't know what or who I was referring to. We had seen over 50 people collectively that day, so I let it slide. I did the note, but I didn't add any information other than what the patient told me, and I made note of the international number, but couldn't remember the code. A few days later, I was still thinking about the situation and remembered the cameras, I asked the front desk to look at the video with me, and to my astonishment, there was JD talking to me in the hallway and checking out the front desk, with the front desk writing the transaction on both the cash ledger and the digital ledger. All three of us were confused. The front desk did some snooping and found no record of anything or anybody by what they thought JD's name was. We called the booking company and nobody had even made an appointment for that day, at least not under my profile. I'm still rattling my brain over this. How did the appointment disappear from both our EHR and the booking software? Was it a glitch? Or was there something more sinister at play? To this day, I have no idea what happened, and I still get the chills just thinking about it. It's like JD was a ghost patient who disappeared without a trace. I've talked to my colleagues about it, and some have suggested that it was just a glitch, while others have speculated that it was a case of identity theft or fraud. Whatever the case may be, it's a mystery that I may never solve, and it still haunts me to this day. It just goes to show that sometimes even the most mundane situations can turn into a puzzling enigma that leaves you questioning every thought you knew. My daughter has been seeing a ghost since she was a toddler. When my daughter was two years old, she started seeing things no one else in the family could see. She would talk to little kids and see them appear before her. It was never scary, just unusual. Fast forward to 2018 and my daughter was eight years old. And we had just moved into a new duplex apartment complex with my son who was three and me. 
Everything seemed okay at first. I hadn't felt any bad vibes and my daughter hadn't seen a ghost in over a year. However, after two months of staying there, I walked into my daughter's room one day. And she was playing with another little girl. She told me that she met the girl last week, and she's a sad little girl. I never felt comfortable with my daughter seeing the thing that she saw. I would always tell her not to interact with them and tell them to leave her alone. But after years of experience it and seeing that nothing was harming her, I'd gotten used to it and would just talk to her about the things she saw because in reality, she couldn't help what she saw. After she told me about the little girl, I didn't hear about her for a week or so. But things started to feel different in the house, especially when my kids were gone for the weekend. At night, it would feel like someone was watching me, and I would hear noises in the attic. There was an attic in the duplex, but I never went up there, ever, because attics have always spooked me out. One night, I was watching TV, and I dozed off. The next thing I knew, my daughter was screaming and crying at the top of her lungs. I immediately jumped out of bed, thinking someone had broken into the house, and ran straight to the kids' room. When I got there, my daughter was sitting in bed, still screaming, but looking in the corner of the other side of the room. I asked her what was wrong, but she continued to scream and cry while pointing and asking, Mommy, don't you see them? I looked to where she was pointing, but I didn't see anything. She said they were playing instruments and laughing at her, and she shouted at them to leave me alone. Then she looked at me and asked what 666 meant. It was at that moment that I became enraged because my innocent child was being taunted by evil entities. I grabbed her hand, rushed to my room, and locked the door. I prayed and called to my cousin, who came over to bless the room. After almost two hours of trying to calm my child down and letting her know that she was protected, she finally fell asleep in my bed. You would think that everything would stop after a night like that, but it seemed like I had pissed one of them off. While my kid were asleep in my bed, I just fell asleep when something told me to wake up. I immediately woke up and saw a dark figure gliding over to where my daughter was sleeping. Before it could bend down to touch her, I shouted at it to leave her alone. I grabbed my Bible from under my pillow and started saying the Lord's Prayer, and the figure went away. After that night, I moved out and left all the furniture behind because I didn't want anything attached to it. We never went back to that duplex again. The experience has left me shaken, and it made me realize that there's a thin veil between our world and the spiritual world, and I'm not willing to risk my child's safety for anything. An unexplained voice called my name twice. I woke up bright and early at 5.30 in the morning, feeling refreshed and ready to start my day. I went about my usual routine of getting ready for work and taking a shower, brushing my teeth and getting dressed. Everything seemed normal until I stepped out of the bathroom and heard a deep woman's voice say my name, as clear as day. I spun around, completely confused and disoriented, trying to figure out where the voice was coming from. I looked around the room but saw nothing out of the ordinary. I then checked my phone, which was in my hand, and I noticed that it was silent and locked. I couldn't understand where the voice was coming from, as there was nothing in the bathroom that could have made such a sound. At first I thought it was just my mind playing tricks on me, so I decided to brush it off and continue getting ready for work. However, about ten minutes later, as I was walking down the hallway, I heard my name again, this time in the same neutral woman's voice but further away, coming from the bathroom. At that point, I was so scared that I almost peed my pants and I decided to leave for work early. As soon as I got to work, I messaged my flatmates about the incident, telling them that I had heard a voice say my name twice. One of my flatmates hadn't heard anything before, but the other one informed me that they had heard voices before and asked me if it came from the bathroom. He said that his encounters, he always heard murmuring, and he hadn't been able to make out any of the words. He didn't say anything at the time because he thought he was going schizophrenic or something like that. I was terrified, and I didn't know what to do. I couldn't think of any logical explanation for what had happened, and I was at a loss for how to even move forward. I'm a bit of a scaredy cat, and I wasn't sure if I wanted to go back home after work. I decided to do some research on the internet and see if I could find any similar stories, and I came across some information about paranormal activity. I started to wonder if maybe there was a ghost or some other entity in our apartment. 
and it was trying to communicate with us. I felt scared and intrigued at the same time. I couldn't shake the feeling that something strange was going on. I decided to talk to my flatmate about it and see if we could come up with a plan to investigate further. After discussing it with my flatmates, we decided to do some research on our own and see if we could try and find out if there were any reports of paranormal activity in the building or the surrounding area. We also decided to set up some cameras and audio recording devices to see if we could capture any evidence of the voices that we had heard. Over the next few days, we kept a close eye on the cameras and audio recording devices, but we didn't find any evidence of paranormal activity. We were still left with more questions than answers, and we couldn't shake the feeling that something strange was going on in our apartment. In the end, we decided to just accept that we may never know what exactly had happened that day. We moved forward, and the incident gradually became a distant memory. However, I couldn't help but wonder if there was more to the story than we even realized. I just want to understand it. When I was younger, I lived in a house that was very active with paranormal things. There were many different experiences that people shared about my house, but my experience was a little bit different. It first happened when I was around eight years old. I slept with my sister a lot because I was scared to be alone, and I was sleeping and I had this horrible dream, but it was weird. It was kind of like sleep paralysis, except I couldn't open my eyes, so everything was dark. During this, there was a deep pressure on my chest as if someone was sitting on it. I literally couldn't breathe. It was like something was holding me down and I couldn't move or scream. My sister shook me until I woke up because I was breathing funny, quote unquote. This continued to happen and happened more and more frequently. It was horrible and I couldn't understand what was happening. It felt like something was attacking me in my sleep. I would wake up gasping for air with my heart pounding and I was too scared to tell my parents because I didn't want to be seen as weak or crazy. Instead, I suffered in silence and tried to find ways to cope with the terrifying experience. As the months went by, the attacks became more frequent and intense. It was like someone or something was trying to suffocate me. I couldn't escape the feeling being held down and being unable to breathe. I was terrified to fall asleep, and I'd often stay up until the early hours of the morning just to avoid the attack. It was affecting my life, and I felt like I was losing control. Eventually, my family moved to a different house, and the attack stopped. It was like a weight had been lifted off my shoulders, and I could finally breathe again. I tried to put the experience behind me and move on with my life, but the memory of those terrifying nights stayed with me. Years later, I still wonder what could have caused those attacks. Was it a spirit or an entity that was haunting the house? Or was it just a strange medical condition that I was experiencing? I've done a lot of research on the subject, reading books and articles and attending seminars and conferences. And I've learned that sleep paralysis is a pretty common experience. But the added pressure on my chest is not. It could be possible that it was a spirit trying to communicate with me or even harm me. But I'm not really so sure. Looking back, I realized that maybe I should have been more worried about my experiences. I should have talked to someone about it and sought help. I was too afraid to share what was happening to me, and it took a toll on my mental and physical health. It's essential to take care of ourselves, and that includes seeking help when we need it. In conclusion, my experience with the attacks of my childhood was pretty traumatic. It left me with many questions and a deep curiosity about the paranormal world. It taught me that it's okay to ask for help and that we should never be afraid to share our experiences. I hope that my story will serve as a reminder to others that there's always help available and we should never suffer in silence. The scratching sound in storage space. I recently moved into a new house and my room is in the finished attic. I love my room because of the cozy feeling that it gives me, and the view of the neighborhood is fantastic from up here. There are two tunnel-like storage spaces on either side of the attic that my family uses regularly, and the other day while I was working on my laptop, 
I heard a sort of scratching or dragging noise coming from one of those storage areas. Initially, I thought it was a mouse or a rat that had snuck up into the storage area, so I decided to investigate and looked around, but there was nothing to be found, no nesting or droppings or anything. I brushed it off as my imagination played tricks on me, and I went back to work. However, two days ago, I heard the same noise again, and this time, I was sure that it was coming from the same storage area. I gathered my courage and went to check again. Still, nothing out of the ordinary. It was strange and inexplicable. I'm a total skeptic, I guess you would say, and I don't believe in ghosts or paranormal activities. But this event really freaked me out. I was concerned about what could be causing the sound. My house was only built about 20 years ago, and there have never been any deaths or accidents here. So what could it be? I tried to convince myself that it must have been something rational, but maybe it was a faulty pipe, or maybe it was the wind making noise, but deep down I couldn't shake the feeling that something else was going on here. I started paying more attention to the storage area specifically, and I noticed something strange. There was a cold spot in that area where I heard the noise. It was weird because the temperature in the rest of the attic was the same. I started to think that maybe there was a draft in the storage area, but when I tried to locate the source of the cold, I couldn't find anything. I even went as far as to ask my family members if they had heard anything strange in the attic, but they say that they hadn't heard anything. It was as if I was the only one hearing this noise. I couldn't get it out of my mind, and the more I thought about it, the more scared I became. I couldn't concentrate on anything else, and I started to feel paranoid. I was worried that something bad might happen, and I wouldn't be able to explain it. The more I thought about it, the more I became convinced that it was something paranormal. Maybe it was a ghost or a poltergeist that was haunting my attic. I knew that it sounded silly, but I couldn't think of any other explanation, and in the end, I decided to move to my bed to the other side of the room, as far away from that storage area as possible. I also made sure to keep my door locked at all times, and I still hear the noise every now and then, but I try to ignore it and tell myself that it's nothing to worry about. Despite my efforts to rationalize the situation, there's a part of me that still wonders what's causing this noise. I don't think I'll ever truly know, but I've learned to live with it, and I'm just glad that whatever it is, it hasn't harmed me in any way. Shadow People Experience Recently, my wife and nine-year-old daughter and I went on vacation to northeast Georgia, where we stayed at a cabin. While I was excited to spend some quality time with my family, the trip turned out to be a nightmare. Throughout the entire week, I slept poorly and kept having horrible nightmares. It was unusual for me since I rarely remember dreams, but these nightmares lingered on, haunting me day and night. I started to wonder if the process of weaning myself off Celexa was to blame, but for my restless sleep, however, what happened next changed everything. One night while trying to fall asleep, I saw something that shook me to my core. I looked toward the door in the hall and saw a figure that was darker than the rest of the room with no lights on. The figure seemed to be disproportionately large, but with no features. It was as if the darkness was taking a shape in front of my eyes. After I saw it, the figure either crouched, and disappeared, or sunk into the floor. It was a terrifying experience, and I couldn't explain what I had just seen. The following night was far worse as far as not feeling rested, and the worst dreams. I was completely exhausted due to the lack of good sleep, and I'm fairly open or sensitive to spirits, but I hadn't sensed anything ghostly in the house before this incident. But now, I was not only exhausted by lack of good sleep, but also freaked out. I started to question the safety of the cabin, wondering if there was something ominous lurking in the shadows. My wife mostly ended up sleeping in with our kiddo because she's afraid of a new place. But the few nights that she did sleep in the master bedroom with me, she also had disturbing nightmares and poor sleep. We both couldn't shake off the feeling of unease and terror that had engulfed us since our arrival. We had never experienced anything like this before, and it was starting to take a toll on our mental and physical health. 
We did some research on our own and found that many people have had similar experiences with shadow figures. These shadow figures are believed to be ghosts or entities that take the form of shadows. They are often associated with negative energies and feelings of dread. Although we were not entirely sure what we had seen, the possibility of encountering an entity or ghost in the cabin was pretty much overwhelming. In conclusion, our trip to northeast Georgia turned out to be a nightmare. Unlike other vacations that we had taken before, the shadow figure that I had saw was not only terrifying, but it also left me with a lot of questions. We're still unsure of what we encountered in that cabin, but we know that it had a profound effect on our well-being. We learned that the paranormal world is real and shouldn't be taken lightly. We hope that our experience will serve as a cautionary tale for others and urge everyone to approach such situations with caution and care. Face to face with a shadow person. When I look back at my life, one of the most significant events that occurred happened in the summer of 1995 when I was just 14 years old. It was a beautiful day, the late afternoon around 4 p.m., and still very light outside. I was in my mom and dad's house, standing near the back door in the kitchen, and my dog was with me. I had just put some scraps from my tea in his bowl and he was eating his food when suddenly something strange happened. My dog lowered his head, bared his teeth, his hackles stood up, and he started growling. Now my dog was a wire-haired fox terrier Jack Russell Cross, and he was usually very placid and mild, so this behavior was highly unusual for him. As I stood up straight, I noticed my shadow on the wall near the door getting darker and darker until it was devoid of color, beyond black. It was then that I realized that my dog was not protecting his food, he was scared. As the shadow stepped away from the wall, it took on a fully 3D form, and it was only about a couple feet away from me. My dog ran away, but I was frozen with fear. I remember being around 5'4 at the time, and this thing was the same height as me. It had no facial features and a smooth outline. It had shape and form, but at the same time, it was so dark that it seemed like a void. I couldn't see any eyes, but I got the sense that it was looking at me. This being and I stood and stared at each other for what felt like five minutes, but probably mere seconds. I was terrified and it seemed shocked that I could see it. Suddenly the being raised its arms up so that its hands were above its head and shot up into the ceiling into a puff of smoke, the same color as the being. The smoke dissipated as soon as it had appeared and I could move again. I have no idea what I had seen, as I have never heard of anything like a living shadow, and I didn't know anyone who had seen something like that. Back then, the internet wasn't what it is now, and we didn't even have a computer to access it anyways. I spent many years worrying that I had some kind of mental illness or something, and then years later I found a website where other people had written about their experiences with these shadow people. In the past 10 years, I've heard a lot of people talking about them on various podcasts. However, I don't really know what they are, and I'm not going to pretend that I do. All I know is that I saw something that I don't understand. It's strange because other people in my family have seen this shadow person, but only in glimpses. I've seen another at a friend's house, and though creepy, in comparison, that one was nowhere near as scary. It's just bizarre. I've never been able to shake that experience from my mind. Sometimes when I'm alone in a dark room, I can't help but wonder if that shadow being is lurking somewhere in the shadows, waiting to reveal itself again. It's a thought that still scares me to this day. My Ouija Experience let me tell you about my experience with the board. When I was in middle school, I went to a friend's birthday sleepover. And we did all the typical girl things, painted nails and did makeovers and watched a movie. Everything was normal until my friend suggested that we make a Ouija board. On a sheet of paper, we scribbled out yes, no, and goodbye, along with numbers in the alphabet. She told us all the rules, and we nodded in agreement that we would follow them. I remember being scared but wanting to fit in and wondering if this was even a good idea. 
The first movement happened, and I looked across to the girl facing me, insisting that she had moved it. She denied it, and said that it wasn't her who moved the clear pebble we were using as the planchette. We asked dumb questions like who we each liked and if our crushes liked us, Typ- you know, typical middle school girl stuff. I didn't really remember much of these sessions other than a particular name, Wanda, and that we had asked her if she was a demon, and she told us that she was not. After a while, it wasn't scary anymore, and we began to enjoy it more and more. I remember feeling so excited, like I wanted to keep playing, as if we were in a video game. The next day, I told my dad about it. He wasn't mad or ashamed, he just wanted to make sure that we were all safe about it. Fast forward to my first year of college, and I was over at my friend's place for her birthday, and she had talked about how she found a Ouija board and that we should try it. I was a little hesitant, as now I realized the true implications of them. We eventually started setting boundaries, but I was still hesitant to believe that the planchette was moving. My friend asked questions like, when's my birthday and what's my name, and shifted to questions not about myself, tending to ask about the entity rather than me. My friend suddenly asked if the spirit knew my deceased grandfather's name, and it spells out L-O-U-I-S. I was in shock because none of my friends had known that. I know that I hadn't directed the planchette to the letters, so I was surprised to see that it was correct. Later on, another friend of mine said that she felt something grab her foot underneath the table. I was right next to her and didn't feel anything, and at that point, I thought it was best to say goodbye and call it a night. It was just all too weird. I never truly had a bad experience with the Ouija board, but it's still very creepy to say the least. I know that some people swear by their accuracy, while others dismiss them as mere parlor tricks. But after my experiences, I'm still not sure what to believe. It's like something else takes control and it's hard to shake that feeling even after the session is over. All I know is that I'm a little bit more cautious now when it comes to playing with things like Ouija boards. Sometimes it's better to leave the unknown alone and not invite something into your life that you can't control. Proctor Valley Monster Back in 2005, I'd recently graduated from college and moved back to my hometown, San Diego. It was great bringing back since a lot of my friends still lived there, and it was super easy to find friends and go ghost hunting with, and we all loved to get creeped out. One of the legends that always fascinated us was the Proctor Valley Monster, a folkloric story that combined a few different tropes like a woman in white, a phantom car, our version of Sasquatch called Zoobies, and even UFO sightings. It was a hodgepodge of paranormal activity that always piqued our interest. The story was mostly centered around a two-lane state bypass road that ran for a few miles between Chula Vista and Jamacha. It was essentially a service road for the airport antennas, but it was also right next to a high school, and for decades development didn't make it out there so it was a ripe setting for teens drinking and ghost stories. One day, my friend Sal and I decided to drive down the road. We had done it maybe ten times before, and it was always a desolate and spooky experience. You occasionally see headlights in the distance, and it's almost always Border Patrol doing their rounds. But every so often, you would see another car, undoubtedly looking for ghosts, just like we would have been. But this time, it was absolutely empty. As we drove, we saw familiar things, like evidence of a bonfire, empty beer cans, abandoned appliances, etc. The road was half-paved, half-sanded over, so you always hear the tires as you change from surface to surface. But this time, it seemed so boring, nothing was out there, just a stretch of nothingness. However, the second-to-last turn was when things took a turn for the weird, My jeep lost the back end a bit, so I oversteered and straightened it out, and as I did, the headlights focused on what we can only describe as a seven-foot owl-like human creature with yellow eyes standing in the middle of the road. I slammed on my brakes, and the sand flew past us. We just sat there looking at this thing for what seemed like forever, but it was probably about 45 seconds. It was taller than my car, a weird brown and black color with white striking on its chest. 
But what was even weirder was that it had human legs with knees and weirdly taloned feet. It had bright yellow eyes that seemed to pierce our very souls. Then all of a sudden it opened its wings and started to take flight over our car, letting out a very low and guttural screech as it flew over us. My friend and I just sat there trying to figure out what the hell just happened. We had all been out there so many times, but we never saw anything like that again. To this day, I still wonder what that creature was and where it came from. It definitely was not of this world. Creepy experience when I woke up. As soon as my mom got divorced, she decided to move to a new house. It was a fresh start for her, and she was excited about the new beginnings. My sister and I were also happy for her, but it also meant that we would have to visit her in her new city. I was already 21 and living in another city, but I made sure to visit my mom whenever I had the chance. During one of my visits, my sister couldn't come with me, so I had to stay alone in my mom's house. My mom had given me my own bedroom, but my sister's room was more comfortable, so I decided to sleep in there instead. Little did I know that my decision would lead me to an experience that would scare me to my core. You see, my sister had once experienced something similar to what I was about to experience. She had told me about it, and at the time, I thought it was just a ghost story. But as I lay in my sister's bed, I woke up suddenly at 3 a.m., completely frightened and anxious for no apparent reason at all. The room was pitch black and I couldn't see anything. For a moment, I even forgot where I was and where the light switch was. I started frantically searching for the light switch, trying to remember where it was. When I finally found it, I turned on the lights and scanned the room, but I couldn't see anything out of the ordinary. I know it may sound like I'm overreacting, but the terror I felt in that moment was indescribable. I'd never experienced anything like it before, and now, suddenly, I was experiencing it twice. The whole thing left me feeling creeped out and scared. The next morning I remembered my sister's story, and I couldn't help but wonder why this had happened to me. Was it just my imagination playing tricks on me, or was there something more to it? I tried to shake off the feeling, but it lingered throughout the entire day. I couldn't help but think about what I should do next. Should I tell my mom about it, or should I keep it to myself? Should I talk to my sister and see if she had any advice for me? I was completely lost and didn't know what to do. As the day went on, I couldn't help but feel uneasy in the house. I kept looking over my shoulder and checking the doors and windows, as if someone or something was going to jump out at me at any moment. In the end, I decided to talk to my sister about it. She listened to me carefully and told me that she had experienced something similar, but she had found a way to deal with it. She suggested that I try meditating or practicing mindfulness to help calm my nerves and clear my mind. I was skeptical at first, but I decided to give it a try, and you know what? It worked. By focusing on my breath and letting go of my fears, I was able to calm myself down and find some peace of mind. Now, whenever I visit my mom's house, I make sure to practice mindfulness and meditation, and haven't experienced anything like that since. It just goes to show that sometimes the scariest things can be overcome with a little bit of self-care and mindfulness. Rick Akasek, my precognition story and further experiences with him. Hi, I'm Jane, and let me tell you about my strange but incredible experience with the late Rick Akasek. I've been a lover of music for as long as I can remember, and I've always had a special place in my heart for the classics of the 60s throughout the 80s. I'm only 17, but my love for this music is just as strong as any other fans. It was the night before my 14th birthday when something inexplicable happened. I was getting ready to go to a friend's house for an early celebration, and I wanted to put on some music to lighten the mood. I picked up my car CD, which I had barely listened to before, but I felt the most horrible gut feeling. It was as if something deep inside me was telling me that something was very wrong. I looked back at the CD and saw Rick Okasek's picture. Suddenly, I knew with absolute certainty that he was going to die. I tried to shrug it off and not say anything to my mom, but the feeling struck me. And later that night, I put on Steve Miller instead to take my mind off of what had just happened. 
A few hours after I got into my friend's house and I got the news, Rick Okasek had just died. I couldn't believe it. I barely knew anything about him, yet I was both crushed and shocked that I learned this before the world knew and didn't tell anybody about it. Since that day, Rick has shown up in my dreams from time to time, usually with a bright purple aura around him. It's the color I've come to associate with him and his presence. We don't talk much in these dreams, but we do share time together before I wake up. It's as if he's just there to hang out with me. But Rick doesn't just visit me in my dreams. When I'm awake, he lets me know he's there by knocking over a book of his lyrics and poems that I keep on my desk. It's a little unsettling at first, but I've come to accept it as just his way of saying hello. For the past two years on the anniversary of his death, I started a little ritual. I light a purple candle and talk and spin records with him using an opalite pendulum. I set some records on the floor and he chooses what music he wants to hear by swinging the pendulum. It's always an amazing experience and he's quite insistent with his decisions. He makes pretty great musical choices too. Sometimes I think to myself, why would Rick Okasek hang out with a 17 year old from Wisconsin that never even knew him? But I'm glad to have him around. It's like we have some sort of cosmic connection that goes beyond time and space. I still can't explain why I had that gut feeling that fateful night, but I'm grateful for it. It led me to discover Rick Okasek's music and connect with him in ways I never thought possible. I may never fully understand what's going on, but I'm happy to have him as a friend, even if it's just in the spiritual realm. My Paranormal Encounter In 2014, I was living in an area near Gainesville, Florida, one normal evening, my older brother and I were playing Call of Duty Black Ops on my Xbox 360. After we finished, we had to clean up the house and turn off all the lights before we were allowed to go to sleep. While doing the nightly chores, I noticed that the Xbox had been turned on by itself, which was very weird because I clearly remembered turning it off. But I wasn't too alarmed, so I simply powered it off again and crawled into the lower bunk of me and my brother's bunk bed. As I was laying in the bunk, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched intensely. It was keeping me up, and it only seemed to intensify more as I tried to ignore it. Then it happened. I heard my Xbox 360 power on again, and it instantly threw me off because all of the remote controls were on the TV stand, and the only way it would power on is if the heat signature was right in front of the power button. I was startled by this, so I waited for a while but I eventually got up and turned it off again, and as I crawled back into my bed and got comfortable again, I was greeted with chills running back up my back as I head back and the Xbox powered back on again. At this point, I was both scared and frustrated. However, this time, before I could even act, I was greeted by a bright flash of light in my face, like someone took a picture of me with the flash on. It was sudden and silent, and it was just like that, a flash, and before I could react, my room was refilled with darkness. The next thing I heard was my older brother asking, Did you see that? I could hear the concern in his voice. As soon as I responded with the concerned yeah, a second flash happened. Except this time, the origin of the flash seemed higher up, like it was oriented toward my brother's part of the bed. And after this, my brother and I went silent and watched in confusion and at ease as the flash reappeared in different parts of the house. Based on how the light would reflect off the walls, he couldn't tell where it was. It was going on in all rooms of our house, flashing multiple times in every room and slowly making its way down the hallway. Eventually, it made its way into our kitchen, and at this point, my brother and I got out of bed and we were watching the flashes happen in the living room. Then we watched as the kitchen lights turned on and off, except this time, rather than a flash, it seemed as if the light switch was being flipped repeatedly. After about three minutes, my brother mustered up the courage, grabbed a pocket knife, and headed out of our room and went into the kitchen to check it out. The light switch stopped flickering, and the incident was over. To this day, this is one of the weirdest incidents that I've ever experienced. I'd like to know if anybody has any opinion, or if anyone has experienced or read about something similar.
Old Occurrence A few years ago I had a truly bizarre experience at my in-law's house. They lived far out in the countryside in a small lakefront community on Greenwood Lake in South Carolina. They had some neighboring properties nearby, but most of the folks there were seasonal, and my in-laws were the only ones who lived there year-round. One late Sunday night, my fiancé and that wife was taking a shower, and I was alone with our dog in the living room, the back of the house facing a clearing in a relatively dense forested area that couldn't be seen in from the house at night. However, the blinds up and the lights on, it was easy to watch into the house from the woods at night. Usually it's unnerving to look into the woods from my in-law's house, but that unnerving feeling is typically solved by closing the blinds. On this particular evening, I was walking around the house while my fiancé was in the shower. It was very late and it was just me and our dog in the family room. I had just turned off the TV when suddenly the hairs on my body stood up and I got chills. At that exact moment, our dog ran to the window by the kitchen and barked incessantly at the window. I thought my in-laws must be getting back home after being at church. I got up and peeked out the window by the couch while the dog was going nuts barking out the window. But to my surprise, there were no headlights or anything, only a massive thick fog that appeared out of nowhere. I glanced over at the window where my dog was still barking and noticed what looked like squatting figures peering into the window at him. It gave me goosebumps and I started walking towards them. However, when I blinked, nothing was there anymore but the dog was still barking. When I finally got to the window, the fog was still apparent but less thick, and I looked around in the yard, but I didn't see anything until my eyes made it into the woods. I couldn't make out a precise figure, but it looked like something pale with glowing eyes was looking back at the house. I closed every blind in the house and turned on every light I could in the yard. Later that night, the in-laws came home, and the fog was gone, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. I heard scratching sounds on the walls of the room. We were sleeping in all night, almost like a cat trying to climb in to higher ground. And since then, I've never set foot in the woods surrounding my in-law's house and always feel like something is watching me when I'm there. Honestly, this experience left me quite traumatized. I'm someone who enjoys exploring the outdoors and connecting with nature, but this event has made me incredibly wary of my surroundings, especially in unfamiliar environments. It's hard to shake the feeling that something sinister is lurking just out of sight, waiting to pounce. Even though I know it's likely just my imagination, I still can't help but feel on edge when I think back on that night. Ask Reddit 2 when I took my showers, I heard a lot of talking coming from various voices. It was hard for me to fully understand what they were saying, but I heard them calling out my name. It was strange because most people in my life only knew me by my nickname, which I've had for almost my entire life. Even my boyfriend and his family thought that my nickname was my real name. So when I heard my real name being called out, I answered back, calling out to them. After I responded, their conversation would continue, and at first, I thought it was just my imagination, but it kept happening. I would rush out of the shower, but it was just like my child and I inside, with all the doors and windows still locked. As I mentioned earlier, the house I was living in had been converted from something else. The house heater was located in the corner of the bathroom in plain sight, without any kind of cover or door to hide it. Because of this, the pilot light would sometimes go out, and I'd have to light it by myself. The last time I had to relight the pilot light, I noticed something strange. There were names written all over the instruction sticker, in a childish cursive and in pencil. One of the names on there was mine, which was odd because I'd never seen those names before. Not in any of the times that I'd gone to light the pilot light before. I asked my boyfriend's cousin, who knew about the history of the house, and he knew who the previous occupants were, and if their names matched the ones on the water heater. He said that none of the names matched, which only added to the mystery. My birthday was coming up, and it just so happened to be on the same day as my boyfriend's extended family member's birthday, who was home from the Navy. A big party was being planned, and everyone was getting ready. 
My boyfriend's cousin came over to my house and asked to use my shower because he's worried that he wouldn't get hot at his shower at his house next door. I knew that his family was very strict, so I decided to go to the family's house next door while he showered, just to avoid any potential issues. While I was at the family's house, the cousin finished his shower and came back to my house. He told me that I didn't have to mess with him and asked me why I kept calling his name and knocking on the window. I was confused and told him that I'd been at the family's house the whole time, sitting on his mom's couch. He questioned his mom in Spanish, and she confirmed what I had said. I asked him what happened, and he told me that someone kept talking from just outside the bathroom door and calling his name. And when he yelled back, no one would answer him. But the talking just kept going. It was all very unsettling, and we never did find out who or what was behind it all. My encounter with a demonic entity has traumatized me. Let me tell you a story that has haunted me for years. It all started when I began communicating with the Virgin Mary and St. Peter through paintings on my bedroom wall. I know it may sound unusual to some, but it wasn't uncommon for me to speak with them. They would talk with me kindly and lovingly almost every night. It was as if they were my second set of parents. I would feel their warmth when they came to me. It was comforting and the feeling was something I couldn't quite describe. But then a few years ago, something strange happened. I was lying in bed waiting for their arrival, as I did every night. When they finally came, they said nothing. This was odd because they always greeted me first. I asked them what was wrong, and that's when the thing took a dark turn. They screamed at me in unison, saying that I would feel nothing but pain in the afterlife, the pain of the black void, and that it would never end. It would be agonizing, and I would suffer for all eternity. They repeated this for what felt like 15 to 20 minutes straight. It wasn't like a normal human scream. It was much louder, and I can't explain it. After they finished, I vomited, and I didn't stop crying for weeks. I was already scared of death since I was young, but this experience made it so much worse. I begged for them to come back so I could apologize and ask what I did wrong to deserve that, but they never did. I haven't heard from them since. I've had this theory for a while now that it wasn't really Mary or Peter that spoke to me that night. Instead, it was some kind of demonic entity that was attracted to me for some reason. It took advantage and fed on my fear. I don't know where they went, but they abandoned me. I think the demons may have ruined my mind, body, and soul. Since then, I haven't had a full night's sleep in three years. I only get a few hours of sleep every few days. The fear of death consumes me. It's constantly in the back of my mind, and it never goes away. I can't eat properly, and I'm always feeling sick and disgusting afterwards. My brain feels like it's splitting in half, and it hurts. I'm torn between wanting to stay alive because of the fear of either hell or the black void is so terrifying, and wanting to die because I can't take this stress anymore. Fear controls my life, and every aspect of my being revolves around fear and suffering. All of this pain and stress and fear must be worse than what comes after death. I'm in so much agony I don't know what to do. I've never been this scared in my life and I'm so afraid of death, but I think of nothingness or hell might be less painful than my current existence. This is why I believe I was tortured by those demons posing as holy figures. What else could have left me with so much pain and stress? A true holy figure wouldn't have done that to me, especially ones I trusted so deeply. Maybe this is the wrong place to share this, but as a 33-year-old father of four, I lead a busy life with my job as an operations manager for a small advertising company. My work can be a stressful thing, so I always make a point to find nature reserves, national parks, or just parks to visit during my travels. This time, I was sitting outside enjoying the beautiful weather at an inner city park in Oklahoma City when a woman approached me. She was about my age, and she had beautiful platinum blonde hair which I couldn't help but compliment her on. We started exchanging pleasantries, and I felt like I knew her well, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it. During our conversation, the topic of religion came up, and I was surprised when she mentioned a pagan practice that my family believes in. This belief is that instead of running linear, it's cyclic, 
and runs concurrently alongside all other possible timelines. I found her views fascinating and elaborated on my family's beliefs that were similar, which she finished for me, almost verbatim. I asked if we had met before, but she began to tear up, telling me that she missed these conversations. We hugged and I felt like it wasn't only okay, but maybe right in this situation. I even offered to exchange contact information so we could continue our conversation further. However, that's when she said something that made my skin crawl. She told me that unfortunately, this would be the last time that she got to talk with me. As I let go of the woman, I looked her in the eyes again to continue the conversation, but she was gone. I was alone, sitting in that park bench, and it left me shaken up all day. Unable to sleep out of pure curiosity, I lay in bed with my seven-year-old and five-year-old, both asleep with their knees and elbows into my side. Questions and thoughts ran through my head. Was that encounter real, or was it a stress-induced apparition? Did I meet a version of my daughter in some distant future? Was I dead? And was this the afterlife? Has anyone else ever had an encounter like this? If so, is there any other way to replicate the scenario and maybe to tell what potentially, if that was maybe my daughter from another timeline and that I love her and always will? As someone who considers myself spiritual, I believe that entities exist beyond our veil, and we can only glimpse them briefly, perhaps. This encounter left me with a lot of questions and thoughts, and I can't help but wonder what it all meant. Work is hard, but in retrospect, the entire year has been a breeze compared to my time in the army, or even past years in operations. But this experience has left me shaken up, and I'm not sure what to make of it all. Story time. When I was around 13 years old, my family experienced a great loss. My grandma had passed away. As a result, we moved into her old home, and much to my dismay, the bedroom was located in the basement. I had always had an uneasy feeling about that basement, but I never thought too much of it. I always assumed it was a common stigma that basements were scary places. However, when we moved in, my fears intensified. Every time I went down to my room, I felt like I was being watched and sensed something moving around near the furnace and stairs. Occasionally I would see shadows and a light would turn on, but I always brushed it off and I tried not to think too much about it. One night while I was dead asleep, I suddenly woke up. I'm usually a heavy sleeper, so it took me by surprise. It felt like someone in my dream was telling me to wake up. As I looked around, I smelled something strange. To my horror, I saw a small fire starting just five feet away from me. It was caused by a short and some wiring. I was able to wake up my dad and together we were able to put out the fire before it spread and burned down the entire house. That night, I couldn't help but feel grateful for whatever it was that woke me up. I felt like there was something in that basement with me and it may have saved our lives. From then on, I couldn't shake off the feeling that there was something strange in the basement. Even during the day, I felt like something was lurking around the corner. I did try to convince myself that it was just my imagination, but I couldn't shake off the feeling that there was something there. One day while I was doing laundry, I heard a strange noise coming from the storage room. It sounded like someone was moving things around. I was terrified, but I couldn't ignore the noise, so I slowly approached the door and with trembling hands, I opened it. As I peered inside, I saw something move out of the corner of my eye. I was petrified and had no idea what to do, but then the thing that had been moving around came into view, and I was surprised to see that it was just a cat. I had never seen it before, and I didn't know how it got into the basement, but it seemed to have made itself a home here. From then on, I would often see cats lurking around the basement. It made me feel better knowing that I wasn't alone down there but I still couldn't shake off the feeling that there was something else lurking in the shadows. Years went by and we eventually moved out, but to this day I still can't help but wonder what was in that basement with me, other than the cats. Was it just my imagination, or was there something else? Either way, I'm grateful for whatever it was that woke me up that night and allowed me to save our home from burning down.
identifying strange entity from childhood. Today I stumbled upon a story that caught my attention, and I can't help but feel intrigued. The story revolves around a person with a photographic memory, which can be both a blessing and a curse. As someone with a vast knowledge and comprehension, I can relate to how memory can sometimes become overwhelming. This person's story takes me back to the childhood days, where they were playing around in the woods by their house. Suddenly, they slipped on a root and fell down an embankment into the street. While this road is usually quiet, there is a car coming down the hill and around the bend. The person panicked because they knew that the driver wouldn't be able to see them and they would likely hit them. The next part happened in just a few seconds, but the person felt like an eternity. They shut their eyes tightly and waited for the inevitable, but then suddenly something strange happened. They felt calm and weightless, like they were floating on the surface of water. They opened their eyes and saw what they thought was a man standing over them, giving them a curious look. The entity was a translucent green-blue older man, which was the person that sort of made it look like he was made of glass. It was a unique experience that they never had before, and it felt otherworldly. The entity had some sort of flaky, ridgy stuff on its head, resembling bug wings or mushrooms. He was wearing a fur coat, and one arm was tucked in the front, while the other was at his side, and it was blackened like burnt wood. It was an unusual sight, and the person had never seen anything like it before. While they were looking at the entity, they forgot all about the car that was about to hit them, when they came back to reality, they saw a branch had fallen on the hood of the car from the big oak tree up above of the road, causing the driver to slam on the brakes. They were relieved that they were safe, but afraid that they would be blamed for knocking the branch onto the car. They ran all the way home and told their dad about what had happened. The person's dad believed them, but their mother didn't. The experience left them with many questions that they couldn't answer. They wanted to know who or what the entity was and why it saved their life. They felt guilty for not knowing, but they were also grateful for the experience. As a language model, I don't have any answers to the person's questions, but I can tell them that their experience is not unique. Many people have reported similar encounters and said that they've tried to explain them through science or spirituality. However, the truth is that there may not be a single explanation for what the person saw. In conclusion, the person's story highlights the complexity of the human experience and how memory can both be a blessing and a curse. It also reminds us that many things in this world we may fully never understand. And that's okay. We can still appreciate the beauty and the mystery of life, even though it doesn't make sense. Weird creaky sound in the midnight, coming from the top of the roof in the sky. Three years ago, I was in the middle of preparing for my class, and it was the final exam for class 10. It was around 1 p.m., and I was fully engrossed in my studies. But before I go on to describe what happened, let me set the scene for you. I live in an apartment on the top floor, which means that the floor above me is just an open terrace. There's only one other house on this floor, which is where I live, and the other half is open to the sky. People usually come up to the terrace to get some fresh air or to dry their clothes. However, at this time of the incident, there was no one outside as it was midnight. The house I live in has two doors, a wooden one and a steel bar gate. In between these two gates, there's a small room where I keep my shoes and other stuff. If I step up out of my door and take three steps forward, I can look through the gate and see out of my door. So that night, as I was studying, I heard a sound coming from outside. It was like someone was pulling a creaky trolley or a vehicle, which was making a slow, constant noise. At first I thought someone was outside, but after a minute or so, I wondered why the sound was still going on. It seemed strange to me that someone would just keep pulling a trolley for such a long time. Well, curiosity got the better of me, and I decided to investigate. I opened the door and went near the gate to see what was going on. To my surprise, there was no one out there. The sound was coming from above, about eight or nine feet above the ground. I wasn't able to see what was making the noise because I was at an angle above my vision, around 80 degrees above my head. However, I could sense that it was coming from the top of my head particularly, and it felt like something creaky was flying above me. 
I was too afraid to go out and see what it was. It was already around 1 a.m. and the sound was not stopping. I just stayed inside my house and listened to it, and eventually the sound faded away like a moving object going away from me. I couldn't figure out what it was, and my parents didn't believe me either. They said that it couldn't have been rats pulling or something like that, but when I went out, there was nothing there. Even if it was rats, I shouldn't have been able to hear the sound coming from the bottom. But the sound was coming from the top of the roof, and it went on for like four or five minutes before fading away. I couldn't shake the feeling that it was something else entirely. The first thing that came to mind was a UFO, but I couldn't be sure. It was a strange experience that left me feeling uneasy for a long time. Coincidence or spirit help? I remember this incident like it was yesterday, even though it happened about 12 years ago. At that time, I was just 16 years old and I was in high school. My house was in a small neighborhood and we had to park on the main street since we didn't have access to our driveway due to the electrical pole's positioning. I was also a dog sitter in the neighborhood so I knew many of the dogs living in the area. And one day after school, I parked across the street from my house since I couldn't park in my driveway. As I was about to grab my backpack from the trunk of my car, I heard a loud car turn into the street. The car was unlike anything I've ever seen before. It was decorated with a skyline view of the Metroplex on the hood and the city's football team on the driver's side car, among other things. There were two guys in the car, and they were driving slower than most people would on the street. I thought they were lost, but something about it seemed off. As the car approached, I locked eyes with the driver, and the car slowed down even more. I was standing by the rear door of my car, and I realized that there was no way I could cross the street and run into my house in time. I was afraid that I'd either have to fight for my life or be kidnapped by these two men. Just as their car was about to stop, the driver looked shocked and sped off. I was relieved, confused, and curious about what had just happened. That's when I noticed two massive Rottweilers standing on either side of me. I'd never seen these dogs in my neighborhood before, and I never saw them again after that day. Despite their intimidating size, the dogs never growled or made a sound. They just sat there beside me, and I suddenly felt safe and protected. I grabbed my bag and started running towards my house, and the two dogs followed me. They were on my heels, never leaving my side. As I reached my door, I kept looking over my shoulder and saw the two Rottweilers watching my back. They seemed to be standing guard, making sure that nothing was following us. I felt grateful for their presence, and I wanted to give them some food and water. I prepared the bowls in my kitchen, which was close to my door, and when I returned, the dogs were gone. I felt a little sad that I didn't get to thank them properly, but I was also relieved that they weren't lost or just passing through. A few minutes later, my dad got home from work, and I asked him if he had seen two dogs. He should have noticed them walking away from our house, since only a minute or two had passed since they left, but he said he didn't see anything. I was puzzled by their sudden appearance and disappearance, but I knew that they had protected me and helped me feel safe when I was vulnerable. A short collection of ghost stories from my old house. I was raised in a house with a dark history. When I was only four years old, my family moved in. There is a concrete ramp that led to the door, which was built for a disabled man who had once lived there. Unfortunately, he had passed away after falling into a nearby river and drowning. The story of his tragic demise always frightened me as a child, especially when my mother told me that she had once fallen asleep downstairs and had a dream of a man in a wheelchair watching her. Part of me was convinced that it wasn't just a dream. Moving on to some of the strange occurrences I experienced while living in that house. The room at the front of the house, which happened to be my bedroom, was definitely haunted. I saw and heard a lot of things that I couldn't explain away. For instance, my wardrobe would rock for no apparent reason, even when I wasn't anywhere near it. I tried to attribute it to perhaps sitting on a wonky floorboard and slipping, but deep down I knew there was something more to it. 
One time I was sitting on my bed with my cat when I saw a shadow move out of the corner of my eye. My cat looked too, but there was nothing there. Another time my bed moved when I was sitting on it, and again I tried to rationalize it by thinking it wasn't on the floor, so it must have slipped. I remember my radio making noise when it wasn't plugged in, or when it wasn't near it at all, but my memory is hazy on that one. However, the most bizarre experience I had in that house was when her dog died at the age of 16. She used to bark to come in from the garden, and even after she passed, I would hear that distinctive bark. It was the weirdest thing because our neighborhood said that they heard it too. One night, I was either home alone or the last one to bed, and as I was turning off the kitchen light, I heard someone say good night. It was a creepy and unexplainable experience that sent shivers down my spine. Lastly, after we got another dog, one night we were all relaxing on the sofa when suddenly the dog jumped up, ran to the bottom of the stairs, and started barking viciously at something at the top. His hackles were up, and there was no one, nothing there to trick his vision. I decided to investigate, but the dog wouldn't follow me, so I was left alone to face the unknown. Sadly, we were eventually forced out of the house several years ago, but I miss it in some ways. The house got me used to the paranormal, so when we moved into our next house and I heard footsteps in an empty room, I didn't even react. I hope the new family who moved in after us were able to cope with the strange happenings in that house. Rayford Prison Blues As someone who used to work in a prison field in Rayford, Florida, I've had my fair share of unexplainable experiences. I couldn't talk about with my colleagues, let's just say that. We were specifically instructed not to discuss any paranormal happenings in our prison, but I still think about them all the time and I need to get them off my chest. I even tried talking to my dad, who also worked there, but he dismissed it all as rubbish and claimed he never experienced anything out of the ordinary. One of the most chilling experiences I had was when I was assigned as a CO for Echo Dorm. This particular dorm always gave me an eerie feeling, even during the day when it was bustling with all sorts of characters. I won't go into specifics about the inmates, mainly due to the length of the story. I worked there every night about three months from six to six. And one night, everything seemed normal, and we even had a lockdown at 11 p.m. because of an NBA game on TV. It was around 3 a.m., and I had just finished letting out the morning KP. As I sat back down in my officer station, I looked up and saw an inmate out of his cell. I immediately jumped up and exited my station to see why this guy was out. As I exited, I looked to my right and saw him climb up the stairs and then disappear into thin air. I was completely shocked, but I knew that if I called my sergeant, she would think I was crazy, so I brushed it off. The next night I was talking to one of the inmates, and he mentioned that some of the other inmates had been talking about how the building was haunted. I asked him to elaborate, and he went on to tell me that they had seen a ghostly figure wandering around the dorm at night. Apparently it was a ghost of an inmate who had died in the dorm years ago. They called him the E-Dorm Ghost. I couldn't believe what I was hearing, but at the same time, it explained the bizarre sightings that I'd experienced the night before. Over the next few weeks, I started to hear more stories about the ghost of Edorm. Some of the inmates claimed to have seen him in their cells at night, while others said they heard strange noises and voices coming from empty cells. Even some of my fellow COs had their own spooky encounters, but we were all too afraid to talk about them openly. Eventually, I was transferred to a different area of the prison, and I never had to work in the Echo Dorm again. But even now, years later, I can't help but think about the strange occurrences that took place there. And while I know some people may dismiss it all as superstition, I can't deny what I saw with my own eyes. The ghost of Edorm will always be etched in my memory as one of the most haunting experiences of my life. My paranormal experiences are getting more intense. Today I was at my breaking point, and this happened less than 10 minutes ago. 
I was lying down facing my wall with my back to the room. My dad was on his way to the car, and he was about to leave to go to my aunt's. All of a sudden, I feel this heat and pressure of a human hand slither onto my back and touch about right where my waist is. I look back and there's nothing. Things like this happen to me more frequently now, and I'm not upset that there are things like this getting close to me, but it doesn't sit well with me that these spirits feel comfortable getting that close. Another story was a few months ago. I used to religiously sleep with the mirror facing my bed, and I knew that this was wrong, so one day I just turned the mirror around and go to sleep, and the energy of the room immediately shifted. But I thought that was good, so I went to sleep. Around 5 a.m., I heard the door open and close in my sleep. I thought it was one of my partners just checking on me or something. I opened my eyes, 20 minutes or so later, to an entity that looked exactly like me. But the eyes were enlarged by a mile. I was not particularly scared, but it was maybe two inches away from my face as I was laying on the edge of the bed, and I could see its hands holding onto the edge. As soon as it realized I saw it, it quickly moved out of my sight, but I couldn't move my eyes. Then it peeped into frame again just to make sure and left. I heard some rummaging in my room as if it was looking for something. And then when I could look, I saw it standing where my mirror used to be, and it looked disfigured. But it looked like me. It had my clothes on and its limbs were bent, and it was frantic for some reason. I went back to sleep and woke up, and I don't remember until maybe midday that I started freaking out. I think this is what they call a mimic spirit. I never feel alone. I only see these things or feel like something is with me when I'm alone or when I'm alone and it's night, especially in the car. When I'm on FaceTime, I feel safe, but when I'm on a regular call, I still feel a weight on me. There's always something watching and I feel like I'm the only one that notices, even in hotels. I feel like it's maybe not just me and something's actually going on. I don't know what to do. I don't want this to continue into college or something like that. I'm not scared of anything and never will be. I'm just very confused and wonder if anyone else has experienced this. My life is gone. As a lifelong resident of New Mexico, I've never ventured beyond my home state. Growing up, my family consisted of my mother, two young brothers, and an infant sister. My father passed away from heart cancer when I was very young, leaving us to live in a severely old, decrepit, and broken-down two-bedroom house. Despite its state, it was our home and we made the best of it. On the night before my 16th birthday, my mom gave me $200 and entrusted me to take care of the house and my younger brothers while she went out with my little sister. She sternly warned me against any drugs or alcohol and instructed me to inspect her home at precisely midnight. With my mom's trust and a few friends, I settled in for a low-key evening of food and movies. After dozing off while watching something delinquent on TV around 11 p.m., I set my alarm to wake up early and hang out with my girlfriend Kayla. However, when I woke up, everything seemed off. My mother wasn't home, which was unusual as she never left the house without telling me. Confused and disoriented, I realized that I wasn't even in my own home. I was in an upper-class white person's house, to put it bluntly. Panic set in as I frantically searched for my brother, brother or sister, anybody. I woke up my friend who was still sleeping on the couch and demanded to know what was going on. He insisted that they were in my house and that I didn't have any siblings. He also suggested that my mother was probably out partying or something. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. The baby stuff, my brother's toys, and their beds were all missing. My mom's room was trashed with beer cans and an overwhelming smell of cigarettes hung in the air. My mom never drank or smoked. I couldn't fathom that she would let us see her in the state. I lost control and spent the next several hours tearing apart the house, searching the neighborhood and practically ripping out my hair in desperation. My best friend was scared and eventually left barely speaking to me since. When my mom finally arrived home that night, she was drunk and laughed at my panicked state. 
asking if I was high. I sought counseling and medication to try to make sense of the situation, but to no avail. I couldn't shake the feeling that everything was wrong. Even to this day, I know that this world I'm living in is fake. I can't remember a life before this one, and nothing feels right. It's a constant struggle to hold on to my sanity and not completely lose myself in this fabricated reality. I cling to the hope that someday, somehow, I will find my way back to the life that was stolen from me. Real story from when I was 10 to 11. When I think back to my childhood, there's one particular incident that still gives me the chills. I must have been around 10 or 11 years old, although I can't quite recall the exact age. I remember being home alone with our beloved Husky, who was always quite vocal, but on this day, he was eerily quiet. He just sat there, staring intently at our front door. At first, I didn't think much of it, I assumed he was just being a dog, maybe sensing something outside. But as time went on, it became clear that something was off. The husky was usually so lively and animated, but today he was just sitting there, still as a statue, with his eyes fixed on the door. After a while, I couldn't take it anymore. I stood up from where I was sitting, and I walked over to the door, feeling a sense of unease that I couldn't quite explain while doing that. I peered through the glass, and that's when I saw her, a girl who looked almost exactly like me, but with long hair and green eyes. My own hair was cut short, and my eyes were hazel, so the similarities were striking. I felt a strange mix of curiosity and fear as I opened the door to greet her, but when I did, she was gone. There was no one there. I shrugged it off, thinking it was just my imagination playing tricks on me. I shut the door and turned around and went back to the spot on the couch. That's when I saw her crouching behind the couch, hiding from view. I froze, unsure of what to do. I wanted to approach her to see if she was real, but at the same time I was terrified. How could there be someone who looked so much like me? Was this some kind of prank? As I hesitated, the girl disappeared into thin air. I was left standing there heart pounding, trying to make sense of what had just happened. When my parents got home, I told them everything that had occurred. My stepdad was dismissive, telling me that it was probably just my imagination, but my mom had a different reaction. She looked horrified, as if she had seen a ghost. When I asked her about it later, she refused to tell me what was going on, leaving me to wonder if there was more to the story than I had realized. Till this day, I can't shake the feeling that there's something deeply unsettling about that experience. I don't know if the girl was real, or if she was some kind of apparition or figment of my imagination, but what I do know is that it left a lasting impression on me, one that I won't soon forget. I still don't know what I saw years ago, and I'm at a loss for answers. About a year ago, my wife and I were invited over to my grandmother's apartment. She was developing mobility issues, and she needed our help. That night was particularly challenging as my grandmother was quite stubborn, and it was close to midnight. Both my wife and I were exhausted, but we didn't want to leave her alone. We helped her to the bathroom and then moved her to her bed. That's when something strange happened. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw something black and quick and small dart across the room. At first, I thought it was one of my cats, but when I went in the direction to where it went, there was nothing there. My wife noticed how annoyed I became when I first saw it, but I chalked it up to being tired and I didn't say anything. The next day, we were back at my grandmother's place again, helping her out around the same time. As we were moving her to her room, I saw my wife look toward my legs, and then she had a confused expression on her face. After my grandmother went to bed, I asked my wife what had happened, and at first she said nothing. But when I mentioned what I saw yesterday, she said she saw the same thing. She thought it was one of our cats, but she couldn't find it. She saw it dart across from my legs to the bathroom. I have no idea what it was, and neither does she. 
at first I was hesitant to say ghost or anything like that because I'm an atheist and I've always tried to see the rational side of everything. But I got nothing. Our cats were upstairs. There were no mice or rats and there were no medical issues on our end that could have caused us to see something like that. Despite my rational nature, I couldn't shake the feeling that something strange was going on. I started to wonder if there was something in my grandmother's apartment that we could not see. Maybe there was a ghost or some other entity that was playing tricks. I didn't want to scare my wife or my grandmother, so I kept these thoughts to myself. Over the next few days, we continued to help my grandmother out, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. I started to pay closer attention to my surroundings, looking for any signs of movement or anything out of the ordinary. Yet, there was nothing. As days turned into weeks and weeks turned into months, I started to forget about what had even happened. Life got busy and I didn't have time to dwell. But every now and then, when I was alone, I would think back to that night and wonder what it was that we saw. Looking back on it now, I still have no idea what it was. Maybe it was just my imagination, or maybe there's something else going on there. Either way, it was a strange experience that I'll never forget. Kinda weird thing happened today. I used to have a 15-year-old Pomeranian who had been in the family since I was a young teen. She was the family dog, but now about seven years ago, my mom moved to a place where she couldn't keep her. So the dog became mine. She was quite a little brat when it came to getting into the garbage, no matter where it was. She would tear into it and make a huge mess wherever she had the chance. As a result, she was banned from ever going into the kitchen, unattended. It was a struggle because she knew she wasn't supposed to do it, but she was so sneaky about it and sometimes would tip over the kitchen bin and rip up everything in there. It was always the same ritual. Knock down the bin, drag out the bag, pick through it, and take a few things that would be found in obscure places later. My family always jokingly referred to her as the garbage hound because it was such a trait of her personality. But last month she passed away after a cancer diagnosis. She went downhill really fast and she was gone before it even really hit me that she was sick. It's been hard, as these things always are. Today, I went out for a few hours to get some groceries and stuff and something strange happened. When I got back, I walked into the kitchen, and the garbage bin was tipped over, and the bag was clearly pulled out. And there was trash scattered all across the floor. I literally just stared at it for a few seconds while my mind was registering it and running through what could have happened here. I live alone, and it wasn't tipped when I left. I could never leave a mess like that. I was trying to see if something or fell or somehow got tipped in the bin and everything just fell out, but it looked picked through just the way it did when my dog got into it. One thing was a yogurt container that was across the entire kitchen and under a table. She'd always specifically take small containers like that. I know it sounds stupid, but I really think it could have fallen on its own. I have one other dog, but she's a tiny two-pound chihuahua and she can't walk on hard floors because she slips and hurts her legs. She was in my carpeted room. She would have had to walk down the hall and through the living room and into the kitchen, all of which have hardwood floors. She wouldn't have been able to tip over the bin by herself either, and has never gotten into the garbage once, so I just don't know. It's not that serious, but it's just weird. It's almost as if my dog was still there and wanted to remind me of her little quirk before she left. I miss her so much, and this just makes me feel like she's still with me in some way. Rather post this here than Facebook. Throughout my life, I've experienced unexplainable occurrences that were never violent in nature, but still left me with an uneasy feeling. I used to brush them off, attributing them to my cat, Misha or Bishop, who were known to cause mischief around the house. However, it became clear that my pets couldn't be responsible for everything, especially when they were by my side or in another room altogether. The strange happenings began when I was around eight or nine years old, long before I had any pets. 
I vividly recall feeling a presence in my room, even when I was alone. Sometimes I'd hear whispers that I couldn't quite make out, or see a shadow dart across the wall. These occurrences were sporadic, but they left me feeling uneasy. As I grew older, the strange happenings continued. Sometimes the door would close by itself, and I'd hear knocking sounds coming from within the house. My collectibles, including my Funko Pop dolls and trolls, would be rearranged or moved into different locations. I'd hear voices, too, when no one was speaking, and my cats would hiss or chirp for no apparent reason. Recently, my roommate and I had a particularly unsettling experience. We were in the middle of a conversation when he suddenly went silent, his face pale and his eyes glazed over. He pointed behind me, and when I turned around, I saw nothing out of the ordinary, but my roommate swears he saw somebody peeking at us from the doorway leading to our hallway. That same day, I was sound asleep with my vacuum cleaner powered on by itself. The following day, it happened again, and random music would often start playing on surround sound system. Even though none of our phones were connected to Bluetooth, we didn't recognize the songs. But the scariest incident happened about a month ago. I was playing Super Smash Brothers when out of the corner of my eye I saw my Bluetooth speaker stand up and tip over off the table. I posted about it on Facebook, but when my brother made fun of me, I took the post down. On that same day, while I was in my bedroom, I heard three loud knocks come from my bathroom. The knocks were so forceful, it was as if the police were banging on the door. All of these experiences have left me feeling unnerved and unsure of what to do. While I try to convince myself that there must be some rational explanation, deep down I know that something unexplainable is happening. And with each new occurrence, I can't help but wonder what else is out there. My Parents' Haunted Neighborhood When I graduated college, I moved back home to live with my parents for a while. Their community in the southwestern U.S. is in the middle of the desert, and it can get pretty dark at night, especially when there's no moon or clouds in the sky. But that wasn't the only reason that living in that neighborhood was an interesting experience. It was also known for its paranormal activity. People would post on the community Facebook page asking if anyone had any strange experiences, and the comments on those posts would be flooded with people sharing their own stories. My parents had this odd cat that would never go outside unless someone was with her, and one night I was home alone watching TV when the cat came darting past me and ran to the sliding glass door that opened to the backyard. She was in her low, sneaky position as if she was about to hunt or attack something. She was also fixated on something in the back corner of the yard. Curious about what had caught her attention, I opened the door and let her out. She ran up the bushes out of the corner of the yard and stopped in her tracks. I walked outside to see what was going on. It was one of those dark, moonless nights, so I couldn't see much except the outline of the bushes. Suddenly, an orb of bright yellow light flew out of the bushes, about the size of a softball. The orb went up and over the cinder block wall into the neighbor's yard. The cat and I both jumped in fright. I went back inside feeling uneasy about what I'd just witnessed. A few hours later, the cat showed up in the window, still in a state of panic. A few days later, my parents returned from their vacation and I told them about my experience. This freaked out my mom, who was reading the community Facebook posts about the neighborhood having paranormal activity. And that night, I saw a bunch of police cars show up outside the neighbor's house and ours. The police officers had their guns drawn as they got out of their cars. I alerted my parents and we watched from the windows. The next door neighborhood girl was outside talking to the police, but we couldn't hear what she was saying. The police searched her house and found nothing, but the next day, my dad called her neighbor to ask if everyone was okay and see if they needed any help. Apparently, their daughter was home alone when she saw a black, shadowy figure in the end of the hallway. She screamed and ran for her phone, calling the police, and they searched the house and the surrounding area, but found nothing. It's interesting that the orb I saw flew into their yard a few nights before this incident. I still don't know what caused the orb, and the experience still gives me chills to this day. The paranormal activity in that neighborhood is just too real.
My mom saw a demon. Allow me to regale you with a spine-chilling tale from the depths of my family's history, an eerie incident that befell my dear mother during her childhood. Picture this. Every weekend, my grandparents would gather, my mom, my uncle, and themselves, for a customary visit to their own parents residing in a far-flung state. Now, the ancestral abode of my great-grandparents held a peculiar distinction, for it was nestled upon Native American land, a place teeming with an abundance of supernatural happenings. This detail, my friends, plays a pivotal role in the unfolding of this story. In the midst of these weekend sojourns, a fateful night cast a dark and unforgettable spell upon my mother's dreamscape. Within this haunting reverie, she found herself accompanied by her parents and her aunt, embarking on a surreal odyssey through a world where reality seamlessly intertwined with the realms of imagination. To her dismay, the tranquil dwelling that housed her kin was suddenly seized by the wrath of a ferocious tornado, violently uprooting the very foundation upon which their lives stood. Amidst the chaos, her aunt succumbed to panic, desperately fleeing through the front door, only to meet a grisly fate as she impaled herself upon a menacing tree stump. As my mother jolted awake from this nightmarish vision, she found herself engulfed in a torment of fear. Desperate to make sense of the disturbing imagery that had invaded her slumber, my mother mustered the courage to confide in my grandmother, recounting every chilling detail. Alas, her plea for solace and understanding was met with dismissive wave of the hand. Her grandmother ascribing her vivid imagination and the harrowing nightmare to the unrestrained wanderings of a child's mind. Little did they know that the line between dreams and reality was about to blur in the most sinister fashion. Time whisked my family away to an unforgettable weekend when their footsteps carried them to the hollowed grounds of my great-grandparents' house. Unbeknownst to my mother, a rendezvous with the supernatural awaited her within the confines of that ancestral estate. Alongside one of her cousins, she embarked on a leisurely exploration on the sprawling property, immersing themselves in a playful game that befit the innocence of their youth. Yet destiny had far more chilling plans in store for their unsuspecting soul. Something has been mimicking my family. My great-grandparents owned a considerable amount of land in Oklahoma, on some Indian land. We're not exactly sure of the significance of this land, whether it was where Native Americans lived at some point or a burial ground. However, it's where their house was built. I have two somewhat similar stories about this place, and I'll update you with the details of the second story when I get them streamlined from my mom and grandma. It seems like whatever entity is there has been following my family ever since. My mom has had similar experiences, and now I'm experiencing some stuff too. For the sake of this story and my sanity, I'll refer to my great-grandfather as Mark and my grandma as Carol, who happens to be the youngest in the family. Carol has a very large family, and I can't remember the exact number of siblings due to some dying at birth, but there were a ton of kids living in that house. Mark was an alcoholic, and to put it nicely, a butthead. One summer day, Carol and her siblings were out outside playing around, moving their mattress so they could sleep outside. It was hot outside, so they were giggling and being loud. Suddenly, Mark stormed outside, very intoxicated, carrying an axe. He told them to shut up and started to mock them, laughing. I'm sure there were some not-so-nice things said based on what I heard about him. He walked back inside once the siblings agreed to keep it down. Enough time had passed, and they knew it wasn't just an echo that they were hearing. Deep in the brush past the house, they heard Mark's voice saying the same thing in the same tone, even down to the giggle. The kids got freaked out and ran inside to make sure he didn't go outside to scare them. To their surprise, they found Mark inside, sleeping in his recliner. The story always struck me, because it's just so strange. My great-grandfather was notorious for being a drunk, and not a very nice person to be around at that. But it seems like even after his passing, he was still around and not in a pleasant way. When my grandma and her siblings heard Mark's voice in the brush, it was as if he was still there, 
mocking them even though he was asleep in his recliner. I didn't know what to make of it, but it's just weird. When I visited the property, I always had a strange feeling, like someone was watching me, not in a good way. Even when I was in the house, I felt uneasy, like there was someone or something else there with me. I brushed it off as just my imagination, but now I'm experiencing some strange things too. I'm starting to wonder if it was more than just my imagination. Maybe there's something there and it's not a friendly presence. Whatever it is, I hope it doesn't follow me back home. Experiences from working in a real haunted building. Let me tell you about the time I worked at a haunted house in my hometown during October. It was an old building that was built back in 1916 and was originally a hotel. Over the years, it had changed hands several times, and it was a hospital and an apartment building at different points in time, among other things. The building had been abandoned for a while, but every few years, someone would try to raise money and do something with it. Eventually, a local high school drama teacher bought it and turned it into a haunted house experience. I was initially brought in to be a substitute actor, but ended up getting a position because the girl who worked in the room before me refused to work alone. At first, she tried to stop people from telling me why, but eventually I found out that she had been scratched up pretty badly by something or someone while standing alone in the shower in the room. She still worked there, but just refused to be alone. As soon as I stepped into the room, I could feel a bad vibe. It was an unsettling feeling that would make me hate being there alone every night. The second thing I noticed was a rocking horse in the corner of the room. It was hanging in the corner, but it would rock all the time. I wasn't pushing it or anything. There wasn't any particular breeze. It just rocked continuously. The next thing that caught my attention was a super loud sound of running water behind me all the time. The pipes in the building didn't work at all, so water shouldn't have been going through them. It also wasn't raining or anything. I never figured out what that sound was, but it was there every night. Another strange occurrence that happened quite frequently was our technology stopped working a lot. Our lights and sounds that we used for the performance would randomly stop working all the time. But it wasn't a total power outage or anything like that. It was just like strobe lights or speakers that would shut down. There were a few nights when I took my phone out of the box where all the actors put their phones and my phone would go all wacky. I don't remember all the details, as it's been years at this point, but when I turned on my phone, it was some sort of black-blue screen with colored or white text that covered the entire screen. It was weird that it only ever happened in that building. Despite all the creepy things that happened, though, I loved working there. The thrill of scaring people and the adrenaline rush that would come with it, unmatched. I guess it's true what they say. Some people just love the thrill of the unknown, and I'm definitely one of them. Giant chicken prints in the snow. When I was around 17 or 18 years old, back in 2011 and 2012, something really strange happened to me and my friends. It was the kind of thing that you never forget, no matter how many years go by. It all started with my buddy, who lived a few blocks away from me, stole a rosary off a headstone at a cemetery. I know it sounds really bad, but we were just dumb kids at the time. Now let me tell you about this cemetery. It's an old cemetery where the founders of the town are buried. And connected to the cemetery is an old farmhouse. The whole area is definitely haunted. We would always shortcut through it to get to our neighborhood. Even though we knew it was a really bad idea. But we were young and dumb and we thought it was exciting to go through there. So on this particular night, I wasn't with my friend when he took the rosary. But I met up with him at his house later that night. We were all just hanging out on the couch when his phone rang. His phone was on the coffee table next to the rosary and the caller ID read unavailable, misspelled and all. The number that showed on the phone was 666-666-6666. We all got spooked I told him to answer it, but he didn't. We all just sat there feeling uneasy. After a while, I decided to go home for the night. 
And this all happened during the three days a year, three days a year that we have snow or ice in Texas. It was already really creepy. and The weather just added to the eerie feeling in the air. The next day we met up again and I shit you not, there were these giant chicken prints that came from the creek that we had to cross over between our neighborhood and the cemetery going right up to the window of his room where we were all hanging out the night before. These prints were bigger than my hand and had three toes facing forward and another small one facing backwards, identical to a chicken, just much bigger. We were all really freaked out. It was like something out of a horror movie. What's also weird is that the tracks just ended at the window. There were no tracks leaving the window. It was like whatever made those prints just appeared out of nowhere and disappeared the same way. We never did find out what happened that night, but I know that I'll never forget it, even now, years later. Whenever I think about it, I get chills down my spine. It was like we were being watched by something. Something that we couldn't see or understand. And even though I'm older now, I don't believe in ghosts or the supernatural. But I can't help but wonder what really happened. The Clocks Encounter when I was younger, around elementary or middle school age, I used to spend weekends at my grandparents' house. It was a regular occurrence, nothing out of the ordinary. Whenever I stayed over, I slept in the guest room, which was a typical room with a double bed, a big wardrobe, and a small table in the corner with a TV on it. What made this room unique was the two long shelves filled with clocks. I remember counting around 20 clocks in total, ranging from old to new, cheap to expensive, and even alarm clocks. They all had their own distinctive ticking sound, which filled the room and lulled me to sleep every night. One particular night, however, everything changed. I woke up in the middle of the night feeling uneasy. At first I couldn't quite put my finger on what was wrong, but then I realized the ticking sound of the clocks had changed. They were no longer making the regular tic-tac sound, Instead, each clock would make a tick noise, and then the sound of a deep voice saying, Tack, would follow. It was as if a man was standing in the room saying, Tack, every time the clock was ticking. I tried to ignore it, thinking it was just my imagination playing tricks on me. But the sound continued, and it only got louder and louder. I started to panic, feeling as though something was very wrong. I attempted to go back to sleep by covering my head with a pillow, but that didn't work. I could still hear the voice saying, Tack, over and over again, getting louder and faster each time. In a moment of sheer terror, I made the decision to leave the room and run to my grandma's bedroom. As I approached the door, the sound grew louder and quicker, the voice now yelling, Tack, with increasing intensity. I bolted out of the room and the sound immediately ceased. I didn't stop running until I reached my grandma's bed, where I told her everything that had just happened. We prayed together, and I ended up sleeping in her bed for the rest of the night. From that point on, I continued to spend weekends at my grandparents' house, but we always removed the clocks from the guest room at night. I never experienced anything like that again, but I have had other paranormal encounters since then, and interestingly, some of these have also been related to clocks, but none have been as frightening as that night in the guest room. The man with the top hat. Good, bad, or neutral? I recall my friend telling me a story about a man in a top hat that their sister had been seeing in her mirror for the past decade. They didn't know much about the man, whether he's good, bad, or neutral, but they wanted to know if anyone had any information about him. According to their sister, this all started about 10 years ago when she began experimenting with a Ouija board and drugs such as psychedelics, cocaine, and weed. She was also being reckless and taking risks. During this time, she began to see a man in a top hat in her mirror at night. He was all black and he had no face, but he was definitely a man with a top hat. 
My friend's sister would see him in her bad nights, and even though she moved four or five times since then, she's still seen him in the mirror at night. In fact, it doesn't take long for him to appear once again. Unfortunately, my friend's sister's life hasn't improved much since, and she's now in a much worse situation than she was a decade ago. There was also an incident where she had a sleepover with a female friend a few years ago. The friend got up to use the bathroom and claims to have seen a man in the mirror as well, although she initially thought it was just a dream. As an AI language model, I don't have any experience with this man, but I can certainly understand why my friend's curious about him. The fact that he's been appearing in the mirror for a decade is concerning, especially since my friend's sister has been seeing him during difficult times in her life. I wonder if there's any correlation between the man in the top hat and the Ouija boards and the drugs that my user sister was interacting with. Perhaps she unwittingly opened up a portal or attracted some sort of entity that's now attached to her. It's certainly possible that this man could be a negative entity that's feeding off of her energy. It might be a good idea to reach out to a paranormal investigator or a spiritual practitioner to get some advice on how to deal with the situation. They might be able to offer some insight into who or what this man could be and how to rid oneself of its presence. Overall, it's a curious and intriguing story, and I can see why my friend's interested in learning more about this mysterious man in the top hat. I hope they find some answers, and that their sister's able to find some peace from this experience. Precognitive Dreams I had a series of very strange dreams that I just can't explain. It all started in December 2020, about a week before New Year's Eve. I had a dream that I was in a hotel that I'd only visited once during my lifetime. And strangely, I didn't see any people in my dreams, but I felt the presence of my late grandmother, who passed away in 2018, and my girlfriend at the time. It was as if they were there, but couldn't see them. Suddenly the scenery changed, but I found myself walking in town. My phone rang, and it was my girlfriend. And she started the conversation with the word, Sweetie, we have a plan for New Year's. And it was a bit odd, and then I woke up. After a few days, my girlfriend called and said that she had arranged to celebrate New Year's Eve at her friend's house, and she started the conversation the same way that it was in my dream. I told her about the dream, and she said that I had a very strong intuition. I didn't know what to think about it, but it was weird. Another strange thing happened a week or two later in January. In my dream, I was sitting in the living room. My father asked me if I'd bought bread from the bread shop, where I buy bread every day. I said that I'd overslept, but it was already closed when I got there. Then when I woke up, I went and checked my phone, saw a couple of messages and calls from my father. My sister and I were the only ones home at that time, and my phone was on silent, and I called my father back, and he asked me if I had bought bread. I said that I didn't, and that I just woke up. After that, I checked the clock, and it showed 12.50, and the bread shop closes at 13. It was an unusual occurrence because I never sleep later than 9 a.m. I got ready and went to the bread shop to find it closed. The last strange thing happened last week. One of my colleagues at work had a husband who had bypass surgery, and he was in the hospital. That night I had a dream of my heart stopping out of nowhere, and I had to drink coffee to keep it working. It was like fighting for my own life. My heart would stop, and it would. I'd try to get it back. The next morning, the woman wasn't at work, and everyone was talking about her husband, who had died during the night after many unsuccessful attempts of defrib. It was a bit spooky, and I couldn't help but wonder if there was some connection between my dream and the woman's loss. All in all, these dreams were quite strange and unexplainable. I can't help but wonder if there's something more to them, something beyond my understanding. Ghost Experience When I Was a Kid when I was seven years old, my family moved into a one-story house in Los Angeles, California. 
My mom had always loved this house, but was outbid when it had been on the market previously. Now a few years later, it was on sale again, and this time my parents had the winning bid. The house had a dining room that had been painted black, and my mom heard that the previous owners had been conducting seances there. However, this didn't scare her off, since she had grown up with her mother using a Ouija board and tarot cards. We had many paranormal experiences in that house, but one particular experience sticks out in my mind. My sister and I shared a room, but she usually went to sleep in our parents' room almost every night because she got scared. One night, I was woken up by tapping on my shoulder. When I opened my eyes, I saw the silhouette of an adult man walking slowly across my room. It was like a shadow on a far wall, and I still clearly remember his profile. He was tall with a sharp pointy nose and strong jawline. I froze in fear watching as the man walked slowly and then disappeared. I was terrified and hid under my blankets pretending to be asleep, not sure if what I saw was a ghost or an intruder. The next morning I told my parents about what had happened, and they were silent for a minute. That's when I knew I wasn't the only one experiencing things in that house. My father started experiencing severe night terrors including one night where he thought he was physically fighting someone and fell through our bedroom's glass window. We didn't live there for a long time, but the paranormal experiences didn't stop after we moved. We had only moved a few blocks away to a rental house that we lived in for about a year before my parents bought another house, and that was just a couple blocks away. It made me wonder if there was something in that entire vicinity. The experiences that we had in those other two houses were just as strange as the first house, we had a sudden rat infestation, our dog died for no reason, things went missing, and we had ghost sightings. If that wasn't enough to make me sound crazy, I also had an experience with fairies, but I'll save that for another post. My main ghost story is definitely when I was seven, and I was awoken by a ghost man in the middle of the night. I'll never forget it, I'd love to say it was my first and only ghost experience, but it was neither. It's possible that the paranormal activity followed us from house to house, and I'll never forget the terrifying experiences I had during my childhood. Mimicked in Algonquin Park In 2019, I had the opportunity to go on a canoe trip with my uncle to an Algonquin Park in Ontario, Canada. We embarked on a four-day portage trip, where we carried a canoe to a lake, crossed it, and then hiked to the other lake. We started to access Point 12, Pine Tree Lake, and after two days of paddling, we reached Sylvia Lake, where we set up camp for the night. After setting up our tent and taking a refreshing swim, my uncle and I decided to take a leisurely paddle around the lake. It was close to sunset, and the warm colors of the sky were stunning. We paddled northwest of our campsite, and we were just enjoying the peace and tranquility of the lake when a large bird flew overhead. In a goofy mood, I decided to make a caw sound at the bird. My uncle and I chuckled at my silliness, but our laughter was cut short when we heard the exact same sound coming from the swampy bay to our east. My uncle and I looked at each other with confusion. We knew it couldn't have been an echo because it was too close, and there wasn't anything in that direction that could have bounced the sound back to us with. Curious, my uncle asked to do it again. Caw, one, two, three, caw. I think I saw a ghost or a shadow or something. When I was younger, my family and I went on a trip to New Orleans. And we were staying in a pretty old hotel. It had an old feeling to it, and I didn't think too much of it. It was just eerie. It was just a place to sleep after all, but that's where I had my first paranormal experience. One night, my dad and I were laying down in bed. The room was completely dark. The only light was from the lamp post outside from the window. My dad was already asleep, and I was facing his back. As I rolled around to the other side, facing away from him, that's when I saw it. There was this man with a hat and a long coat, and he was holding a briefcase. I couldn't really see his face. It was like a shadow or an outline of a person, not a physical human. He didn't do anything, but just stood there. I was super freaked out and didn't know how to react. I couldn't tell if I was having sleep paralysis, though I don't think it was because I was still able to move my body and blink my eyes and stuff, or just my mind playing tricks with me. But there it was, standing right in front of me. 
I didn't wake up my dad because I didn't want to scare him or have him think I was crazy. I just stared at this figure for what felt like an eternity. I had a creepy night. As I chatted away on the phone with my friend, the topic of the supernatural occurrences somehow came up. We talked about it a few minutes, and as I paced back and forth in my house, I walked by the door of my sunroom and heard a whisper, barely audible, saying something like, I am with you. I froze for a second, completely spooked, but tried to brush it off as just my imagination running wild. I quickly told my friend, no shit, man. I actually heard a voice. I continued to pace around my house as we talked, but my mind was no longer on the conversation. Suddenly, I heard a loud banging coming from my sunroom, and my cat jumped up in my surprise. I was already on edge from the earlier whisper, so this just added to my anxiety. A little while later, as I walked by the sunroom door again, I heard another whisper. This time, it was too inaudible to make out any words. Later, while sitting in my living room, I noticed my cat jumping around the window, as if she were trying to attack something outside. I got up to investigate, but didn't see anything out of the ordinary. But as I looked out the window, I saw a shadowy figure swaying by my car parked in the street. At this point, I started to panic. I called a mental health hotline, hoping that this was all just a figment of my imagination, or maybe a result of some kind of mental health issue I wasn't aware of. And as I tried to explain what was happening to the person on the other end of the line, there was a loud buzz that interrupted the call for a few seconds. It was unsettling, but I tried to continue the conversation. But the person on the hotline wasn't that helpful. They just kept asking me about my medication and when I had last taken it. As time passed, I grew increasingly anxious. I couldn't sleep, so I stayed up and watched the clock. About an hour later, I heard the melody of Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star coming from somewhere inside the house. It was unsettling, to say the least. I followed the sound and eventually found a sound machine that we kept in the house for my niece that had gone off. I turned it off and stayed in the room for a while, too afraid to leave and have it turned back on immediately after. Finally, about 30 minutes later, my dog started staring at the front window looking extremely stressed. I didn't know what to do or what to make of these events, but I knew that I didn't want to experience anything like that ever again. Where is Jim? To give you some context, I've never experienced anything paranormal in my life at all and my husband is a real skeptic. He doesn't believe in anything supernatural or ghostly. Also, my paternal grandfather passed away before I was born, so I never got to meet him. My grandmother had remarried, and my only grandfather figure growing up was my step-grandfather, whom we're going to call Ed. My parents divorced when I was about four years old, and I've been estranged from my dad's side of the family ever since. Fast forward to 2016, I was 24 years old and married with a three-year-old daughter. My husband and daughter had only ever met my maternal grandparents, who we were very close to. One morning, my husband woke up and said that he had a strange dream. He said that there was a man in her house, and he looked like my grandfather, but he wasn't my maternal grandfather, whom he had met before. The man did not speak but my husband somehow knew that he was there to check in on us and make sure that we were okay. I found this strange, but I didn't think much of it and I went about my day. Later the same day, my daughter was playing in the living room and out of nowhere she asked me, Mommy, where's Jim? I was confused and asked her what she meant. She didn't respond, so I shrugged it off and went back to what I was doing. Later that day, I was talking to my mom on the phone and told her about my husband's dream. My mom replied, Your grandfather Jim was a wonderful man. He would have loved you and Brian. I was stunned. Did she say his name was Jim? How could my daughter have known that name? My grandfather had passed away before I was even born, and we rarely talked about him. It was a strange coincidence, to say the least. I still get the chills when I think about it. 
Since then, I've experienced a few more strange occurrences that I can't explain. Sometimes I feel like my grandfather is still checking in on us. My husband is still a skeptic, but even he admits that there might be something to this. We've had unexplained sounds, footsteps, and even the occasional feeling of someone touching us when there's no one there. My daughter has also had a few instances where she mentioned Jim. I don't know what to make of it all, but I choose to believe that my grandfather is still with us in some way. Old Pacemaker in a Drawer I recently lost my beloved mother to a heart complication. She had been on her second pacemaker, and when it was replaced, they let us keep the old one. It's been three years now, and we kept it in a drawer in our living room. It had stayed quietly there until recently when something strange happened. Before the pacemaker was replaced, it used to make a noise to alert us that the battery was running low. At the end of my mother's life, her current pacemaker was making this noise a lot, but the doctors turned it off for good. It had just been over a week since my mother passed away, and yesterday, the pacemaker in the drawer started making the same noise. At first, we thought it was coming from the TV, and it gave us a big fright and brought us back to her last week in the hospital, hearing that noise over and over again. It was really weird because this particular pacemaker hadn't made a sound in years, and now it was suddenly talking to us. As you can imagine, this experience left us all feeling quite spooked and unsettled, we didn't know what to make of it, but it was clear that there was something strange going on. We tried to think of logical explanations for why this might be happening, but nothing seemed to fit. Was it just a coincidence, or was there something more to it? After talking to a few people, we learned that the concept of residual energy, it's the idea that objects can hold energy from past events, which can sometimes manifest in strange ways. It's possible that my mother's pacemaker was still holding on to her energy, and that's why it was making the same noises again. It's a comforting thought. In a way, to think that a part of her is still with us, right? Of course, there are other explanations. Maybe there was a glitch in the pacemaker system, or maybe it was just a fluke. But for me and my family, the idea of the residual energy is a compelling one. It's a reminder that our loved ones never truly leave us, even if after they're gone. In some small way, they continue to exist in the world all around us, through the things they touched and the memories they left behind. Regardless of what caused the pacemaker to start making noise again, it's been a source of comfort for us for a long time. It's a small reminder of my mother's presence in our lives and we're grateful for it. It's strange how even the most unexpected things can bring us a little bit of peace when we need it the most. Hide and seek in the dark, the ghost of Grandma B. When I was around 10 or 11 years old, my best friend's family inherited a house from an old lady who his mom had been caring for. They called her Grandma B, and as far as I knew, she had lived in that house for decades. The house was nice and it had been renovated somewhat recently before she passed away. I remember that she died in the house while in care of my friend's mom. Me and my friend really enjoyed playing hide-and-seek in the dark, and it was just a lot more fun that way. I had never been scared of the dark or had any anticipations of seeing anything, but that changed during the first weekend I stayed there when they moved in. I want to describe the layout of the house here so that you can better understand what happened. When you walked through the front door, the garage door was to your left, and the kitchen was to your right. The living room was right next to the kitchen, and it was an open floor plan, so you could see everything. If you walked straight, you would walk right through the door to the gaming room that we would use at the time, and if you took a left right before the gaming room, you would be in the short but wide hallway that would turn right after a few feet. So we were about ten rounds into this game of hide-and-seek, and nothing had happened. We were just having fun, and I was counting face down on the couch facing the kitchen, when I got up and turned around to face the gaming room in the hallway, I immediately saw what I thought was my friend walking into the hallway. I saw him taking multiple steps before disappearing. 
Only me and him were awake at the time. I was so sure that what I saw that I said, Timmy, come on, man. You got to do better than that. I saw you go into the hallway. You had forever to hide. I walked into the hallway to get him, but behind me, the gaming room door opened and he walked out of it. I've had experiences in my life, but this is the only time I'm 99.9% .9 sure I saw a ghost. It was a faded white silhouette and I saw every limb. I mostly saw the back of its head, but I saw its ears and nose too. I was genuinely freaked out, but it also offered me a sort of peace for what comes after you die. It's strange to think that someone who might have lived in that house for so long could still be there. But it's also kind of comforting to know that maybe Grandma B was still around, watching over the house that she had lived in for so many years. Very specific messages in dreams. Losing my senior dog has been one of the most traumatic experiences of my life. The thought of not being able to prevent its death left me feeling helpless and guilty. I couldn't shake off the feeling of grief and it consumed me completely. The night after his passing, I was afraid to go to sleep. I knew that I'd have nothing but nightmares about the event that had taken place. I prayed to whomever would listen for forgiveness but the feeling of guilt stayed with me. I spent hours tossing and turning in bed, unable to sleep. It felt like I was carrying a heavy weight on my chest, and I couldn't shake off the feeling of despair. But then something strange happened. In the early morning, I had a very specific dream, and in my dream, I kept repeating an address in my head. Something like 10197 Nurtons Avenue. It felt like a message that I had to remember because it was related to my dog and it was maybe of the utmost importance. When I woke up, I was confused and curious. I typed the address into the search engine, but nothing came up. It was a strange address and I didn't really make any sense to me. It sounded similar to a street called Morton's Avenue that I knew of, so I tried that one. The address had no meaning or significance to me in real life. However, when I searched for it on the map, it led me to a patch of woods. I used to look around, or rather I used the look around option to see if there was anything that stood out. And that's when I saw it. A sign pointing towards a patch of woods that read Dog Park. It hit me then that I used to take my dog to that park when he was a puppy. It had been years since I'd been there, but the memory was still fresh in my mind. I'd like to think that my dog remembered it too and that he was trying to communicate with me from beyond the veil. It was too specific and odd to discount as a coincidence. I had never known the exact address of the dog park, and I hadn't thought about it in years. It felt like my dog was trying to tell me that he was okay, and that he was happy and playing amongst friends. I wondered if anyone else had any similar dreams or experiences. Maybe there was more to the world than what we could see, and maybe our loved ones were still with us in some way. It was comforting, and it gave me some solace in my time of grief. What's going on? Help! I live in a house surrounded by woods, and to be honest, I think it's haunted. At times, I thought I was hallucinating things, but my boyfriend confirms that he's seen and heard the same stuff too. My dog always growls and gets spooked by walls and closets and hallways, and things get thrown around the room for no apparent reason. Strangely, a child's voice can be heard in the house, but there are no children around here. Even weirder, there's a patch of woods about a hundred feet from my house that's giving us the creeps. One night, my boyfriend went outside with our dog and came back terrified saying that he heard what sounded like a human voice making gurgling pig noises from the woods. We decided to walk to the gas station at 1 a.m. the other night, and as soon as we approached the woods, around 50 or 70 birds started chirping loudly. Morning birds, mind you. But when we got closer to the woods, they stopped chirping all at once, and it gave us the heebie-jeebies. At night, we often hear children laughing in the patch of woods, but it's not just us. Even our neighbors have heard it too. We tried to record it once, 
but the laughter stopped the moment we took out our phones. And let's not forget about the screeching and yelling sounds, which we think might be an owl or a fox, but we're not completely sure. What's even more unsettling is that I feel like whatever is haunting her home is following me. A few years ago, I was lying on my bed, scrolling through my phone, when suddenly my bed started shaking violently, as if someone was trying to wake me up. I searched online and found out that some people think it's spirit trying to get your attention. No, thank you. When I was 10 years old, I was trying to fall asleep when I felt someone sit on the edge of my bed. I hid under the covers and peeked out hesitantly, but no one was there. I didn't have any pets back then, so I couldn't have been them. I feel like I have, maybe have this ability that I can sense bad energy and I can vibe things really well. I always know when I'm being watched and I get these symptoms almost every time something bad is about to happen. Lately I've been feeling the energy shift and I'm convinced that I'm being watched all the time. I'm always on edge and it's getting exhausting. Anyone else relate to ghost sightings with interdimensional beings rather than the deceased? Having delved into numerous accounts of near-death experiences, NDEs, I've come across fascinating tales where individuals find themselves detached from their physical form, seemingly emanating from the back of their head and ascending toward the ceiling. These individuals often describe their essence as nothing more than a pair of eyes, unable to perceive their own hands or feet. Amongst these intriguing narratives, one NDE account stood out to me. It involved a woman who encountered peculiar black blobs during her near-death journey. These enigmatic entities acted as if they were bullies, informing her that she possessed the power to manipulate objects with her thoughts alone. Strangely enough, the appearances of these black blobs bore resemblance to the hallucinations often depicted by individuals diagnosed with schizophrenia. Notably, such hallucinations are known to evolve and transform over time. Curiously, black blobs or clouds are not solely limited to NDEs, but are frequently observed during paranormal encounters within homes or even wooded areas. Furthermore, they emit an unmistakable scent of smoke and sulfur. It's interesting to note the parallel between these manifestations and phenomena associated with alien encounters or poltergeist activities. In fact, they share striking similarities with descriptions of interdimensional beings. This correlation leads me to ponder a thought-provoking question. Could these black blobs, devoid of physical bodies, actually be interdimensional beings? Perhaps when they do acquire a corporeal form, they transform into extraterrestrial entities. Could this transformation be a result of their involvement in numerous instances in breeding abductions? These musings invite introspection and open a gateway to speculation. While I am merely presenting these observations and hypotheses, I would be intrigued to hear your thoughts on this matter. It's a captivating realm where the boundaries between the physical and the metaphysical become blurred, urging us to explore the mysteries that lie beyond our conventional understanding. True Tale from My Granny when I was a child, my grandmother told me a story about how she got a massive candy cane-shaped scar on her inner thigh. She would often tell me this story whenever I got hurt and needed a bit of cheering up. It happened in the year 1944, when she was just 16 years old. My grandmother had a daily routine of walking to school, but being an adventurous teenager, she would often take shortcuts by hopping fences. And there was one particular fence that she had her eyes on, and if she could jump it, it would save her so much time. She tried many times to jump it, but she seemed to not be able to do it. She would have to hop the shorter fence on the left and walk all the way around the houses. One day, my grandmother was on her way home from school, and she was jumping fences like she usually did. As she jumped into the yard where she would have jumped the shorter fence, she noticed a man standing near it. 
The man was dressed in an old-fashioned suit, and my grandmother said that it was a pinstriped one with a black hat. At first, my grandmother was embarrassed because she thought that the man had caught her jumping fences. But when she looked closer, she realized that the man was only half of a man. He was solid at the top and faded out around his waist. She was scared, but she tried to stay calm and ran towards the tall fence to jump it. My grandmother ran as fast as she could toward the tall fence and jumped it. She was so scared that she didn't even notice that the fence had barbed wire on the top. And as she climbed over, it cut her inner thigh. When she finally made it home, she realized that her leg was covered in blood and her favorite skirt was ripped beyond repair. The scar from that incident stayed with my grandmother for the rest of her life, and it became a reminder to always be careful and be aware of your surroundings. Whenever she told me this story, I could see the scar on her inner thigh, and it always amazed me how something that happened so long ago could still be so vivid in her memory. My grandmother passed away many years ago, but I still think of her often and the stories that she told me. This story in particular has always stuck with me, and I retell it to others whenever I need a little bit of inspiration to be brave in the face of fear. My only ghost experience was a ghost cat. As a child, I lived in a house that was owned by an older couple who were hoarders and had a bunch of cats. I recall the house being cluttered and messy, with trash piling up four feet high in some areas. Eventually, the couple was evicted, and when the new owners came to clean the house, they found the remains of many dead cats. Even after my family moved out, the next owners discovered cat skeletons underneath the house. Ew. During our time in that house, we had one pet cat, a big fluffy gray and white Maine Coon. I remember frequently seeing cats out of the corners of my eye, or hearing meows that didn't quite sound like my cat. But I was always convincing myself that my mind was just playing tricks on me like usual. One day I was sitting in her office at the computer, working on something or other, and we had an L-shaped desk with a drawer on the right side. And as I was sitting there relaxing, I saw what I thought was my cat walking under the desk by my feet. I greeted the cat, saying hi to it, but then I did the one biggest double take of my entire life because this was not my cat. The cat was different, skinny and short-haired, white and translucent. I could see the black background of the desk through it. When the cat looked up at me, it meowed and then walked through the wooden drawer on the right side of the desk. The cat just walked through the drawer, like a ghost on TV phasing through a wall. It was completely dumbfounded and sat there for a minute, trying to process what I had just seen. Eventually I got up and went to find my actual cat, who wasn't in the room. I never saw that ghost cat again, but I did feel like there were many ghosts in that house. While we lived there, I often had a sense of their presence around me. However, I never felt any negative energy or malicious intent. I think the cats that had lived in the house before probably just wanted a friend, and I was always happy to have them around. In fact, when we moved a few years later, I felt a twinge of sadness to leave that house behind. Even with all of its quirks and ghostly visitors, it was a place that had been my home, and I would always have fond memories of it. My deceased dog may still be around. It was a few days after my Labrador passed away, and I had just come back home on Tuesday, April 4th. I was sleeping soundly until I was awoken by a distinct sound that seemed like a cry. Initially, I was irritated at being disturbed from my sleep, but my anxiety started to rise as I tried to go back. I couldn't shake off the thought of what could have made such a noise at 3 a.m. Despite my unease, I eventually fell back to sleep. The following day, nothing noteworthy happened, and I went about my day as usual. However, on Thursday, April 7th, something strange occurred. I was in the middle of a conversation with my mom about something unrelated to our dogs. When we suddenly stopped talking, my mom looked frightened, and that's when I realized. 
I had heard a distinct sound, and I'd heard this before. It was the same cry I heard a few days earlier. I felt myself shaking as I asked my mom if she heard it too. She responded in the affirmative, confirming that we both heard a muffled cry sound. It was around 2 a.m. and we immediately checked on our other family members to see if any of them had made that sound. However, everyone was either asleep or doing nothing out of the ordinary. My oldest sister, who usually laughs a lot, said she hadn't laughed the whole night. We were all puzzled and couldn't figure out what was happening. After this strange occurrence, I went back to bed and didn't experience anything else that night. It's hard to say what was causing these sounds. Maybe it was all in our heads because we were all struggling with our beloved one's dog recently dying. And we wished that maybe we could have done things differently. It's also possible that it was an animal since we lived, you know, far from the city. However, the fact that both my mom and I heard the same cry on two separate occasions makes me wonder if it could have been something else entirely. Looking back at it now, it all makes sense. The first cry sound I heard that woke me up was likely from my Labrador who was in the next room when he passed away on March 31st. As for the second cry sound my mom and I heard, I can't be sure, but what I do know is that it was a unique sound and we'd never heard it before. It's comforting to think that it might be one of our dog's way of saying goodbye and it's assuring that he's in peace now. Let me tell you about the scariest experience I've ever had. It happened when my friends and I decided to go airsofting in my friend's woods at night. There were five of us and we split up into two teams, three on one team and two on the other. While two of us had to go into the woods and set up a plan, the other three waited outside. But before we could even enter the woods, we were stopped multiple times by one of my friends who didn't want to go in at all. He had a dreaded feeling the whole time. I have to admit, I felt kind of the same way. But I thought it was just maybe the normal jitters of being hit by pellets or something like that, so I tried to ignore it. Finally, we made our way into the woods, and that's when things started to get really strange. A figure about six foot five, not skinny but not big either, ran toward us, but then changed direction once all three of us started shooting at it. I was within arm's reach of it, but I couldn't see its face or anything like that. It was blocked. What's even more terrifying is that our shots didn't affect it at all. Its stance didn't falter, it just kept running. Then it ran into the woods. And the other two of my friends, who were waiting outside, saw it too. They came running back to us, and we all traced its steps. But they abruptly stopped in the middle of the woods. There was no sign of the figure anywhere. It almost didn't feel real, and I can't get it out of my head. What was this thing? Why was it in the woods? Was it even real? These are the questions that keep running through my mind. I've never experienced anything like it before, and I hope I never do again. It's been a few days since that happened, and I still can't shake off the feeling of dread and unease. It's like something is watching me and following me, but I can't escape it. I've tried to talk to my friends about it, but they don't seem to take it seriously as I do. They think it was just a prank or something. I know what I saw, and it wasn't a prank, it was real, and it was terrifying. I don't know what I should do now. Should I go back to the woods and investigate? Should I tell someone about it, or should I just forget about it and move on? I don't have any answers, and the uncertainty is eating away at me. All I know is that I've never wanted to experience something like that again. The woods, once a place of fun and adventure, now seem like a place of danger and mystery. Was it sleep paralysis or something else? It was a regular night, and I was sound asleep in my bed, when suddenly I woke up in the middle of the night. I tried to go back to sleep, but I just had this strange feeling that something was off. It felt like someone or something was watching me, and it made me very uneasy. I thought it might just be my imagination, so I tried to shake it off and just go back to sleep. But as I lay there, facing at the ceiling, I can't shake the feeling that I'm being watched. Finally, I decided to turn my head to the right and face the door. That's when I saw it, standing in the corner of my room beside the door. A shadowy, dark silhouette. 
It had two red glowing dots that seemed to be its eyes, and they were looking straight at me. I was terrified and I tried to put on my glasses to see if I was really seeing what I thought I was seeing. But before I could do that, the thing jumped right on top of my chest. I felt a heavy weight on top of me and suddenly, my body became paralyzed. I couldn't move at all and I was having trouble breathing. I was so scared as I was looking straight at its face, but I could only see those two red evil glowing eyes. I closed my eyes and muttered, in Jesus' name I demand you to go away. And after I said those words, I opened my eyes again, and the shadow person was gone. I felt like I could move again, and I quickly got up and turned on the lights. I was drenched in sweat and fear, and I was wondering what the hell just happened. I was so freaked out that I decided to sleep the rest of the night with my lights on. But things got even crazier the next morning during breakfast with my mom. I was planning on telling her about what had happened to me the night before, But before I could say anything, she started telling me about something strange that had happened to her. She said that she had felt a dark presence in her room and saw the some shadowy figure that I saw in the corner of her room, just standing there and looking at her for a minute. I was freaking out even more now that my mom had seen the same thing. It couldn't just be a coincidence at this point. We both saw the same shadow person and it had attacked me and paralyzed me. It was a terrifying experience and I couldn't stop thinking about it. I didn't experience anything else related to the paranormal after that night, though, but I truly believe that there is power in Jesus' name and that these entities tremble before it. Hospital Spirits As a nursing student, my clinicals start early in the hospital around 6.30 in the morning, And I remember one morning, while I was waiting for the rest of my group in the lobby, and the atmosphere was super eerie. There were often no people around at that time, and if they were, they were usually on the floor working, waiting for the day shift to come in. Suddenly I heard an elevator chime, and a door opened. I expected someone to walk out, but it was fully empty. I figured that someone may have gotten out and bumped a button, but in the ten minutes I was there, No one ever got into that elevator. The more I thought about it, the more it creeped me out because I just couldn't make sense of it. I couldn't shake off the feeling that something strange was happening. I've been to another hospital in the area, and I'm convinced that a few of the floors that I've been on have spirits or at least some type of presence. I often hear loud thumps on the walls or the floor, but I only ever hear that on the seventh floor. One of the nurses I was with, on on a different floor, mind you, had told me that she'd experienced things too. I've tried to tell myself that all these things, just doors closing or someone slamming cabinets or whatever cause I could make up, but deep down I knew it wasn't that. There's no doubt that in a hospital, people's energy is bound to be trapped. After all, hospitals are places where people come to heal and where they often experience intense emotions. And one night... I was doing rounds on the seventh floor, and I had an overwhelming feeling that someone was watching me. I turned around, but no one was there. Then I heard footsteps coming toward me. I tried to tell myself that it was just a nurse or a doctor, but I couldn't shake off the feeling that something wasn't right. I quickly finished my rounds and left the door, feeling relieved to be away from whatever energy that was. I've talked to other students and nurses, and many of them have similar experiences. It's almost as if the hospital has a life of its own and we're just there to witness it. Sometimes I wonder if I should be scared of these experiences, but I remind myself that I'm here to learn and help people. Whether they're spirits or not, I'll continue to do my best and give my patients the care that they deserve. I think I met Giuseppe Tartini. Remember the time when I and my friends went on vacation to Slovenia, a small country east of Italy and south of Austria? It was back in 2019 and we decided to visit the beautiful town of Piran, which is located near the Slovenian coast. One of the highlights of the town is the Tartini Central Square, which features a statue of Giuseppe Tartini. We planned to walk around the square, buy some souvenirs, and maybe try some local cuisine. 
However, things took a strange turn that evening. My friends and I were standing near the statue of Giuseppe Tartini, listening to rumors that it moves. Suddenly, a man appeared before us, and he looked exactly like the statue of Tartini. He started to talk about random facts about Giuseppe and his compositions and the pieces that he created. I was amazed by the man's knowledge, but I couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. How did he know so much about Tartini? We didn't speak to anyone else that evening, and the man kept talking to us. It was such a bizarre experience. He even told us about a dream that Tartini had once had. I was getting more and more curious, so I decided to ask him who he was. His reply chilled me to the bone. He said, I am known, but unknown. And without another word, he disappeared into the night. After the encounter, my friends and I were left feeling spooked. It was such a creepy experience, and I couldn't shake off the feeling that the man might have been Tartini's ghost or something. The fact that he looked exactly like the statue was just too much to ignore. I tried to research if anyone else had experienced something similar, but I didn't find anything of the sort. The encounter still gives me goosebumps when I think about it. In conclusion, Slovenia is a beautiful country with many mysterious places and stories. The encounter with the man who looked like Tartini has stayed with me since that day, and I still wonder who he was and how he knew so much about him. Maybe someday, I'll find out the truth behind the mysterious encounter in Piran. I had a dream my dad committed suicide. When I was just a kid, my dad passed away. It was a really hard time for me, as I was only eight years old, and I remember my mom telling me that I had gotten really sick, and that's how he died. Of course, at the time, I didn't really understand the gravity of what had happened. I was just sad that my dad was gone. But then something really strange happened. A few weeks after my dad's death, I had this incredibly vivid dream. And in the dream, I was just laying in my bed, playing my Nintendo DS like I always did. And suddenly, my dad just burst into the room. I was so surprised to see him that I jumped up from the bed and asked him what was wrong. But he just completely ignored me as if I wasn't even there. My dad started going through my dresser and grabbing clothes and underwear. I was really confused about what he was doing, but he didn't say anything. Then he tied all the clothes and underwear together until he made a noose. I was getting really scared at this point, but I still didn't say anything. My dad then hung himself from my window with the noose that he made. I started to panic and kept trying to say I'm sorry and I love you, but he just kept ignoring me. It was like I wasn't even there. The dream was so vivid and real that I woke up in a cold sweat. I was so shaken by what had just happened and what I experienced. Years went by, and I never really talked about the dream to anybody. But then one day, my friend told me something that shocked me. She said that my dad actually died by hanging himself while he was on a job trip in Ohio. I couldn't believe it. I didn't know what to say. I decided to confront my mom about it, and I was really angry. I demanded to know why she had lied to me about my dad's death. She confirmed that it was true, that my dad had actually hung himself. She said that she had only told me that he was sick because I was too young to understand. It was a really difficult time for me. I couldn't believe that my dad had done something like that. And the fact that I had a vivid dream about him hanging himself before I even knew how he died was just too much to handle. But eventually I learned to cope with it. I talked to a therapist and I found ways to deal with my grief. And now, even though it's been so many years since my dad's death, I still think about him every day. Mimics can fuck right off. On summer, my dad had taken me on a trip to repair the roof on one of the buildings on our property. Unfortunately, I was going through a rough patch with my health and was mostly confined to the house, crocheting and watching horror movies to pass the time. On a particularly windy day, the gusts were so strong that they rattled the windows and created an uproar of noise. It was undoubtedly not the best time to be up on the roof. So, my dad had promised to take a break from roofing 
and do some yard work instead. Bored with my crocheting and tired of watching scary movies, I turned off the television and focused on my crochet work. It wasn't until after lunchtime that my dad had returned to the house, mentioning that he's going to go relax in the hammock and read for a bit. Suddenly I heard my dad scream my name in a terrified tone with his unique accent adding to the fright. As my name is Vanessa, it was evident that he had called out my name, and I immediately worried that he had fallen off the roof, or worse, somehow he was in danger. So I ran as fast as I could toward the back of the house where I had collided with him. He was out of breath and I had a terrified look. So did he. I was worried sick and asked him what was wrong. He told me that he had heard me screaming in fear, as if I was in danger or heard. It was perplexing because at the same moment we both heard each other's voices scream our names. Now this may seem odd, but I call my dad Daddy, which doesn't sound anything like Vanessa. We were both equally terrified and we couldn't understand how this could happen. For weeks we tried to explain the occurrence, the rattling noises and the creaking doors and listening to the tree branches when it's windy, but nothing came close. Although we had experienced spooky happenings on our property before, this was different because of the mimicry of our voices. We couldn't explain what had just happened, whether it was a ghost, a demon, or just a prankster. What was its purpose? And what was it trying to achieve? Nevertheless, we always check out any weird stuff on our property and never let this instance of mimicry lead us to believe that it's a trick instead of an actual emergency. Premonitions When I was a child, I had a dream that I still remember to this day. I went to take a nap on my mom's bed, which was unusual because I rarely remember my dreams. And in the dream, I saw an older lady lying face down, sprawled out on the wooden floor with a blue dress. She was near a ballroom, but I couldn't identify who she was. When I woke up, I was sitting straight and scared, and I told my mom that she's dead. My mom tried to calm me down, telling me that it was just a nightmare, but I kept insisting, and I felt scared for the lady. Later that night, around 11 p.m., my mom's phone rang. It was a long-distance call from Mexico, and my aunt was sobbing uncontrollably on the other end. She had found my grandmother dead lying in the bathroom floor, face down from an apparent heart attack. The dream that I had earlier suddenly made sense, and I couldn't help but wonder if it was a premonition. It's strange to think that I'd never met my grandmother, as she stays in Mexico, and yet I still knew that she was the woman in my dream. Years later, during quarantine, I had another dream that left me shaken. My friend had been diagnosed with cancer and moved back to his hometown in Texas. I would text and video call him, sending him care packages and letting him know that I was thinking of him. And one night, I dreamt of him sitting in a hospital bed, smiling and waving at me. I woke up feeling uneasy and texted him about my dream, hoping it was just a sign of him getting better. However, he never texted back, and a few days later, I find out that he was still going in for radiation sessions. Exactly one month after my dream, his family posted on Facebook that he had passed away in his sleep at the hospital. I remember sobbing and feeling like somehow I was to blame for his death. My husband tried to comfort me by suggesting that maybe he was saying goodbye. These experiences with my dreams have frightened me because they seem to indicate that time isn't linear and that maybe we can see into the future. It was especially scary to know that my brain couldn't put a face to my grandmother in my dream, but still knew that she was dead. Have any of you had any similar experiences with your dreams? It's all so mysterious and makes me wonder about the unknown depths of the human mind. Saw a face in the closet. This is a story that I will never forget because it happened to me. It was in 2015, shortly after my baby cousin was born. My aunt and her boyfriend had just moved into a one-story house, and they asked me to stay with them for a few days to help with the baby. I had never been to this house before, so I was excited to see it. The house was pretty old, but it seemed like a pretty nice place to stay. There were six of us in the house, including the baby, and two pets, a cat, and a small Pomeranian dog. 
Everything was going well until one night, something came. I was trying to sleep, but I kept hearing strange noises. It sounded like someone was banging on the walls, scratching at the doors, and talking in hushed tones. I tried to ignore it and go back to sleep, but it was too hard. The noises kept getting louder and I started to feel uneasy. Suddenly I heard a loud bang on the door in front of me. I looked up and saw a child-sized handprint on the door. It hadn't been there before and it was just weird because there were no kids in the house except for the two-year-old baby. I took a picture of it with my phone and decided to show it to my friend later as proof that I wasn't making this shit up. But then things got even more creepy. As I took the photo, I saw a face smiling creepily at me through the glass in the closet behind the front door. It was so scary that I couldn't even scream, I just froze. The next morning, I woke up and looked at the photo, and I was terrified to see that the handprint wasn't the only thing in the picture. I could see the creepy face, and it looked like it was trying to say something to me. I felt like something was watching me, and I knew that I had to leave that house as soon as possible. When I showed that picture to my family, they didn't believe me. They told me that it was just a reflection of the Pomeranian dog in the glass. But I knew what I saw, and it was not a dog. I still have the picture to this day, and it still creeps me out every time I look at it. Later on, my aunt told me that an older man had died in that house a few years ago. I wish she had told me before I stayed there, because I would have never came. I'm just glad to be moving on from that house, and I hope that no one else experiences what I did. Be careful what you get from your friends. When I was around 12 or 13 years old, I experienced something that I'll never forget, and it started when my mom received a gift from one of her friends. Two small diamond-framed paintings. One painting was of a grassy field with long blades of grass swaying in the wind. The other was of a small water well with a lever on the side. My mom decided to place them in the room that my brother and I were staying in. And that night, I had a dream that felt all too real. I was walking down a dark hallway toward a bright light at the end of it. As I got closer and closer, my heart began to panic with fear. When I finally reached the brightly lit empty room, I saw an old woman hanging from the ceiling. Her hair was gray and tied up in a bun and she was staring directly at me. She called out my name her body squirmed as she tried to get it out. With one bony arm free, I began to scream and run. I woke up screaming. My mom was there holding me. She had just come home from work and found me crying and screaming in my sleep. She tried to comfort me, but then she noticed that my brother was also tossing and screaming in his sleep. He woke up crying too, and my mom was confused and worried. I told her about the old lady in my dream and that's when we heard my dad screaming from the room across from mine. My mom rushed to his room with me close behind, and when we got there, my dad was pointing at the walls. He said that he had a dream that the old lady from the paintings was coming out of them like a snake and slithering back into the wall. My mom's face turned pale, and we couldn't believe that all three of us had dreamed about the same old lady. My mom grabbed the paintings and immediately ran them out of the house. She threw them in the dumpster and nothing happened after that. My mom later found out that her friend had gotten them from a thrift store with a couple of other things too. We still wonder what that old lady was and if there was something wrong with those paintings. This experience has stayed with me forever and I still get the chills thinking about them. My dad was followed home by duendes. My dad has always been a man of a few words, but every now and then he opens up and shares a story from his childhood. One of those stories involved a peculiar encounter with duendes, a small supernatural being from Latin American folklore. It was many years ago when my dad was a kid, and he and my grandpa were tending to their land. Bored with the work, my dad wandered off to a nearby stream where he saw a group of strange little beings playing in the water. 
They were about the size of dolls with human-like proportions and movements. Some of them even appeared to be walking on the water. As my dad watched in amazement, the duende signaled him to come and play with them. My dad eagerly joined in, splashing around with the little beings for what felt like hours. But when my grandpa finally found him, he was furious. He couldn't see the duendes and assumed my dad was playing alone. My dad was disappointed to leave his new friends behind, but didn't think too much of it at the time. However, things start to took a turn when my dad started seeing the duendes around the house. They would pop out from behind walls during dinner and my dad would offer scraps of food, much to my grandparents' annoyance. My dad was convinced that the duendes were real, but no one else in the family could really see them. My grandparents thought he was making it all up or imagining things. Concerned by their son's behavior, my grandparents took my dad to see a quarandera, a healer who practiced traditional Mexican medicine. The quarandera performed a small ritual and advised my dad to keep a cigarette behind his ear for a week. Miraculously, the duendes disappeared, and my dad never saw them again. Despite the oddness of the encounter, my dad had always maintained that the duendes were real, and that the experiences were some of the most vivid memories of his childhood as a whole. He's embarrassed to tell the story, but I'm fascinated by it. It's incredible to think that there are so many supernatural beings all around us that we can't see or understand. My aunts and uncles have even more stories about the Duendes, some of which are not so friendly. I'd love to hear more about these mysterious creatures and their secrets. Dead friend told me he passed. This is a story that happened to me recently, and it's been weighing heavily on my mind. I had a friend whom I'll call Jack that I met when we were 17. I had a huge crush on him, but it turned out we were both better off as friends. Over the years, we became the best of friends, and I always felt a deep connection to Jack, even though we lost touch. In 2019, another friend of mine whom I'll call Diane tried to find Jack on Facebook. We searched high and low, but we couldn't find him. We even messaged the wrong guy accidentally, which was pretty funny in hindsight. But a couple of months later, Jack found me on Facebook and messaged me out of the blue. We talked and texted and got back in touch. Diane and I wanted to meet up, but it was the height of COVID, so we didn't. Jack and I kept in touch all throughout 2020, and I remember texting him how thankful I was that we had all survived the year. We made it, I said to him. But then in January 2021, strange things started happening in my house. The lights would flicker and I saw someone walk into my office, assuming it was my daughter, but no one was there. The TV turned on by itself and it was all very unsettling. Diane suggested I see a medium to see if there is a spirit in my house. I made an appointment for the coming Saturday, feeling relieved and hopeful that I'd get some answers. As I was taking a shower that night, I tried to think of who might come through when I saw the medium, and suddenly I heard Jack's voice and I heard say, she doesn't know I'm gone. It was strange, but I didn't think too much of it. I made a mental note to text Jack in the morning just to see how he was doing. But the next morning, a mutual friend called me to tell me the devastating news. Jack had died. He had accidentally overdosed on fentanyl. I was crushed and still hurt. He was such a good friend. I should note that I have SLI, or sliders, which means that I tend to affect electronics and other objects around me. I didn't think much of the lights flickering at first, but looking back, it was so strange. Anyway, I miss Jack a lot, and he's a great guy and a wonderful friend. I hope wherever he is, he's at peace. Woman with Goat Legs I always loved listening to stories, especially the ones that gave me the chills. One such story I heard was when I was a kid, and it stayed with me till today. So the other day, I was talking to my grandma about it, and she shared some more detail that I wasn't aware of before. The story was about of our neighborhood, and someone who used to work as a baker when he was younger, and as a baker... He had to wake up very early in the morning around 4 a.m. to prepare fresh bread and pastries for the day. And one morning he was on his usual path, 
passing a wooden bridge when he suddenly heard some steps behind him. The steps sounded like hooves. And as he turned around, he saw a tall and very beautiful woman standing behind him. But as he looked down, he saw the woman had goat legs. He had startled and frightened her and ran away as fast as he could. I was always fascinated by this story, and so I decided to research it a bit further. I found some old forms where people from the Balkans were sharing similar stories about the same entity. They all described the same creature, tall and incredibly beautiful, with goat legs. But I was surprised to learn that it was an old Slavic pagan mythology to it, too. There were elves that were described exactly like the one our neighborhood had been seeing. As I delved deeper into the mythology, I learned that these creatures were known as Villa, or Samovilla, and they were considered to be a forest spirit that could also shapeshift. They would also be depicted as beautiful women with goat legs, and they had the power to control nature. In some legends, they were also known to help people, but in others, they could be malicious and cause harm. The more I read about these creatures, the more intrigued I became. I was fascinated to learn about the different mythologies and beliefs that existed in our culture. I couldn't help but wonder if there were more stories like this that were yet to be discovered. Overall, the story of the baker and the goat-legged woman is just one of my many fascinating tales that exist in our culture. It's incredible how these stories have been passed down from generation to generation and have continued to captivate us with their mysterious and supernatural elements. Wide Awake and Dreaming I remember the time when I was working as a caregiver. It must have been around seven years ago, and at that time I started having even more bizarre dreams than ever before. I dreamt of skeletons devouring my legs, one of my patients assaulting me, and patients who were wheelchair-bound walking around. I also dreamt of non-verbal patients talking, which seemed strange. Additionally, I had dreams where I was being followed by something white, a white van, a white dog, or white birds, and men in white robes were always present in these dreams. I had a history of prophetic dreams, and I often dreamt about the future. I dreamt about family pregnancies, deaths, TV show episodes, and relationship and breakup arguments, the lost items being found. I also had some apocalyptic dreams, where I saw the planet on fire. These dreams were so vivid that it felt like I was living in them. One particular dream has been in my mind recently. I was being followed by men in white robes, and when they caught up to me, they pushed me to my knees and asked if I believed in Jesus and if that he was the Son of God. I answered yes, and they beheaded me. The pain was real, and I woke up feeling like it was a vision of a past life. Although I'm not sure if that's true, I had another strange dream where my friend Christina and I had the same dream. We even crossed paths in the dream. The more we talked about it, the more we thought it was an astral projection, not a dream. We were both inside the apartment and saw a child who didn't live with us, but he looked almost exactly like her son, who did live with us. Christina told me she thinks it could have been her child that she lost due to a miscarriage. What's strange about some of these dreams is that I don't remember falling asleep, and in some others, I don't remember waking up. It's as if I'm in another re like I'm living, rather, in another reality altogether. These dreams have left me feeling bewildered and disoriented at times. I've thought about this day for years. I can hardly believe this myself, but there was a time when my boyfriend and I were staying at my family's cabin in the woods. It wasn't exactly remote. The other cabins nearby and a popular lake close by as well. We were getting ready to leave around 5 a.m. so I could drive him to work when something caught my eye. I slammed on the brakes and there it was, a creature. It's hard to describe, but it was huge, maybe six or seven feet tall and it walked slowly out in front of my vehicle. It was staring at us, as if it didn't care that we could see it. Its arms dragged along the ground as it's hunched over, and it was so skinny that we could see its ribs. It was completely hairless, and even though my headlights shone on it, I 
couldn't make out its face. As it crossed in front of us, it disappeared behind a car at another cabin across the little dirt road. The creature just stood there, watching as we drove away. I was in shock and my boyfriend and I were the only ones who had seen it. After that day, I refused to stay there again, but my father didn't believe me until strange things started happening. My dad heard something big running on the roof one night, but when we went outside to look, there was no one there. On another occasion, he heard a loud knock on the bathroom window, which would have been impossible considering it was about 10 feet off of the ground. When he went outside, no one there again, and nothing that could have been used to reach something that high. It wasn't until then that my father started to believe me. I've thought about what I saw for years now, and it still perplexes me. I've been asked why I didn't run it over, but the truth is, I didn't feel threatened by it. It was like the creature was just curious. Plus, I was in shock. Things like that aren't supposed to exist. I've searched online for any information that could explain what it is that I saw, but I haven't found anything conclusive. Some people have suggested that it might have been a Bigfoot, but I'm not sure. All I know is that what I saw was unlike anything I've ever seen before, and I hope never to see it again. Generational Haunting let me tell you about a terrifying thing that happened to me about 10 years ago when I was just 12 years old. I was out in my front yard stacking firewood all by myself carrying it to the back. As I was getting ready to take another load out back, I noticed a dark figure with a hood just standing there watching me. The figure and I were staring eye to eye and I just felt frozen like I was spinning in circles. Once I was able to collect myself, I raced inside and basically broke down in my mom's arms. We then went out front, and of course, nothing was there. Then we went out the back. The entire wood pile I was stacking, which was over my head, had fallen to the ground. It honestly felt so surreal, and I didn't know how to react after that. After that incident, there were so many instances of weird things happening to me, such as coat hangers moving around in my closet in the middle of the night, or jumping up and seeing something watching me. There was even an instance where my father saw a dark shadow go into my room at night, and that spooked him as well. But anyways, things like that happened on and off for a while. I just figured I was paranoid or had some sign of schizophrenia and got myself into experiencing those things through my mind. Fast forward to tonight when I was visiting my older family member, and to note, he had no idea and still doesn't know about my prior experiences. But anyways, he talked about how he used to have these recurring dreams about a dark figure, and he'd actually see this hooded figure. He called it the Angel of Death, and he described what he saw, and it was exactly what I had seen. He went further into talking about how his brother and even his father had seen the same thing prior to him. After hearing his story, it made me wonder what I had experienced. Was it actually real, or was it just my mind playing tricks on me? I still get chills thinking about that day and all the strange things that happened after. It's a strange feeling to have someone else confirm what you have seen, especially when you thought you were the only one. I'm not sure what it all means, but I do know that it's something I'll never forget. Paranormal Experience or Sleep Paralysis When I was 14 years old, I had a sleepover with a few of my friends at one of their houses. We were all settled in the basement for the night, with me on the mattress on the floor, my sister on the couch, and my other two friends on the pull-out bed. It was pretty late and we finally went to bed around 1 or 2 a.m. In the middle of the night, I woke up and I saw something in the corner of my eye. I turned my head slightly and saw a dark silhouette of a man standing on the staircase, peering at us. Initially, I thought it was just one of my friend's dads or brother checking up on us. However, the shadowy figure began to move down the staircase and up to the pull-out bed where my two friends were sleeping. It just stood there, staring at them. Despite feeling tired and groggy, I couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. I watched as the shadowy figure slowly made its way towards us. This time, it approached my mattress on the floor and stood over me 
completely motionless. I felt like I couldn't move, and all I could do was open and close my eyes in fear. A few moments passed, and I opened my eyes again. The shadowy figure was still there, except this time, it was bending down with its face closer to mine. At that point, I started shaking uncontrollably and closed my eyes again, hoping that it would go away. The next time I opened my eyes, the figure had vanished. I knew that it wasn't a dream, but I still couldn't make sense of what I had seen. Later on, I found out that my friend's brother wasn't home that night, which eliminated the possibility of it being him checking up on us. This left me with only a few possibilities. It could have been her dad, an intruder, or a ghost. Looking back on that experience, I believe that it was likely a case of sleep paralysis. Sleep paralysis occurs when the body is in a state of REM sleep, but the brain is still awake. It can cause vivid hallucinations and a feeling of being unable to move. Regardless of what it was, the experience has stayed with me for years. To this day, I still think about that shadowy figure that stood over me in the middle of the night, wondering what it could have been. Haunted Barracks sold my belief in the paranormal. I remember when I shipped off for basic earlier this year. A week into our training, some of my fellow soldiers started saying they kept having nightmares and felt like someone was watching them at night from the far corner. Admittedly, during my fire guard shifts, the bay did feel a bit off, but I brushed it off as just my imagination. However, as time went on, more people started claiming strange things were happening. At first, I didn't really believe it until one night when I saw the motion sensor going off at the corner everyone claimed to feel somebody at. Yet no one was there. That same night while cleaning the bathrooms, I kept hearing the stalls slam shut while no one was there. My buddy told me that night he had sleep paralysis and saw someone in the corner of the bay. All the lockers kept opening and slamming by themselves. Following this, another guy claimed someone kept waking him up at 3 a.m., standing near his bed. After a few nights, I was doing laps around the bay when I walked by his bunk. Out of my peripheral, I saw someone standing over him. They were so close to me I could have reached out and touched him. I looked over, and as I was about to ask what they were doing, the figure vanished into thin air. Following this, my friend who's also on guard sat at the front desk. We saw the safety latch slam shut by itself, and the door flung open into the wall so hard it dented it, then slammed shut. It was so scary that we both froze in place for a few minutes. Later that week, we found one of the paper towel dispensers in the bathroom happened to be loose. We pulled it out only to find an old-ass Ouija board inside. We knew that maybe this was the cause of all the weird things happening around us. After throwing it away, everything stopped overnight, and the bay returned to its normal, pretty much normal, peaceful self. It's amazing to think that something as simple as an old Ouija board could cause so much fear and chaos from that experience. I learned to always keep an eye out for anything strange or suspicious, and to trust my instincts when things don't feel right. My mom kept whispering my name in a phone call that she says never happened. I still remember the incident that happened in 2013 when I was only 12 years old. I was home alone and sitting on my computer when something strange and inexplicable occurred. Let me take you back in time and share my experience. As a child, I was always afraid of being alone at home, especially after watching horror movies with my older brothers. So whenever I was home alone, I would open every door in the house and let the sunlight in and feel, less, feel a little bit less scared. That day was no exception. I was playing League of Legends on my computer when I heard her old landline phone ring. It was odd because my mom never called me at that hour. However, I picked up the phone and said hello. What happened next shook me to my core. I heard my mom's voice whispering my name in a few very low, muttered tones in a low voice, and I could feel my heart pounding in my chest. I freaked out and started to say, Mom? But there was no reply, only dead silence. After a few seconds of terror, I hung up the phone and sat down crying while still playing on the computer. When my mom got home from work, she noticed that I was anxious and asked me if something had been upsetting me. 
I told her everything and asked why she pranked me by calling and whispering my name. She looked confused and said, I never called you, honey. We checked her phone and there was no outgoing call to our house's phone that day. My mind was racing with theories of what had just happened. Was it something supernatural or one of my brothers pranking me? I couldn't shake off the feeling that it was real. None of my brothers admitted to the prank and they didn't know how to spoof a phone call and to this day, my mom still swears that she never called me that day. She remembers being freaked out though. After the incident, I was even more afraid of being home alone. I would always keep the doors and windows locked and have my phone nearby just in case something strange happened again. I tried to rationalize the experience, but deep down I knew that there was something I couldn't explain here. It remains one of the most frightening moments of my life and I still get goosebumps thinking about it. Paranormal being in my house. It was a Saturday morning, and my girlfriend and I had stayed up late the night before, fixing my computer. We were sleeping in when I decided to get up and grab a towel for a shower. As I made my way to the kitchen, I noticed that one of my parents' cars was missing. So, I assumed they had gone out for the day. We have two small dogs, but they were outside, so they couldn't have let themselves in. After grabbing a towel, I headed to the bathroom to take a shower. As I was getting dressed, I heard loud noises coming from my parents' room. It sounded like someone had forcefully opened the door, and I heard bare feet running on the tiles outside the bathroom. The footsteps ran into the dressing room, which is located across from the bathroom door, and then the door slammed shut. At first, I assumed that my mother had overslept and was in a hurry to get dressed, but when I opened the door to the dressing room, I found it empty. I was shocked and I couldn't believe what had just happened. I asked my girlfriend if she had heard something go into the dressing room and she said yes. But when I told her that no one was in there, she was equally surprised. We decided to quickly search the house, but there was no one there. The dogs were still outside and it couldn't have been them. All of the windows were closed too, as it was still quite cold outside. After about 10 minutes, my parents arrived home from their swim. I immediately told them what had happened, and they confirmed that it wasn't them. I also mentioned to them that we had felt an energy in the house before, but it had never made itself known like this. As the day went on, I couldn't shake the feeling of unease that the incident had caused me. I tried to search online for any possible explanation, but nothing made sense. I wonder if I could have seen a ghost or some sort of paranormal activity here. The thought of that made me even more nervous. In the end, I still don't know what it could have been, but the experience left me feeling spooked and unnerved, and I'm not sure if I'll ever be able to shake it off completely. I found out I'm not the only one who saw a lady in my dad's house. I come from a family of strong Catholics, but my dad's side of the family isn't very religious. Despite this, most of his family members have experienced strange occurrences in this house. We all believe that it could be the spirits of my grandparents who both died in the home and had their ashes spread in the garden on a rose bush. Personally, I've always experienced odd or creepy things since I was young. Some of these experiences are inexplicable, while others I attribute to something else entirely. When I was younger, I used to sleep on my cousin's bedroom floor. The room faces a long hallway that leads to the stairs. On occasion, I would wake up in the middle of the night and see what I thought was a short lady in a long dress holding a tray. She would simply walk down the stairs, and that was it. I've always loved horror and ghost shows, so I assumed that it was just my brain regurgitating information I had heard on TV. Recently, my cousin and I decided to do a bit of Googling and discovered that a whole block of houses my dad's place was on used to be a factory or something similar. We didn't think much of it until the topic of ghosts came up during a conversation with my cousin and her boyfriend. As a joke, I mentioned that I used to see a lady walk down our stairs, and my cousin's reaction caught me off guard. She stood up, her eyes widened and she started saying that she had always saw the same thing. 
and even swore that one time she saw the lady at the bottom of the stairs. I was surprised, but also felt a sense of relief that I wasn't the only one who had seen this woman. It was an interesting thing to hear the story that my cousin had also witnessed the same thing, and it made me wonder if anyone else in the family had experienced something similar. Despite the strange occurrences in the house, I'm not afraid of ghosts or anything. I've come to accept that these things exist, and I'm open to the idea that there may be more to the world than what we can see or explain. Something turned on the lights to my bathroom. Let me tell you about a strange experience I had when I was growing up. I had a bedroom with a bathroom attached that was a Jack and Jill style and connected to another bedroom. Occasionally, my mom would come up to check if I was asleep when she got home from work, but on this particular night, she was off. I was lying in bed awake facing the wall away from my bathroom when I heard the click of a switch and the light was on. It was on for maybe a minute and then clicked back off. I was afraid to turn around but felt as though I was being watched. So I waited 30 or 45 seconds before rolling over to see what looked like a tall woman in a nightgown in my bathroom doorway. This was odd because my mom never wore nightgowns to bed and wasn't that tall. She was actually shorter than me and she definitely didn't have longish hair. I asked my dad if my mom went up to check on me because he'd be able to tell if she had and he said no. Not that he knew of. I asked my mom too, and she said no, and she was confused. After this happened, I started locking the other door to the bathroom, so there was only one way in, and I could hear someone was coming into my room. I was so freaked out that I didn't want to take any chances. To this day, I still don't know who or what it is that I saw. It could have been a figment of my imagination, or it could have been something else entirely. I've always been open-minded about the paranormal and I've heard stories about ghosts and spirits, but I never thought it would happen to me. I've spoken to others about similar experiences and some have suggested that it could be a residual haunting. This is when a spirit or energy is imprinted on a location and it repeats itself like a recording. Others have suggested that it could be a spirit or ghost who's trying to communicate with me or watch over me. Whatever it was, I know that it scared me and I'm still a little bit cautious when it comes to being alone in the dark. I've never had any other experiences like this since then, but I still wonder what it could have been and I hope that I've never ex experienced anything like that again. What was that whistle? When I was just a young lad of around nine years old, I started experiencing incredibly strange and disturbing phenomenon that would occur during the night. Every single night, I would hear this ear-piercing whistle that would start off faint and distant, but then gradually get closer and closer until it was right next to my ear. The sound was so annoying and unbearable that I couldn't help but cover my ears with my blankets, hoping that it would somehow muffle the sound. Despite my desperate attempts to block out the sound, I still couldn't shake the nagging feeling that something was off. One morning after another sleepless night of dealing with the incessant whistle, I decided to ask my family if they had been hearing it too, and to my surprise, everyone denied hearing anything out of the ordinary. I was baffled and confused. Was I the only one who could hear it? This strange occurrence continued to happen for two weeks straight, each night I'd be jolted awake by the obnoxious sound, and each morning my family would act like nothing was out of the ordinary. It was like I was living in a different reality altogether. One fateful night, however, I finally reached my breaking point. The whistle was louder and grating more than ever before, and I simply couldn't take it anymore, so I summoned up all the courage I had and got out of bed. I walked over to my bedroom window and slowly opened it, all the while bracing myself for what I might find. But to my surprise, there was nothing there. No source of the whistle, no shadowy figure lurking in the darkness. It was just me, my window, and the stillness of the night. As I stood there, taking it all in, the whistle slowly faded away until it was no more. From that night on, I never heard that sound again. 
I still don't have any answers for what it could have been or where it came from. But I do know one thing for certain. That experience will always stay with me, haunting me with its eerie mystery. New here, thought I'd share my experience. When I was in my early teens, around 14 or 15 years old, a group of us used to hang out together, exploring alleyways and looking for cool places to check out. There were about eight or ten of us, and we always had a blast sneaking around and finding new places to go. One evening, not far from where we lived, we stumbled upon a small walled-off area with an open patch of land and a locked-up garage. It seemed like the perfect place to explore, so we climbed over the wall and started checking it out. The open land was big enough to have a large tree trunk laid out as a kind of bench, and there were various metal barrels and oil cans scattered around. In the center of the land was an old JCB digger, which took up most of the space. We were all climbing around the digger when suddenly a man appeared in the driver's seat. He just popped up out of nowhere, and he was black and white with a slight glow to him. We all screamed and panicked, jumping off the JCB and hiding around the tree trunks and barrels. The man just sat motionless for maybe 20 seconds or so, then vanished again. We were all completely freaked out and we started sharing what we had seen, talking over each other as we were describing the exact same thing. It was really strange a large group of us had all seen the same thing. All these years later, we still talk about that experience. The stories never changed. It was just us playing around and then this black and white guy appeared out of nowhere and then vanished again. What I find unique about this experience is that it wasn't just one or two of us who saw it. It was a large group of people. Whenever I watch paranormal shows or read about similar experiences, it always seems like it's just one or two people who witness something strange. But in our case, we all saw the same thing at the same time. Sadly, there were no camera phones back then, so we didn't have any pictures of what we saw. But even without any photographic evidence, we all remember that experience vividly. It's something that stayed with us all these years, and I don't think any of us will ever forget it. Did I sleep in a haunted bedroom? Cause anxiety later in life? When I was eight, my parents bought our first house a brand new one with no prior owners. One interesting feature of the house was that our family computer was situated directly beneath my sister's bedroom. We had a TV in the computer room, so we spent a lot of time together in that area of the house. However, there was one issue that always bothered us, and it was where the paranormal came into play. My sister and I would frequently hear running footsteps directly above us, emanating solely from her bedroom. Usually it was about four or five footsteps twice a week, though they were quite random. Sometimes we'd hear them two or three times in a day, sometimes every other day or sometimes not at all for weeks. Regardless of how often we heard them, we always knew the sounds of footsteps in any room upstairs from where we were. We all distinctly remember hearing these footsteps, including my stepmom, who lived with us briefly and moved into a new house soon afterward. The only person who claims to have never heard them was my dad. He was probably too engrossed in his work. Now, my sister suffers from terrible anxiety and depression, which has crippled her in many ways. It makes me wonder if there's a link between her mental illness and her haunted bedroom. Could the sound she heard in that room have contributed to her issues? It's just a theory, and I might be one of the only ones who thinks this way. You might think I'm crazy or wearing a tinfoil hat, but I'm cautious and curious to hear your thoughts. Have you or someone you know experienced something similar in their bedroom growing up that you think might have caused mental health issues later in life? Personally, I believe that the sounds of my sister that she was hearing growing up in that room might have had an impact on her mental health. But I could be wrong, and there could be a completely different explanation. Regardless, it's an interesting topic to ponder, and I'm curious to hear other people's perspective on the matter. Me and my employee saw a kid 
running in our store during Earth Hour. As a manager of a small retail chain store, I've had my fair share of weird experiences. However, this particular one happened just recently and it left us all stunned. It was a normal day. My employee and I were moving about 13 cartons of beer to the store. And suddenly I heard fast footsteps and saw a figure of a child running from the corner of my eye. My employee was freaking out because he saw it run past his eyesight. But when he took a closer look, it turned out to be a trolley. I shrugged it off and went to my cashier to ask if there was a kid running around. He said that there was only grown men who entered to buy beer. I went back to my employee and told him to just do our job and discuss it later. However, after our shift ended, we talked about seeing a kid running. My cashier insisted that no kid had entered the store during Earth Hour, which was the time when we had seen the figure. Then, I decided to ask my store staff to describe the color of the kid's shirt. I counted to three and we both said white. I asked if the boy, if it was a boy or a girl rather, and we both said girl with long hair. Now I know there's a skeptic in here, but from what I've experienced in this store, I truly believe that something in here is messing with us. We've had strange occurrences before, like products falling off shelves and rolling cages and things moving suddenly, but this was the first time I saw an apparition, albeit from the corner of my eye. If I was the only one who saw it, I would have shrugged it off. But my store staff was genuinely freaked out when he saw it too. Anyway, I just wanted to share this real life story with you guys. And no, we don't have any CCTV access. Only our area manager has that. And besides, the path where we saw it isn't a blind spot of any surveillance. Talk about coincidence, huh? Boyfriend's mom heard hissing from inside the closet and banging and pushing like something's trying to get out. I'm reading a story about a friend of mine who recently experienced something really strange in her house and I just can't stop thinking about it. She was fast asleep one night when she was suddenly woken up by a strange noise. It was a knocking sound that seemed to be coming from inside her closet. She immediately sat up in bed and listened carefully to try to figure out what it could be. At first, she thought it might be her cat playing around inside the closet, but she quickly realized that it couldn't be the case, because the knocking was too loud and too persistent. She tried to dismiss it and go back to sleep, but the knocking continued and it was impossible to ignore. She woke up her son, who lives with her, and he confirmed that he also hears the knocking sounds at night. It was then that they both started to feel uneasy and wonder if there was something more sinister going on inside their house. The house is located in an area that has a lot of history, including a town that was destroyed by a tornado in the 1800s. There have been reports of paranormal activity in the area, and the fact that the knocking sounds were coming from the closet with the mirrored doors made them both wonder if they had unknowingly opened some sort of portal. They both started to feel like they were being watched and began to experience strange occurrences, like objects moving on their own and sudden drops in temperature. Her son even reported seeing a full-bodied apparition of a man sitting on his bed many years ago. As a logical explanation, they checked for animals or possible issues with pipes, but nothing seemed to explain the knocking sound. That's when they began to worry that it could be something demonic. It's a frightening experience and I can't help but feel for my friend and her son. I'm hoping that they can find answers and solutions to this strange and terrifying situation. If anyone has any ideas or suggestions, please share. They would be much appreciated. What does three knocks mean, speaking from my own experience and from others' experience? I remember the eerie feeling that washed over me when I first heard three knocks. It was a slow and deliberate rhythm, not like any sound that could be produced by a human being. I was alone in my house that night, and the knocks seemed to be coming from one of the upstairs rooms. It was as if someone non-human was trying to communicate with me. 
At first, I dismissed it as my imagination playing tricks. But then I heard the knocks again, and this time they were louder and much more insistent. I began to feel a sense of dread creeping over me. I tried to convince myself that it was just the wind or some other natural occurrence, but deep down I knew that there was something else going on entirely. As the night wore on, the knocks continued. I became increasingly agitated. I started to wonder if I was even in danger. I tried to call a friend or family member, but there was no one available to answer. I was trapped in my house with this mysterious knocking sound. The next day, I talked to some friends and family members about what had happened. To my surprise, several of them had experienced the same thing. They too had heard three knocks, always when they were alone in their homes. Some had heard the knocking on their front doors, while others had heard it on their windows or walls. We all shared our experience and tried to make sense of what was happening. Some suggested that it was a sign of a ghost or a spirit trying to communicate with us. Others thought it was a warning of some sort, perhaps a premonition of an impending danger. To this day, I still don't know what the three knocks mean or where they come from, but I know that I'm not alone in my experience, and that brings me some comfort. I hope that one day we'll be able to find the truth behind this mysterious phenomenon. Until then, I will always be on the lookout for those slow, deliberate knocks, and I'll never forget the sense of unease that they bring with them. Spirits of Soldiers That U.S. Army veteran and infantry scout I've seen and experienced a lot during my time serving in Afghanistan. But something strange happened to me one night after a long and grueling 12-hour mission that didn't get back to us in the FOB until early in the morning. After another two hours of after-action review and cleanup, it was finally time for a good shower. The FOB I was stationed in was located between three very hostile villages, and this particular FOB had always been really active with mortar attacks. It even had been almost overrun once before, but this night felt extremely quiet compared to others. I couldn't wait to feel the hot water on my skin. I grabbed my backpack with my shower shoes, shampoo, wash rag, and a towel, as well as my PT clothes and flashlight. As I was showering, I could hear the sound of others walking to the shower area. I could also hear their conversation. They were talking about how they'd been attacked on their mission and that three people had died. My heart dropped and I quickly jumped out of the shower to see who it was. But when I got out, there was no one there. I opened the door to the bathrooms and outside, but I didn't see any light at all. I wanted to know which company they were in, so I could check on them later. But they were nowhere to be found. As I finished cleaning up and got dressed, I couldn't help but think that Someone had really died. Then there would have been an FOB blackout order. This means that no one has internet access until the families of the deceased have been contacted. It's a safety measure to prevent soldiers from posting about their fallen comrades on social media before their families have been notified. When I got back to my tent and jumped in my bed, I opened up my laptop to see if I still had internet, and to my surprise, I did. This whole experience was very weird to me, and I've never told anyone about it. But it's always left me wondering what really happened that night. Pretty weird experience I had a couple years ago. When I was a kid, my brother and I were practically inseparable. We did everything together from playing baseball to soccer and even hockey. We were only a year apart, so it made sense that we played on the same sports teams. It was awesome having a built-in best friend and teammate. One summer day, we went to a camp together, and halfway through the day, we had lunch. After lunch, I couldn't find my brother. I remember walking around with the lifeguard, who was also my babysitter at the time, trying to find him. I was getting worried, and I started to ask her if maybe they drowned. Unfortunately, that's exactly what happened. I remember everything about the day in extreme detail from them pulling him out of the water to the sound of my mom's cries when she found out. It's weird to think that I was only five years old at the time and now I'm 21. The memory is still so vivid in my mind 
and it's something that stuck with me all these years. I always wonder what my brother would be like, how he would be, if he had survived that particular day. Fast forward a few years and I'm 16 years old. My mom, my four younger siblings, and I had gone to McDonald's. And when we got home, I was doing what normal teenagers would do, taking pictures and sending them to my friends on Snapchat. I wasn't really paying attention to what I was taking pictures of, but something told me to look closer at one of the photos. As I looked at the picture, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was like an exact version of my little brother, but older. He looked tall, even taller than me at five years old. He had the same hairline and the same nose. It was like he was there, standing right in front of me. But I knew that couldn't be possible. I showed the picture to my mom, and she couldn't believe it either. We both just stared at the photo in awe. It was like my brother was trying to tell us something. Or maybe he was just trying to remind us that he's always with us in spirit. Regardless of the reason, seeing the photo was a moment I'll never forget. An experience I had in 2016. Finally ready to let go. In 2016, I and a few friends decided to go four-wheeling adventuring in Freetown, Massachusetts. We were all aware of this place being a hot zone for paranormal activity, ranging from haunting sightings and UFOs and Bigfoot and other mysterious things. However, being the adventurous bunch that we were, we were determined to explore the area and see if we could catch a glimpse of anything unusual. As we were heading back to the trailhead, my jeep was in the middle of our group of vehicles, and all of them were well lit with light bars. Suddenly, all of us started experiencing electronical issues simultaneously. The lights on my vehicle, the one in front of me, and the one behind me started flickering. All before we knew it, all three vehicles had died. While we were trying to figure out what in the heck was going on, my friend who was behind me claimed to have seen a tall black mass in his rearview mirror, just as the electrical problems occurred. He was so freaked out that he refused to tell us what he saw, but I could confirm that I also saw something eerie once we managed to get our vehicles started back up and left the area as quickly as possible. The strange thing about this black mass was that it felt like pure evil in its most condensed form. It seemed to be chasing us for over a mile through the woods, and all three of us experienced strange headaches and unexplained scratches on our bodies for days afterwards. I am unequivocally convinced that this entity was not of this world, and that it had malicious intentions towards us. Even now, years later, I shudder at the thought of that night, and I try not to think about it too much. It was an experience that left me feeling haunted and unsure of what lies beyond our world. I hope never to encounter anything like that ever again. I think I saw the ghost of my nan when I was a child. When I was nine years old, my nan died of cancer. It was a misdiagnosis, and the doctors only realized she had cancer when it was too late. Her death hit me hard. I loved her so much that I hyperventilated at her funeral and cried that hard. It was tough for my family, too, but we had a strong connection to Wales, with our family being part Welsh, so we spent every year there. After her death, not long after, we were sitting on a bench at some place in Wales, and I glanced over at another bench. There was a woman sitting there alone, who I'm 99% sure was my nan. I couldn't believe it. I rubbed my eyes, thinking it might have been a trick of the light. But when I opened them, she was still there, sitting quietly and enjoying the sea view. She was wearing a very familiar coat, her arm draped over the back of the bench, her eyes slightly squinted against the sun. And she was smiling. It was amazing. And stunning at the same time. The thing I remember most is that I didn't say anything to anyone. I just looked at her. It was like my mouth had gone dry and I couldn't even speak. It was as if I was the only one who could see her. I don't even remember seeing her leave. Perhaps we left first, but all I know is that I'm fairly sure I saw her that day 
And since then, there have been times when I am sure that she's visited me. I've felt her presence and I've even seen her in my dreams. She has always been a beacon of light in my life, and I know that she's looking down on me, proud of the person that I've become. I loved her so much and I hope that she knows that I love her. I moved away from home and it's been nearly two years since I've been back. But next week, I'm going to go back and visit her and leave her flowers. It's been too long and I miss her too much. I know that she's not physically there, but her memory and spirit are still alive in my heart. Strange encounter as a child. Help, maybe? When I was a child around 10 years old, I had an experience that I'll never forget. Even though it sounds weird and hard to explain. Only my dad believes me because he believes in the paranormal. I was playing in the woods beside my house when I tripped and fell over a root, rolling down a small embankment into the street. As I looked up, I saw a car coming around the bend. I thought that it was going to hit me. Then I saw this figure, made of glass, hovering over me. It was a man, but he was transparent, and I could see clean through him. He had an interesting look in his face, like he was examining me. Like when you see a penny on the sidewalk. I remember he was an older man with green and blue colors swirling around him. He looked like he was wearing a fur coat with one hand tucked into the front, and the other arm was kind of black and withered, like wood hanging down to the side without a sleeve. The clarity of the memory is still so uncanny to me to this day. It's like I can still see him with perfect clarity. He appeared to be a solid figure made of glass, and I don't know how to explain it. But it was like I could see through him and yet see him at the same time. It was so surreal. Suddenly, a branch fell from a tree, right on the hood of the car that was in front. And it caused the driver to break. If it hadn't been for that branch falling, the car would have hit me. I looked back at the figure, but it was gone. I have no idea what that figure could have been. I don't even know if it was an entity or some sort of spirit. But I'm pretty sure that whatever he was, he saved my life. I've always wondered if that figure was some kind of entity or if anyone else had seen something like it. It's been bothering me for ages, and I've been researching paranormal stories trying to find something similar, but I found nothing. The memory is still so vivid, and I don't know if it was a guardian angel a ghost, or something else entirely. All I know is that it was a surreal experience and it changed my life forever. Unexplained Light Flash A few years ago I had a strange experience with my sister that I'll never forget. We were both lying in bed scrolling through our phones when we saw something that we couldn't explain. It was a flash of light almost like a camera flash that came from one side of the room. At first we both ignored it hoping that it was just one of us accidentally taking a snapshot selfie with the wrong camera. But as the seconds ticked by we couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't right. The next day we talked about what had happened. The flash had come from where the bedroom door was, but the door was shut. It was close to the ceiling, and there were no outlets or windows in that area. The blinds were shut on the opposite side of the room, so there was no chance that it was headlights of a passing car. I had seen car headlights in that room before, but this was very different. It was just like a camera flash, and it lit up the room for a split second. It was unexplainable. A few nights later, my sister and I were discussing the flash again before we went to bed. As we were laying there, both wide awake on our phones, we saw it again. And this time, we didn't say anything. We just grabbed each other, pulled the blankets over our heads, and called our dad to come check it out. When he arrived, we explained what had just been happening, and we were both scared and didn't know what to do. My dad went over to the area where the flash had come from and looked around. But there was no explanation. Nothing that could have caused the flash. It was as if it had come from nowhere. After that night, my sister and I were too scared to sleep in that room again. We started sleeping in the guest room down the hall, where we felt safer. But even now, years later, we still talk about the strange experience. And we still can't explain what happened. We probably never will. It's a mystery that will always remain unsolved. A 
the man in the tux. As a child, I had a vivid imagination, and I loved to play make-believe, too. However, there was one experience that was far from make-believe, and it still haunts me to this day. It all started in my small town where everyone knew each other. And I was used to seeing the same faces day in and day out. But one night, as I was looking out my window, I saw a man standing under the streetlight across the street. Simple enough. At first, I thought it was just someone passing by. But as the days went on, I noticed that he was there every single night. I started calling him Mr. Tux because he's always dressed in a black wedding tuxedo and a top hat. It was a strange outfit to wear at night, and it made him stand out even more. I estimated that he was around six foot seven, lanky, and had a distinct presence about him. What was even stranger about Mr. Tux was that he didn't seem to have a face. It was almost like he was wearing a mask or his face was blurred out. I couldn't make out any features which made him all the more mysterious and ominous. Despite my fear, I couldn't help but look for him every night. As days turned into weeks and weeks turned into months, Mr. Tux remained a constant presence in my life. It was as if he was always watching me. I would try and tell my parents about him, but they just brushed it off as my imagination running wild. But then, just as suddenly as he appeared, he stopped coming. One night I looked out my window and he wasn't there. I waited the next night and the night after that but he never returned. It was as if he had vanished into thin air. And years have passed since then, but I can't forget about Mr. Tux. I wonder who he was and what he wanted. Was he a ghost or just someone playing a prank? The mystery of Mr. Tux still haunts me. I can't help but wonder if he'll ever come back. Pervy Paranormal Pal About six years ago, I was dating my wife, and she had three children from a previous relationship. They lived in a crappy little trailer that wasn't suitable for them, so I decided to get them a new home. I found an old farmhouse that was built in the early 20s, and it had been remodeled in the 70s. It was a quaint little place, not the warmest in the winter or the coolest in the summer, but it was miles better than their previous trailer. After about two weeks of living there, my wife told me not to pinch her while she was cutting vegetables. I was shocked because I was a solid five feet away from her at the time. As time went on, she started to tell me how she constantly felt something pinching her butt whenever she was in the kitchen. I thought she was just losing her marbles especially because she didn't have a job at the time and was spending most of her time indoors. Eventually, my wife got a job at a school, and one Friday I was home alone and deciding to prep some veggies for my meal prep. Not even a minute in, I felt an absolutely furious grab on my butt cheek. It wasn't a little pinch, but a total grab and lift of my full cheek. It was exhilarating, but at the same time it was terrifying. For three years, every time I was cooking, I would feel this mysterious booty grab. Nothing ever really happened. Nothing unexplainable anyway. Just this strange, wild phenomenon that seemingly was confined to the kitchen. A few months ago, we moved out of the farmhouse and into a new home. Even though the new house is great, I have to admit that I kind of miss my quote-unquote friend and the strange booty-grabbing phenomenon. Maybe it was just some kind of weird ghostly presence that had attached itself to the kitchen. Who knows? All I know is that I'll never forget those three years of cooking with a cheek-grabbing ghost. Restaurant Phenomena As my girlfriend and I were enjoying our meal at Black Angus had an encounter that still haunts me to this day. It was a typical evening and we were engrossed in conversation while we waited for our food to arrive. Finally our orders were served and along with them came the sauces in the little metal cups. As we began to dig in, my girlfriend pointed out that her cup was moving on its own. Initially I dismissed it as a minor quirk, but as I turned to look I noticed that the cup was in fact slowly creeping across the table, and to my horror 
it suddenly did a four-inch slide without any apparent explanation. The table wasn't slippery or tilted or wobbly, nor was the cup itself greased in any way. I was scared shitless and felt an unexplainable chill run down my spine. At first, I tried to reason with myself and find a logical explanation for the bizarre occurrence. Perhaps it was just a simple case of heat and thermal expansion, and the metal cup was expanding and contracting in response to the warmth of the sauce. But as I pondered over it, I realized that it was unlikely to be the case. My girlfriend and I were both freaked out by what we had just witnessed. We couldn't shake off the feeling that something inexplicable had just happened. We discussed it at length, but we couldn't come up with any rational explanation. That night, as I lay in bed, I couldn't help but think about what we had experienced. I felt a sense of unease and wondered if there was something more to it. Was it a paranormal experience, or was it just a strange coincidence? I couldn't be sure, but the incident stayed with me, and I couldn't help but feel apprehensive whenever I thought about it. To this day, I still wonder about what happened that night. It's a strange occurrence that I can't fully explain, and I often find myself trying to come up with a plausible explanation for it. The truth is, I may never know for sure. All I know is that it was a creepy experience and I won't forget it. Turns out the footsteps we heard were from a little boy. Remember the time my wife and I were renting a house in that old area and had a lot of history? When she moved in, there were a lot of things left behind by the previous tenants, as if they were left in a hurry. We found some Bose speakers that were still in good condition, so we kept them. However, after living there for a few months, strange things started happening. The light bulbs in the house always seemed to be loose and would not turn on. One night, while we were sitting in front of the fireplace, we heard light footsteps running upstairs. When we went to check, there was nothing there. Even our chihuahua, Leo, seemed to sense some Something was probably off, and kept looking up the dark hallway. At first, I didn't think much of it. I mean, what could it be? But later, my wife confessed to me that she had brought an ornate gold clock upstairs that she found hidden beneath the furnace in the basement. It was a strange place to put such a nice clock, but my wife liked it and wanted to display it in the house. After she brought the clock upstairs, things got even weirder. The clock would chime in the middle of the night, and the light bulbs would slowly unscrew themselves. I couldn't explain it, but I could feel like maybe there was an eerie energy in the house. It was the kind of feeling that made you uneasy and unable to explain why. To make matters worse, my wife started having nightmares about a little blonde kid wearing an old-fashioned pilgrim clothing type. She didn't tell me about it at first, because she knew that I didn't believe in any of that kind of stuff. But the more she described her dreams to me, the more I could sense that something was off about that whole house. Looking back, I realized that there are energies out there that science can't explain, and ghostly hands that teased us, mischievous energy that lingered in that old house will forever be a mystery to us. But one thing is for sure, we couldn't wait to move out of there and leave that eerie energy behind. I've been haunted by something for seven years. For the past seven or eight years, I've been tormented by something unexplainable. It all began in 2015 when my electronic devices started malfunctioning without any reasonable explanation. As time passed, the situation grew worse, and by 2018, I began to experience horrifying things like sleep paralysis and bruises all over my body, and even night terrors. These experiences were so terrifying that I ended up attempting suicide and had to be hospitalized. During this time, I started seeing white glowing eyes in the dark, which was the most obscure experience I ever had. I also heard whispers at night, sometimes jumbled voices whispering together or just my name being called out. The most bizarre and terrifying part of my experience was when my skin color started changing to gray, sometimes even a dark gray color on my hands. No explanation was ever given for this strange phenomenon. As if this wasn't enough, things got even worse in 2019. I woke up one morning with cuts on my arms and face. Not scratches, but cuts. 
This experience was incredibly frightening and confusing as I couldn't think of any possible explanation for it. After the incident, the torment stopped for about three years and I began to believe that it was all over. However, just three weeks ago, it started again and this time it's worse than ever. I've been experiencing blackouts and I don't remember most things that happened during those periods. Bruises have returned on my legs and I've been having trouble sleeping at night. I've gone to doctors and psychologists, but none of them have been able to offer any logical explanation for what's happening to me. I'm at my wit's end, and that's why I've decided to turn to Reddit for help. If anyone has any suggestion or has experienced anything similar, I beg you to share your knowledge with me. I can't keep on living like this, and I need to find a way to make it stop. Ghosts in the Workplace This story is something that I personally experienced with my mom and her friend at a pub, where my mom works as a manager. It all took place on a Friday night, which meant that it had been quite busy due to the karaoke event that was going on. The DJ had packed up and left his equipment there to collect the next day, but he had left everything unplugged. Once the pub had shut, came down from the upstairs flat to help my mom clean up. She was telling me how busy she was when all of a sudden her friend let out a blood-curdling scream. Naturally, we both turned around to see what was happening and we saw my mom's friend standing still, looking very shaken up. She then told us that she felt her apron rise up and someone whispered into her ear. Initially, we brushed it off as just her imagination or a prank. However, things started to get weirder as my mom was cashing up until then. She suddenly heard someone whisper her name into her ear, which really spooked her out. And at this point, she accused one of us of playing a prank on her, but we just ignored it and continued with her work. Then out of nowhere, the DJ equipment started buffering, and it began playing quiet music. I turned it off, but I didn't realize it was meant to be unplugged until two hours later when we were on our way home. The pub where my mom works has many other strange things happening there as well. For example, glasses have been known to fly off their shelves. And on the CCTV cameras, clear orbs can be seen flying across the screen. And on several occasions, these orbs have brushed past bar staff and my mom and even customers causing them to react as though they're being touched. All these experiences left me feeling quite unnerved about the pub. I don't like staying there at late night anymore. I guess some places are just haunted. And there's not much you can do about it. I need help identifying something I saw floating above me. When I was a child around seven or eight years old, I had an experience that I still can't quite explain. I was playing in my grandmother's backyard with my cousin when he decided to go inside for a bathroom break. As I waited for him to return, I was about to go down the slide of my grandmother's huge swing set when something caught my eye above the houses in the front of the house. It was a ball slowly rolling in midair and coming my way. At first I thought it was just a ball someone had thrown, but as it got closer, I realized it wasn't falling, it was just rolling and rotating in the air, as if it was being controlled by something. I could see what looked like threads hanging off of it, as if it was made of leather and ripped open a bit. I could only tell it was rolling in the air because of the opening and threads hanging out. As it got closer, Right above me, I was able to see it more clearly. It wasn't very high up in the sky, probably about 20 or so feet above me, and it wasn't very big either. It could have been the size of a tire maybe or something a little smaller, but it was still high up off the ground, and I was able to get and make some details on it. I watched as it slowly passed above me, rolling and rotating in the air until I could no longer see it in the distance. I remember being so confused and thinking, what the hell is that? I was a little unsettled watching it, maybe because I had no idea what it could be and how it could just stay in the air. To this day, I still can't quite put my finger on what I could have seen. I've asked around to see if anyone else had experienced anything similar or knew what, what the hell this was, but no one seemed to have any answer for me. And this happened in Southern California. And I often wonder if anyone else in the area has seen anything similar. 
It remains the most inexplicable experience of my life, and I can't help but wonder if somebody else could have seen it too. RN As I lay in bed, my mind slowly drifting off to sleep, I suddenly heard a creaking sound. I realized it was the sound of my bedroom door opening. My heart raced as I quickly turned my head to see what was happening. As I looked toward the door, it slowly closed shut. Fear gripped me as I sat up in bed. I knew I had to check if anyone was there, so I got out of bed and cautiously opened the door. To my surprise, there was nothing in sight. The hallway was silent and no one was there. I started to feel uneasy and my mind raced with the possibility of someone sneaking into my house. I decided to check on my mom, who was sound asleep in her room. After making sure she was okay, I heard something from upstairs. It was the sound of running footsteps. My heart skipped a beat as I realized that someone could be in the house. I tried to be rational and thought it could just be maybe the old house settling. But the fear inside of me was too strong to ignore. I tried to calm myself down and remind myself that I had to go to school the next day, but it was of no use. My mind was racing with the possibility of someone being in the house, and I couldn't shake off the feeling of being watched. I was sweating and felt extremely scared. I tried to go back to bed, but sleep wouldn't come. Every little noise made me jump, and I found myself constantly checking my surroundings. I'd never been so scared in my life. The next morning I woke up feeling exhausted and drained. The fear from the night before still lingered, and I couldn't shake it off. I was anxious to go to school and leave the house behind me. As I walked out of the house, I felt a sense of relief wash over me. The daylight seemed to chase away the shadows of the night before, and I felt a little bit better. But I knew that the memory of what happened would stay with me for a long time, and that it would take a lot for me to feel safe and secure again. Gifts from Children As a dance instructor, our job is to teach children how to dance. But sometimes it can be challenging, especially when there are two little girls in the class who don't get along. They can make my job more difficult than it has to be. And despite this, I still love my job and it brings me joy. I'm also a Doberman owner and I love dogs. I've always had a connection with them. And one night while lying in bed, a vision came to me of my next dog. She would be a red Doberman named Bunny. Couldn't shake this feeling off and it stayed with me for a while. The next day when I got to class, one of the more difficult students came up to me and said, Miss A, I made you something. It's a balloon dog. She handed me a little handmade clay figure that looked like a bunny painted red. I was shocked. It wasn't a Doberman, but the fact that she got the color right was impressive. It felt like she read my mind. It made me think about the power of visualization and how our thoughts can manifest into reality. On a separate note, one of my friends got mad at me for not making her a priority. I forgot to buy her a gift and give her a card for her birthday, which falls in between Thanksgiving and Christmas. I knew I messed up, but the holidays are a very difficult time for me. I don't like them. It's a hard time of year and I struggle. Instead of talking with me about it, my friend cut me off and won't return my calls. I feel bad about it and I wish I could make it right. The simple act for my child in class made me realize that I could so easily make up with my friend if I wanted to. It made me think about the power of small gestures and how they can make a big impact. I'm curious about what other people think about this matter. Do you think it's worth trying to make amends with my friend? Or is it better to just let it go? It's something that's been on my mind a lot lately, and I believe that forgiveness is important, and I hope that one day my friend will forgive me. Has anyone else experienced water pouring from thin air? When I was in my late teens, I experienced something truly bizarre that still leaves me questioning what I saw. As a notorious night owl, it wasn't unusual for me to be up and about in the early morning. One particular night, though, my parents were out of town, and I'd returned home around 2 a.m. after hanging out with my teenage friends. I decided to grab a drink from the kitchen before heading to bed. 
As I was walking out of the kitchen, I heard a peculiar sound, the sound of water pouring into water. It was distinctive, and I followed the sound of the dog's dish. There I saw something that will haunt me forever. An apparent 12-inch stream of water was pouring down from thin air and landing in the dog's water bowl. I could see the ripples as the water made contact with the surface of the bowl. It was an inexplicable phenomenon, leaving me feeling spooked and perplexed. At the same time, it was late, and I was tired, so I decided to ignore it, thinking that maybe I had accidentally bumped into the bowl and my imagination was the rest. I never mentioned this occurrence to anyone, and with time, I almost forgot about it. Fast forward ten years later, and I was attending a small family gathering, where we were all swapping stories about peculiar things that they had experienced. When it was my father's turn to share, I was left stunned. He described seeing the exact same thing I was experiencing happening in her house, the stream of water pouring down from thin air into the dog's bowl, and he had seen it late at night. It was both comforting and alarming to know that someone else had seen what I saw, but at the same time it raised more questions than answers. I couldn't help but wonder if anyone else had experienced anything similar. The thought of it still sends shivers down my spine. Anyone can truthfully say they saw a ghost? As I was walking down the hallway of the third floor of the apartment building in Al Barsha, R445, Dubai, heading towards our room, I saw something that I will never forget. In front of me was a tall figure, a black nun, who stood taller than me, and I'm five foot four. She had lightly dark skin and was dressed in all black clothes, with white inner clothing that stood out against the dark fabric. As I walked towards her, I could feel a sense of unease creeping up on me. I couldn't explain why, but her presence made me feel uncomfortable. I had tried to avoid making eye contact and walked past her with my head down, lost in my thought about life's problems. But as I closed my eyes for a moment, I suddenly felt a strange sensation that I could not ignore. I opened my eyes again and the nun was gone. It all happened so quickly in a matter of just a few seconds, and yet it left me feeling shaken and confused. I couldn't disregard the feeling that something supernatural had just happened to me. I started to wonder if what I had just seen was real or in my mind. I tried to convince myself that it was just a figment of my imagination, but deep down, I knew there was something else going on. For weeks after the incident, I couldn't stop thinking about it. I started researching the history of the building, trying to find any information about the nun that I had seen. But there was nothing at all. No one had ever seen or heard of the black nun in the area. I still don't know what I saw that day, but I can't help but feel that it was something beyond my understanding. Maybe it was a message from the other side, a warning or a sign that I have yet to decipher. But one thing is for sure, I will never forget that encounter, and it will continue to haunt me for a long time to come. One of my many experiences. I was dating this girl for a while and we decided to take her son to the lake with us. When we got back to her place, she realized that she left her keys inside the house. Her doors were one of those automatic locking mechanism kinds, and we were locked out. And it was a frustrating situation. But when her son walked up, the door he whispered, Hey, Tony, open up. And suddenly heard all three locks being unlocked and the door slightly opened. I couldn't believe what I just witnessed and it left me completely speechless. That was the first incident that made me feel like something strange was happening in that house. The second time I heard her son talking to someone when I got home from work. I asked him who he was talking to and he stopped talking and looked at me for a brief moment before going back to talking. But there was no one else in the room. I couldn't make out what he was saying but I knew that something was definitely off. Later that day, my girlfriend got upset because all the crucifixes in the house had been flipped upside down. She blamed me and her son, thinking that it was some kind of practical joke, but both of us denied having any part in it. We were just as scared and confused as she was. 
However, we finally made a decision to leave that house, and it was an incident in the office. For no apparent reason, I heard a noise coming from the room, and like an idiot, I went to see what was happening. Suddenly, the bookshelves collapsed on me, and I was trapped underneath them. It was a terrifying experience, and I knew that it was time for me to get out of there. To this day, I still avoid going to that town and avoid any contact with that girl. I've never experienced so many crazy and unexplained occurrences happen in such a short amount of time. It made me wonder if I was the only one that this had ever happened to, but deep down, I knew that something was wrong with that house, and I didn't want to be any part of it. Shadow next to my bed. When I was a child, I remember experiencing something that still haunts me to this day. It must have been around five or six years old, and I was trying to fall asleep in my own bed. However, I had an unexplainable feeling that made me toss and turn for an hour without success. Eventually, I decided to go into my parents' room to see if I could sleep with them. My dad was fast asleep, but my mom allowed me to join her on the bed. Despite being next to my mother, the feeling of unease did not go away, and as I lay there, I turned over and saw a shadow figure of a man standing in front of me and my parents. The man was eerily still, not talking or moving, just watching us. The figure resembled King Ramses from the cartoon series Courage the Cowardly Dog, but it was all black. I was terrified and turned around to face my mother, hoping to find some solace. After a few moments, I gathered the courage to look back again, but the figure was still there, looming over us. I couldn't understand what was happening, and I was too scared to say anything. I tried to close my eyes and ignore it, but the figure stayed there, making me feel even more uncomfortable. As time passed, I mustered the courage to look back again, but to my relief, the figure was gone. There was no sign of it anywhere. I was relieved, but also confused and scared. I told my parents about the incident, but they didn't believe me either. They thought I was making it up, or it could have been my dad, but I knew it wasn't him as I could hear him snoring right next to me. Years have passed, and I still wonder what it was that I saw that night. It stayed with me, and I've tried to find logical explanations for it, but I've come up short. Maybe it was just my imagination, or perhaps there was something more paranormal at play. Nonetheless, it remains one of the scariest experiences of my life. My flat is haunted. Okay, so I've been in my flat for two years now, and when this happened, the people that were living there, myself, a 20-year-old female, my flatmate Anna, 21-year-old female as well, and my other flatmate Joseph, a 20-year-old male, names changed of course. Initially, weird shit would happen. The front door would open when it was locked, or heating would turn off and on, or the light in the bathroom would turn off and on. But one night actually scared the living shit out of me. So I was asleep, and then I woke up to a slender man looking figure over me, pressing down on me, and yelling at me to unlock my phone. Weird. At first, I couldn't move or scream or anything, so I thought, well, that was a scary dream, and then I stayed up the rest of the night reading, because no way was I going to go back to sleep after that. This happened around 3 a.m., and I text my flatmate Anna, Oh my god, weirdest dream I have to tell you in the morning. The next morning, Anna came to my room and was like, Holy fuck, last night something came out of my room at like 3.30ish and I saw this slender man thing holding your doorknob and looking like it was waiting to get into your room. I then gasped, as I had not told her what had happened last night with that figure, but it was the same guy. Obviously, we're questioning life at this point. So, I wake up Joseph and ask him if anything's weird, and if anything happened to him in the flat. And he casually goes, Oh yeah, I see like a large figure crouching on top of my wardrobe. I'm sorry, what? So yeah, my flat is definitely haunted by this Slender Man guy. But, we've continued living here for another year now. Joseph moved out and another girl, Ava, moved in. Sometimes the lights still flicker and the door opens, but otherwise no scary shit so far this year. I 
think I saw the actual men in black. I don't know how to feel. The story sends chills down my spine whenever I think about it. It happened a few years ago when I was 17 years old. It was summer and my family and I were on our way to visit my uncle who had a small beach house. To get to his house, we had to pass through a large stretch of forest that seemed to go on for about an hour or so. And the sun had risen and was casting a beautiful light in everything. And that's when things started to get strange. My dad turned off his music to check the GPS. And I looked out at the forest and I noticed that we were the only car on the road. Not a single car in front of us or behind us. For a moment, I thought it was strange because it was a very populated area in Oregon and in the middle of the summer. Yet we were the only car on the road for an hour and a half. As I kept staring out at the forest, something caught my eye. A clearing opened up, and I saw two men dressed in black suits, black sunglasses, black gloves, and black shoes. They were tying a big, hairy creature to a tree. I couldn't believe what I was seeing, and they were looking at me. Not the car, me. It was like they knew I had seen them. I was terrified and asked my dad if he had seen them. But he seemed confused and he didn't see a thing. He was too focused on driving and checking the GPS. I've never believed in strange things like this, but I still can't explain what I saw. The creature wasn't lashing around or freaking out. And to make it worse, as soon as I, we left the forest and joined the other cars, everything seemed normal again. It was like I just stumbled into a crime scene. And it still haunts me. I've often wondered if anyone else has had a particular experience that was similar to this, or if I can just chalk it up to a hyperactive imagination. Regardless, it was a terrifying experience that I will never forget. Weird stuff that happened to me. I have always been passionate about playing guitar, especially metal. It's my way of expressing myself and letting out all the emotions that I keep bottled up. One day I was practicing a Slipknot song called Disaster Piece. It's one of my favorites, and I was really getting into it. Just before the first drop, I felt a sudden pressure on my shoulder, the one where my guitar strap wasn't. It was like a hand was placed on my shoulder, but there was no one in the room with me. I turned around quickly to see who it was, but there was no one there. All I saw was a glimpse of an arm in white clothing disappearing into thin air. It was fucking creepy. But at the same time, I felt a strange sense of peace. It was like someone was trying to connect with me through the music. I couldn't explain it, but I felt like the presence was trying to tell me something. Then today, the same thing happened again. I was playing Fight Fire with Fire by Metallica, another one of my favorites. And just before the first solo, I felt the same pressure on my shoulder again. This time... I didn't turn around immediately. Instead, I closed my eyes and I tried to focus on the music. I could feel the presence behind me, and I knew that it was the same one that visited me before. Both bands, Slipknot and Metallica, have members who have passed away. I couldn't help but wonder if it was one of them trying to communicate with me. It was a surreal experience and it made me a little uneasy at first, but then I realized that it was something special. I felt like I was being watched over and guided by someone who understood my love for the music. I don't know if it'll happen again, but I'm not afraid of it anymore. In fact, I welcome it. Playing guitar has always been a personal and spiritual experience for me, and now it's even more so. I feel like the music is a bridge that connects me to something beyond this world, and I'm grateful for it. Ever heard of a lechuza? Remember the time when I saw a creature that I'd never heard of before? It was when I was 19 years old, and I was living in Pearson, Florida. For those who don't know, Pearson is a small town that can be difficult to navigate if you aren't familiar with it. The town is surrounded by dirt roads, greenhouses, and gives off a sketchy vibe. One of my friends lived in a remote area of Pearson, which I disliked driving to specifically, especially at night. And one day, my friend and I were leaving her house, and it was still daylight out. As I was backing out of her driveway and straightened my car forward to start driving, I saw something that I couldn't believe with my eyes. It was a creature that wore a cloak, and it was gray in color. The creature had a male presence, and it was very dominant. It was mad at me, and I can tell from the noise that it made. 
The sound was a mix of a baby's cry and a demonic growl. I will never forget the noise it made. Until this very day. The creature lunged at my car as it screamed, and my friend and I saw and heard it. I was so scared that I drove out of there as fast as I could, and my friend and I were in disbelief the whole way home. We cried, laughed uncomfortably, and questioned what we had seen. It was a lot to take in, and I didn't sleep well that night. The next day, I called my friend's sister to tell her what had happened, and I described the creature to her. She told me matter-of-factly that it was a lechuza, a creature known as a witch or a bad omen that brings bad luck or warns people to stay away. The lechuza wears a cloak and it has a bird's beak, but no description could do it justice. The experience was terrifying and I'll never forget the noise the lechuza made. Even now at 33 years old, the memory has stayed with me and will never leave. Something in my house mimicking voices and whistles. As someone who lives in a two-story house with just my feline companion, N, I never expected to encounter anything paranormal. In fact, when I first moved in roughly two months ago, the place seemed devoid of any creepy or haunted vibes, which was a pleasant surprise given my unusual fear of sleeping alone in the house. However, my comfortable and peaceful nights were interrupted roughly three weeks ago when I began hearing my own voice being mimicked back to me from other rooms or even downstairs. At first, I dismissed these instances as just mere figments of my imagination since they were so quiet, but things took a more serious turn when I heard a very clear, hey buddy, coming from behind a closed door in another room, a room that was completely empty at the time. The same occurrence happened a couple of times in different parts of the house, which left me feeling spooked and uneasy. But things took a more sinister turn when the person taking care of N while I was away this weekend informed me that he heard his own whistle being mimicked back from him from downstairs one morning. He does a very specific whistle to call N, and he was understandably rattled by the experience in fact. He grabbed his keys and left immediately after. As someone who has his fair share of paranormal experiences throughout my life, I never thought I'd have to deal with it alone. Now the prospect of returning home and being alone at night fills me with dread and fear. I'm at a loss on what to do. I'm not sure if anyone's had similar experiences that they can share with me. If anyone has any advice or tips on how to handle these strange happenings, I would be eternally grateful. For now, I just hope whatever's in my house will leave me and my beloved cat alone. Random Whistling As a tenant in a duplex, I share the building with a number of other people. Although I rarely see them, ever since I moved in, I've been hearing strange whistling noises on and off. At first, the sounds were coming from outside on the street, and then when I was out jogging. It was always the same tune, and it had a consistent sound. I thought it was odd, but I didn't think too much of it at the time. However, the strange occurrences continued, and the whistling noise started to show up more frequently, sometimes once a week. It was still the same tune, but I couldn't pinpoint where it was coming from. It would disappear as suddenly as it appeared, leaving me confused and unsettled. I tried to brush it off, thinking maybe it was just a coincidence, or perhaps some kind of bird or animal making the noise. But then something happened that made me start to question everything. One night while I was home alone, I heard the whistling noise again. This time, it was right outside my door. I froze in my place, listening as the sound continued, not knowing what to do. I didn't dare open the door, afraid of what might be waiting on the other side. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong, and the whistling only made me more uneasy. I began to wonder if someone was trying to communicate with me through the whistling, or if it was some kind of warning. I tried asking my neighbors if they had heard anything, but they all looked at me like I was crazy. I'm still not sure what that whistling could be, but I can't help feel like there's something more to it, 
It's unsettling to think that someone or something is watching me and communicating in this strange way. I hope that one day I'll be able to uncover the truth behind the whistling and put my mind at ease. I think I saw a ghost as a kid. Let me share with you a bit of background about my childhood. I lived in a shithole apartment located in the ghetto parts of the city, where shootouts were a common occurrence. The apartment floor had a corridor that led to the front door, which opened into the kitchen. On the left-hand side, there was a bathroom, followed by my sister's and my room, while on the right-hand side, there was the living room, the back door, and my brother's room. It was a small apartment, and my sister and I had to share a bed, while my other sister slept in the same room. I was around 8 or 10 years old when one night during autumn or winter, me and my two older sisters were in bed. All the lights were out, and I was bored. So I looked around the room, I blinked, and suddenly there was a figure in front of me. I think it was a female figure, as it had long, dark, wavy hair. I didn't feel scared or tired, and in a blink of an eye, she was gone. It was a strange experience, but I brushed it off and went back to sleep. A year passed, and my sister and I were playing around the apartment building having fun, and my older sister saw some kind of blue figure of energy in one of the hallways that I was running through. She shrugged it off, but as we went back into our apartment, she froze at the corridor that connects to the living room. When I sat on the couch and asked her what was wrong, she said that she saw someone's foot with a blue dress walking in the house, and heard someone standing on the floor, creaking it. It was the same one from inside the apartment. And to be honest, I never really felt a negative energy with her at all. She never really bothered us except for really freaking out my sister once. We never saw or heard anything like that again, but I think she left us alone. Looking back at my childhood, it's surreal to think that we had to live in such a dangerous and eerie environment. Nonetheless, these experiences have shaped me into the person I am today, and I'm grateful for that. My Best Friend's New House I have a best friend who recently moved into a new house with her three kids. The oldest of her children is only five years old. One day, he started talking to a ghost in his room, a little boy to be exact, and said that he was going to punch him to protect everyone because he wasn't afraid of him. We just brushed it off thinking he was just playing around due to the random scary videos that he watched on YouTube. However, about a week ago, my friend and her ex-husband were in the kitchen when they heard her name, Anna. They looked at each other and heard it again before searching for the source, but there was no one outside and all the kids were asleep. After that incident, we decided to ask our friend's grandpa to bless the house, since he was a priest, and he had already blessed my friend's house a while back. Unfortunately, we didn't know that when he was able to come and bless the house, and in the meantime, we were worried about how to protect ourselves and our children. Then just tonight, my nephew started talking about how he saw the ghost in his room and how it was staring at him, and he described it as having sharp teeth. When this other aunt suggested that he punch the ghost again, he replied that he was scared of it. So now we're wondering what to do to protect ourselves and our babies. We've considered seeking help from a paranormal investigator, but we're not really sure if that's the best option. We have also looked for ways to cleanse the house, such as smudging with sage or placing salt in the corners of the room. We're all a bit freaked out by the situation, especially since we have young children in the house. It's scary to think that there might be a ghost or a spirit lurking around, especially one that seems to be causing fear in the kids. We just hope that we can find a way to protect ourselves and our home until our friend's grandpa can come and bless the house. What just happened? As I lay in bed next to my young son, my mind is wandering aimlessly when I suddenly saw a trip in my vision. It was like someone was unzipping a part of my reality, just to the left of where my eyes were focusing in the room, and to my shock, a young woman had torn through into my reality and was staring at me intently. It was as if she had opened a bag to see what was inside. I could sense that in her reality, she was walking on a busy street in broad daylight. 
I felt like she was just curious to see into someone else's life without any malicious intent. She didn't say anything. She just stared at me with an intense gaze. I started to feel uneasy and asked her to go. And to my relief, she closed the rip and disappeared. I couldn't help but wonder if this was a common occurrence and whether people often looked into other people's realities. I was left with so many questions and had no explanation for what had just happened. It was such an unusual experience that left me feeling both bewildered and perplexed. I spent hours researching and looking for any similar experiences, but I came up empty-handed. As time went on, I tried to make sense of what I had witnessed, but still I had no explanation. I shared the story with a few close friends, but they couldn't offer any rational explanation either. Some suggestions that could be maybe lucid dreaming, while others believed it could have been a hallucination, but neither of these explanations seemed to fit what I'd experienced. And to this day, I still have no explanation for what happened that night. It remains one of the most inexplicable experiences of my life, leaving me to wonder if there are parallel realities that are somehow able to tap into. While it may seem like a far-fetched idea, I can't help but believe that there's something more to this world than what meets the eye. A ghost or demon in my bathroom. For as long as I can remember, I've seen a ghostly figure of a lady in my bathroom. This apparition has remained in the same spot for the past eight years, never moving an inch. It's become a normal occurrence for me, something that I've grown used to over time. However, something strange happened today that left me feeling unsettled and spooked. My friend came over to hang out, and he went to use the bathroom a few times to wash his hands. And as he came out of the bathroom, I went to grab a drink, and that's when I saw it. The ghostly figure was there, but this time it was different. It was broad daylight, and I'd never seen it before in the day, but... The figure was lying down with its head turned towards my friend. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. This was the first time the ghost had ever appeared during the day, and it felt like it was staring right at us. The whole situation was incredibly eerie, and I felt my heart racing as soon as I was processing what was happening. To make matters even stranger, my friend kept going back into the bathroom, almost like he was being drawn to it. It was as if the ghost was trying to communicate something to us or draw our attention to something in the bathroom. It was all so bizarre. I didn't know how to react. After my friend left, I couldn't shake the feeling of unease that had settled over me. I had grown up seeing this ghostly figure, but this was unlike anything I'd ever experienced before. Felt like the ghost was trying to tell me something, but I didn't know what it was. As I lay in bed that night, I couldn't sleep. The image of the ghost lady, now seen in broad daylight, was burned into my mind. It was a frightening experience that I wouldn't soon forget, and it left me wondering what other strange occurrences might happen in my home. What does it mean? When I look back at my high school years, I remember feeling quite disillusioned with the Catholic faith that my family had instilled in me. Seeking something different, something that would make me feel more connected to the spiritual world, I decided to explore Wicca. At the age of 15, I dabbled in it a little bit, and I even attempted my first and only spell. All I remember about that spell was that I had a blue candle lit, and I recited a long poem. That night I had the most peculiar dream. I found myself in a type of gala, and someone asked if I wanted to see my husband. Intrigued, I followed this person, and there he was, tall, pale, and with jet black hair. Then I woke up. As time went on, I found that I kept having recurring dreams of this man. Sometimes he appeared as smoke, and other times he appeared as a person. The most vivid dream I had was when he told me to communicate with him through mirrors. It freaked me out and I never dared to try it. Throughout the years, I had two failed relationships. The first one was amicable. We simply fell out of love but remained good friends. The second one, however, was quite traumatic. He was abusive and there was nothing salvageable about a relationship. Through it all, though, I couldn't shake the feeling that the man in my dreams was somehow connected to my fate. 
Now at the age of 36, I still sometimes think about that dream and wonder what it all meant. Did I really see my future husband? Was it all just a coincidence? I may never know for sure, but what I do know is that my spiritual journey has taken many twists and turns since then. While I never fully embraced Wicca, I did learn to appreciate the power of positive thinking and manifestation. And who knows, maybe one day I'll try my hand at spellcasting once again. Unexplained fingerprints appearing in my girlfriend's mirror. Let me tell you about the strange occurrences happening in my girlfriend's place. She's always been afraid of the paranormal, and I'm always teasing her about it. We've been together for over a year now, and about four months ago, her ceiling fell above her head. It was pretty scary, and it left a dark stain on the ceiling, indicating some sort of water damage. I kept joking that we should do a Ouija board session at her place, but she refused, understandably so. Lately, my girlfriend's been getting increasingly worried about something else. She's been asking me if I've been leaving fingerprints on her massive mirror, which measures about 8 feet by 5 feet. I have not, and I've been teasing her about it, thinking it's just a silly joke. However, she's been very serious about it, fearing that it might be something supernatural. We've been cleaning the mirror thoroughly, but the fingerprints keep appearing, and today there were even more than before. I took some photographs of the fingerprints, and they're clearly fingerprints of a small child, about three feet up from the floor. The strange thing is, is that my girlfriend doesn't have any kids, so it's a bit eerie. To make matters worse, we once went to an old antique store near her place to buy each other creepy and old photos. We found some original photos from the mid-1800s, and I gave her one of a child. It's just a strange coincidence, but it's been making my girlfriend even more scared. I keep teasing her about the fact that her place might be haunted, but deep down I'm starting to wonder if there is something else going on here. The strange fingerprints on the mirror and the creepy antique photo are giving me the chills. Maybe it's time to take her fears seriously and do some investigating. The Summer Camp Encounter I remember this one summer when I went out on Boy Scamp Campout in North Wisconsin, in this well-known campsite with the smiling tent as a mascot. There were about a dozen of us, along with some scout leaders, all in the clearing where one of the many troops were set up. My best friend from childhood and I shared a tent, and it was maybe the third night when things started to get strange. I fell asleep normally that night, but I woke up to some strange sounds in the middle of the night, maybe around two or three. It was hard breathing or soft grunting, and it was really unnerving. I looked around the tent and saw nothing out of the ordinary. Then I noticed my friend was awake too, and we both froze in fear. I gestured for him to be quiet and listened as something started brushing up against our side of the tent, poking into the fabric like antlers. Suddenly, something sharp and black poked through the tent, we heard a loud exhale. Whatever it was, it stepped back and we heard branches crunching and twigs snapping as it faded into the distance. We stayed awake for another hour, whispering to each other and trying to rationalize what had just happened. We wondered if we should check outside the tent, but we were too scared. When we woke up in the morning, we found three to four more holes in the tent, similar to the first one. We checked around the tent to see if we can find any evidence of what had happened behind our tent, and we found bare human footprints that circled around the tent several times. They didn't lead to or from the tent, but just made three or four rings that looped around. My friend and I were both really freaked out by the whole experience, and we talked about it a few times on the trip, but we haven't spoken about it since. It's been a few summers now, and the details are starting to get a bit fuzzy. But I'll never forget that strange night in the woods. Yeah. I had a bizarre experience early this morning that left me feeling quite unsettled. It was around 4.30 a.m. and I'd been sound asleep for several hours. Suddenly, I woke up and realized... I needed to reposition myself in order to get comfortable and go back to sleep, and as I did, 
I distinctly heard a child's voice say, Yeah. The sound of the voice shocked me out of my drowsiness, and I immediately opened my eyes to see what was going on. Of course, I saw nothing out of the ordinary, just my dark, quiet bedroom. I tried to calm myself down by telling myself that it was probably just my imagination, or maybe even some kind of sleep hallucination. But the truth is, I was absolutely terrified. I lay there for a few moments trying to gather my thoughts and figure out what to do next. Should I get up and investigate? Call out to see if anyone was there? I quickly realized that both of those options were ridiculous. I didn't want to scare myself even more, and besides, there was really no way to know what was going on. So I took a deep breath and tried to relax. I closed my eyes again and focused on my breathing, trying to will myself back to sleep. It wasn't easy. Every little noise seemed amplified, and I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. Eventually, though, I did manage to drift off. And when I woke up again, it was several hours later, and the sun was starting to peek through my window. I felt groggy and disoriented, but also strangely relieved that the night was over. Of course, the experience has stayed with me all day. I can't stop thinking about that voice, or what it might have meant. Was it just a figment of my imagination, or something more sinister? I don't know, but I do know that I'll be praying a lot harder tonight before I go to bed than normal. Van Life Haunted by Poltergeist As I settled down to watch my favorite TV show, I was looking forward to a peaceful and restful night. However, that's when I heard footsteps outside my van, which I found quite odd. I mean, who'd be wandering around at 11 p.m.? I tried to shake off the feeling of unease and put it down as just a passerby, but deep down I knew something was off. As the night wore on, I drifted off to sleep. But suddenly, I was jolted awake by a loud noise. It sounded like someone was banging on pots and pans right outside my van. My heart was racing and I had no idea what was going on. I tried to rationalize the noise, thinking it was probably just some kids messing around. But then I heard a clock ticking sound circling my van. That's when I knew something was definitely wrong. I didn't have a clock in my van. A panic began to set in as I realized that I might not be alone. I had no idea who I was making, or rather who was making these noises, but I knew that I had to do something. I picked up my phone and I called my mom, hoping to calm my nerves. As soon as my mom picked up the phone, the noise outside my van suddenly stopped, sending shivers down my spine. It was as if the person making the noise had disappeared into thin air. I was terrified and I didn't want to spend another minute in that place. I decided to get out of there as quickly as possible and find a safer place to spend the night. As I drove away, my mind was racing with all sorts of scary thoughts. Who could have been outside my van? What did they want from me? I was glad to have escaped unscathed, but the experience left me shaken and scared. I realized that I couldn't take my safety for granted, and I needed to be more cautious in the future. Was my childhood home haunted, or was it just my imagination? When I reflect on my childhood memories, there's one particular experience that still gives me the chills. It was during the time when I was around four to six years old. I would often wake up to strange noises coming from our kitchen at around 5 a.m. in the morning. The sun had already risen, so it didn't scare me as much as it should have. At first, I thought it was just my parents making breakfast, but the voices I heard weren't theirs. It was a family of three, a mom, a dad, and their son, who I could hear splashing water and laughing in the kitchen. As a child, I couldn't see into the kitchen from my bedroom, but the voices were loud enough for me to hear them. I remember feeling scared and unsure of what was going on, but the laughter and the joyous sounds coming from the kitchen made me curious at the same time. It was like they were mocking us by wasting our water which was only adding to the mystery of it all for me. Despite being curious, I never dared to go into the kitchen to investigate. Instead, I would grab my pillow and blanket and run to my parents' bedroom to sleep with them. I felt safer with them, and even though I could still hear the voices, it was reassuring to be near them. 
Years later, I discovered that my big sister had heard the same voices as well. It was a relief to know that I wasn't the only one who had experienced this. We never talked about it at the time, but it's a topic that came up multiple times since we moved out of that house. The fact that both my sister and I heard the same voices from the kitchen makes me wonder if our childhood home was haunted. Perhaps it was just a coincidence, but if the experience is there and we both had it, I guess that explains why it freaks me out so much to this day. Hi, I found this subreddit today and I think I want to share my experience, since why not? I used to live in the attic with my family. The space had three rooms with my uncle occupying the middle one and his brother living in the top room. As for me, I stayed in the bottom room. It wasn't the most spacious place, but it was home. However, something strange and unsettling happened during one fateful night. It started when I saw a dark figure moving in circles. It had long hair and fingers that seemed to stretch unnaturally, and at first I tried to dismiss it as a figment of my imagination or some optical illusion, but it felt too real to ignore. Later that same night, I caught the figure peeking into my sister's room. It was a terrifying sight and I couldn't shake off the feeling that something was off. I thought I was the only one who had seen it, but it turned out that a psychic and even my grandma had seen the same thing. They too described the same dark figure with long hair and fingers. It became apparent that it was not a mere hallucination, but something else altogether. We soon learned what we saw was a demon, which made everything even more unsettling. To make matters worse, my uncle saw the same figure. However, his description was slightly different. The figure was shorter but had unnaturally long arms. It was as if the demon had the ability to change its form, making it more difficult to track and deal with. We had many other creepy stories from that attic, but it's too much to recount here. Suffice to say that we experienced a lot of unexplained phenomena that made our stay there difficult and uncomfortable. Thankfully, things have died down and we've moved to a different place. However, the memory of that dark figure still haunts me. Pretty sure my apartment is haunted, and I'm not sure what to do. Since August 21st, my family and I have been living in this apartment. We've been experiencing some unusual occurrences. About a year ago, my oldest son had a screaming fit that woke up the whole house. We assumed it was a nightmare until he told us that he saw a bad man in the kitchen. He described him as wearing a hat and a jacket with a scary face. It is worth noting that the kitchen is directly off of his room which he shares with his younger brother. Within the next week or two, my husband, my teenage bonus child, and I started seeing movements out of the corners of our eyes and unexpected sightings, mostly in the bedroom doorways. These movements were heading either toward or from the bedrooms and moving toward the kitchen. Tonight, while it was still nighttime, my husband and I saw something by our bedroom door both of us were terrified because it looked like a preschool-sized child with blonde hair. It's a pretty spooky thing to experience. We've only had about three months left to live here. Medical emergencies with our youngest child prevented us from moving out sooner. My husband and I both saw the same thing at the same time, which has me really freaked out. I don't know what to do or where to start the research if something like this has ever happened or happened here. We've seen different shadows, for lack of a better word, dozens of times. I used to play it off, but not anymore. I can't do anything without both of us seeing it at the same time. We've also had things move or gone missing out of the blue. It's been a strange few months living here, and I'm not sure what to make of it. I'll be glad when we can move out of this place and into a new one, though. I think I saw a ghost. As a truck driver, my job is to transport equipment for a construction company. The other day, I was on my way to a job site to move a mini excavator. And this site was in the middle of a bunch of fields. There were no houses nearby for at least 500 yards in any direction. 
there was a road that went past the job site and then hung up to a left. Basically, the site was on a corner. As I was coming to the job site, I saw this teenage-ish looking girl who looked like she was straight out of the 1990s walking down the road near the site. I couldn't help but notice her style choice. It was a bit odd. I then flipped my truck around to park and glanced at her again just to take another look. I couldn't believe my eyes when I looked back again. Just five seconds and glancing down, the girl was gone. I was caught off guard and surprised at her sudden disappearance. I started looking around frantically trying to see where she had gone or if someone else had picked her up, but there was nothing, just flat fields in any direction. I couldn't explain what had just happened. There were no cars currently driving by, and there was no way she could have just vanished into thin air. It was midday, and there weren't any creepy or spooky vibes in the air. It was just bizarre, and I couldn't shake the feeling that something strange had just occurred. I couldn't stop thinking about it for the rest of the day, and I asked my colleagues if they had seen anything similar in the area, but nobody had any answers for me. The incident left me questioning what had just happened. Was it a ghost? Was it an illusion? Or was it just my mind playing tricks on me? I may never know for sure what had happened but it was definitely one of the strangest experiences I've had in a while on that job. Weird figure posing as my sister. Back when I was living in Virginia and was around nine or 10 years old, I had an experience that still haunts me to this day. It all started when my friend and I went into my sister's room to bother her, a common occurrence for us at the time. But something was off about the whole situation. As we entered the room, I noticed the person on the bed, whom I assumed was my sister, didn't look anything like her. I couldn't see her face and the long black hair was coming from under the covers, almost like a character from The Ring. Despite the strange appearance, I asked if she was sleeping and the figure shifted into position. I took it as a sign that she wanted to be left alone, so my friend and I headed downstairs to grab a snack. But as we walked into the kitchen, we were shocked to see my actual sister standing there. Confused, we asked her if she had just been upstairs, and she said she was just returning from taking her dog for a walk. She had no idea what we were talking about. Feeling unnerved, we rushed back upstairs to investigate, and we found something that chilled us to the bone. Under the covers, we found the head of a brat's doll, but the doll had brown hair that was way too short to match the long black hair we had seen earlier. Additionally, the figure in the bed was much larger than the doll, so it didn't make any sense. What's even more unsettling is that every time I bring up this incident with my sister, she has no recollection of it at all. It's like it never happened, which only adds to the mystery and fear surrounding the experience. I've been trying to figure out if that was the only time that it happened, and the answer continues to elude me something that I still think about from time to time and sends shivers down my spine. Was it a ghost? I recently took up a ghost sitting job at a huge old mansion and everything seemed fine until last night when something strange happened. Yesterday morning, I woke up at the crack of dawn for a workout class and returned around 6 a.m. to find a light on in the hallway that I had no recollection of leaving on, nor could I figure out how to switch it off. I brushed it off initially and thought maybe I just hit it by mistake. And while we were going upstairs to shower, maybe that was it. But later on in the night, around 11 p.m., as I was getting ready to sleep, things started to get really weird. I'm afraid of spiders and I'm claustrophobic, so I'd been sleeping on the couch instead of the basement like the homeowners requested. I had the bathroom light on, and I couldn't turn off the mysterious light from earlier, so I went to bed with both lights on. However, I woke up in a state of panic around 1.30 a.m. with my heart racing and feeling like someone was watching me. I looked up to see nothing out of the ordinary, so I began to calm down. But then I noticed that all the lights I'd left on we're all off. This realization hit me hard and I leapt up to the couch in a frenzy and turned all the lights back on. After sitting with the lights on for a few minutes, I heard creaking noises coming from upstairs, like
like someone was walking stealthily to avoid making a noise. And that was it for me. I was out of there in a flash, and I ended up going back to my own house to sleep. Honestly, I don't know what happened with the lights or what those creaking sounds were upstairs. The whole thing was terrifying, and I have no explanation for what happened. It was the day of my speech presentation. As a quadriplegic, I've had a brush with death a few times since my accident. But I'm still here, and I'm grateful for every day that I have. Recently, I gave a speech about my experience to my classmates. It was a difficult and emotional topic, but I felt it was important to share my story. After I finished, it was my classmate's turn to speak. He began talking about a friend of his who had died by suicide. It was a heavy topic, and I could feel the weight of the room. But then something strange happened. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a white figure standing next to him. At first, I wasn't sure what I was seeing. Was it just a trick of the light? But as I looked closer, I could see it more clearly. The figure was translucent, almost like a ghost. It was standing right next to my classmate, and I could see the outline of its shape. I couldn't make out any features, but I could tell that it was a person. And then, in an instant, it vanished. I was stunned. Did I really just see that? I looked around the room to see if anyone else had noticed but no one seemed to see anything. I couldn't shake the feeling that something strange had just happened. But then, my classmate looked right at me. It was almost as if he had seen the figure, too. We didn't say anything to each other, but I could tell that he knew something had happened. To this day, I still wonder what that figure was. Was it a ghost, a hallucination, or was it something else entirely? I like to think that it was my classmate's friend, reaching out to him far beyond the grave, Maybe he was just trying to tell him that everything was going to be okay. Whatever it was, though, it's a moment I'll never forget. The walls in my room had a heartbeat. Last night, something really strange happened to me while I was in my room. It was around 10 p.m. and I was just lying in bed scrolling through some silly videos on my phone. I had my back propped up against my pillows and my head rested against the wall. Suddenly I started hearing this weird noise, like someone was tapping their finger against a table. It was so loud and distracting that I couldn't ignore it. At first I thought I might have just had some random noise that would eventually stop. But it didn't. In fact, it got louder and louder till it was right next to my head. The sound began to increase in speed, and it sounded like a racing heartbeat. It was freaking me out because I couldn't figure out where it was coming from. I even put my hand against the wall to see if I could feel anything. To my surprise, I couldn't hear the blood flowing through its veins, and the wallpaper was pulsing. I knew it wasn't my own heartbeat, as the sound's different and it's usually heard inside the skull. This was coming from outside of me. The sound continued to grow louder and I couldn't concentrate on anything else, so I turned off the fan in my room, thinking that it might be the culprit. The heartbeat stopped for a second and then continued, but it was fainter this time. Gradually it faded away entirely. I still have no idea what caused that bizarre experience. It didn't feel like some kind of spirit or ghost was tricking me. That seems like a random thing for a spirit to do, and it doesn't make much sense. However, I have this feeling that my room has its own consciousness and that it may have have to manifest itself physically. Can't explain it, but somehow, something about this experience made me feel like it was the room itself that was responsible for what happened. I have a story for you fellows. About six or eight years ago, I moved into my current house. It's an older home that was probably built sometime between 1950 and 1970. However, about two or three years ago, something strange started happening. I began to feel uneasy vibes in both of my rooms and the basement. I decided to do some research on the internet to see if I could find any information about my property. It turns out that someone may have died while the building was being made, though I'm not sure if that's related to what's happening. One day while walking near my family member's room, I saw something that I'll never forget. 
there is a tall man about six feet standing in the doorway. He was wearing a top hat and clothing that looked like he was from the early 1800s or early 1900s. I couldn't believe what I was seeing, but it was clear as day. A few days later, I saw the same man in the same spot, but this time he was with a little child who looked to be about five or eight years old and male. They both walked down the hallway and disappeared from sight. I started to feel scared and didn't know what to do. Then for the third time, I saw the tall man again, but this time he was alone and walked down the hallway. I couldn't shake the feeling that there was something strange going on in my house. I thought about going to a medium and getting them to investigate, but my family didn't believe in that kind of thing. However, a friend of ours suggested that I might be able to see and feel spirits better than others, and that maybe I could explore that further. I was intrigued by the idea and started researching more about it. Despite my fear, I felt a strange pull toward understanding what was happening in my house and how I might be able to connect with the spirits that seemed to be present there. I keep hearing breathing at night. Hi, my name is Alan, and I live in the city of the Philippines, where power outages are quite common. The darkness is not something that particularly bothers me, but lately I've been having some eerie experiences while bathing in the dark. Whenever I try to take a shower with just a single light on, I hear some breathing noises coming from the corner of the room. It's a strange sound that I can't quite place, and it makes me feel uneasy. I've tried ignoring it and chalking it up to my imagination, but it won't go away. One day I finally mustered up the courage to tell my mother about the strange noises I've been hearing while bathing. She tried to reassure me and told me that it was just probably a dove that I was hearing. I was skeptical of her explanation because I've heard doves before, and their cooing sounds nothing like what I've been hearing. To add to my paranoia, our house is situated next to an unfinished reconstruction, and it's very close to our home. It blocks the window and it makes it difficult to see what's going on outside. I often wonder what kind of spirits or creatures may be lurking in the shadows of that reconstruction. There's also a roof, and it's a little far from the walls. I've heard that people have been seeing strange things on top of it in the past. All of these factors combined makes me believe that what I'm experiencing is paranormal. I'm not one to easily believe in ghosts or other supernatural entities, but the strange sound and eerie atmosphere of my surroundings made it hard to deny that something strange was probably going on. And I keep hoping that one day I'll be able to bathe in peace without feeling like I'm being watched or listened to. Unexplained eerie stuff happening. I've always been interested in the paranormal, but since last year, I haven't been engaged with it as I used to be. However, during this period, some weird stuff has happened that I can't explain. One day while I was lying on my bed wide awake, I felt like someone sat on the edge of my bed. I know very well that my mind did not make it up because it felt too real. I jumped up to check and nothing was there. Then a few weeks later, the same thing happened again and this time I was awake. I turned to the other side of my bed and I swear I heard someone sigh loudly near my ear. Once again, I was alone in the room. These incidents were enough to give me chills. After these experiences, I began waking up in the middle of the night for no apparent reason, and at times I would see scratches and bruises on my body the next morning. I couldn't explain how they got there, and this happened last week too. I woke up with a large brown mark on my ribs, and I have no idea how it got there. I've been trying to make sense of all of these incidents, but I can't find any logical explanation. I've been wondering if anyone else has had similar experiences, or if it's just an explanation as to what might be going on simply. I've researched the internet and read numerous articles, but none of them have been helpful. The more I try to make sense of it, the more confused and scared I became. I've even considered seeking help from a paranormal investigator, but I'm not sure if it's the right thing to do. These incidents have left me feeling anxious and paranoid, and I can't shake off the feeling that something's not right. I'm hoping that by sharing my experience, someone might have some sort of answer to be able to shed some light on what's happening to me. A 
a very odd supernatural maybe story. When I was a kid, my family lived in a house on Mount Lake Terrace, Washington, and I'll never forget it. It was a nice two-story house that wasn't outdated at the time, but something about the basement always made me feel uneasy. It was always so cold down there, and I always felt like I was being watched. But that wasn't the weirdest thing that happened in that house. There were three instances that really stood out to me, and they all happened when I was sleeping. The first time, I was on an air mattress in my soon-to-be newborn sister's room. I don't remember what I was dreaming about, but I do remember waking up very calmly for no reason. I looked up at the ceiling and saw a little Superman-like figure flying above me in circles. It was bright blue and red, just like Superman, and I watched it for a moment until it suddenly did a flip and flew straight at my face. Then it transformed into a huge demon figure with sharp teeth that looked like it was about to swallow me whole. The other two stories were similar. I dreamt about bees and then woke up to being swarmed by bees. And I dreamt about spiders only to wake up covered head to toe in spiders. These instances were spread maybe over a two and a half year period when I lived in that house. I've tried to rationalize these experiences by considering sleep paralysis, but I've never had anything like that happen before or after that house. It makes me question whether it was just my imagination or there was something more to it. But regardless of what it was, it never stopped me from being able to move or jump out of bed whenever I wanted. Breathing of Terror It was a typical day at the school where I work. I'd finished teaching my class and the students had left for the day. I was packing up my things, ready to leave, when I heard a strange noise coming from the storage room. It was a slow, wheezing sound that I couldn't quite place. At first, I thought it might be one of my colleagues, but I soon realized that no one else was around. It was just me and that eerie noise. That sound was coming from the opposite end of the staff area, where the storage room was located. I tried to ignore it, thinking it was just my imagination playing tricks on me, but the wheezing continued, growing louder and more persistent. It was as if something was grasping for air or struggling to breathe. It was an unnerving sound that I couldn't shake off. I decided to investigate and walked over to the storage room. As I approached the door, the wheezing grew louder and more intense. I hesitated for a moment before mustering up the courage to open the door. But just as I was about to turn the handle, a chill ran down my spine. I felt an overwhelming sense of fear and dread that I couldn't explain, and it was as if something was warning me not to open that door. I backed away slowly, feeling a sense of relief wash over me as the wheezing sound faded into the background. I tried to convince myself that it was just my imagination, but deep down, I knew that something strange was happening in that storage room. I wish I had recorded the sound so I could show others what I heard, but at the same time, I'm just glad that it didn't open the door. I didn't want to find out what was making that noise or what other unexplained things might be lurking in that school. From that day on, I always made sure to leave the storage room well alone. I know I'm not the only one who sees things, right? As I'm sitting in the kitchen doing some work, I notice something peek around the corner. At first, I thought it was my brother trying to scare me. So I shouted at him to stop peeking, but there was no response, and I realized that I was home alone in the house. I felt a shiver run down my spine as I tried to wrap my head around what just happened. A few days later, I was once again in the kitchen when I saw it happen. This time I could see its hands, arms, head, and torso. I couldn't make out its face, but I had a feeling it wasn't human. Again, I thought it was my brother playing a prank on me, but he was in the bathroom this time. I felt a sense of unease and discomfort in the pit of my stomach as I wondered what it could be. These occurrences happened only twice, but it left a deep impression on me. I couldn't shake off the feeling of being watched when I was alone in the dark, but that's not all. I would hear strange noises, too. There was this one time when I heard someone calling my name while I was home alone. It happened a couple of times, and it always left me feeling weird. 
I even asked my parents if they called me, but they said they didn't. One night when my parents were in their room, I heard my mother calling me loudly. I rushed to their room thinking that something was wrong, only to find out that my mother never even called me. It was strange and I couldn't explain it. All these experiences made me feel like something was off about her house. I started avoiding being alone in the dark and would always turn on the lights. I couldn't shake off the feeling that I was being watched. and I didn't want to find out what it was. Vision I had on an ICU hospital stay. In 2020, I had a life-threatening experience when I got shot in the chest. The bullet wound was severe enough to require hospitalization, and I ended up spending almost a month at the LA General Hospital. It was during my time at the hospital that I started experiencing a lot of paranormal activity that left me questioning my sanity. One of the most vivid experiences I had was a vision that will stay with me forever. It was the first person point of view vision, meaning I felt as though I was reliving the incident as if it were happening to me. The setting of the vision was LA, and from the way people were dressed, it seemed to be the 90s. I was with a friend and we were cruising down the Pacific Avenue in Huntington Park. It was getting late and we turned onto the street where some gang members were blocking the road. As soon as they saw us, they started shooting into the car. In the vision, I was hit in the top of my head. And I felt the impact of the bullet shatter my skull. It was a painful experience and I started crying and telling the driver to take me to the hospital. However, I died before we could make it there. The entire vision felt so real as if it was happening to me and I lived through it all. It was all incredibly eerie and it left me wondering if anyone else had ever experienced anything similar. While I was in the hospital, I also felt as though I had roommates, even though there was nobody else in the room with me. The paranormal activity I experienced during my hospital stay was unlike anything I'd ever encountered before, and it still leaves me feeling unsettled. Weird Call from My Dead Mother when my mother passed away from cancer nine months ago, my world felt like it had shattered. After her death, I moved into my uncle's house, hoping for some sense of stability and comfort. However, the pain of losing her is still fresh, and I struggled to come to terms with the fact that she was gone. Two months later, on September 22nd, it was my name day, a Latvian tradition. I remember waking up to the sound of my phone ringing, and I answered it. And to my surprise, I heard my mother's voice on the other end. She was asking me how I was doing and if everything was okay. I was stunned and confused, but happy to hear her voice. After talking to her for a few minutes, I got up to get ready for school. And as I was getting dressed, I heard a knock on my door. My uncle's girlfriend walked in and said, Wake up, it's time for school. And I didn't think much of it and walked out. It wasn't until later that day that I realized something strange had happened. I looked at my phone to see if my mother's call had been logged in my call history, but it wasn't there. It was as if the call had never happened. I asked my uncle's girlfriend if she had heard me talking on the phone before she walked into my room, and she said no. I don't know how to make sense of this experience. It's possible that I was still grieving, and in my mind, it was just playing tricks on me. But part of me wonders if it was something more. Did my mother reach out from beyond the grave? Was it a sign that she's still with me? I may never know for sure, but the memory of that strange phone call still lingers in my mind. I can't help but feel a sense of comfort or hope whenever I think about it. Anyone have a similar experience? I've always been aware of the paranormal and I've had several inexplicable encounters in my life. But I don't go out of my way to find such experiences, mind you. And sometimes they just happen to me, and it can be pretty unsettling. A few weeks ago, I was working on a project in my living room. I was sitting at my kitchen counter, which has good view of the entire room, and the front door was broad daylight, and everything seemed perfectly normal until I heard the doorbell ring, followed by three knocks. 
I glanced up, expecting to see someone standing outside the rippled glass door. But, to my surprise, there was no shadow or silhouette, which was odd because I could usually see someone if they were on either side of the door. I checked outside the window, but there was no one in sight. I walked outside to investigate if someone was walking up or down the street, but there was no one. After the incident, I tried to rationalize what had happened. Maybe it was just a salesperson who rang the doorbell and knocked before quickly leaving in a car. But the whole incident happened so fast that I still felt skeptical. A few days later, my grandfather passed away, and I couldn't help but wonder if his spirit had come to visit me before moving on. It was a haunting thought, and I couldn't shake it off. Another possibility that came to my mind was that the doorbell could have been malfunctioning, but it didn't explain the knocks that I heard. Ever since that day, I've been more attentive to the paranormal around me, and I feel that there's more to this world than we can see or explain. I may not seek out the paranormal, but it seems to find me nonetheless. Ghost Friend I've been living with the ghost of a little boy in my room for as long as I can remember. He's not a troublemaker, in fact, he's quite harmless. When I first saw him, I was around six or seven years old, and he was sitting on my desk just staring blankly at the floor and his feet. I remember being terrified and telling my mom about it, but she didn't believe me and thought I was just trying to get attention. Over time, I started to get used to his presence. He would just sit there, not bothering me in any way, and I would just leave him alone. I tried to talk to him a few times, but he never spoke. He would just stare down and not respond to my questions. I even tried taking pictures of him, but whenever I checked the photo, he was never there. I tried hundreds of times, even being discreet, but he just didn't show up in any of them. Now I'm 18 years old, and he's still in the same spot doing the same thing. I've gotten used to him, and I even welcomed him into my room. I've been calling him Little Dude all this time, but I'd love to give him a real name. If I had to estimate his age, he's probably around four or five years old. Despite his presence, I've never felt threatened by him. In fact, I've come to enjoy having him around. He's like a companion who's always there, watching over me. And sometimes when I'm feeling down or alone, I'll talk to him, even though he never responds. It's comforting to have someone to talk to, even if they're a ghost. I've always wondered who he is and what happened to him. Did he die in this room? Did he have a family? I may never know, but I've come to accept him as a part of my life. He's not just a ghost, he's a friend, and I hope he stays with me for a long time. My friend and I heard something last night, and I can't stop thinking about it. Last month, me and a couple of my friends went to explore these old army forts. I've been to this place a lot of times before, but this time was different. We were the only ones there, and as we were exploring one of the bunkers, suddenly we heard a metallic scraping sound coming from one of the openings. We got freaked out and ran out of there as fast as we could. We were relieved that we got away with no incident, but we were unable to explain what we had heard. Yesterday, my friend and I decided to go back to the forts once again, and it was dark and nobody else was there. We went there to smoke, and as we were talking, we started to hear a cowbell ringing frantically. I froze and my friend looked off into the distance. I suddenly jumped back into the car. I started freaking out and we drove away as soon as possible. After we had calmed down, we decided to pull over and discuss what had happened. My friend said that when he initially heard the noise thought it was nothing, but he looked into the darkness and he saw something shaking really fast, but he couldn't make it out, maybe just a silhouette. He decided to drive back and investigate, and we ended up hearing a noise four more times in different spots. It was like the sound was moving around. I don't know if what we experienced was paranormal or not, but it definitely creeped us out. We couldn't explain the metallic scraping sound from the last time, and now this cowbell ringing out of nowhere. It's just too weird. Maybe it's just our imagination, but we couldn't shake off the feeling that we were being watched. All I know is that I'm not going back there anytime soon.
jewelry box with the music box inside started playing at 3 a.m. It was a late night at my parents' house and my boyfriend and I were in the kitchen making some food. We just started talking when suddenly I heard a faint song coming from either upstairs or the front of the house. My boyfriend heard it too, but we didn't know where it was coming from. At first, I thought it might be from the phone, but as I listened to it more closely, I realized it was coming from a jewelry box that had always been in my room since I was a child. Curiosity got the better of me and I decided to text my sister to ask if she had heard anything. I also heard a door close upstairs and I wanted to make sure that she wasn't up and about. She replied that she had been in bed for a while and hadn't heard anything herself. I tried to brush it off and assume that maybe my cats had been playing with the jewelry box. However, that wasn't a convincing explanation. As the winding mechanism was difficult to operate and the box was situated against the wall, to be sure, I texted my mom to see if she had started playing with the box. You see, sometimes she would sleep in my room when my dad snored too loudly, but the reply I received the next morning surprised me. My mom said that she was in my room, but it wasn't her who started playing the music. She had been woken up by it and thought it was her phone ringing. Furthermore, my cats hadn't been in the room, which made it even more spooky. It was a strange occurrence and my sister thought it might have been maybe my mom playing a prank on us. But my boyfriend, dad, and I didn't think it was a prank. After all, my mom wasn't much of a prankster, and she would always stop if someone got scared. The mystery remains unsolved and it was definitely a spooky night for us. Three knockings on my bed. Last night, I had an experience that left me feeling uneasy and unsure of what to make of it. As I lay in bed watching YouTube with the door closed and the lights off, I suddenly heard three distinct knocks on the edge of my bed. I froze, unsure of what to do, but before I could even process what had happened, the knocking started again, another three knocks. My heart was racing as I tried to make sense of what was going on. I searched online for any possible explanation or meaning behind this strange occurrence, but I couldn't find anything that provided a satisfactory answer. As I lay there in the dark, I mustered up the courage to call out to my sister who was passing by my room. I asked her to come in and turn on the lights, hoping to see if there was anything there that I couldn't explain. Or perhaps that would explain the knocking. But when she came in, there was nothing out of the ordinary. My pets were outside of my room and there was no sign of an animal that could have made such a weird knocking sound. I felt more confused and scared than I was before. I tried to brush it off and go back to watching my videos, but my mind kept replaying the sound of the knocking. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off, and I spent the rest of the night tossing and turning, trying to make sense of what had just happened. Now the next day, I still feel unsettled and unsure of what to make of it all. I'm left wondering if it was just my imagination playing tricks on me, or if there was something more to it. I wish I had some advice or explanation of what happened, but for now I'm just going to keep an open mind and I'll stay vigilant. Strange dim light down my hallway. I'm still in a state of shock after what happened just a few minutes ago. It was around midnight, and I had just left the bathroom when I heard a strange thud coming from my living room. My first instinct was to turn my head and see what it was, And that's when I saw it. A floating dim light moving slowly down the hallway toward my kitchen before disappearing. To say that I was freaked out would be an understatement. I couldn't believe what I had just seen, and I didn't know how to react. This wasn't the first time something like this had happened to me. It was starting to become a pattern. Every time it happened, I was left feeling confused and scared, wondering if there was something wrong with me or if there was some other explanation. I've been searching for answers ever since, trying to find some kind of explanation for what I saw. Was it a ghost, a spirit, or was it just my imagination? I'm not sure, but I just can't ignore what I saw. The fact that this has happened before only adds to my fear. I don't understand why it keeps happening and what it could mean. Is there something in my house that I'm not aware of? Or am I being haunted by something from my past? I've tried talking to my friends and family, but they all just brush it off. 
they don't understand how scared I am or how real it all feels to me. Right now, I'm still trying to process everything and come to terms with what I saw. It's not something that I can just forget about and ignore. I need answers, and I hope that one day I'll be able to find them. But for now, I'm just left with my fear and confusion, wondering what could be lurking in the darkness of my own home. Woman with changing face. When I was 21 years old, I had a summer job at a hotel in Greece where I met a woman who was 32 years old and quite different from others. Although she wasn't beautiful or anything, I felt magnetized by her, not in a sexual way, but in a peculiar way. We started hanging out and I told her that I believed in the paranormal, which piqued her interest. As a result, we spent a lot of time together when we weren't working. However, she clearly wanted something more than friendship, which I didn't reciprocate. One night we were drinking wine with two other people in my room, and all of a sudden she began to stare at me in a strange and mysterious manner. I couldn't take my eyes off her, and I felt completely paralyzed and terrified, my heart racing. The next thing I knew, her face began to melt and take on a demonic form that frightened me even more, and I was unable to move. After a great effort of will... I managed to break eye contact with her, but the others had not noticed anything unusual. Later that night, I confronted her and asked her what she had done to me because I was convinced that she had done something evil. She revealed that she had tried to open up my chakras or something similar, and then she left. That night I didn't sleep at all, but I was having a strange feeling that I didn't feel tired the next day. On the contrary, I was full of energy and extremely optimistic and I noticed shining silver spots in the sky, which was quite unusual. After about a month, I left that job, and we never saw each other again. But I still wonder what happened that night, and I seek an explanation for this strange experience. Shadow Man and His Buddies When I was 16 years old, I experienced something that still haunts me to this day. It was a stormy night, and my little brother and I were alone at home. The thunderstorm was insane, and the sky had turned an eerie green color, which I assumed was natural for such storms. However, it had a weird sense of horror or dread that wouldn't go away with it. That's when I felt compelled to look out of one of our living room windows which revealed three cloaked shadow figures floating down my sidewalk and eventually up my driveway. They were all wearing trench coats and fedora hats, and the one in the back was shorter than the other two. I couldn't see their feet, but the sight of them filled me with panic and I immediately locked myself in my bathroom. That night I developed sleep paralysis, which continued for years. Every time I had an episode, I would see the man in the fedora hat with the red eyes staring at me from the foot of my bed. He never spoke, but his presence was enough to scare me. It wasn't until last summer, when I was 29 years old, that I talked to my mom and brother about the incident. That's when my brother brought up the same night, saying that he remembered the sky turning green and the storm stopping abruptly, making everything still and weird. It was a relief to know that I wasn't the only one who experienced it. I've always wondered if anyone else had dealt with something similar. Was it just my imagination, or was it something real? It's strange to think that all these years... I was going insane, but now I have someone who remembers the same incident, something that's left me with more questions than answers. My childhood home was haunted. When I was growing up, my sister and her friend were really into playing with Ouija boards. They were around 11 or 12 years old at the time, and would often play in our bathroom. What's strange is, is that they didn't even have a real board. They had drawn one on a sheet of paper. But despite this, the board seemed to work, according to what I heard with them. My mom had told me that the two young boys and an older lady had died in our home, which was pretty old. I don't know if it's true, but if it is, then maybe our home is more sensitive to this kind of game. I decided to join my sister and her friend once, but I immediately got bad vibes and said screw it, and I wasn't down for it again. However, they continued to play. 
My sister had mentioned that they were trying to contact her friend's uncle who had recently passed away. I don't remember the answers they got, but I do remember them saying that the glass started moving. They were really excited about this and continued to play, even though they didn't know what they were doing. But the scariest thing that happened during one of their Ouija board sessions in her old apartment bathroom was when they had lit some candles, those small round ones, maybe around eight of them, and all of them blew out at the same time. My sister said that they panicked and quickly said goodbye, and they never played with the board again. However, I always felt like they had invited something into our home. Years later, for no reason at all, I woke up one night and saw a face in my bedroom, down in the basement. I can't say for sure if it was related to the Ouija games, but it definitely left me feeling uneasy. My Grandpa I'd like to share a personal story that I hope will bring a smile to somebody's face. Growing up, I never knew my dad. It was just me, my mom, and my grandparents. My papa was like a father figure to me, and I was really close to him. Little did I know that he was battling cancer, and he never told us until he had only about a month left to live. I didn't see the signs, and he hid it so well that it was just too late by the time that we found out. I was only eight years old at the time, and things were really tough. I became paranoid, and I started sleeping with hammers and screwdrivers underneath my pillow thinking that it was my responsibility to protect everyone. I felt like I had to be the man of the house and take care of everything. About two weeks after my papa's funeral, something incredible happened. He spoke to me. I know it sounds crazy, but I swear it's true. I woke up at around two in the morning and said that everything would be okay. He promised that he wouldn't let anything happen to us and that he would always be watching over us. That night, I finally felt peace at night. It was like a weight had been lifted off of my shoulders. I knew that everything would be okay. Even though my papa wasn't physically with us anymore, I knew that he was still watching over us and protecting us from harm. As I got older, I realized that my papa had given me a precious gift that night. He had given me the gift of faith and hope, and I knew that I could always count on him to be there for me, even when he wasn't physically present. To this day, I still feel his presence in my life, and I know that he's always looking out for me. How about you guys? Something was running behind my car. As I drove home last night going around 55 miles an hour, I suddenly noticed something human-shaped running behind my car. There were no other vehicles on the road, and it was a rural area. I usually check my rearview mirror this late at night because deer are known to dart out of nowhere. But this time, I was looking at something that was not a deer. It was a strange, unknown entity that was following me for nearly five minutes. I kept glancing back at it, trying to figure out what it was. I couldn't get a clear look at it, but it was definitely humanoid in shape. Living in the Midwestern Great Lake area, I was familiar with stories of creepy urban legends and such but I'd never experienced anything like this before in my life. I could feel my heart beating faster as I tried to come up with a rational explanation for what I was seeing, but there was none. As I approached a street light, I looked back once more, and to my surprise, the figure vanished into thin air. It was as if it had never been there in the first place. I felt a wave of relief wash over me, but at the same time I couldn't shake off the feeling of unease. I couldn't wait to get home and share this bizarre experience with anybody. I immediately called up my best friend and recounted the entire incident in vivid detail. She was equally freaked out, and we spent the next hour scouring the internet for any explanation or similar account. To this day, I have no idea what I saw that night. It could have been my mind playing tricks on me or something supernatural. But one thing's for sure. That experience left a lasting impression on me, and I don't think I'll ever forget it. I feel like ghosts are following me in Japan. As a child, I've always been aware of the presence of ghosts around me, but my recent experiences in Japan have left me feeling creeped out. It's been about 10 days since my friend and I started our travels, and I've encountered ghosts on multiple occasions during our trip. 
However, the events of last night truly shook me to the core. As I was trying to fall asleep, the air conditioning unit in our hotel room began to make strange noises. Despite the loud sounds, my mom, who was sleeping next to me, didn't stir or react in any way. I was terrified and struggled to drift off to sleep. The next morning we boarded a train and I attempted to sleep during that journey, but something strange happened. I felt as though someone was blocking my breath. I couldn't wake up from my slumber. To make matters worse, my mom told me that she saw me untie my hair while I slept. But I always tie my hair before going to bed. Additionally, my brother informed me that I had been making strange noises in my sleep, which was not typical of me, as I usually sleep soundly beside my mom during our travels. I can't help but think that there's something following me, and these occurrences are too coincidental to ignore. Perhaps there's a ghost or a malevolent spirit that's attached itself to me during my travels. The thought of being followed by a ghost or spirit is unnerving, and I'm not sure how to shake off this feeling of unease. Have any of you experienced something similar while traveling? I'd love to hear your thoughts or advice on how to deal with this situation. The odd experience yesterday when I was sleeping and being woken up. Yesterday, my husband kindly offered to take care of our baby for the morning so I could get some extra sleep. Little did I know that my dream was about to be invaded by a haunting presence. In my dream, I was being followed by a ghost or a spirit. Despite my fear, I kept telling the entity that I wasn't afraid of it. And walking away, I must have been a terrible liar because I was actually terrified. And at one point in my dream, the spirit blew into the other side of my neck, causing all the hairs on the back of my neck to stand up. Then it started violently shaking my shoulder. Suddenly I was awakened from my dream to find that my shoulder was actually being shaken in real life. I tried to ignore it and go back to sleep, but it happened again this time, without the presence of the ghostly dream. I was completely confused and I didn't know what to think. Had my dream simply continued into reality? Was there something more sinister here? I was freaked out to say the least. Naturally, I checked on my family and baby to make sure that they were okay, and they were sound asleep, completely oblivious to the supernatural experience I had just endured. I couldn't help but wonder, had anyone else ever experienced something like this? The fear and confusion that lingered within me left me feeling uneasy. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off, but for now, I'll just have to leave it as a mysterious and unexplained occurrence, and hope that it doesn't happen again. A backflip bottle. As a teacher at a school, I had just finished the last class of the day, and I was in the process of packing everything before I could leave. As part of our safety protocol, we make sure to sanitize everything in the classroom with alcohol to keep the germs at bay. I took out my alcohol bottle and spritzed down the kids' tables with it, making sure to get every surface. I then placed the bottle back on the counter by the wall, specifically in the middle of the counter, not on the edge or the side. I turned away from the bottle to continue packing up, but then I heard a loud thud. I quickly turned back around, wondering what caused the noise. To my surprise, the alcohol bottle had somehow jumped off the counter and was now lying on the floor. I was completely gobsmacked. There was no way that bottle could have done that on its own. As I tried to wrap my head around what had just happened, I attempted to debunk the event, thinking it might have been a coincidence or something else. But no matter how many times I tried, I couldn't recreate the fallen bottle. It just didn't make sense that a bottle was lying in the middle of a counter, suddenly doing a backflip and ending up on the floor. To make matters even more bizarre, this wasn't the first strange occurrence that had happened at the school, and there were other unexplainable events that had taken place. This was the only one that I could find any logical explanation for or rather couldn't find any logical explanation for. It left me feeling unsettled and curious about what else could be happening in this school. A 
I saw a demon dragging a big cage. Let me tell you about a terrifying experience that happened to me two years ago when I was still living with my parents. I woke up in the middle of the night not knowing what time it was, and as soon as I opened my eyes, I saw a tall figure standing beside my bed. It was so close to me that I could feel its breath on my face. I could see that its body and head were extremely black, making it impossible for me to see its face. However, I could tell that it was wearing a long black coat. What made this experience even more chilling was that the figure was dragging a big cage behind it. The cage was so big that it was touching the ground, and the strangest thing was that it was empty. I was sharing the bedroom with my two siblings, but they were both sound asleep. I couldn't wake them up no matter how hard I tried. The demon simply walked away and disappeared into thin air, and in that moment, I just knew that it was a demon, although I can't explain why I had that intuition. Perhaps it was the aura of darkness and evil that surrounded the figure, but whatever it was, it left me paralyzed with fear, and I couldn't move or speak until it was completely gone. After that night, I couldn't sleep well for a long time. The image of the demon in the empty cage haunted me for days, and I was scared to close my eyes at night. Even though I knew that I'd been through a bad dream, the fear and unease that I felt were very real, and to this day I still can't explain what happened, and I pray that I never experience anything like that ever again. I'm hearing weird noises. Living in a flat can have its own set of strange experiences, and I've had a fair share of them. For the past six or seven months, I've been hearing some bizarre sounds around 2 or 3 a.m. It's as if someone is moving furniture around in the municipal office, situated just below my apartment. Initially, I brushed it off as normal office work, but the sounds were happening too frequently to be ignored. As it turns out, I'm not the only one who's experiencing this. My neighbors who live in the flat straight opposite to ours have also heard the same sounds. They even mentioned seeing strange faces when they wake up after falling asleep on the sofa. It's a strange coincidence and it's left us all feeling quite disturbed. The strange occurrences did not stop there. One night at precisely 2 a.m., an alarm in the municipal office began beeping for no apparent reason. I immediately got out of bed and peered out of my window to see if there was any movement. The alarm continued for a while until the office personnel arrived and disabled it. According to them, they had left the window open by mistake. I couldn't help but feel that there was more to this than meets the eye. All of these occurrences have left me feeling uneasy, and I can't shake off the feeling that something odd is happening in the municipal office. I'm not sure if it's just my imagination, but I have been keeping a close eye on things, just in case. And for now, nothing out of the ordinary has happened in my flat, but I remain vigilant. Who knows what other strange things might happen in the future? Waking up cursing and swearing, and I never do this awake. I remember the night vividly. It was a few years ago, but I still get chills thinking about it. I had been sleeping peacefully, but then I suddenly woke up and started saying terrible things. It was like something had taken over my body. I couldn't control what was coming out of my mouth. It was terrifying, and I felt completely helpless, like I was in hell. When I started to calm down... I realized that my dad had opened the door and was asking me why I was yelling. I tried to explain to him what had happened, but he interrupted me and said, I thought you were a son of Christ. Then he just left, leaving me feeling confused and scared. It took me a few moments to realize that I don't live with my dad anymore. I had been living alone at the time, so I started to think that maybe it was just a dream. But then I looked at my door and it was open. That's when I knew that something was really wrong. I've never been a religious or spiritual person, but after that experience, I couldn't help but wonder if some kind of bad spirit or demon had tried to use me. It was the only explanation that made sense to me. And then there were other strange things happening around that time. I remember a crow flying around my house. Someone had even left a head of a pig outside my door. It was so bizarre. 
I don't know why some people believe in these kinds of things, but I can tell you from my personal experience that they're real. And that night, I felt like I had to come face to face with something that I never thought existed. Is my dog's spirit visiting me, or is it something else? I have a personal story to share about my experience with my 17-year-old dog passing away about five months ago, and my recent adoption of a cat. Losing my beloved pet Rex was heartbreaking and left me feeling a deep sense of grief. However, with the passing of time, I found myself feeling better every day. My new feline companion had brought a lot of joy into my life, but she has a habit of successfully opening my door at night, which can be a bit frustrating when she jumps on my bed and wakes me up. So I make sure to close the door tightly before I go to sleep to avoid any disturbances. But last night, I woke up at 3 a.m. with the sensation that my cat was standing with her front legs on my bed. I felt the indentation beside my legs, but then it disappeared. Feeling a bit irritated and tired, I tried to go back to sleep. About 10 minutes later, I woke up again, thinking that I needed to close the door before my cat woke me up once more. But, to my surprise, the door had been closed the entire time. As someone who believes in the afterlife and spirits, I was taken back by this experience. I've never had anything like this happen to me before. When it happened, I didn't feel scared or anything, just kind of annoyed. I'm aware that some people believe that 3 a.m. is the witching hour, or that it may be a time when spirits are most active, so I can't help but feel a bit concerned that there might be something else in my bedroom at night that I don't want. Hand pulled me up from the water. When I was in high school, I went on a field trip to the Philippines that included a visit to a lake where we were all allowed to swim. It was an exciting prospect and four of us climbed into a makeshift boat that resembled a pallet. I jumped into the water and as I was swimming around, I suddenly felt a hand grab me and pull me up. I surfaced quickly and immediately asked my friends who had pulled me up, but they just laughed at me. They told me that it would have been impossible for them to pull me up since I had just jumped far enough away from them not to be able to reach me. And I had been pulled up while I was underwater. The experience was a bit unnerving, and although it's been 15 years since it happened, I'm not forgetting it. I remember feeling disoriented and confused after being pulled up like that. I tried to shake it off or go on the rest of the field trip, but the incident kept replaying in my mind. I kept wondering if there was something in the water, some unseen force that had grabbed me. I asked my friends if they had felt or seen anything strange, but they just dismissed it. Over the years, I've tried to rationalize what happened to me that day. Was it really just my imagination, or was there something more to it? I've read stories of supernatural encounters in bodies of water, of spirits lurking beneath the surface. I can't say for sure what it was that pulled me up. But the memory of that day has stayed with me all these years. Exorcism As a 23-year-old male, I've had the unfortunate experience of witnessing not just one, but three exorcisms. It's not something I like to talk about often, as it brings back memories that still haunt me. The fact that these exorcisms were performed on my family members only adds to the complexity of my emotions surrounding the subject. I remember the feeling of dread that would come to basically every time I knew these exorcisms were going to take place. The air would feel heavy and there was a palpable sense of fear and tension in the room. I won't go into too much detail about what happened during these exorcisms, as I don't want to trigger anyone who may be reading this, but suffice to say that it was terrifying. The voices that would come out of my family members during these exorcisms still haunt me to this day. It's hard to explain the feeling of hearing voices that's not your loved ones coming out of their mouth. It's like they're possessed by something else entirely, something that is not of this world. 
I know that there are skeptics out there who don't believe in the reality of an exorcism, and I respect their right to hold that opinion, but for me, having witnessed these events with my own eyes, there's no denying the existence of something beyond our understanding. I would love to hear from others who have had similar experiences with exorcism specifically. It's not something I feel comfortable discussing with most people, as it's such a sensitive and personal topic. But knowing that there are others out there who may have gone through similar experiences could be a comfort to me. Ghost Kitty Living in my over 100 year old house, I can't help but notice the presence of a ghost kitty. I've named her She because I think I know who she is. I often feel her rubbing against my ankles, and I see her out of the corner of my eye, but my living cats are nowhere near me. She's even come in to sleep on my bed, and I can feel a small weight on my bed and little feet padding coming across the comforter to cuddle next to me, but when I try to pet her, there's no one there. I became curious about who this ghost kitty was and who it could be, and I decided to ask my elderly neighbor, who was one of the few remaining people who knew of the previous owners and the house and all that stuff. He told me that the woman who originally lived there was a cat lover and had a gray and white tuxedo kitty named Sheba. Sheba was very old when her owner passed away, and my neighbor took care of her while things were being sorted out. Unfortunately, Sheba passed away within a week of her owner passing. It seems that Sheena had never left this house, and I believe that she had become a ghost kitty that roams around the house. Interestingly, I also feel the presence of the original owner in the kitchen, specifically. However, Sheba is the only one that roams around the house like a typical feline. Although I've gotten used to her presence, it can still be startling when I hear her around me, and I do find it comforting that Sheba and her owner are still around for some way, keeping an eye on the house that they love so much. Grandpa's House Let me tell you about the spooky experience I had while I was at my grandpa's house with my cousins. We decided to go to the basement using GarageBand and a specific audio tool that my cousin Tate, who is a bit on the heavier side, had suggested. Before we went down there, we joked around about my younger brother Jackson going down there alone to try to find something. My older brother Caden had previously claimed that when he went down there to retrieve his guitar to play it about five or eight years ago, he saw a ghost and got scared. Then, when he went down there again, the guitar had moved, so we were already a bit spooked before the actual story takes place. Tate decided to download a See in the Dark app. That only worked on his phone, and the app worked like a charm. We were able to see clearly down the staircase. My cousins always loved to tease me by turning off the lights while I was playing with the piano. So, we finally went down to the basement and heard nothing but the buzzing sound of the app working. We went into the toy room, and that's when Tate brought up the fact that our grandpa had told him that the house that we were in was built on an Indian graveyard, and that sent shivers down my spine. As we were down there, we captured something on the audio saying, leave, and other things like, what are you doing? My cousins thought it would be funny to send me down there alone, which I hated the thought of, and we ended up catching even more voices. Needless to say, we stopped going down to the basement after that. It was just too spooky for me. Our Voices I've never really believed in the paranormal until this started happening to me and my brother. We keep hearing our names being yelled at us in our own voices, and it's freaking us out. The weirdest part is, is that it only happens in one place and always at night. We've tried to ignore it, but we can't deny that it's real. The strange occurrences always start with a knocking or banging sound, and then we hear our names being called. It's always behind us, and we never see anything there. It's like someone or something is following us around, but we can't see them. The most unsettling part is that when it speaks to me, my brother can't hear it, and when it speaks to him, I can't hear it. It's like it's only targeting one of us at a time, 
And what's even more disturbing is that it uses my brother's voice to yell at me and my voice to yell at him. It's like it's mocking us or trying to scare us. We've tried to rationalize it and find a logical explanation, but we can't. It only happens in one place and it's always the same pattern. We're starting to wonder if it's some kind of ghost or spirit trying to communicate with us. But why would it only say our names in the other person's voice? And why only one word? At first we were really scared and would run away whenever we heard names being called like that, but now it's happening so many times that we're just like, what the fuck again? Shit. And we go home. We still don't know what's causing it, but we're hoping to find some answers soon. Creepy in question. I was enjoying a late night movie with my sister and our two dogs in the living room. It was around 1 a.m. and my sister and the dogs had already fallen asleep while the movie was still running. Suddenly I heard what seemed to be a cat crying for its life. Being a pet owner, I've heard cats fight before, but this sounded different. The sound was so loud and it felt like it was coming from just outside our back door. and I couldn't hear any other animal noises to suggest a fight. I paused the movie, trying to wake up my sister, who was in a deep slumber. I tried to nudge my dogs, hoping they'd sense something was off, but they didn't even budge. It was as if the noises were inaudible to them. I started yelling, hoping to wake someone up, but no one responded. I decided to turn on the porch light and peep through the window, but I couldn't see anything suspicious. Suddenly, the noises seemed to be moving away, becoming fainter. Just then, my sister woke up with a start and her heart was racing. We heard one or two more cat screams, but the last one sounded as if it was right outside her door, and then it mimicked itself, getting quieter before vanishing altogether. At that moment, my dogs also woke up, but they seemed more confused than scared. We were both shaken by this incident, and we couldn't help but wonder what could have made those noises. The whole experience was so surreal, and we couldn't make sense of it. We didn't get back to sleep that night couldn't help but feel like something strange had just happened. Maybe the 20th time I've seen a girl shadow at night. As a child, I had a few experiences with ghosts, particularly with this little girl, and since then I've become a light sleeper. Last night around 3 a.m., I was sound asleep when I heard some movement. I woke up and to my surprise, I saw a little girl crouching and staring at a controller on the floor. I tilted my head to get a better look, but as soon as she saw me, she dashed into the hallway without making any noise. I was left perplexed and scared. I stayed up until 5 a.m. afraid that the little girl might come back. This isn't the first time something like this has happened to me while staying at my mother's house. I'm currently here because of a divorce. The first incident happened back in November when I was talking with my sister. I was standing in the hallway, and she was in the doorway, and suddenly the little girl with curly blonde hair ran from right to left behind my sister. I only saw her head and her hair and part of her shoulder as I was looking at my sister. We both froze, and I asked my sister if she saw it, and she said no, but she felt footsteps behind her as if someone was passing by. These experiences left me feeling uneasy and scared, and I don't know who this little girl is or why she keeps appearing to me. I'm not sure if I want to know. All that I know is that I'm having trouble sleeping and that I feel like someone's watching me. I hope that these incidents stop soon and that I can get some peace of mind. Weird vibes from the new neighbor. Since earlier this year, new neighbors moved in across the street from me. My wife and the neighbor hit it off, and they hang out while our kids play together. I try to be friendly with the neighbor, but there's this strange energy between us, an awkward vibe that I can't quite put my finger on. It's something heavy and unfamiliar to me. It wasn't until after my wife opened up to me about her neighbor that I realized why I was feeling this way. Apparently, she builds and sells spell boxes, visits cemeteries, and has spiritual attachments, and does card readings. 
My wife even mentioned that the neighbor flipped the devil card during one of their readings. This made me uneasy, and I couldn't shake off the feeling that something wasn't right. Lately, my wife has been experiencing unexplained nightmares and sleep paralysis, which is unusual for her. I also had a strange dream involving the neighbor, while she appeared demonic. I couldn't remember the specifics of the dream, but I woke up feeling depressed, upset, and angry. The only thing that I could recall was the neighbor's appearance. As someone who's always felt somewhat clairvoyant, I don't like the vibe that I get around her. I feel like there's more to her than meets the eye. I can't help but wonder if her spiritual practices are affecting her household in some way, despite there being no physical uses or disrespect. I can't ignore the strange energy that surrounds her, and I'm not sure how to approach this, but I know that I need to protect myself and my family from anything that can harm us. Did not realize my neighbor's mother passed away the day before I saw her in their window. Three years ago, I moved into a house right in front of my neighbor who's in her mid-forties and lives with her mother who's in her seventies. They're fun people and they invite me and my kids to get all together and have occasions together. I met her mother multiple times and she was always a vibrant woman with a smile on her face. Last Friday, I returned home from a business trip and I saw my neighbor's mother sitting in her usual niche by the dining room window. It was dark outside and I could see her backlit shadow, so I waved and she quickly waved back. I thought nothing of it and proceeded to go inside my house. I didn't see my neighbor's car in the driveway, which I found strange because she never left her mom alone due to the risk of falling. Her mother had already fallen a few times and even broke her hip once. Well, the next morning I saw my neighbor and casually asked her how her mom was doing. Then she informed me that her mother had passed away on Thursday morning, and that she hadn't seen since. And I was out of town when they were telling the news to people. I was frozen with shock. I didn't tell her that I had just seen her mother sitting in her usual spot the evening before. But I still got goosebumps thinking about it and wonder if it was really her mother's spirit watching over her house. It's a haunted thought. But it could be comforting to think that her mother is still keeping eyes on things from the other side. Shadows and Lights I'm a 21-year-old college student who has always been fascinated by abandoned exploration videos. About two months ago, I started watching them more frequently, spending hours at night engrossed in the eerie footage. But then I started to hear strange noises at night, which I initially attributed to the videos playing tricks on my mind. However, the noises persisted even after I stopped watching the videos, leaving me feeling uneasy. As if that wasn't enough, I began to notice shadowy figures lurking in the corner of my door frame. At first, it would peer over and then disappear, but after a few days, it stopped disappearing and just remained there. The figure looked human, and I couldn't shake the feeling that it was watching me. To make matters worse, I recently started watching a YouTuber who reacts to scary things, and ever since then, my LED lights, which I used to keep my room lit, have been turning off and on every time the video plays disturbing voices that says things like, I'm in your walls, and other unsettling phrases. Needless to say, I've started to avoid staying up late and have been closing my door at every opportunity. All of this has left me feeling anxious and on edge. I'm not sure if I'm just letting my imagination get the best of me or if there's something truly sinister going on in my room. Either way, I don't think I'll be watching any more scary videos anytime soon. My sister and I had the same dream about the both of us being victims of an attempted abduction. As I recall, the dream occurred on different days, but the memory of it still lingers in my mind vividly. It was the day when our mother took my sister and me to the grocery store for our weekly shopping. I noticed that two tall men in black were following us. Their presence sent shivers down my spine, and I couldn't shake off the feeling that something terrible was going to happen. I couldn't remember their faces, but I knew that they had a sinister agenda. 
As they were checking out, my mother realized that she had left her wallet in the car. My sister and I offered to go get it for her. As we were waiting for the checkout line, it was taking forever. And as we walked toward the car, I saw the reflection of one of the men reaching into his pocket for a cloth, which I assumed to be chloroform. Panic set in and my sister and I ran into a nearby nail salon, frantically asking people inside to call the police. The next few moments were a blur, as we could hear the men barging into the salon and dragging us out. We were helpless and the police never came. The dream ended abruptly, leaving us both feeling uneasy and unsettled. My sister and I recalled this dream multiple times over the years. Perhaps it's a sign of our fate or a message from our subconscious minds. I can only hope that if such a situation ever arises in real life, we would have the strength and courage to overcome it. Not really a ghost story, but still kind of supernatural. I'm from Ohio, a place where red cardinals are abundant, especially during springtime. Recently, my mother had to travel to Indiana to take care of my grandpa, who had undergone surgery and was hospitalized. My mom firmly believes that the cardinals are guardian angels, and that they appear to us to either look out for us or to inform us about the upcoming death of someone close. Although I wasn't a firm believer in that, something unusual happened during the past few days. Every time I looked outside or went out, I would see two or three cardinals, which isn't unusual in this area during this time of year, but this felt different. A small voice inside my head kept repeating, it's his time. Yesterday evening, my mom called with heartbreaking news. My grandpa had passed away. It was a devastating moment. I couldn't wrap my head around the fact that he was gone. However, the cardinals that I saw over the past few days now made sense. It's like they were spiritual messengers trying to convey the message that it was my grandpa's time to go. I never thought I'd believe in this theory, but now I'm convinced that it's true. In a way, I find it comforting to know that my grandpa maybe had his guardian angel around during his last moments. It makes me feel like he was surrounded by love and care. Though I still grieve for my grandpa, the thought that he had a peaceful passing brings me a sense of solace. Has anyone else seen spirits or ghosts on a war battlefield? Whenever I visit Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, a Civil War hotspot, I always encounter strange sightings of spirits or ghosts, or whatever you want to call them. The first time I went, I stayed in a pre-Civil War house and saw something in my doorway. It was black and had red eyes, which was incredibly strange because I don't experience sleep paralysis. The next night, I saw a little girl playing with toys on the carpet in the children's room where I was staying. The next time I went to Gettysburg, I stayed in a renovated car shop that once belonged to a baseball player. However, every night at 3.11, I would wake up to a glowing figure holding a baseball bat. It was so vivid and surreal, I couldn't shake off the eerie feeling that it gave me. On my third visit to Gettysburg, I saw soldiers walking through the fields as we were driving in at night. It was a strange and eerie sight, and I couldn't help but feel unsettled throughout the trip. Thankfully, we only stayed for three days, and as soon as we left the town, I felt fine again. But I can't help but wonder if anyone else has experienced similar encounters in Gettysburg. The sightings I had were so vivid and lifelike that it's hard to dismiss them as being coincidences. It's like the place is a magnet for paranormal activity, and every time I visit, I'm bound to see or experience something bizarre. A visit. Today marks the one year anniversary of my grandpa's passing, and I can't help but feel his presence around me. I remember last year when I saw multiple cardinals during April, and it felt like they were sending me a sign that it was his time to go, and something similar happened earlier this evening that reinforced my belief. It was a warm day, so my mom and I had to go in the living room with the windows open. And suddenly, we heard the familiar call of a cardinal. My mom and I rushed outside to our back deck, and there it was. Perched high up in a tree, chirping away. Felt like it was looking directly at us, and my mom whispered, 
It's my dad calling to us. I felt a chill run down my spine as I looked at the cardinal and I couldn't help but feel like it was a sign from my grandpa. We stood there watching the cardinal chirp for a few minutes before it eventually flew away. My mom almost started crying and I couldn't help but feel emotional as well. It felt like my grandpa was checking in on us and the cardinal was his way of communicating with us. I've never been a firm believer in the whole cardinals being guardian angels thing, but in this case, I truly believe that the cardinal we saw tonight was my grandpa's way of letting us know that he's still watching over us. I'll always cherish this memory, you know, never forget the feeling of his presence around me. My True Creepy Stories One night I was sitting at the dinner table, enjoying my meal while the lights were on. However, outside it was pitch black. As I looked up, something caught my eye. A white figure, almost glowing, was crouching underneath the window and then began to walk. I couldn't tell if it was a person or something paranormal, but I vividly remember the entire figure was completely white. It sent shivers down my spine and I was left wondering what it could have been. Another strange encounter I had was during the day. I was looking out the window and I saw a figure that resembled a scarecrow, but it was much taller than any normal scarecrow. It had to be at least 10 feet tall, and it was walking behind a fence. I couldn't make out much of its features, but I could tell that it was wearing a robe with a hood, and it had a skull face. It was a truly frightening sight, and I felt like I was in some kind of horror movie. Both of these are experiences that left me feeling uneasy and terrified. I couldn't explain what I saw or rationalize it in any way. I tried to tell my friends and family about what had happened, but no one believed me. I felt like I was going crazy, and these encounters continued to haunt me for a long time. Even today, I still wonder what those figures were and if they were trying to communicate with me in some way. Angel brushed my cheek. Late at night, my parents pulled into a Chick-fil-A parking lot to wait on their online order. My brother and I were sitting in the back seat, and I was starting to doze off. Suddenly, I felt the warm back of someone's hand brush my cheek, and I saw a soft, warm glow. This sudden touch jolted me awake, and I immediately asked my mom if she had checked on me. She looked at me with confusion and said she was on her phone this whole time and didn't know what I was talking about. I was left feeling extremely confused and wondering what had just happened. I'm not religious or spiritual in any way, but something inside me just couldn't shake the feeling that maybe it was a sign from a deceased loved one or even a guardian angel. For weeks I couldn't stop thinking about that night and the mysterious touch on my cheek. I kept replaying the moment in my mind, trying to make sense of it wasn't until later that I found out that the Chick-fil-A parking lot where we were waiting had been the site of a tragic accident years ago. The accident resulted in the death of several people, and there were rumors that the site was haunted. I couldn't help but wonder if the touch on my cheek was a sign of one of the spirits that still lingered in the area. It's been years since that night, but the memory still haunts me to this day. Weird sighting just happened to me. It was a beautiful day, so I decided to spend some time outside reading. Our house is located near the woods, and there's a shed next to me at an angle while I look out over our yard and into the woods. As I was lost in my book, I heard a crunching noise coming from the woods. I assumed it could be a deer or a turkey, since they often come close to me when I'm still. I looked up to see what was making the noise, but to my surprise, it wasn't any of the usual suspects. Instead, I saw this strange, bizarre thing. I know this might sound vague, but it looked like a headless, naked torso, with just its arms dragging itself across the ground. There was no blood, and it was just injured. But the way it moved was so peculiar, it gave me goosebumps. It reminded me of those strange ocean sunfish, but this was eerily more human. I was terrified and had never seen anything like it before. I couldn't comprehend what it was, but I rushed inside to get my cousin to show them this bizarre creature. 
but by the time I returned outside, it had vanished into thin air. I was left wondering if what I had seen was some sort of paranormal thing. Was it a ghost or some strange creature? The whole incident gave me the creeps and stayed with me for a while. I heard the voices of my family in my basement, and I was home alone. A few years ago when I came home from school, my family wasn't there yet. I had an odd feeling like someone was watching me and constantly looking around, but no one was there. I decided to grab a snack and watch some YouTube to take my mind off it, but then I heard what sounded like the basement door opening. I assumed it was my family, but it was a strange thing since they usually entered through the front door. I called out, but there was no answer. Suddenly I heard my parents' voices coming from downstairs, but it sounded different. It was like their voices were spirited away or otherworldly. I couldn't quite make out what they were even saying, but I was sure it was their voices. After a while, my family arrived home through the front door, which confused me even more. How could they have been in the basement when they just arrived? I checked the garage door, which leads to the basement, and it was closed the whole time, so nobody could have entered. It was such an odd experience, but I didn't feel threatened or scared. I don't think it was urgent enough to call a paranormal investigator, but I couldn't explain what happened. To this day, it remains a mystery to me. What did Ivan encounter with? It was a typical day and I decided to take a nap in the afternoon. I lay down on my bed and my loyal companion Tara lay on the floor next to me. Suddenly I noticed a strange phenomenon. There was a sphere-shaped flying cloud with a diameter of around 30 centimeters floating through the air. It came in through the door and disappeared into the wall. The cloud was moving at a slow but precise speed and I couldn't help but watch it in awe. Initially, I thought I might just be hallucinating, because it seemed like such a surreal experience. However, Tara also noticed the strange object, and got up to stare at it with me, indicating that it was real. I didn't feel scared or anything negative. I was just curious and intrigued by what was happening. As I lay down to take my nap, I kept an eye out for the mysterious sphere for it to reappear. However, after a few minutes, I didn't see it again. I eventually fell asleep, pondering the strange event that had just occurred. Seeing Shadow Creatures and Light Flashes For years now, I've been seeing some strange things that I can't explain. It started with small light orbs, just slightly larger than a laser cat toy, flicking erratically in the window of my hallway. I would often wake up in the middle of the night and see these orbs dancing around before disappearing, but that was just the beginning. More recently, I've been seeing shadow figures out of the corner of my eye. Tall, shadowy men will peek into my door frame and stand in my hallway before slowly fading away. Sometimes I see shadow spiders crawling up my walls, or even on my arms. It's a creepy feeling, especially considering that I live in an old house that has always given me an uneasy feeling at night. These experiences have left me feeling uneasy and on edge, wondering what exactly I'm seeing, I'm trying to rationalize it, thinking maybe it's just in my mind and it's playing tricks on me. But the more I see these things, the less convinced I am of that explanation. As I sit here typing this, I can't help but feel the sense of dread at the thought of what else might I see tonight. Eventually, I closed my eyes, tightly, and I hoped it would disappear when I opened them again. But when I did, it was gone. I didn't sleep much that night, and I couldn't shake off the feeling of being watched. The next morning, I asked my family if they had experienced anything strange, but they said they hadn't. To this day, I still don't know what it was that I saw that night in the hotel room. It was just so strange and inexplicable. I've never experienced anything like this since then. But I'm curious, has anyone else experienced anything like this while staying in an old hotel or somewhere with a creepy vibe? <laughs> 